again? Well, that seems really difficult to build a detector of intelligent or intelligent com co communication. Sort of, uh, if we take an alien perspective, observing Earth, are you sure that they would be able to detect humans as the special thing? Wouldn't they be already curious about other things? There's way more insects by body mass, I think, than humans by far, uh, and colonies. Uh, obviously, dolphins is the most intelligent uh, creature on Earth. We all know this. So it could be the dolphins that they detect. It could be the rockets that we seem to be launching. That could be the intelligent creature they detect. Uh, it could be some other uh, trees. Trees have been here a long time. I just learned that sharks have been here 400 million years, and that's longer than trees have been here. So maybe it's the sharks. They go by age. Like mm -hmm. there's a persistent thing. Like if you survive long enough, especially through the mass extinctions, that could be the, the, the thing your detector is uh, detecting. Mm -hmm. Humans have been here for a very short time, and we're just creating a lot of pollution, but so is the other creatures. So I don't know. Do you, you, do you think you would be able to detect humans? Like, how would you go about detecting in the computational sense? Maybe we can leave humans behind. In the computational sense, detect interesting things. Uh, do you basically have to have a strict objective function by which you measure the performance of a system? Or can you find curiosities and yeah. interesting things? Yeah, well, I think at the first um, measurement would be to detect how much of an effect you can have in your environment. So if you look right. at look around, we have cities, and that is constructed environments, and that's where a lot of people live, most people live. So that would be a good sign of intelligence, that you uh, don't just live in an environment, but you construct it to your liking. Yeah, uh, And that's something pretty unique. Uh, I mean, there are certainly birds build nests, and all, but they don't build quite cities. Termites build uh, mounds and hives and things like that. Uh, but the complexity of the human uh, construction cities, I think, would stand out even to an external observer. Of course, that's what a human would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, you can certainly say that uh, sharks are really smart because they've been around so long and they yeah. haven't destroyed their environment, which humans are about to do, which is yeah. not a very smart thing. Uh, but we'll get over it, I'm, I'm, I, I believe. Uh, and and uh, yeah. we can get over it by doing some construction that actually is benign uh, and maybe even enhances uh, the um, resilience of, of nature. I tend to enjoy thinking about aliens and thinking <laughs> about uh, the sad thing to me about extraterrestrial intelligent life, that if it was, if it visited us here on earth, or if we came on, on Mars and, or maybe in another other solar system, another galaxy one day, that uh, us humans would not be able to detect it or communicate with it or appreciate, like it'd be right in front of our nose and we were too self-obsessed to see it. Not self-obsessed, but our, 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 our tools, our frameworks of thinking would not detect it. As a good movie, Arrival and so on, where Stephen Wolfram and his son, I think, were part of developing this alien language of how aliens would communicate with humans. Do you ever think about that kind of stuff where if humans and aliens would be able to communicate with each other, like if we uh, met each other at some, okay, we could do SETI, which is communicating from across a very big distance, mm. but also just us, you know, be, be, <laughs> if you did a podcast with an alien, <laughs> do you think we'd be able to find a common language uh, and uh, a common methodology of communication? I think from a computational perspective, the way to ask that is, is you have very fundamentally different creatures, agents that are yeah. created. Would they be able to find a common language? Yeah. Yes, that's, I do think about that. I mean, I think a lot of people who are in computing, they, uh, and AI in particular, they got into it because they were fascinated with science fiction right. and, and all of these options. I mean, uh, Star Trek generated all kinds of devices that we have now. They, they yes. envisioned it first. And, and it's a great motivator. Um, to think about things like that, um, and I. So one, what, and again, being a computational scientist and and trying to build intelligent agents, what I would like to do is have a simulation where the agents actually evolve communication, not just communication. We've done that. People have done that many times. That they mm -hmm. communicate, they signal, and so on. But actually, develop a language 
And language means grammar. It means all these social structures and on top of that, grammatical structures. Uh, and uh, we do it in under various conditions uh, and actually try to identify what conditions are necessary for it to uh, come out. Uh, and then we can start asking that kind of questions. Are those languages that emerge in that, those different simulated environments, are they understandable to us? Can we somehow make a translation? We can make it a concrete question. <laughs> I mean, so machine translation of evolved languages. And so, so like languages that evolve come up with, can we translate, like I have a Google Translate for the evolved languages. Yes. yes. And if we do that wow. enough, we have perhaps an idea <laughs> what an alien language might be like, the yes. space of where those yeah. languages can be. Because we can set up their environment differently. It doesn't need to be gravity. Yeah, you know, right. it can, you can have all kinds of societies can be different. They may have no predators. They may have all, everybody's a predator, all kinds of situations. Yes. And, and then see what the space possibly is, where those languages are, and what the difficulties are. That would be really good, actually, to do that before the aliens come here. <laughs> so yes, it's good practice. Yeah. Uh, on the similar connection, you know, you can think of AI systems as aliens. Is there a ways to evolve a communication scheme for, there's a field you can call it like explainable AI, for AI systems to be able to communicate? So you have a bunch, you evolve a bunch of agents, but for some of them to be able to talk to you yeah. also. So to evolve a way for agents to be able to communicate about their world to us humans. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's possible mechanisms for doing that? We can certainly try. And if we, um, if it's an evolution competition system, for instance, you reward those solutions that are actually functional, that that communication right. makes sense. It allows us to together again, achieve go common goals. I think it's possible, but even from that um, paper that you mentioned, the, the anecdotes, it's quite likely also that the uh, the agents learn to, you know, lie <laughs> and, and fake and do all yeah. kinds of things like that. Yes, I mean we see that in in even very low level, like bacterial evolution. There are there are cheaters, um, and who's to say that what they say is actually what they think? It, um, but but that's what I'm saying that the, there would have to be some common goal so that we can evaluate whether that communication is at least useful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, they may be saying things just to make us feel good <laughs> or, or get us to do what we want, whatever, not turn them off or something. But, but uh, so we would have to understand their internal representations much better to really make sure that that translation is critical. Um, but it can be useful. And I think that it's possible to do that. Um, there are examples where visualizations um, are automatically created uh, so that we can look into the what the, uh, the system, uh, and the language is not that far from it. I mean, it is a way of communicating and and logging what you're doing in some inter interpretable way. Um, I think a fascinating topic, yeah, to do that. If aliens were observing Earth through the entire history, just watching us, and uh, we're tasked with uh, summarizing what happened until now, what do you think they would say? What do you think they would write up in that summary? Like it has to be pretty short. Less than a page, like in uh, Hitchhiker's <laughs> Guide. There's, I think, uh, like a paragraph or a couple sentences. How would you summarize? How sorry? How would the alien summarize? Do you think uh, all of human civilization? My f first thoughts take more than a page. Uh, they'd probably distill it because if they watched. Well, I mean, first. I have no idea if their senses are even attuned to similar stuff to what our senses are attuned to or what the nature of their consciousness is like relative to ours. And so let's assume that they're kind of like us, just technologically more advanced to get here from wherever they are. That's the first kind of constraint on the thought experiment. And then if they've watched throughout all of history, they saw the burning of Alexandria. They saw that 2000 years ago, in Greece, we were producing things like clocks, the Antikytheria mechanism, and then that technology got lost. They saw that there wasn't just a steady dialectic of progress. So every once in a while, there's a giant fire that destroys a lot of things. There's yeah. a giant like uh, commotion that destroys a lot of things. Yeah, and it's usually self-induced. Uh, they would have seen, <laughs> seen that. <laughs> and so as they're looking at us now, as we move past the nuclear weapons age into the full globalization, Anthropocene, exponential tech age, 
still making our decisions relatively similarly to how we did um, in the Stone Age as far as rivalry game theory type stuff. I, I think they would think that this is probably most likely one of the planets that is not going to make it to being intergalactic because we blow ourselves up in the technological adolescence. And if we are going to, we're going to need some major progress rapidly in the social technologies that can guide and bind and direct the physical technologies so that we are safe vessels for the amount of power we're getting. Actually, Hitchhiker's Guide has a uh, estimation about how, how much of a risk this particular thing uh, poses to the rest of the galaxy. And I think, I forget what it was, I think it was medium or low. So, so their estimation was would be that this this species of ant-like creatures is not going to survive long. There's ups and downs in terms of technological innovation. The fundamental nature of their behavior from a game theory perspective hasn't really changed. They have not learned in any fundamental way how to uh, control and properly incentivize or properly do the mechanism design of games to ensure long-term survival. And then they move on to another planet. Do you uh, think there is, in a more slightly more serious question, do you think there's some number or perhaps a very, very large number of uh, intelligent alien civilizations out there? Yes, would be hard to think otherwise. I know, I think Bostrom had a new article not that long ago on why that might not be the case that the Drake equation might not be the kind of in story on it. But when I look at the total number of Kepler planets just that we're aware of just galactically and, and also like when that um, when those life forms were discovered in Mono Lake that didn't have the same six primary atoms, I think it had arsenic replacing phosphorus as one of the primary aspects of its energy metabolism. We get to think about that the building blocks might be more different. So the physical constraints even that the planets have to have might be more different. Uh, it seems really unlikely not not to mention interesting things that we've observed that are still unexplained. As you've like had what? guests on your show discussing Tic Tac and... Oh, oh, the ones that have visited. Yeah. Well, let's dive right into that. What do you make sense of uh, the rich human psychology of uh, there being hundreds of thousands probably millions of witnesses of UFOs of different kinds on Earth, most of which I presume are conjured up by the human mind through the perception system. Some number might be true. Some number might be reflective of actual physical objects, whether it's uh, you know, drones or testing military technology that's secret or otherworldly technology. What do you make sense of all of that? Because it's gained quite a bit of popularity recently. There is uh, some sense in which that's uh, that's us humans being hopeful and dreaming of otherworldly creatures as a way to escape the dreariness of our of the human condition. <laughs> but in another sense, it could be it really could be something truly exciting that a science should turn its eye towards. So, what do you, where do you place it? Uh, speaking of turning eye towards, this is one of those super fascinating, actually super consequential possibly topics that I wish I had more time to study and just haven't allocated. So I, I don't have firm beliefs on this because I haven't got to study it as much as I want. So what I'm going to say comes from a superficial assessment. Um, while we know there are plenty of things that people thought of as UFO sightings that we can fully write off, we have other better explanations for them. Uh, what we're interested in is the ones that we don't have better explanations for, and then not just immediately jumping to uh, a theory of what it is, but holding it as unidentified and being being um, curious and earnest. I think the the uh, Tic Tac one is quite interesting and made it in major media recently, but I don't know if you ever saw the Disclosure Project. Uh, a guy named Stephen Greer organized a bunch of mostly U.S. military and some commercial flight uh, people who had direct observation and classified information uh, disclosing it at a CNN briefing. And so you saw um, high-ranking generals, admirals, fighter pilots, all describing things that they saw um, on radar with visual uh, 
with their own eyes or cameras, and also describing some phenomena that had some consistency across different people. And I find this interesting enough that it, I think it would be silly to just dismiss it. Um, and specifically, like we can we can ask the question, how much of it is natural phenomena, ball lightning or something like that? And this is why I'm more interested in what uh, fighter pilots and astronauts and people who are trained in um, being able to identify uh, flying objects and um, atmospheric phenomena um, have to say about it. I think the thing, then you, you could say, well, are they more advanced military craft? Um, is it some kind of, you know, human craft? The interesting thing that a number of them describe is something that's kind of like right angles at speed, or if not right angles, acute angles at speed, but something that looks like a different relationship to inertia than physics makes sense for us. I don't think that there are any human technologies that are doing that even in really deep uh, <laughs> underground black projects. Now, one could say, okay, well, could it be a hologram? Well, would it show up on radar if radar is also seeing it? And so... Uh, I don't know. I think there's enough. I mean, and for that to be a massive coordinated psyop, is it as interesting and ridiculous in a way as the idea that it's UFOs from some extraplanetary source? So it's it's up there on the interesting topics. To me, there's if it is at all alien technology, it is the dumbest version of alien technology. It's, it's so far away. It's like the old, old crappy VHS tapes of alien technology. These are like crappy drones that just floated or even like space to the level of like space junk because it is so close to our human technology. We talk about it moves in ways that's, uh, that's unlike what we understand about physics, but it still has very similar kind of geometric notions and something that we humans can perceive with our eyes, all those kinds of things. I feel like alien technology most likely would be something that we would not be able to perceive, not because they're hiding, but because it's so far advanced that it would be much, it would be beyond the cognitive capabilities of us humans. Just as you were saying, as per your answer for alien summarizing Earth, it's, uh, the starting assumption is they have similar perception systems. They have similar cognitive capabilities, and that very well may not be the case. Let me ask you about staying in aliens for just a little longer, because I think it's a, it's a good transition in talking about governments and human societies. Do you think if a U.S. government or any government was in possession of an alien spacecraft or of information related to alien spacecraft, they would uh, have the capacity, structurally would they have the, the processes, would they be able to uh, communicate that to the public effectively or would they keep it secret in a room and do nothing with it? both of uh, to try to preserve military secrets, but also because of the incompetence that's inherent to bureaucracies or either. Well, we can certainly see when certain things become declassified 25 or 50 years later that there were things that the public might have wanted to know that were kept secret for a very long time for reasons of uh, at least supposedly national security. Um, which is also a nice source of plausible deniability for um, people covering their ass for doing things that would be problematic and um, other purposes. There are, there's a scientist at Stanford who supposedly um, got some material that was recovered from Area 51 type area did analysis on it using, I believe, electron microscopy and a couple other methods and came to the idea that it was a nanotech alloy um, that was something we didn't currently have the ability to do, was not naturally occurring. So there, I've heard some things. And again, like I said, I'm, I'm not going to stand behind any of these because I haven't done the level of study to have high confidence. Um, 
I think what you said also about would it be super low tech alien um, craft, like do, would they necessarily move their atoms around in space, or might they do something more interesting than that? Might they be able to uh, have a different relationship to the concept of space or information or consciousness or um, one of the things that the craft supposedly do is not only accelerate and turn in a way that looks non-inertial, but also disappear. Yeah. So there's a question as to, like, the two are not necessarily mutually exclusive. And it could be possible to, some people run a hypothesis that they create intentional amounts of exposure as an invitation of a particular kind. Yeah. Um, who knows? Interesting field. We tend to assume, like, SETI, that's listening out for aliens out there. I've just been recently reading more and more about gravitational waves and you have orbiting black holes that orbit each other. They generate ripples in space time. On my, uh, for fun at night, when I lay in bed, I think about what it would be like to ride those waves when they, uh, not not the low magnitude they are as they, when they reach Earth, but like get closer to the black holes because it will basically be shrinking and expanding us in all dimensions, including time. So it's actually ripples through space time that they generate. Why is it that you couldn't use that? It travels at the speed of light. It travels at a speed, which is a very weird thing to say when you're when you're uh, morphing space time, it's it's a comp it's it's uh, you could argue it's faster than the speed of light. So, so if you're able to communicate by to summon enough energy to generate black holes and to orbit the uh, to to force them to orbit each other, why not travel as the ripples in space time, whatever the hell that means somehow combined with wormholes. So if you're able to communicate through, like we don't think of uh, gravitational waves as something you can communicate with because the the radio will be have to be the size, a very large size and very dense, but perhaps that's it. You know, perhaps that's one way to communicate. It's a very effective way. And uh, that would explain, like we wouldn't even be able to make sense of that, of the physics that results in an alien species that's able to control gravity at that scale. I think you just jumped up the Kardashev scale so far so f that yeah. you're not just harnessing the power of a star, but harnessing the power of mutually rotating black holes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, That's way above my physics pay grade to think about, including even uh, non-rotating black hole versions of transwarp travel. Yeah. Um, I think, <laughs> uh, you know, you can talk with Eric more about that. I think he has better ideas on it than I do. My hope for the future of humanity mostly does not rest in the near term on our ability to get to other habitable planets in time. And even more than that, in the list of possible solutions of uh, how to improve human civilization, uh, orbiting black holes is not in the, on the first page for you. And not on the first page. Okay. I bet you did not expect us to start this conversation here, <laughs> but I'm glad the places it went. Uh, I am excited on a much smaller scale of uh, Mars, U Europa, or Titan, or Venus potentially having very like bacteria-like life forms, just on a on a small human level. It's a little bit scary, but mostly really exciting that there might be life elsewhere. Mm -hmm. in the volcanoes and the oceans all around us, mm -hmm. teeming, having little societies, and whether there's properties about that kind of life that's somehow different than ours. I don't know what would be more exciting if those colonies of single cell type organisms, what would be more exciting if they're different or they're the same? If they're the same, that means through the rest of the universe, there's life forms like us, something like us everywhere. If they're different, that's also really exciting because mm -hmm. there's life forms everywhere that are not like us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a little bit scary. I don't know what's scarier actually. <laughs> I it's think both scary and exciting no matter what, right? 
the idea that they could be very different is philosophically very interesting for us to open our aperture on what life and consciousness and and self-replicating possibilities could look like. The question on are they different or the same, obviously there's lots of life here that is the same in some ways and different in other ways. Um, when you take the thing that we call an invasive species is something that's still pretty the same hydrocarbon-based thing, but co-evolved with co-selective pressures in a certain environment, we move it to another environment, it might be devastating to that whole ecosystem because it's just different enough that it messes up the self-stabilizing dynamics of that ecosystem. So the question of are they, would they be different in ways where we could still figure out a way to inhabit a biosphere together or fundamentally not? Fundamentally, the uh, nature of how they operate and the nature of how we operate would be incommensurable is a deep question. Well, we offline talked about uh, mimetic theory, right? It, it seems like if they were sufficiently different, where well, we, we would not even, we can coexist on different planes, uh, it seems like a, a good thing. If we're close enough together to where we'd be competing, then it's you're getting into the world of viruses and pathogens and all those kinds of things to where we would, uh, one of us would die off quickly through basically mass murder without even- Even, without, even accidentally. Even accidentally. If we just had a self-replicating, single-celled kind of creature that happened to not work well for the hydrocarbon life that was here that got introduced because it either output something that was toxic or utilized up the same resource too quickly and it just replicated faster and mutated faster. That it wouldn't be a um, mimetic theory, conflict theory kind of harm. It would just be uh, a, a von Neumann machine, a self-replicating machine that was fundamentally incompatible with these kinds of self-replicating systems with faster mystic. The thing that I sometimes worry about is uh, the fact that we haven't seen overwhelming evidence of alien civilizations out there. Mm. Makes me think, um, well, there's a lot of explanations, but one of them that worries me is that uh, whenever they get smart, they just destroy themselves. Oh yeah, I mean, that was the most <laughs> fascinating, is the most fascinating and chilling number or variable in the drake equation is yeah. l at the yeah. end of and at the end of it you look out and you see you know one to 400 billion stars in the milky way galaxy and we now know because of kepler that an astonishingly high percentage of them probably have habitable planets and you know so all the things that were unknowns when the drake equation was originally written like you know how many stars have planets actually back then in the 1960s when the drake equation came along the consensus amongst astronomers was that it would be a small minority of solar systems that had planets or, no. or stars but now we know it's substantially all of them how many of those stars have habitable have planets in the habitable zone it's kind of looking like 20%, like, yeah. oh my God. And so L, which is how long does a civilization, once it reaches technological competence, continues to last, yeah. that's the doozy. <laughs> and, 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 and you're yeah. right, it's, it, it's all too plausible to think that when a civilization reaches a level of sophistication that's probably just a decade or three in our future, the odds of it self-destructing just start mounting astronomically, no pun intended. <laughs> my, my hope is they, that uh, actually there is a lot of alien civilizations out there and what they figure out in order to avoid the self-destruction, they need to turn off the thing that was useful, that used to be a feature and now became a bug, which is uh, the desire to colonize, to conquer mm -hmm. more land. To, so they like, there's probably ultra intelligent alien civilizations out there. They're just like chilling, like on the beach with a, with a whatever your favorite alcohol beverage is, but like without sort of trying to conquer everything, just chilling out and maybe exploring in the in the realm of knowledge, but almost like appreciating existence for its own sake versus uh, life as a progression of conquering of other life. Mm -hmm. Like this kind of predator prey formulation that resulted in uh, us humans perhaps is uh, something we have to shed in order to survive. I don't know. Yeah, that, that is um, a very plausible solution to Fermi's paradox. And it's, it's one that makes sense. You know, when we look at our own lives and our own arc of, traject of technological um, you know, trajectory, it's very, very easy to imagine that in 
an uh, intermediate future world of you know flawless VR or flawless you know whatever kind of simulation that we want to inhabit, it will just simply cease to be worthwhile yeah. to go out and and you know, expand our our interstellar territory. And but if we were going out and conquering interstellar territory, it wouldn't necessarily have to be predator or prey. I can imagine. Um, a benign but sophisticated intelligence saying, well, we're going to go to places, we're going to go to places that we can terraform. Yeah. We'll use a different word than terra, obviously, but we can turn into habitable for our particular yeah. physiology. Uh, so long as that they don't house, you know, intelligent sentient creatures that would suffer from our invasion. Mm -hmm. um, but it is easy to see a sophisticated intelligent species evolving to the point where interstellar travel with its incalculable expense and physical hurdles just isn't worth it compared to what could be done, you know, where one already is. Do you, um, do you think there's other alien civilizations out there? First, do you think there's other life out there? F first, do you think there's life in the solar system? Second, do you think there's life in the galaxy? And uh, third, do you think there's intelligent life in the solar system or the galaxy outside of Earth? So intelligent life, I have no idea. It seems deeply unlikely, uh, possible, but I'm not even sure if it's plausible. So that's the special thing to you about Earth is somehow intelligent life came yes. to be. Yes, and it's only, you know, very briefly, probably extremely briefly. Um, Uh-oh, you mean like it's always going to be, like we're gonna destroy ourselves? Exactly. Oh boy. And life will continue on Earth happily, uh, probably more happily. Um, so the trees and the dolphins will be here, I'm telling you. And the cockroaches and the yeah. incredible fungi, you know, yes. they'll be fine. Uh, so life on Earth will be fine, was fine before us and will be fine after us. So I'm not that worried about intelligent life, but I, I think it is unlikely, even on Earth is unlikely. Mm -hmm. Out of, what is it, five billion species across the history of the Earth? Yes. There's been one, an intelligent one, and for a blink of an eye, uh, yeah. possibly not much longer than that. Uh, so I I wouldn't bet on that at all. Though I would love it, of course. You know, I I wanted to find aliens since I was a little girl, and so of course I initially wanted to find ones that I could be friends with. Yeah. And I've had to let go of that dream because it's so deeply implausible. But see, the nice and sorry to interrupt, but the nice thing about intelligent alien civilizations, they may have more biosignatures than non-intelligent ones. So they might be easier to detect. That that would be the hope. On Earth, that's not the case, but it could be the case elsewhere. Oh, it's not the case on Earth. We Most of the biosignatures we have on Earth are created by quite simple life. If you don't count pollution, pollution is all well, it's the all, us, all, all well, us baby. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't see uh, polluting gases as a as a possible like. I look for polluting gases. I would love to find polluting gases. Well, you know, I'd be worried for them, of course, the same way I I think about my alien colleagues all the time, looking at us, and I'm sure they worry about our pollutions. But it would be a really good, robust, unambiguous sign of life if we found complex pollutants. So I look for those too. Yeah. I just don't have any hope of finding them. I think intelligent life in the galaxy at the same time that we're looking is yeah. deeply implausible. But life... I think is inevitable. And if it is inevitable, it is common. So I think there'll be life everywhere in the galaxy. Now, how common that life is, I think will depend a lot on whether there's life in the solar system beyond Earth. So I'll adjust my expectations very much based on there being life in the solar system. If there's life in the Venusian clouds, if there's life in the if there are biosignatures coming out of the plumes of Enceladus, if there's life on Titan. Oh, yeah, that's right. Insula yeah, yeah, plumes of Enceladus. That's the, um, that's the Saturn one? It's the moon that has the geysers that come out. Yeah. And so you can't see the under the subterranean oceans, but... It's supposed... To, it's, so it would be in the atmosphere. I was going to ask you about that one. Uh, have you looked at that? Uh, have you... Is, is that a hope for you to use the tools that you're using with Rascal uh, and other... <laughs> <laughs> ways for detecting the 16,000 uh, um, molecules that might be biosignatures to look at Enceladus? Yes, that's absolutely the plan. 
is there, what's the what's the limiting factor currently? Is it the 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 quality of the telescopes? Is uh, what's the, what's the, the the quality of the data? Yeah, the quality of the data, the observational data, and also the quality of Rascal and other associated things. So we're missing a lot of fundamental data to interpret the data that we get, and we don't have good enough data. Um, but hopefully, we will in the coming decades we'll get some information on Titan. We have Dragonfly going over. Uh, we'll get the plumes of Enceladus. We will look at the clouds of Venus and there's other places. And so if we find any life or any sign of life ever, like on Mars, then I'll adjust my calculations and I'll say, life is not just inevitable and common, but extremely common. Because all of these places we've mentioned, the subterranean oceans on Enceladus, the methane oceans of Titan, the clouds of Venus, the acidic clouds of Venus, these are places that are very different from the places where we find life on Earth, even the most extreme places. And so if life can originate in all of these completely different habitats, then life is even more resourceful than we thought. Yeah, that's which really- it's everywhere. That's really exciting if it's everywhere. If if there's life on just one one of the moons, if it's on Mars. Anywhere, anywhere in the solar system. And I will bet everything I own that every solar system, every planetary system has a potential for habitability, you know, because even if they don't have a habitable planet, they'll have moons around other giant planets and there'll be so much life. So for me, that's the only thing to figure out now, whether life is inevitable and quite common throughout the galaxy or everywhere, mm -hmm. but it's somewhere between those two. Intelligent life, I make no bets. And See, if I had to bet, I would be against. So yeah, to me, like two discoveries in the 21st century would change everything. One is, and maybe I'm biased, but, one is a discovery of life in the solar system. I feel like that would change our whole conception of how unique we are in the universe. I, I think I'm much more eager than you are to jump from basic life to intelligent life. I feel like if there's life everywhere, like the odds are there has, like we cannot, like you have, Oh, I see. You're you're saying it, there could have been many intelligent civilizations out there, but they just keep dying out. It's like the little. Yeah, I was detecting them. You know, ships in the night. Ships in the night. Oh, that's that's ultra sad. Just like is it sad? A graveyard. The Earth is not better for having us. Is it? We. It there's, doesn't owe us anything. Would you be sad to find alien giraffes? Would you be disappointed if you found alien giraffes? Because I would not. No, well, giraffes, first of all, they look goofy with their necks and everything, but- Let, No, we do not shit on giraffes. <laughs> okay. Giraffes are right. wondrous animals, are deeply understudied. We still know so little about them because no one does PhDs in giraffes. I am, um, there's a point I made a PhD in phosphine when people aren't doing PhDs in giraffes. We do not know enough about giraffes. I think it was like Ricky Gervais that did a whole like long thing in you about- trust Ricky Gervais <laughs> to talk about giraffes? That is not his expertise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's a stupid necks. It Why doesn't make any sense. I, it, the, the, I mean, that's giraffes fine. Giraffes are very resourceful animals who do incredible things and can kick a lion. Why don't you fist. climb the tree? Why don't you climb the tree? You don't need to grow uh, through the, the the lengthy evolutionary You'd process. Shitting on giraffes. I do, okay. What? Giraffes fine. are wondrous I, animals. I would uh, very appreciate take it. Back. That. I I take it back. I apologize. I, I trust I trust your expertise on this. Uh, the 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 thing that makes humans really fascinating and i think the earth but i'm a human is where we create Disclaimer. yeah we create things that are yes there's all the ugliness in the world there's all the on the on the bi uh, biological on the chemical level there's the pollution but we create beauty if you if you even from a physics perspective look at symmetry as somehow capturing beauty, the breaking of symmetries, stuff grounded in all the different definitions of symmetry, we're good at like creating things. So are spiders. But not giraffes. Okay. But yes, this is a spiders. <laughs> yes, there are spiders that create this little bubbles of air so they can breathe underwater. They can literally scuba dive. There are spiders that can create parachutes so they can glide. Yeah. And talk about symmetry. Look what spiders can do. And I just thought of spiders, but if I was an alien species coming to Earth, 
there'll be plenty to wonder, and we would just be one. One of the things. Yeah, clunky. Yeah. Naked monkey. Yeah, the ants might be even more fascinating. Exactly. The ants. Ants can figure out exactly through some emergent consciousness what the maximum distance between their trash, their babies, and their food is just from without any of them knowing how to do this. And collectively, they've learned how to do yeah. this. If I was an alien species, I'll be looking at that. Well, so that was the other thing I was going to mention. The second thing is... I tend to believe we, we can engineer consciousness, but at the at the basic level, understand the source of consciousness. Because if consciousness is is unique to humans, and if we can engineer it, that gives me hope that it can be present elsewhere in the universe. That's the other thing that makes, it's Agreed. an open question, that makes humans perhaps special, is not maybe the presence of consciousness, but some kind of, somehow a presence of like elevated consciousness. It does, again, maybe human centric, but it feels like we're more conscious than giraffes, for example, and spiders. Yes, uh, I won't deny that. I, I, there is something special about humans. I, you know, they're my favorite species. I, they are. They are, you know, yeah. some of my best friends are humans. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I think highly of humans, it's, yeah. it's great. I just don't have great hope for our longevity. And specifically, I don't have great hope given that we're the only species out of five billion that did this cool consciousness trick. I just, I don't wanna bet on finding um, a kinship elsewhere. That's quite interesting to think about. I don't think I've even considered that possibility that, uh, that there would be life in the solar system. So that, indicates that very possibly life is like literally everywhere. Yeah, everywhere right. it can happen, it does. Yeah, you know? and mo like especially what we're discovering with the exoplanets now, uh, they're, how numerous they are, or Earth-like habitable quote unquote planets, there's like they're everywhere. The most it's, common type of planet is yeah. rocky, it seems. And so, but I didn't consider the possibility that life is like literally everywhere and yet intelligent life is nowhere long enough to uh, to communicate with each other, to form little clusters of um, civilizations that expand beyond the solar system and so on. Man, maybe becoming a multiplanetary species is uh, is a less likely pursuit than uh, than we imagined. I but, agree. But one of the things that makes humans beautiful is we hope. But I I hope for humanity. And one of the things I hope for is that we become less obsessed with conquering and we become less obsessed with spreading ourselves. I hope that we transcend that, that we're happy with the universe without having to go and take it. So you can hope for the species without hoping for a multi-planetary existence. That is only, I think, the drive of our most primitive instincts to go and take, to go and plant a flag somewhere. We love planting a flag somewhere. And maybe we could overcome that minor drive. And once we do, the AI systems we build will destroy us because we're too peaceful and they will go and conquer and plant the flags. Best of luck to them. The cockroaches will be happy to. Um, <laughs> keep their keep to the business <laughs> I as tend they to, always have. I tend to believe that robots can have the same uh, elegance and consciousness and all the qualities of kindness and love and hope and fear that, that humans have. In you principle, know. they could, yes. Well, I don't really trust the people who make them. <laughs> this is about the giraffe comment, isn't it? it okay. Is. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't forgiven you <laughs> shitting on giraffes. What have they done to you? You um j just as a small tangent, uh, your master's thesis is also fascinating. Um maybe we could talk about it for just a little bit. It's uh titled Influence of a Star's Evolution on its Planetary System. So this interplay between a star and a planet, is there something interesting you could say about what you've learned about this this journey? that a star takes and the planets around it? Well, I, when I was younger and I was told what would happen ultimately to the earth as the sun expands towards a red giant and you know, Mercury would just like mm. fall in 
And then, you know, Venus fall in and the sun doesn't care. And it just seemed so, I felt so small. I felt like the earth and everything on it. It's just the universe doesn't care. Even our sun doesn't care. And I think I felt like our sun should feel some sort of responsibility for its planets, you <laughs> yes, know? Yeah. And it just felt like such a violent and neglectful parent. Yeah, it's and like a parent eating its own children. It's horrible. It's just <laughs> yeah. a horrible notion. Uh, but it made me think, what if this there's some sort of generation? And so at the time when I was doing my master's, there was a notion of the white dwarf cemetery, which is this idea that when stars become white dwarfs, that death is so horrible that planets, potentially habitable planets that could have been habitable before, they're now gone. There's no, there's no chance for life. But then I thought, what if life returns? You know, now it's a white dwarf. It's calmed down. It's not going to go anywhere. White dwarfs are very stable across like universal timescales. And so could you have planets around the white dwarf that could themselves get life again? Mm -hmm. You know, um, life doesn't care. And so my work was basically killing dozens of planets thousands of times. I just ran thousands and thousands of end body simulations. Well, you simulated this? Yeah, so I simulated the star wow. growing and just eating all these planets up and just absolute chaos. Um, the orbits of the planets would change as the star loses mass. So you would have like Jupiter plan like planets just crashing into the other planets, throwing them into the sun early. It was terrifying to watch these simulations. It was um, absolute carnage. But if you run thousands of these simulations, some systems find new balance ways of staying alive. Some uh, systems post star death find stable orbits again for billions of years, more than enough for life to originate again. And so that was my idea during that time that thesis was trying to explore this notion of life coming back and this idea of the universe doesn't care if you're here or not and it will go about its business you know andromeda will crash into us and doesn't care no one cares if you're alive in the universe and so letting go of that preciousness of life i found very useful at that stage of my career and instead <laughs> i just thought what if if life is inevitable it doesn't matter that it came by four billion years ago. It can start again four billion years later. And maybe that is nice. Maybe that's where hope lies, the phoenix rising everywhere. Planets being destroyed and created, and we're here now. And others will be more or less here-ish billions of years later. So accepting the cycle of death and life and... Uh, yeah. I'm not taking it personally. Not taking know? it personally. The son doesn't owe us anything. He's yeah. not a bad parent. It's not a parent at all. Yeah. I was looking at the uh, work of Freeman Dyson and seeing how it, how this universe eventually will just be a bunch of supermassive black holes before they also evaporate. And a bunch of tiny black holes too. Yeah. Absolute black quiet. Holes. Everyone, all the black holes a little too far away from one another to even interact until it's just silence forever but until then many many cycles of death and destruction and rebirth and rebirth so they i mean this is why the aliens have been showing up recently uh it's <laughs> like if you if you look at i mean there is i mean it's probably there's a correlation with a lot of things but what the ufologists quote unquote often talk about is that there seems to be a much higher level of ufo sightings since like in the nuclear age so like if aliens were indeed worried about us like if you were aliens you would start showing up when the the living organisms have first discovered a way to destroy the entire the uh, the entire colony couldn't um the uh, increase in sightings not have to do with the fact that people now have more cameras it's an interesting thing about science like with ufo sightings it's it's like either ninety nine point nine of percent of them are false or a hundred percent of them are false. The interesting thing to me is that in that point zero one percent, there's a lot of things in science that are like these weird outliers. They're difficult to replicate. You have like there's even physical phenomena, ball lightning. There's difficult things to artificially create in large amounts or observe 
in nature in large amounts in such a way that you could do to apply the scientific method. There could be just things that like happen like a few times, like or once, and you're like, what the hell is that? <laughs> And that that's very difficult for science to know what to do with. I'm a huge proponent of just being open-minded because when you're open-minded about aliens, for example, is it allows you to think outside of the box in other domains as well. And somehow that will result, like if you're open-minded about aliens and you don't, you know, don't laugh it off immediately, what happens is somehow that that's going to lead to a solution to P equals NP or P not equals NP. Like in ways that you can't predict the open-mindedness has tertiary effects that will result in progress, I believe. Which is why alien, I'm a huge fan of aliens, because it's like, because uh, too many scientists roll their eyes at the idea of aliens, alien life. And to me, it's one of the most exciting possibilities uh, and the biggest, most exciting questions before all of human civilization. So to roll your eyes, is not the right answer. To roll your eyes presumes that you know anything about this world, as opposed to just knowing 0.0001% of this world. And so being humble in the face of that, uh, being open to the possibility of aliens uh, visiting Earth is a good idea. Not everything though. I'm not so open-minded to the flat Earth uh, hypothesis as, as there's a growing number of people uh, believing in, but even then, or the inner earth. I've got shouted at in a public talk about it. Inner, the, so like the earth is hollow? Yeah, my understanding is that there's an, this conspiracy theory that as far as I can tell has no grounding in reality is that there's a slightly smaller earth inside this one, which is just too cute as a concept. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and you can access it, I think from Antarctica. And uh, that's where we keep, and I quote, the mammoths and the Nazis. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean that one is ridiculous, but like I do like. Hey, the, I thought you were keeping an open mind. I am. This is this is. <laughs> I genuinely think well, that's more likely than aliens visiting the Earth, and I say this as someone who has dedicated her life to finding like alien life, and and so that's how improbable I think the visitations yeah, I mean, it, are, because interstellar distances are so huge that it's just not really worth it. See, I I have a different view on this whole thing. I think the aliens that look like little green men are like extremely low probability event. Like uh, mammoths and Nazis? Under? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. that, that's that similar. Okay. But, but other kind of ideas, like the, the, the sad thing to me, and I think in, in my view, if there's other alien civilizations out there and they visited earth, neither them or perhaps just us would be even able to detect them. Like we we wouldn't be open minded enough to see it. Like if if um, because our understanding of what is life, and I just um, talked to Sarah Walker, who's um, you know Sarah. Yeah, we we talked for three hours about the question, "What is life?" Sarah's uh, a good person to talk <laughs> to about what is life. So. But like the whole point is we don't really, we have a very narrow-minded view of what is life. And it, when it shows up, and it might be already here, um, trees and dolphins and so on. Uh, <laughs> <Very good> <laughs> and or, 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 or mountains or I don't know, or the or the molecules in the atmosphere or... Um, or like I, people make fun of me, but I do think that ideas are kind of aliens themselves or consciousness could be the aliens or it could be the method by which they communicate. We don't know shit about the way our human mind works. And the fact that this thing is- It could is, be a quantum process. Please don't, I, I understand this. I, <laughs> it's not woo woo, I'm not, I, we could, but it very well could be. There could be something at the uh, at the physics level, right? It could be at the chemical or the biological level, things that are happening that we're just close, too close-minded because our conception of life is at the level of like us, like at the jungle level of, of mammals and on the time scale, that's the human time scale. We may not be able to perceive what alien life is actually like uh, what I, the scale at which their intelligence realizes itself, we may not be able to perceive. And the other thing that's really important about alien visitations, whether it happened or not, is especially after COVID in 2020, I'm losing a little bit of faith of our government being able to handle that that well. Not 
our government, but us as a society, as a collective, being able to deal with new things in an effective way that's inspiring, that's efficient, that uh, like whether it's, if, if it's a, a dangerous thing to deal with it, to alleviate the danger, whether it's the possibility of, of new discoveries and something inspiring to ride that wave and make it inspiring, all those kinds of things. I honestly think if aliens showed up, they would look around, everybody would ignore them and the government might like hide it, try to like see, to keep it from the Chinese and the Russians, if it's the United States, uh, to call it a military secret in a very close-minded way. And then the bureaucracy would drown it away to where uh, through paperwork, the poor aliens would just like waste away in a cell somewhere. Like there's a that certain- would not happen. That would never happen. Part of the reason that I feel so confident that aliens have not visited is because they would have had to visit just to have a look remotely, you know, from Neptune or something, which makes no sense because interstellar travel is so difficult that it would be quite a ridiculous proposition, but that's the bit that I think is technically mm -hmm. possible. If they did come here and they were visible by anyone, detectable by anyone, the thought that any government, no matter, or any military could just contain them, these beings are capable of traveling interstellar distances when we can barely go to the moon, like yeah. barely go to the moon. So these things would be way, 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 way. And the fact that we think our puny a military yes, of true. any, even if all the military in the world got together, and the fact that they could somehow contain it, this, it's that's it's like the ants bit that's trying laughable. to contain a exactly. human that visited them, exactly. But uh, and I, scientists, you would have to bring scientists on board. You've yeah. met a lot of scientists. Yeah, how good are they at keeping secrets? Because in my experience, they're absolutely appalling at keeping secrets. Yeah, that's terrible. Even the Fossil on Venus thing, which was a pretty well-kept secret. Oh, this is true. You had a bunch of people that were- th I told my dad, Yeah, you know, my dad knew. <laughs> and hopefully he didn't tell anyone, but if it had been an alien visiting, he probably would have told the mate, you yeah. know? And so these secrets could not be kept by any scientist that I know, and certainly not collaborative scientists, which would be needed. You would need all sorts of um, scientific teams. So between the pathetic power of any world's military compared to any civilization uh, capable of traveling and our absolute inability to keep secrets, I, 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 Absolutely not. I will bet everything that we have not been visited because we are too okay. pathetic to hold that. Well, let me uh, <laughs> to let hold me push that back truth. If we're making a like a ten dollar bet, so the possibility <laughs> here that the main alien say there exists one alien civil, other intelligent alien civilization in the galaxy. The to me the if they visit Earth, what's going to visit Earth is like the crappy. <laughs> like the really crappy short straw, drum. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like this, this like really dumb thing that's uh, I don't know, like the early Game Boys or something. Like, I think there's a cartoon about this. There's an alien that gets sent to Earth, Commander Spiff or something, and it's kind of a punishment or something. Uh, but that's not possible. That's the thing because interstellar distances are so hard yeah. to to. Cross you have to do it on purpose. You have to do it on purpose. It has to be a big, big deal. And we know this because, yes, you're right. We don't know enough about galactic biology. We don't know what the universal rules of biology or biochemistry are because we only have the Earth. But we do know that the laws of physics are universal. We can predict behavior in the universe and then see it happen based on these laws of physics. We know that the laws of chemistry are universal. We know the periodic table is all they have to choose from. So yes, they may be some sort of unimaginable intelligence, but they still have to use the same periodic table that we have access to. They still have a finite number of molecules they can do things with. So they still have to use the resources around them, the stars around them, the universe around them. And we know how much energy is in these places. And so yes, they may be very capable, capable beyond our wildest dreams, but they're still in the same universe. And we know a lot of those rules. We're not completely blind. But there's a colleague of yours at Harvard, uh, uh, Kamran Vafa, he's a theoretical physicist. I don't know if you know him. I've only joined Harvard about six months ago. Okay. It's time to meet all the theoretical physicists. Uh, so he's a string theorist, but uh, his idea 
is that uh, aliens that are sophisticated enough to travel interstellar, like that, those kinds of distances, will figure out actually ways to hack the the fabric of the universe enough to have fun in other ways. Like this universe is too boring. Like you would figure out ways to create other universes, or like you 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 go outside the physics as we know it. Uh, so the reason we don't see aliens visiting us all over the place is they're having fun elsewhere. This is like way too boring. We humans think this is fun, but it's actually mostly empty space that not, no fun is happening. Like there's no fun in visiting Earth for a super advanced civilization. So he thinks like if alien civilizations are out there, they found outside of our current standard models of physics ways of having fun that don't involve us. But, and that, that's probably true. But even the notion of visiting, that's so literally pedestrian. You know, yeah. of course, we want to go there because going there is the only thing we know. We see a thing we want, we want to go there and get it. Yeah. But that is probably something they've no longer got need for. I specifically don't particularly want to go to space. It sounds awful. Uh, you know, none of the things I like are going to be there. And I, my whole work, is my whole career is finding life and understanding the universe. So I care a lot, mm -hmm. but I care about knowing about it. And I feel no need to go there to learn about it. Mm -hmm. And I think as we develop better tools, hopefully people will feel less and less a need to go everywhere that we know about. And I would expect any alien civilization worth their salt have developed observation tools and, and tools that allow them to understand the universe around them and beyond without having to go there, this this going is so wasteful. Yeah, so more focus on the knowledge and the learning versus the colonization, like the the conquering and the, all those kinds of things. That's, that, you know, beneath them. <laughs> that's beneath them. That, I mean, that said, do you think there's, um, in your hopeful search for life through phosphine and other um, gases, mm -hmm. let me ask a little bit out there a question, maybe it's a speculation, but maybe touching on Roswell, do you think it's possible that there is out of this world aircraft or uh, beings that are in the possession of one of the governments on this earth, like the US government? Is it possible? So the one perspective of that, if it's possible, is it possible to keep a secret like that? I would say this, I think it's very it's highly possible. Because if you go, if you just look at all the sightings, and let's go, just look at Project Blue Book. Go, there was what, I forget how many thousands of sightings. And there's a percentage, it's like 10 or 15% of them, they, they still can't explain. Like our Tic Tac is one of them. The, you know, they basically, the government has come out and said, we don't know what that was. Okay, so so if you go, okay, of that 15% that we don't know, and of these thousands, there's still, that 15% makes up a pretty big number. What are the chances that not one of them crashed somewhere on the globe and was recovered? And I don't care if it's an intact system or you got pieces of it of a metal that we can't explain or some, some um, biological matter, to say the least. It could be intact or it couldn't, but the, the odds of that now are starting to go down that, you know, that could never happen. And I'm not talking just the United States. I'm talking the world. Globally. So is there a chance that a foreign government actually possesses or our government or someone in the in the world on the globe of the seven plus billion people has something that is not from this world? And I'm not talking a meteor, but something that was manufactured in some way that allowed transport or observation. Could be a drone, could be a foreign drone, you know, like Voyager flies around and does all that stuff. And we got stuff that just went past Pluto that's out in the Kuiper belt. You know, there's there's stuff out there floating around, and you know, what about ours? It's going to crash into Jupiter eventually, or whatever, because we've had stuff crash into planets. So, if that's the case, you would think something is out there that we have something that we can't explain. And and according to Lou, there is stuff that we can't explain. You know, and I would assume that Lou, who ran a tip, has has seen stuff that he can't openly talk about, because you know, because I had a clearance. Mm -hmm. When you have a clearance, you were you sign your name. You're bound to that. And to me, that's an important oath that you hold to, you know, and this is kind of where, uh, you know, people have issues with Bob. So if, you know, and I leave it to you to determine if you believe Bob or not, I'll tell you, Bob is a straightforward, very sane, normal, super smart guy. Bob Lazar, yeah. Yes. There is the other side that says, well, should he have come out and talked, you know, to those who hold clearance who, you know, are true to the government, you would say 
he should have never spoke. He, he was under an oath to not say anything, but he did. If you ask Bob, why did you say something? His, the, his answer was, I understand there's an oath, but I felt that the technology could benefit all of mankind and it shouldn't be locked away. And I'll leave, if you believe Bob, that's, that's kind of what Bob says. And that, that's a, such an interesting key point. If there is aircraft, a technology that's in the possession of the, say, the U.S. government, should they make that publicly known? This well, is the Snowden th question. This, this is, is the question of like, do we release stuff that can potentially change the nature of human civilization? Like the the way we th the way we think about our place in the world. Also, the if that technology is potentially useful for military applications, the nature of military conflict. Should we release that information or not? If you were the government. So here, well, here's exactly how. So. For, for classified information, the government is the people that classify it. So I can't go, I can't look at something and go, oh my God, this Avion bottle is now top secret. I can't, I don't have the authority, the ability or anyone to do that. That's, the, that's up to the government. And I agree with that because I worked for the government for 24 years of my life. So um, I understand that. Um, but now you go, there's reason stuff is classified, okay? And it has to do with uh, sometimes information is classified by how it was obtained, it's just like the mob. If I have a spy and I'm a mobster and you're the counter mobster, but I have a guy on the inside that's feeding me information, I can't do it. And a perfect example is if you've ever seen the, uh, it's the Tom Cruise movie, what is it, Air America or whatever, but he he plays the guy in Louisiana who was hauling drugs for Pablo Escobar. Mm. And he ended up getting a, a cargo plane and the government, the CIA was kind of funding him to do stuff. That's how he got hooked up with Pablo, but they put cameras on his airplane. And when Reagan had come out and said, here's pictures, we have proof that they're running these drugs. It didn't take Pablo long to figure out those pictures were taken from inside of the plane of this guy he had been working with. And that guy ends up dead. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you classify to protect the source. You classify to protect the technology because if the technology would get out, it could be grave damage or there's levels, depending on if it's a secret or top secret. There are levels of damage that could be done to the U.S. government and our well-being as a country. And we owe it to this because we're all Americans. You know, to me, no matter what some people will say, even in this country, this is the greatest country on the planet. Yeah. This is the only country that you have the ability to do what you want to do. It's just don't be lazy. And I have stories of people that came over here. And started with nothing, and they're they're living the American dream. And they'll tell you, and they didn't get it because of, you know, like you. You came over here mm -hmm. from Russia. You get no minority status or anything else. You get, you're a white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, whatever your religion Jew, or whatever. But... Jew, but you come over here. I kind of knew that from the last one. <laughs> but, um, but you come over here, you basically have made yourself. Yeah. You're educated. You're working at literally the top research university in the world, to be honest. Um, I can do whatever the hell I can create a, with a bit of, with a lot of hard work, I can do quite a bit. And, and no one gave it to you. No. Nah. So, I mean, and I well, have people- Well, I'm a believer that like, that, I mean, we are uh, a community. So like, there is a social aspect to it, but the freedom and the American dream is a real thing. And this is this, I, you know, I joke about being Russian, but I, I'm an American and this is, I do believe the greatest country on earth. So there's a reason the nationalist pride, uh, the pride in your nation is a powerful thing. And around that, this secrecy holds value. But to me, alien technology is bigger than that. I mean, it's it's not so much a threat as a you're holding back something that could inspire the world, you're like that, so, a human knowledge. So let's talk in theory. So I'm going to go back to Bob because I've talked to Bob. So Bob is a propulsion guy, right? Right. Bob has a bicycle with a rocket motor. He built the <laughs> rocket car. Yeah. You know, so he did that. So if you are trying to figure out a propulsion system. Let's just say this is, I'm just talking, this is Dave's theory. Yeah. I am, I own, I have, I have custody of this thing from a technology that I don't understand. And I know it's a propulsion system. So now I got to figure it out. Right. So who are you going to go to? Right. You go find someone. So you go, wait, here's a guy who 
at the time was working at Los Alamos, which they have proven, who is big into propulsion. He designs all this. He builds a shit in his garage. Hmm. Hey, he's super smart. Why don't we bring him in? So you hire him on a contract and you go, hey, we're going to brief you into a program. And he goes and works on wherever he says he worked. You know, that's not important, but you get access to the technology to try and figure it out. And then you go, well, you know, Bob comes out and says, you know, I, we're figuring out these things, but there's a part where our technology isn't advanced enough for us to figure the whole thing out. So then, you know, and let's just say Bob doesn't come out and tell anyone. He he works on it until the, he gets to the point where he's stagnated. He, he, he's, at a, he's at a wall. You go, ah, I can't do it. So sometimes the best thing is to bring in a fresh mind. So you mm -hmm. go find someone else who's in a propulsion, you bring him and they work, they can't figure yeah. it out. Or they get to the point where kind of back to the Einstein theory where, hey, I've got all these theories on how it works, but we don't have the technology. We haven't advanced enough to actually do what we need to do. We still have to advance technology more. So then what do you do? You shelve it. You go, hey, good projects over and the contract, you shelf it and you wait another 10 years. And you wait another 10 years until technology and our abilities and our, our research advances more. And then you go find new people to bring in that are experts in that field and go, hey, we want you to work on this thing. And here's what we know about it so far. Yeah. Or you don't tell them anything because because remember, if you re if you reveal someone else's research, you can taint their beliefs. They'll start right. to sway in that direction. So right. you go, I'm not going to tell you anything. I'm going to give you this thing. And now you tell me what you think. And as they progress, if they get stuck on a problem that maybe Bob and someone else solved earlier, you can go, hey, what about this? You don't have to tell them where it came from. What about this? And now they can leapfrog and they get another two steps closer to the final answer. And then we get stuck by our evolution do, of technology do, do you, and you shelve it again. Do you think that's the right way to do it? Because it's heartbreaking. I don't, listen, I love government, but we just had this discussion about Elon and so on. The, the alternative approach is to release this to the world and say there's a mystery here. And then the Elons of the world, the Jeff Bezos, we talked about money, but it's also not just money. It's like this engine that's within, we talked about the American dream to say, I'm gonna be the one that cracks this mystery open. And like, that's within a lot of us. And like money aside, people in their garage just will. But you're thinking like a scientist. So now let yeah. me, now let's shift to, let me think like a country. So we have country A, B, and C. And, and you can look at the nuclear arms race. So we know that Germany was really close. We know that Russia was getting pretty close. Yeah. We just won the race and we were the first ones with it. Yeah. And still to this and day- Germany could have won. The, oh, they could have won. They could have won, but someone was smart enough to not finish the equation when they knew they had the answer. It, it's literally what it comes down to. Someone was smart enough to realize if that, that got into the hands of the Nazis, that it would be the end. And, and that's, that's a tough call to do that, knowing that you have the answer and you can't solve the problem because it will go into the wrong hand. And that's kind of the fear when you look at this, you go, okay, so if we do this, if we put it out there, we've got this technology, if we don't work on it, kind of international space station, like where we're all going to work on it together in a, you know, like Antarctica is really supposed to be treaty free from any weapons or anything. And we're supposed to, you know, we got the international thing down there. We're all going to work together. If you did it in a, in the confines of that, and you could control the flow in and out, uh, because what you don't want is the someone stealing information and getting it back to where, and countries are notorious to do this. Hey, we're doing it internationally, but we're secretly doing it ourselves to see who can come up with a solution first. Um, that's the problem because we have this inherent thing of power and technology like that is power. Mm. It would it would literally change the game of the way the world operates. And from not just a transportation or mankind, but from a military aspect, it's got huge, huge. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I so beautifully, beautifully presented. And there's, I feel like there's a tension between those two places: the scientist view of the world and the national security view of the world. Let me let me get to this kind of yeah. interesting point, which is a lot of conspiracy theorists kind of paint a picture of government as an exceptionally, as a hierarchical system that's exceptionally competent and good at hiding secrets. And then, I mean, I tend to not subscribe to almost any conspiracy theory uh, to the degree at least that the conspiracy theorists do. Uh, I agree with you. But the, there does seem to be, and I tend to think of government as unfortunately uh, incompetent, at least the bureaucracy. It seems that the communication, like the three videos that were released and just the way of DOD in general talks about the things we've been talking about. 
it's just confused, it's contradictory, it's not inspiring, it's it's uh, suspicious, it's just not, it's just even the way they release the videos. You know, the Tic Tac, if presented correctly, could just inspire a generation of scientists. It's like, at the, you know, us going to the moon, uh, it's inspiring. I mean, it's incredible, like, you know, yep. and, and the way it was released, it was suspicious. It was like low resolution video on a crappy website, like with some crappy documents. And uh, I mean, why, what is I, I don't know how to ask this question, but can government do better? Why are they doing it this way in terms of communicating the things they do know to the public? Because I don't think they know how. I don't, especially in this topic, it's been hidden for so many years. And I don't think... Because uh, I don't buy off on the conspiracy stuff. I just think that, you know, when it comes in, like I said, you know, the government has a right to classify stuff. They they classify everything because they don't know. You have something, you don't know what it is, you don't know. So we just go, well, it must be must be top secret and let's put it in a vault. You know, it's kind of like the Indiana Jones where they take the ark and they put it in, the, it's in the giant army warehouse. Um, you know, we don't even know what we have. So, but I also believe that you know, and I'll say this openly, I don't think that the American people know, need to know everything. I think there's a reason that stuff is classified for the protection of this country, uh, and I totally believe in that. So, you know, uh, and we, I was joking with Joe when he was talking about the Storm Area 51 stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's probably the worst idea you could possibly have yeah. is to just storm a military installation. It's just stupid. Yeah. There are reasons. There are reasons that we have things that we don't just let out to the public because – if we do, as soon as you do let someone know that you have something, they immediately try and counter it. And perfect example, the U.S. in the 60s developed a bomber. It was a Mach 3 compression lift bomber called the XB-70. Okay, there was three of them built, three of them ever built. It was a like 60,000 foot high, you know, Mach 3. I mean, it was an incredible airplane when you see it. And there's actually the last one remaining is in Dayton, Ohio at the museum. You know, it would go, the wingtips would fold down. It looks like a Concorde, but it's way faster. Um, when that got out that we were developing it, the Soviet Union developed the MiG-25, literally a high altitude interceptor to counter that bomber. And they built an entire fleet of MiG-25s. Right, we built three XB seventies and we scrapped the program. Right, because now you go well, it's it, the technology is cool. We proved it, but now it becomes obsolete. So it's not even worth building a whole fleet of these things. You know, it's constant. It's a chess game. We do something, they do something. We do something, they do something, and it's we do something and then they counter it. They got to it's you got to figure out how to defeat it. So you go, oh, we'll do, build something. So the more we keep uh, quiet, especially from a defense standpoint the better. We actually, at personally, I think we talk too much. And I think the the military and the DOD is starting to see that, you know, we're too open. You know, uh, you know, you announce, hey, we're building this because there's a budget line and we live in a free society. Um, but you don't have to release all the specs and you don't have to put everything in open source. But that's a problem when we go to universities. If we want to go do work with MIT and you want to partner with MIT and you're a defense company and you want to partner... Yeah. You know, you guys have a rule that if you create it, then it yeah. can be open source because the university yeah. owns it and we are an institution of learning yep. where the defense side might go, we don't, we don't really want that published in a paper in Scientific America or yeah, it's, it's I It's so believe. heartbreaking. I talked to CTO of Lockheed, uh, Keiko Jackson, and just, just Concorks, the, some of the best, if not the best engineering and science, but engineering really ever is done in secrecy. And it sucks because it's so inspiring and they can't talk about it. It is, but some it's of so it's due to funding. The, the U.S. government has deep pockets. You know, some of this new technology that you develop for an open source, unless this is, goes back to the original conversation, we now, there's enough money in the private sector that individuals control. Yeah. Bezos, I'm not talking Amazon. I'm talking Jeff Bezos A single individual is worth over $100 billion. He has the ability to do stuff. I'll tell you what. The Gates Foundation with between Bill Gates and 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 his uh, his wife and Warren Buffett and some of the other money, because I think uh Bezos' ex-wife actually donated a huge chunk of her half into the, the Gates, Gates Foundation. Foundation. Yeah. So I mean, what's the Gates Foundation worth these days? You know, if and, and these are guys, you know, brilliant, brilliant. I mean, some of the greatest minds that we have to go, 
you know, what are they doing? Because they have the ability, to, it's a nonprofit. They can go, hey, I want to fund this. I want to yeah. fund this research. They can look beyond the conflict between nations. You can and- look beyond the conflict of having to have, uh, you know, classification. You can do what you want. You know, it's just like, you know, we, we classify how to do, uh, you know, the whole nuclear, you know, how to create a critical mass, mm-hmm. right? But there's really smart high school kids that have figured it out mathematically <laughs> they it, and they yeah. do their science project. And then the government comes in and says, hey, we got to classify your government because we just don't want this out in the public domain, which I understand. But they never stop them from free thought and developing that. It's just, hey, we really don't want this out there. Okay. So I understand that. I, I totally understand that. But if they, you know, if, if Bill and Melinda want to do this and go, hey, we want to do this and they're going to work with Bezos and they're going to work with Elon and we're going to, I mean, you think about it. There's a significant amount of money that could be available to R&D. And I'm not talking just science like this. I'm talking medical research and all this. But then you go, well, who gets it? Because now you're competing against the the companies that actually do it. You go, is that, well, are they the greatest minds? I'd say, you know, we have a tendency to go, these are the best that we have. And I'd say, well, no, that's the best that we know we have. But there's probably people out there that don't want to work. There's brilliant minds that don't want to do anything with defense because they just disagree with what it does. So they go to another path. They can do something else. And that in a sense, the, uh, the Elons of the world, the Jeff Bezos, are actually, in a certain sense, much better than uh, DOD at finding the brilliant, weird minds out there. Because they're not tied to the government. So when you work a government contract... The government writes, they tell you what they want, and then they work with you on the requirements. And they usually have a, an end in mean. You know, they have an idea that this is what I want it to be. Where if you go to like SpaceX, where, you know, they come up with, why don't we just land these things on a pad and reuse them? <laughs> yeah. Well, if the government scientist, if you're on a government contract, says, no, that's not the requirements. We're not paying for that. We want you to do this. You're, you're kind of controlled. Or when Elon does it, his company, he, they can do whatever the hell they want to do because they have no bounds. The only bounds they have is the liability if it doesn't work and it lands on something. So what do you do? You go out to Kwajalein and you test it. And if it crashes and it lands in the ocean, hey, we clean it up. No big deal. We lost some money, but we'll move on. It's, you know, money makes the world go around contrary to what everyone thinks. But, you know, there's a lot of money that's sitting around that you can do a lot of really cool stuff with. And I don't know. I mean, I'll guarantee that, uh, what is it? Blue Origin? Isn't that Blue Amazon? Origin, yeah. You know, that they're doing some cool stuff because they have funny. And I I joke with uh, the guy I know that worked at SpaceX and he was funny because they were building the first test thing and they they were limited. And Elon found this like 400 acre thing. I think it's about 400 acres down by Waco, Texas. And he's like, I go, how? He goes, he goes, dude, I worked. He goes, I worked with, he goes, because he's done government contract. He goes, there's government contract and then there's working at SpaceX with Elon money. And that's what he refers to it as, is Elon money, where it was like, don't, I'll throw them, and he would throw the money at it and make it happen. And it's, I'm talking this fast. Yeah. I mean, he talks about, he has a great story about this. I mean, this is Elon, but this is how fast you can do in the private sector vice, the government where there's the bureaucracy is. They had a company that was a, basically a tool and die machine shop that did a lot of their high precision parts for the rockets. Mm-hmm. They had went to the guy, but he had contracts with other companies. And when the economy was down, uh, the guy was actually looking at going out of business. So the guy I know, he's telling me his story. He he was talking to the guy. He had to go over there and get something. And he's like, holy shit. He goes, hang on. So he calls up on the phone, SpaceX. He says, hey, is Elon there? Can you get him in the boardroom? We'll be there in 20 minutes. So he grabs this guy who's literally going to fold his company. They go over to SpaceX. And I may be getting some of this wrong if people are going to fact check me, but this is yeah. pretty close. They go in the boardroom and and he said, literally within like, a, you know, an hour or two, Elon has bought the guy's company. That guy is now a senior VP running the, his company, and they're going to pull all the stuff into the SpaceX thing so they can actually build the parts, and they can still contract out to make the money outside. And they, it happened like that fast. And it's because- not just money. It's because I've seen, I witnessed it too with Elon. I think it's uh, whatever the whatever the forces of capitalism that that. Uh, allow a person like Elon Musk to rise to the top. But like, because I've also worked for DARPA, like for, for research for uh, in terms of a source of funding, I, I there's a weight of bureaucracy when I was working, uh, like being funded by DARPA. And with Elon, like I was literally in the presence of like, anything is possible, cutting across all the bullshit 
of paperwork, of the way things were done in the past, of the bureaucracy, the rules, the constraints, the all of that stuff. Just you can cut across immediately. How much money and time do you waste dealing with your bureaucracy when you could actually be doing real work? That's the difference. This is why I honestly, when I went back to the industrial defense complex that we were warned about, when you look at it and go, SpaceX can do something for half the price ahead of schedule that what Boeing were paying Boeing, and you go, oh, well, this just came out. And you go, well, then why are we even dealing with this side when we can deal with this side? Yeah. Because you've got a fully automated capsule that has a manual mode that they got to fly around in. It worked like a champ. It went up. It hung out. It came back. It splashed down. It worked perfectly. You know, we're going to dust it off. And oh, by the way, unlike the Apollo capsules that were used and then put to museums, they're going to reuse that Dragon capsule. It came down, they're going to dust it off, put a new coat of paint on it, slap it on top of another rocket, and away it goes. <laughs> Holy cow. It's amazing. It's a shift. It's a complete shift in mentality. And for us as taxpayers, we can explore at half the cost. Yeah. It's exciting, especially given uh, putting the Tic Tac in context, like then the sky or but it's limitless the possibilities we could do with this kind of mechanism. I, I think it's exciting yeah i think we live exciting. in an exciting time right now besides everything that's messed up in the world right now well this is a this is a hopeful like there's so much conflict going on so much tension uh that's to me space exploration at the moment is a reason to uh get up in the morning and have a hope for the future to look up to the sky and oh, we're, I, we're humans we can like solve so many we can solve all of this. I was talking about when I was doing the Tucker thing and I said, uh, is this would be great, you know, because when the government had come out, you know, a month ago and said, hey, this does exist, we're doing this and oh, we're going to release more stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was texting like Lou and Chris Mellon and those guys before I went on because they had called me up to be on Tucker's show. And I'm like, hey, I go, you know, this would be great. You know, just come out with this, find the, the, the relic of a spaceship, like pull out the Roswell wreckage if you have it. Pull out the Roswell wreckage and do it. God, it would be so nice to not have to deal with the the riots in the cities. And the, I mean, I know it's an election year and all that, but God, it would be something, it would be refreshing to not have to turn on my TV and see everything that is just depressing in the world. To begin, holy cow, we actually do have this and we're working on this technology. So, yeah, imagine if there is a Roswell aircraft and they pull it out. Imagine the innovation that happens in the next 10 to 20 years without any more information than that. <laughs> Just the, the innovation that happens, the look on Elon Musk's face, the look on Jeff Bezos's face, and all the brilliant engineers. It would change are, the game. It would change the it game. It would change the game. One of the challenges is you're essentially an eyewitness account. Like, we don't have good data. We have very limited data of... Um, of the incident that you've experienced. So let me kind of dig in. Let me just ask some questions of uh, maybe to see if there's, just to paint more and more of the picture. One, you kind of mentioned, so Tic Tac shape. Let's break apart two situations. One is the video, but let's look at the actual eye account, the, the eyewitness account that you saw with your own eyes. Mm -hmm. What's the, what can you say about the shape of the thing? Is there interesting aspects outside of the Tic Tac? Like, is there any appendages? Is there um, some texture to it that? No, smooth, white, Tic Tac. You know, we don't, <laughs> so you don't smooth... see, there's no, no wings, no visible propulsion, no windows, when no you... probes that we could see. We don't notice, like I said, we don't see the little things on the bottom of it until we see the video in the TV mode when it's zoomed in right before it's shortly, you kind of see them zoom in. You don't see it typically on the YouTube stuff that's out there. Um, yeah, but, but remember, there's... we're looking at the original tape, so there's not, the, the, there's basically no degradation. But when you saw with your eyes, there's no kind of appendages. No, none. What about, like somebody asked, a lot of people asked you questions, so uh, I appreciate you spending your time here. Let me ask some of them. Uh, did you, I mean, you chased it, so you flew close to it, relatively speaking. Was there, did you feel it, any wake? Like any, did you feel it in any way in terms of your interaction, like aerodynamically? No. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> so uh, another aspect of it, there's an interesting thing. You've developed a feel for for objects in the air. Did you feel like it was surprised by your arrival, or did it? it let me ask a few questions around it. So, did you did it feel like the thing was surprised? Did it feel like 
It wanted to be seen almost to show off its capability. Did, uh, and did it, what did it feel like relative to if you were doing a, um, uh, an air fight against uh, sort of like, a, I don't know, a, a foreign jet? So one, I think it, I think it knew we were there when we showed up. Uh, it's just, it's me. Uh, it's kind of like an animal. If you've ever been around deer in a field, you know, the deer will look up and if it sees you and you're on the other side of the field, it'll actually go no threat and it'll start eating. You know, they don't put their tail up as you move closer to the deer. Then it goes, Oh, it's there and I'm going to react or I'm going to move. So as we were up high and it's down doing whatever it was doing, um, you know, which I don't know, someone asked, what do you think? I don't know, maybe it was communicating with something. I joked on Good Morning America. Maybe it's like talking to the whales, kind of like Star Trek, you know? <laughs> and I actually used that clip. It was kind of funny, but... Um, yeah, we're a little human-centric. We think like it would it, it show up to talk to us, but maybe it's yeah. talking to the dolphins. Maybe it was, yeah, it was to whatever, you know, because it was hanging <laughs> around that whitewater. And I don't know, if was there something there? Was there a seamount? We just didn't find it again. I don't know. But once we started to descend and it actually reoriented its, its longitudinal axis and it started mirroring us coming up, then it was obviously where we were there and it was really coming up just, you know, you figure I'm at 20 and it's coming up and it ends up getting up to 12, uh, where I cut across the circle. I think it was very aware that we were there because it interacted. We call it a two-circle fight when you're fighting another airplane. Um, but, uh, you know, was it – was were we afraid? I don't think so. I mean, and to me, I was more curious. You know, the what, curiosity the, overcomes any fear that you would have. And I always felt, to to be honest, if I was inside the airplane, uh, especially as long as much time as I'd spent inside the airplane flying and doing stuff, I felt totally, it was like a safe zone. I mean, yeah. I, I felt totally comfortable inside the airplane as most, po you can't, if you're in the airplane and you feel scared, it's not the job for you. Right. You have to feel that because the airplane is part of you now. Yes. You know, I am inside. I have the stick. I have the throttles. I've got my Wizzo in the back seat. He's running all the displays. We are a team. We are in the state of the art airplane, you know, brand new. You feel pretty good. And then you get something that, you know, can climb from the surface up and then accelerate like it did, like it was like no big deal. You know, for an airplane, if, if you just put me from a standstill, let's just say slow flight, just get me at 100 knots above the water. And for me to, you can't just start a climb. I'd have to lower the nose. I'd have to accelerate. And then I'd have to start coming up. And this thing just like, just did it like it was like no big deal. Yeah. You mentioned that like you, kind of your reaction to it was uh, it like, it's something that you would love to fly almost. Uh, so this object, just the curiosity you experience is like, like what it almost like, what the heck is that piece of technology and I want to fly it? Like, what made you feel like it's something that you could fly? Do you think it's something that a human could fly? Like, in terms of interpreting what you saw as a piece of technology, because another perspective on it is it was uh, not, it, that the thing under the water was the key thing. And what you were seeing is some kind of projection or something that well, like I don't think it was a projection I think it was a real object it was an ob a physical hard object that oh, yeah. you could be f flied oh yeah yeah I think all, all four of us will tell you the same thing it wasn't it wasn't this was not because you go okay let's just go on a th it's a light projection well if we hologram. were both sitting next to each other we were looking at it from the exact same angle and all that and I go oh, okay there's a the in theory you could have that but with an 8,000 foot altitude difference flying, you know, and they're, you know, she's probably not directly above me. She's kind of hanging out watching this whole thing happen. You know, you're getting two different perspectives from two different altitudes over a clear blue, you know, if you've ever been at sea, and I don't mean like coastal, I mean like when you get out at sea, the ocean is the bluest. It's incredible. Um, you know, you got a bright white object over a deep blue ocean. You got pretty high contrast. And for this thing just to disappear... Uh, it's, it's wasn't, I'm telling you, I would, I mean, I know we, we all have the same, uh, recollection of what yeah. happened. You know, there's so some it's... details because it's so long ago, but for the most part, we know what we saw and we all came back and looked at each other like, what the hell was that? What if, I mean, do you think about the thing under the water? that's not often talked about if there's something under the water, couldn't have been something gigantic. <laughs> like It could like be. What? Like, do you ever it's think the abyss? Of, <laughs> <laughs> Big ship. I mean, that's why, up. as a person, so I love like swimming out into the ocean. My mom's an Olympic swimmer, so like, 
I love that feeling, but I'm also terrified when I swim because the abyss, it could, anything could be under there. I Like there's not enough focus on that perhaps because there's no visibility, but is, a, I mean, is there anything interesting to say about the possibility that was anything underneath there? Could be, I mean, think about it. If you're gonna hide on this planet, where's, what's the least explored yeah, sure. spot on the planet? Two thirds of it's the ocean. You, there's, there's, there's literally, I mean, come on, the, 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 the Malaysia airplane, the, the triple seven, I think it was a triple seven that crashed, you know, they turned, they didn't go where they're supposed to, and they just disappeared and they've been searching for it and they found pieces of it. But you would think there's large objects that, you know, when that thing hit the water, depending on how it broke up, there's big pieces that would be, you'd find something. They haven't found anything except what floated. Um, so, if, so to hide something underwater, I think would be easy. So, yeah. So one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is you happen to be one of, at least in my view, one of the most credible witnesses in history of uh, somebody who's uh, witnessed uh, a UFO, literally an identified flying object. And not only witnessed, but got to, how do you put it, like chase it, essentially? Chased or, it. Chased it. <laughs> so let me just lay out, I think it's easier than you telling the story, maybe me and my, dumb simpleton ways trying to explain the stories I understand it and then mm -hmm. maybe you can correct me. Uh, so on uh, November 10th, 2004, the USS Princeton, which is one of the uh, the carriers. That's a cruiser. It's a, it's a cruiser. It's a cruiser. So you can't land on a- uh, No, a, helicopter, it has a helicopter pad on the back. But. Gotcha, so, and it has weapons on it. Okay, gotcha. It shoots the missiles up. But it has a nice radar. Just it's got like, an incredible spy one system, phased array four panels, so it looks in quadrants. Perfect, so they, they started noticing on November 10th that there's a few objects flying around at 28,000 feet with speed of, uh, with a, what's I guess is considered a low speed of 120 miles an hour. Don't know what that's in knots, but uh, out on the coast of California. So, and they kept detecting these objects for just about a week. Then comes in like your, part of the story, which is on November 14th th from the, I guess it's from the USS Nimitz, uh, you flew and witnessed a 40 foot long white Tic Tac shaped object with no wings, flying in ways you've never thought possible. And uh, in some interview somewhere you said, I think it was not from this world. So there, there's a mysterious, aspect to this object, to this entire situation. Uh, there's videos involved. The video of a flare forward looking infrared. Receiver. Receiver, there's also the visible light so you can switch. Yeah, I mean, it's TV mode. It's a TV mode, so that gives you visible light and then it has an IR mode. And uh, Chad Underwood recorded that video so, and those are the videos that were released by the Pentagon later, one of the three videos. The two other videos, uh, Go Fast and Gimbal, were recorded in 2000 something, 14 or 15, 15 yeah. uh, on the East Coast of the United States. They had different kinds of objects, but they were weird in the same kind of way <laughs> in terms of at least the videos and the experiences that people have described were similar in, in the degree of weirdness. But uh, the difference is, is actually on the, the East Coast of 2014 case, very few people have spoken about it. And even in your situation, very few people have spoken about it. So there's a mystery to it, uh, but it's in some sense, it's a quite simple story without much resolution to the mystery. <laughs> and it's fascinating. And there's a lot of opinions, there's division of opinions because uh, it's a mysterious, I mean, it truly is a UFO in the sense that uh, UAP, uh, what is it, I, I, unidentified aerial, aerial phenomena. phenomena. So can you uh, maybe correct me on any of the things I've gotten wrong, elaborate on some key things and describe that experience in general? So here's what I know. So yeah, we went out uh, on our mission to go train uh, and they canceled the mission and they sent us down. There's all kinds of rumors out here. There's all kinds of, after this has come out, 
So originally it was the four of us. There's two jets, two people in each jet. They're F-18Fs. Okay. There is no video from our event. It was all four sets of eyeballs staring at this thing. And then when we came back and told it, when Chad and his pilot took off, that's when Chad got the video of it. And we're like, that's it. That's exactly, that's it. And um, So when and, you say eyeballs, you mean literally your eyes are seeing a thing. Yeah. So so as we're flying out, we get we get vectored. They come up and tell us, hey, we're going to cancel training. This is a USS Princeton. So this is a Siege's cruiser. So we're talking to one controller um, who... Is like, hey, sir, first you ask what ordinance we have on board. And I laugh because we don't carry live ordinance in training typically because bad shit stuff happens. Usually someone forgets to put a switch on and then the missile comes off and hits a good airplane and it's not good. So we had what's called a CATAM-9, which is really just a blue tube with the AIM-9 seeker on the front of it, which is an IR missile. Uh, so there's only two ways to get it off. You can beat it off with a sledgehammer. You can take this thing and so you put a wrench in it and it unlocks the lugs and pulls the lugs back in that hold it on. When it really fires the impulse from the engine, actually throws the lugs forward and breaks that release and it comes off down the rail. That's how it works. So they said, hey, well, we have real world tasking. So as we're going out, uh, my wingman, the other pilot, uh, she maneuvers the airplane to the left-hand side of me. So she's kind of stepped up like this. And I'll use your mic box to start. So as we're going out, they're calling ranges are called bra calls, bearing range and altitude. And they're telling us, Hey, it's at 40 miles or 50 miles and 40 miles and 30 miles. So they're saying, Hey, two, seven, zero, 30, 20,000. That's all they say. So we got our radars and we had, uh, we had uh, mechanically scanned radars at the time, APG 73, good piece of gear, APG 79, new ones way better. But anyway. And I apologize if I interrupt the story, uh, hopefully it's useful, but they're telling you a location of a thing that you should look at. Yep. They're telling us they have a contact on their radar. They don't know what it is. They just have a blip. They have a little blip. Well, they've been watching these things. And what he told me is they had been looking at these things as we're driving. He says, sir, we've been tracking these things for about two weeks. That's, we had been at sea for two weeks. Mm -hmm. He goes, this is the first time we've had planes airborne. We want you to go see what these are. Gotcha. So, we said, so okay. they kind of interrupt the mission to say, yep. check it out. That's what exactly is it? it. So we start driving out there. And uh, as we get down to, he's going, you know, 20 miles, 15 miles, 10 miles. And then you get to a point where they call merge plot, which means we are inside of the resolution cell of the radar because radars don't see everything They're So they have a range and they have an azimuth resolution, right? So, and it's basically think of a little cube so they can, and the whole sky is made of all these little cubes and they're looking. So if you're inside a cube with something and you're both inside the same little cube, then the radar can only see one thing. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep, yep. So they call merge plot. Well, when we say merge plot to us, it means he's right around, something's around you, get your head out. So we're not looking at radar scopes anymore and the whizzos, the whizzos can look, but everyone, it's heads out. When they say merge plot, you're done looking at your displays inside, you're doing this and you're trying to find it. So as we look out to the right and you look high and low, because he could be anywhere from the surface all the way up. Now, keep in mind, the ship is like probably 60 miles away, so it can't see the surface. And you can do your standard radar horizon calculation and go, hey, it's the the thing is 40 feet off the water, the panel. Can he really see, you know, there are radars that can see around the curve, but let's just say that it can't at this time. So you go, is it, you know, where is it at? <clears throat> so as we're looking around, we see, now this is a, it's a clear day. There's no clouds and there's no white caps. It's just a calm, it's actually a perfect day. If you owned a sailboat, it was that five to 10 knots of wind and you just want to kind of go out there and you're not going to get beat up and have white water come over. It was the, it was the perfect day to own a sailboat. How many miles out do you see? Like seven, like you see just, it's a clear day. Oh, it's 50, it's unrestricted visibility. You can see literally all the way to the horizon. It's just clear, wow. it's nothing. And we're basically off the coast. If you look at a map and you go San Diego and then Ensenada, of Mexico, we're kind of in between that, and we're probably about, by the time this all hits, we're probably, I don't know, 80, 100, I don't know, but somewhere out, it's pretty far off the coast. Perfect visibility. But from, from yeah. 20,000 feet, you'd be amazed. You can do the calculation. You can see stuff. You know, you'll see land 50 miles away. Mm -hmm. You know, you can see, you know, and when you're looking at a, a continent, it's really easy to see you're not looking at an island. I mean, you're looking at Mexico. And you can see on the white caps in the water if you, if there is any. Oh yeah, they're easy. They're just, yeah, for us we look at it because we know if it's natural wind or so if it's a really white cap windy day, then the ships just kind of barely be moving when we land on it. It makes it actually easier. 
if the ship has to move where it's got a big weight because it has to make its own win when we land, which is the day that it was this day, you go, oh, okay. And it creates what's called, we call the burble, but when the air flows across the flight deck, it drops behind the ship, you know? Mm. Yeah. And then it kicks back up. So when you're coming board to land, it's going to make you go up a little bit and then you're going to fall and you got to con- you got to anticipate that to stand glide slope. So we're, we're pretty we're pretty conscious of what's going on out there with the waves and the wind. So we look there's no waves, there's no wind, there's no white caps and we look down and we see white water. So if you put a if you put a piece of land, a sea mount below the surface like, you know, even 20 feet below the surface it's big enough as the waves come in, you know, waves have height and length. When they come in, that's what happens on the shore. When a wave comes in, it hits and then it starts to collapse and it pushes the wave height up because mm-hmm. it can't go anymore. And then it and breaks it over the top and, yeah. you get, you get and that's the where you get the white. So thing. what happens is at sea, when you get a sea mount, you'll see stuff come in, the wave will crash and you'll get white water. You can go out when it's high tide in, in any one of the coasts, you can go out here off of Boston and go, hey, at low tide, I can see those rocks. And at high tide, I can't see the rocks mm-hmm. are covered, but there'll be white water around those rocks. You'll be able to tell there's something underneath the surface. Does that make sense? Yep. So that's what it was. We see, we don't see an object because there's all kinds of, oh, they saw this, they saw another craft below the way. We didn't see anything below the water. We just saw white water. But the white water, and I like to shape it, you can say it was a cross. I say it's about the size of a 737. So it looks like if you took a 737, put it about 15, 20 feet below the water. So the waves breaking over the top and you're going to get white water where the plane is at. You'd see this, this kind of shape. So it looks like a cross. So as we're looking down off the right side, the back seater in the other airplane, Jim, says, this is that talking in partials again. He says, hey, Skipper, do you? And that's about what he gets out of his mouth. And I go, what the hell is that? In a nice Do you day. see that essentially is what he's So saying? we see the white water and that's what draws our eyes down there. Otherwise, we'd have never seen it. So we see this, this I would have loved water, to see the look on your face when you see that. Like, and then we what? see this little white tic tac because yeah. we're about 20,000 feet above it. And it's doing, it's going basically north, south, and then east, west, north. And so it's abrupt. It's very abrupt. So it's not uh, like a helicopter. If a helicopter's going sideways and it goes once, it's going sideways left and it goes right. What it'll do is it'll go, it's got a speed, it slows down because there's inertia. Yeah. And it stops and then it goes back the other way. This thing's not. It's like left, right, left, right with no. So moving in ways that doesn't doesn't feel intuitive to you at like, all of the things you've seen in the past. So as a pilot, the first thing you think is it's a helicopter, right? Right. So you go, oh, what is? Because when we see it, it's moving, we're like, oh, helicopter. So the first thing you look for to see if it's a helicopter when they're doing that, because usually when they get down there towards that fifty feet, you'll get rotor wash. You see it in the movies when the helicopters by the water, it kicks, it, the water comes up the sides because the downdraft. You know, like a thunderstorm will do that. It pushes the air down and then it has to come up the sides. So you see it and you go, well, there's no, there's no rotor wash. What is that thing? Hmm. So by this time we're driving around. So as we're, if we were at the six o'clock, we're driving around towards that nine o'clock position and we're just watching this thing. And it's just, it's still pointed north, south and it's going left, right. And it's kind of moving around the object. And if it had, if I had to say it biased itself, it was biased towards the bottom half. So if you've got the east, west, and then the north, south kind of across, it's hanging out on the southern thing that's hanging out. It's just kind of moving around up, down, left, and it's crossing over it. And it's going up. It's just kind of... So now we're like, oh, what the hell is that? So then I go, hey, I'm going to go check it out. And the other <laughs> pilot says, I'm going to stay up here. And I said, yeah, stay up high because now we get we get a different perspective. Mm-hmm. So she's up here and I'm down here as I'm descending. She can watch because right now all I'm watching is the Tic Tac. She can watch me and the Tic Tac. So she gets a God's eye view of everything that's going on, which is really important. You know, you can you'll hear people say it's high cover, or whatever. She's watching me, which is it's perfect as the story goes on because it, it gives us a two perspectives, you know, of a perspective that's about 8,000 feet above us when that thing disappears. And they don't, you know, because if it's just like, oh, I lost it. And they go, no, it's over to the right. We can still see it. We all lost it at the same time. So as we come down, we get to about 12 o'clock and I'm descending. And it's an easy descent. I'm doing about 300 knots which is a, a really good airspeed for the airplane for maneuvering because I have I have everything available to me at that speed. So I'm coming down. And as I get to 12 o'clock, as the Tic Tac's doing this, it literally, it's like it be, it's aware of us and it just goes bloop and it kind of points out towards the west and starts coming up. So now it's obviously knows that we're there. Whatever this thing is, it knows that we're there. So as we drive around, it, it's coming up and I'm just coming down. We're just, I'm just watching it. Now you gotta remember this whole thing is like, this is like five minutes. This is not like a, we saw it and it was gone yeah. or, oh, I saw lights in the sky and they were gone. We watched this thing on a crystal clear day yeah. with four trained observers watch this thing fly around. So we're like, okay. 
So I get over to the eight o'clock position and I'm a little, I'm a couple thousand feet above it. And it's about, so I'm probably at about 15 K. I think it is. I think that's my story is about 15. It's just estimating. So you can see it's just a really easy descent because. So what's 15 K? 15,000 feet. I thought it was 8,000. Uh, no, the, the other airplane ends up about. So I'll thought, get to that. Okay, so, gotcha, sir. So they're still at about 20,000 feet. So they're okay, driving and around. Then you're slowly descending. And I'm descending. They're staying gotcha. up there. So yeah. I'm kind of doing this gotcha. as they drive around. Okay. So I'm looking at this thing and it's about the two o'clock position. We're about the eight o'clock position. And I'm like, oh, I've got, I've got enough altitudes. I'm going to, I'm going to cut across the circle. I tell the guy in my back seat, dude, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. He's like, go for it, skip. Cause I was a skipper. So I cut across the bottom. So I'm kind of almost coming out co-altitude as this thing's coming out. I'm going to meet it mm -hmm. and I'm driving and, uh, I get to probably, it's, I'm probably about a half mile away, which you think, well, a half mile is pretty far. Half mile in aviation isn't, it's nothing. That's I mean, you can tell there's a pilot in an airplane. You can see all kinds of stuff at a half mile. You can see pretty good detail. So I'm like right there and it's coming across my nose. So now I'm basically pointing back towards the east. So I'm cutting across because I'm going to the three o'clock position. It's at two o'clock and I'm going to meet it at three o'clock. So as I do this, it goes, it just accelerates and disappears. So it's a, this happens at around estimating about 12,000 feet. So they're at mm -hmm. 20. So they've got about 8,000 foot of altitude above us when this happens. And it just is it crosses our nose, it just, it accelerates and literally in less than, you know, probably less than a half second, it just goes, and it's gone. And so we're like, and I, the first thing is, dude, did you guys see it? The other airplane's like, it's gone. We don't, we have no idea where it's at. So we kind of spin around real quick. I go, well, let's see what's down here. And I turn around, we're looking for the white water and we can't, the white water's gone. There's nothing. It's literally all blue. So now you go. And I, I remember telling the guy in my back seat, I go, dude, I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty weirded out because this is, I've, I mean, it, it, you know, I had at the time like 30 some hundred hours of flying. I'd been doing it for 18 years. It's nothing like anything you've seen. No, no. So as we turn, we go, oh, well, let's just go back, you know, because now I got to put on my real hat, which we have to train because we're getting ready to deploy to, you know, overseas. So we got to get our training done. So that's my mindset, especially as a CEO, because I got to get, I got it training out of the flight time because I'm responsible to do that. So, hey, let's go back. And the, the, the guy who's going to be the bad guys is the CEO of the Marine Squadron. And uh, so Cheeks is at the other. He's listening to all this happen, you know, because he's just like, because oh. he, they, when he first went out, they were going to do him. But the little Hornets, the legacy Hornets, the F-18Cs, don't have as much gas as the Super Hornets. So he had launched first and they were going to do him. And then when they knew we were off the deck, they just told him, hey, go to your cat point down south and we're going to send, we'll pass this off to the the Super Hornets. What's a cap point? By the way? Uh, that's where we hold. So it's called a combat air patrol point. So we're just going to hold at one end. He's going to hold at the other end. It's kind of like, hey, yeah. you guys are going to get each. It's, think of it, if it's a football field, we're going to sit on one goal line. He's going to sit on the other goal line. And when they say go, we're going to run at each other and then try and do something in the middle of the field and then go back to our set reset points. Okay. So you're talking to him. He's, he's, he's listening to the, all he's just listening. Down. We don't talk to him at all. Oh. He's just listening. He just dials up because they know that we all know the frequencies. So he's listening to what's going on. Cause he's like, cause they canceled training. So what else is he going to do? He's just going to hang out there and do circles while he's waiting him and his wingman. So they just, they're listening to all this go on. And then at this point you move on. Yeah. We come back up to train. We go back as we're flying back the controller. Cause we're talking to the, the kid on the Princeton, the, the, uh, the, uh, they're called OSs. They're op operation specialists. They're the ones that run the radars. And we're talking to him and he's like, Hey, sir, you're not going to believe this, but that thing is at your cap. It showed back up. It just popped up. You know, this is like 60 miles away. It just reappears. We're like, oh, okay. So we got the radars out. We're looking for it. Uh, we get out there. We never see it. We never see it again. Uh, we do what we need to do. We come back to the ship. Of course, now we're like, oh, this is going to be, we're, you know, I told, I told him, I go, dude, you know, we're going to catch, we're going to catch shit for this. <laughs> when we get back to the ship, word's going to get out and we're just going to catch maximum shit. And we did. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of that joking, you know, so the ship plays movies. We have movies on the boat. And they do 12 hours of movies. So they repeat because there's a day check and a night check. So the same movies in the morning and night play. So you never get to ever get to watch a whole movie on the boat, which drives my wife crazy because I'll watch stuff on TV that way too. I'll be like, oh, hey, I've seen this. And then I'll jump into a movie in the middle and then I'll pick it up later and I'll see the beginning and I'll put it all together because uh, that's how we have to do it because we're so busy. Uh, well, the movies became, and I, it was Men in Black, Aliens, yeah. uh, uh, Independence Day. Definitely going to catch some shit. Oh, we did. <laughs> but let let uh, let me just ask some dumb questions. So just take him because it's whatever whatever the heck you saw, whatever the heck happened. It's you know one of the most fascinating things um, 
events in recent history. So whatever it was, it's interesting to talk about at different kinds of angles. There's no good answers, but it's interesting to ask some dumb questions here. Uh, so first of all, you mentioned, see, so you saw at some point X, Y, and then uh, somebody in the Princeton said, you're not gonna believe this, sir. It's at your cap point. Now that's a different place. How the heck did it know what your cap point is? That's a good question. That's you, you the one of you don't. No one, you know, you don't. We don't tell it. It's, we don't broadcast it. We have a waypoint in the system. But I don't know. Maybe it knew where we were going because we use the same one day after day after day. Right. It's just use um, it. But it it obviously knew. But where you we never were saw it there. Never saw it there. Fish. Chad, when he took off, when he got the video, we landed. We told them, "Hey, look, we just we just chased this thing." And they're like, <laughs> "What?" I go chased it, and they're like, "What?" I go. Dude, he, I go, and I told him, I said, dude, get video. And he goes, and so, and that's how he is. He's like, oh, I'm going to go. And he, he was, he, he was determined that he was going to find this thing. So when you look at his video, and this is the stuff that isn't out that they don't see because not all the, the all you see is the FLIR tape. That's the targeting okay. pod, the forward looking infrared receiver. Um, I'll probably overlay the video. So when he, people have seen when it. he goes out, it's, uh, you know, what he's looking at on his displays is he has basically two radar displays up. He has azimuth and range on the right one, and he has azimuth and elevation on the left one. So this is called the ASL display, and this is called this is basically the PPI, which is the you're at the bottom of it. You're at the bottom of the square. It's it's really taken this. It's taken a cone because a radar really looks left and right from a point, and it squares it out. So the entire bottom of the scope that we look at is us because they do this. They square it off. So. So he goes out, and when he first sees it, he gets a radar return on it because when he's not trying to lock it. So the radar's just throwing energy out and getting it. You know, it's a Doppler radar. So when it's in search mode, that's all it's doing. It's going, oh, I can see you. I can see you. And it's looking yeah. for a return. So he gets a return, so he wants to see what it is because all you get is a little green square unless it builds a track file on it. But the little green square is just sitting there. It's not moving because it's it's sitting in one spot in space. He locks it up. When he goes to lock it up, now he's putting a bunch of energy on it. Yeah. So he's telling the radar, stare down that line of sight and whatever's there, I want you to grab it and build a track file on it, which will tell us how high it is, how fast it is and the direction that it's going. Okay. The radar smart enough that when the signal comes back, if it's been messed with, it will tell you, it'll give you indications that I'm being jammed. So mm -hmm. that's all it is, is you send the signal out something, it manipulates the signal either in range and velocity or whatever, and it sends it back. And the radar was smart enough to go that is not a return that I'm expecting. Something's messing Something's with me. I'm weird. being jammed. And it shows you and it puts strobes up. It gives these lines on the radar and it does some stuff. So you can mean it. Well, it does. It goes full into it. It's being jammed in about every mode you can possibly see because everything comes up and the, the this aspect gets along. It's all kinds of, I don't want to get into details, but you can tell it's being jammed. So, and it's, as you said it does, on Rogan, by the way, that jamming is an act of war. Active right? jamming is a, when you actively jam another platform, yes, it's, it's technically an act of war. Feels like you should be freaking out at this point. <laughs> I mean, so, well, he does it. And then in the back seat, so they don't have a stick and throttle, they have what their side stick controllers, so they can control all the sensors mm -hmm. and they can just toggle around and do stuff. So, he can, he has the ability to just move one switch real quick and it will go from that azimuth elevation on the radar to the targeting pod. Well, as soon as he commanded the radar to look at that target, the targeting pod goes, oh, what's over there? And it'll stare because it goes down the line of sight because all the systems are hooked together. You can decouple them, but they're going to automatically couple up. So when he castles over, he it's a switch. It looks like a castle switch. was a castle. So when he moves that thing to the left and he swaps the displays out and he says, instead of looking at the radar, I want to look at the targeting pod. He sees it on the targeting pod because the targeting pod's already looking there. Mm -hmm. And now he's on a passive track because he's not literally sending any energy out. He's just receiving IR energy from the Tic Tac. Yep. And then the system itself will track the pixels and the contrast differences. Yep. It depends yep. on what mode you're in. So it says, oh, and that's where those little bars you see in the video where the bars come up left and right. doing some vi vision-based tracking. That's exactly what it is. Um, yep. So And, he, and, then and that's the video. He goes through. Changes chat, zooms, changes the he mode. Change, he goes through all the modes. So there's a narrow, medium, and wide. So wide is far away medium and then narrow and then there's the tv mode and he goes from ir mode to the tv mode the cool thing with the tv mode is narrow ir mode is only medium tv mode so you can actually get closer with narrow tv mode it's got a better zoom capability when you go into tv mode um so he goes through all those things and that's when you see it going from yeah. a black background to a white background He's trying to figure out what the heck is this well, yeah, and he wants to get as much data as he can on it based on the different modes instead of just staring at it going, what is that thing? Yeah. Um, granted, the, so the, the video has been out, it actually was on YouTube for years. 
and the, before the government released it, it Someone, was leaked uh 2000 what seven about no i got a the guy that was in my back seat sent me an email and i had retired so this is about no because i was working i was working down in san diego so this is about 2008 early 2009 he so sends me a link to strangeland.com, which <laughs> is much. not suitable for work. Oh, yeah, it's top yeah. notch. Yeah. Um, and he says, hey, I can remember the email. Hey, Skip, does this look familiar? And I look at it. I'm like, how the hell did that get on strangeland.com? <laughs> so next thing you know, it ends up on YouTube, yeah. which was cool because you can send a YouTube link to someone. You don't send strangeland.com yeah. to someone because you don't know what you're going to get. Yeah. It's like Googling kittens. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so it ends up there somehow. So it gets on YouTube, which was cool because I would go out with my friends and we'd be drinking and they, they go, dude, what's the coolest thing you ever saw flying? You know, it's kind of like you were asking what it's like. And I go, oh, dude, I chased a UFO. And they're like, get out. And I'm like, no, serious. So this is literally how it happened. So I was sitting with my friend, Matt. So Matt and I did our, my, he was the guy in my right seat of the A6 when I did my very first night trap, right? And we were friends to this day, right? Because when you do stuff like people like that, you know, you, I had to have faith in him. He had to have faith in me. You know, it's, they're, they awesome. become like your brother. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and these are guys that literally, you know, I don't talk to him on a regular basis. Like Chris, who works at Apple, if, if Chris called me up tomorrow and said, dude, I need help. I need this. I'd be like, all right, let's figure this out and let's do it because it's yeah. they're like family. You you do it, and most Navy guys we don't we're not we don't send letters to each other weekly. You, you know, I have friends that could I haven't talked to in ten years that they showed up on my door. We you know pop a bottle of wine, grab a beer, You're right shoot the shit, it. take about first ten minutes to catch up, and then it's it's like old times, and it's it's amazing how fast this happens. So incredible. So I'm out to dinner with Matt, um, and I'm telling him this story, and he's like, get out of here. So he goes back and he tells our friend Paco. Um, Paco has uh, fightersweep.com. It's a blog site. So Paco's obsessed. Like he is way into UFOs. Yeah. So Paco calls me up. He says, dude, I was talking to Maddie. That's what we call him. He goes, I was talking to Maddie. He goes, dude, you, you got to tell me this story. So I'm like, all right. So I spend a chunk of time. And so he calls me one day and I'm like, I get a voicemail. Hey, give me a call. So I call him up. And he answers the phone, but I can hear people in the background. And I go, hey, dude, what's going on? He goes, hang on, hang on. I got to put you on speakerphone. I go, what are you putting me on speaker? He goes, you got to tell the story. I'm having a dinner party. <laughs> you got to tell the story. So he's literally having a dinner party with his cell phone in the middle of the table as I tell a Tic Tac story. Yeah. So he calls me up again. He says, hey, I got this blog. And uh, he just writes about fighter stuff. Like he wrote about, that. we call him the shit hot break. That's a guy that when you're landing on a carrier, comes and turns and gets ready to land really fast. Like breaks it off right at the back of the ship. And uh, uh, one of the guys, when we were junior officers on the USS Ranger, one of the apartment heads in the other squadron was a guy, Nasty. And Nasty was notorious for coming in in a Tomcat and cranking off the shit hot break, mm -hmm. right? So he he'd he literally wrote a thing about the shit hot break with Nasty. And there's another guy, our Mav was our uh, one of our landing signals officers for the air wing. It just it was it's just it's a good article on how this was and how you know it it, it kind of forms you in naval aviation. It's kind of being kind of the part of the club so he's like i gotta write about this thing i'm like what do you guys i gotta write about it. i go all right i go because at first i would say no i'm like dude i don't want this out there just so you haven't really before then talked about it much no, my, I mean, my you, wife didn't even really know the whole story what just as a comment is it just because you caught some no uh it was just i'll tell you what three days we we had the incident for about two days they played the goofy movies the, there there's a comic on the back of the air wing schedule yeah. that they would put it was like first one was a far side and the second one was me and the guy in my back seat, and it was men in black, but it had our names, you know, protecting the yeah. world, protecting the Nimitz battle group type stuff. It's yeah, just okay. funny shit like that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so that, no, that was just, it. to me, it wasn't that big of a deal. It was like, okay, that's weird. We're never going to know what it was. I want to get out because this is important because yeah. there's all kinds of rumors. There's a group of folks there. No one ever came out in suits to talk to us. N nobody ever. looking like me. No. Came out no. on a. On a uh, no, no so one came out the, on a helicopter. No one came out on an airplane. You know, you get, oh, I, I was told to turn over this classified. What's funny is all the COs, and, and several of them are still in the Navy. Uh, there's one that is a, he, I think he just finished up. He was a captain of an aircraft carrier. Yeah. You know, so he'll end up making Admiral and all that stuff. I, th those guys are all my friends. I talk to them yeah. daily. Just, just to clarify, so 
just for people who don't know, there's a story that both on the Nimitz and the Princeton, uh, folks in a helicopter landed, they showed up, they took the data, quote unquote, so all the sort of recordings associated with this incident, and they took it and presumably deleted it. There's a kind of story to that. And then uh, from what I've seen, you said that you believe, just like we were talking about offline, that jokes spread faster than, uh, or just rumors spread faster than anything on, on, on these ships. Uh, that it was, it might have been a joke that started, and uh... well, they did. So here's the, here's the joke. Yeah. So they had come down, right? We had the tapes, um, and they were Chad's tapes. So we use those tapes over and over again. You know, they're they're consumable. But remember, I have a budget as a squadron, so I have a budget, so I have to buy those tapes. I have to all that stuff that we use. I'm accountable for. Yeah. And the tapes are actually classified secret because of the data that's on them. Yeah. Okay. So we had the tapes. So the the secure the intelligence guys the intel officers came down from what's called civic it's cvic which is carrier intel center came down and said hey we need the tapes these guys are going to come they're going to come and get them this so, so, so we're like oh, i'm like oh or whatever you know so we hand them the tapes and then someone because i have you know you know people shortly after they came and got the tapes someone came to me and said you know they're they're messing with you they're playing a joke so i said oh well let's see how well that goes because you know I'm, I'm a CEO and they're not. And, uh, so I went down to civic and, uh, it was a, was probably, I think he was a Lieutenant or a Lieutenant JG. So he's way junior to me. And I said, Hey, uh, I want my tapes back. And he looks at me and I go, I know you guys are pulling my leg. I know you, there's no one came out and I go, and you have about 30 seconds to get me my tapes before I start tearing this place apart. That's literally what I told him. And I said, and if your boss has an issue, he can come and see me because it's not going to go well. I said, because this is bullshit and I need those tapes. Then he literally walked right over to a filing cabinet, opened it up. They weren't in a safe. He opened up a filing cabinet and pulled them out and handed them to me. Mm -hmm. I said, and I basically said a few things to him, like, don't ever fuck with me again. Yeah. And I left. I had the tapes. So this, no one came out. There's no flying going on when all this is happening. And I took the tapes back and then I copied the tapes. So I took two brand new eight mil tapes and I copied the sections that I want. So there's a rumor too that, Oh, the original FLIR video is 10 minutes long and there's some, one of these petty officers is saying, oh, I saw it. That's total crap. The original video is about a minute, 30 seconds long. What you see on the release video is the entire video. So you have mentioned, uh, I apologize if I say <laughs> stupid things, please correct no, me, but you, you, you have mentioned that, uh, like on Rogan, I think that you watched it on, you know, on a bigger screen. It felt like it was higher definition. So let me ask the, the question. Is there a higher definition version, do you think, of the FLIR video that would give us more pixels and more information, presumably because of the um, um, higher I number of I would doubt it, because I don't know where, the stuff that the government released, I don't know where they got it. Okay, so the stuff that was on Strangeland and YouTube, you know, someone pulled off of a secret, It's it looks like a rack. You know, there's tape machines in there and it gets converted to digital and stored on a hard drive and they pulled it off that hard drive and they put it on YouTube. Um. No, it's it's just like, you know, anytime, even a digital media, the more you copy digital media, there's some it quality degrades. that gets, it degrades. Yeah. So this, you don't know how many times this has been copied. So we were looking, I, the videos I've seen are right off the original, they're high eight tapes that's yeah. basically pulled off the back of the display. So it's not filmed with cameras. It's literally a digital feed that's pulled off the back and put onto a high eight tape. That's how the recorders work. Now it's actually digital to digital. It's not even on tapes anymore. They, it's, it's a digital recording system, but we were still in that process of slowly up because original we had little cameras here that shine. So if the light hit, it would wash out the displays. So this is, it's a pretty good feed. Um, when you put it on, so we're, instead of looking at it on your tiny little computer monitor or whatever, I'm looking at it on a, a like a 19 inch, because it was still normal TVs back there. We had just put flat screens in the ready room that I had bought so we could watch movies. So, because we- A nice, huge 19 inch screen. <laughs> it was maybe 20. It was nice. <laughs> wow, that's huge. Yeah, it was gigantic. <laughs> Um, hey, I can get for like 50 just, bucks, you can get like 60 this is, inches. <laughs> this is 2005. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so you're looking at this big thing and, and, and it, but you could see, so when you get to the TV mode, when I say there's little things coming out of the bottom of it, yeah. you could see those and it was very clear. But know? in terms of the actual visual on the Tic Tac, was it, did you, did you get much more information from the higher, from the clear? The little things out of the bottom. At the, we didn't so the see the bottom information. I got so you. when you see it, because he's coming almost co-altitude with it, you can see yeah. the bottom of it. And it looks like little 
You know, like if you look at a Cessna, there's little antennas hanging out of the bottom. Mm -hmm. Kind of like that. There was two little things out of the bottom. There was nothing on the top. There was no plume, no IR, no no visible propulsions, even heat signature. You know, it's all that stuff. And then the other thing that people didn't see is they didn't see the the radar display, uh, which that that really raises a classification level, especially to see what the radar does when it's being jammed. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, when I matter of fact, when they did the unofficial official investigation in about two thousand and let me think, about two thousand nine, um, I had gotten a call on my cell phone from a guy who government employee, and said, <laughs> "Hey, he told me who he was. He's still in the government. Um, I, I'm friends with him." And he yeah. said, "Hey, we're going to investigate your Tic Tac thing." This is literally five years later. Yeah, five years later. And I said, okay, whatever. And he did a pretty good job. I call it the unofficial official report because um, it was really never official. It wasn't. It, but I'll give you the history of why I say that and why it never came out in FOIA requests. So he does the report. He sent me the report. And all he said is, hey, I'm going to send you this report. Please don't distribute this report. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. The report is now out because Harry Reid got it to George Knapp. And they were good enough to redact it, but there's a few versions of it unredacted. And I'm very protective of the other people that were involved in this. So Jim has talked, but he's off the grid. He doesn't talk to anyone now. The pilot of his airplane, she has come out on unidentified, but they don't release her name, although people are starting to do it. And she's had weird shit happen around her house. She's got kids, you know, so I'm very protective of her. Um, and I've told people like Jeremy and George, if I know that the names ever came from you, I will never talk to you again about this. And Jeremy's been really good about it. And so has George. And then, but George, George knew who the names were because he had, he got the report from Senator Reid. Um, and then the other crew. So the, uh, the pilot of the airplane that took the video that Chad was in, if you talk to that individual, they really don't have the recollection. They were just out flying that day and it wasn't mm -hmm. a big deal. Um, so yeah. it's, it's, you, you need to protect cause not everyone wants people knocking. I don't want people knocking on my door and, you know, and, and there's rumors, oh, you talk to everyone. I think you're about the 23rd person that I've talked to total. Yeah. And that includes, uh, you know, the, the newspapers and stuff. And I've been selective because there's so much, I mean, if, if I turned down, like I turned down Russian TV, uh, <laughs> I can give you her name when we're done here. But yeah. she, she called, she not only called me, she called my wife, she called my daughter, she called my son and she called oh, my son-in-law. Um, because they're persistent. So I'm, I'm pretty protect. I'm, I'm very particular. I mean, the reason I'm talking to you is because I knew we would have a conversation that wasn't based just on the Tic Tac and the incident, but we yeah. could actually talk about some of the science and some of the theoretical to get into, to get more people involved, to go, yeah. Yeah. cause I think there's, you know, and when you talk to, you know, Lou Elizondo or Chris Mellon, you know, the group at TTSA, you know, the, that whole What's thing was, TTSA? that's to the stars. Uh, Academy. Academy yeah. That's the Tom DeLong group that got started. Yeah. So, and, and you go, well, uh, you know, cause I think Tom has caught a lot of crap for this, but he's actually, when you talk to him, he's, he's, he's very smart. And I ask him, how'd you get into this? And he goes, oh, when I was traveling around with Blink-182, he goes, you read a lot of books when you're laying in a van as you're driving to your next gig mm -hmm. before you make it big. And he goes, and he read, he was reading books and he read one of them on UFOs. I'm trying to think the title. It's one of the big ones that's out there real popular. And so he started just, he started asking more and through his fame with Blink-182 in the band, he got more and more connected. You know, if you talk to Chris Mellon, who is an undersecretary of defense for intelligence, and he's part of the Mellon, you know, dynasty, you know, from Carnegie Mellon type, uh, very, very smart. He knows, he 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 definitely knows how the government works because he worked there. Um, and so when I went down to DC to talk to people he's one of the first people I'll go to when I did, uh, Tucker Carlson about a month ago, month and a half ago. Mm -hmm. Um, I asked, I, I, he texted me, I, I texted him, Tom Lou to go, Hey, cause they were like, you got to do it. Cause I turned to, I had turned Tucker down a couple times before and his, uh, his producer had called me and I'm like, all right, I'll do it. Cause those guys are like, you gotta, you gotta do this for us completely. Let me ask the big question. I apologize yeah, uh, yeah, for the absurd romantic nature of it. Uh, Outside, I mean, one of the things, the fact that you've laid your eyes on a UFO probably opened your eyes to the possibility that some of the other sightings, there there could be other sightings that have legitimacy to them. What to you is the, outside of your own sighting, is the most interesting sighting or UFO-related event 
in history? Uh, I think there's several. What is it? Ramachand Forest in England. Uh, the U.S. guys that saw stuff and actually got radiation burns. One guy was medically disabled, but they weren't going to give it, and he had help from Jim or, uh, John McCain. His office helped get the guy's uh, uh, disability reestablished. I think that's a big one. Uh, I think there's people out there that have seen stuff, and I'm talking credible uh, because there's you got to remember there's a huge chunk of these sightings that get disproven. They're they're actually explainable. Yeah. Uh, you know, you had sent me the question, the, the Phoenix lights, uh, Phoenix lights. I yeah, think there's, said, what's that? I, I, so I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with some of these. The, the, I'm not either. It's, <laughs> I, I, I want a funny story on that. So I was at a, I was at a conference and hopefully he doesn't watch this and get offended, but we had this, uh, this, it, it was, I call it speed dating. So there was a table, there was about eight people at a table. <laughs> yeah. And we would go sit at the table and they could ask us questions. And then after 10 minutes, we moved to the next table. Yeah. So I was speed dating all these people that are really into this. Yeah. It was kind of funny, but uh, I'd sat down and it's always funny because some people will try and dominate it, but uh, you know, you have to kind of push the dominators away so that, you know, if you're quiet and introverted, you yeah. can ask your question too. Yeah. So we got into this and the guy starts naming all these. Well, what about this? What about the Phoenix lights? I'm like, I don't know about the Phoenix lights. What about this event? I'm like, I don't know about that. He goes, he looks at me and he goes, well, you're not a UFO guy. I go. No, I'm not, but I chased one, so I'm an expert. Have you? <laughs> and you could see him get yeah. deflated because I'm kind of a smart ass like yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, the, the firsthand experience from a credible, in some sense, these sightings have to do both with the evidence and the human. Well, I think part of that is, to us, it, that that's a credibility piece because n the four of us that actually saw it, plus you know the, the other two that were in the airplane that shot the video, none of us are UFO-obsessed people. So... When we come out and say, because to me, it's just, an, it's five minutes of my life. I, I, mean, I did a lot of really cool, I've had a, a really kind of neat things I've, I've been able to do. Um, but when you look at it and go, uh, we don't, it, to me, it wasn't, it, it's not the pinnacle of my life. You know, to other people that they live in the UFO world and they, it's like they, you know, if you talk to people, they'll go, that are really into it, who've never seen one. It, it kills them that they didn't see one when here we are because, and what's unique with ours, which kind of adds that level is it wasn't, we just didn't see it. It wasn't like, Oh, look, something in the sky. And it was weird. We actually engaged with it. You know, it was, yeah, a, that was, it was an engaged that, five minute thing. And there's other stories from other countries. Like there's a story uh, in the back in, when the Soviet union existed, that they actually would chase these things. And one of them shot at some, you know, it shot it because they said, shoot at it. And it shot at it. And then it got shot down. And then he said, don't ever shoot at them again and don't chase them. Just you can observe them, but don't go after them because obviously they have firepower that we can't control. Because if you can make something float around and jam radars at will and do whatever you want, you know, modern terrestrial weapons are probably not very useful. You know, you can go to Independence Day. They had that force field around. Oh, we got to, we got to, now you got a cyber warfare. You got to take the bug down. You got to take the warfare. So now we can actually uh, inhibit some type of damage. So there's a, I mean, you mentioned the Phoenix Lights. This is somebody on, uh, I think Reddit said, uh, ask him any thoughts on mass UFO sightings like the Phoenix Light. So the interesting thing, like you said, with the Tic Tac is that multiple people laid their eyes on this. What What are your thoughts about the Phoenix Lights or many people so have seen So here's it? the deal with massive sightings. So the Phoenix Lights is unexplainable, although I know the Air Force had said something about it. It was an A-10 drop in flares. No, I don't think so. You know, it's, oh, you know, flares don't burn that long. They just come out and they, you know, they detract and they go away. Although on the other hand, there's, you know, because clouds can do things. So, so I lived in central California for 18 years and you would get, oh my God, what was that in the sky? And it was really Vandenberg shooting a missile off. You know, they were doing ICBM tests at one time where they shoot from Vandenberg and they fly across and they go land in the atoll at Kwajalein, you know, and then they can check the displacement, the accuracy and all that stuff. You know, it's stuff that we do because we're a superpower. Um, but when you see them go up, you know, especially if you've ever watched a rocket really launch on a clear night, it'll have the stream, the glow, and you can tell it's a rocket. But if you don't look up until later, when it starts to get to the outer edge of the atmosphere where the uh, plume coming out of the engine is not constrained, but and you can watch this on TV when even the SpaceX ones go up, it's nice and narrow, narrow, narrow. And then it hits a point where it really starts to go up and it starts to come to the sides because there's the forces aren't holding that all into one unique thing. And it looks really odd. And then it'll go off. Because it burns out and then you get stage separation. Then you see the next one go off and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. um, and people don't understand that because they didn't watch it from launch. Because we used to sit in our driveway and, you know, Vandenberg, is, it was a three-hour drive. But you could sit and watch it. Go, you knew they were launching at night. You'd watch. 
you watch the thing. It's really cool. If you don't see anything, what you see is the weird clouds from the exhaust plume, you know, what's left, the residue that's sitting in the atmosphere, and it and the wind starts blowing it. So you get these really kind of weird shapes in the sky. You know, that's part. But when you go to Phoenix Lights and you go, hey, you know, when when a thousand people see something, you're you gonna discredit all a thousand people, or you're gonna try and explain it away with something else. You know, the you know the big it's a weather balloon. You know, <laughs> hey, yeah. what is it? It's a weather balloon. Again, just like the Tic Tac, I think is just inspiring uh, for uh, the limitless nature of the science. I think you're. I think more is going to come out. I think uh, some of the stuff that the the to the stars folks have done. Uh, so there's a the to Italian, the stars academy. Yeah, it's what are your thoughts along. about them? Are they? Um, I like, talk to them quite a bit. Um, I am not a part of to the stars academy. I, you know. But, you know, like I talked to Lou, I just was texting him before this. Yeah. Um, so he, the, what's their mission? What's their hope? What's their, what's their, when they, they started, their mission was to try and don't look at this as little green men, but let's look at this as a technology and let's try and almost reverse engineer and figure out how these things operate and how can we explain this from using our knowledge, you know, physics based knowledge to go, how would something like this operate? That's really their bottom line was mm -hmm. to, to try and use and then couple that with because they've got the series unidentified, um, couple that with television b to get the word out. So you're actually putting something instead of because everyone has a theory, you know, ancient aliens covers all kinds of theories. You know, it's kind of yeah. off of, oh, my God. And, and I've seen the stuff and I've seen stuff that I've said taken out of context on shows that I yeah. did not talk to. Uh, so there's all that because you can take a clip and go, oh, it's this, it's that, you know, and if I know about stuff like it, you can't technically use my likeness unless I tell you, you can. So if I haven't signed something, you can't do it. There was a guy who put something out and I was in it and I told him you can take it down or you can talk to lawyers because I'm not, I'm not supporting you. So and, they use um, it to tell some kind of narrative that doesn't, yeah, well, it's not connected to reality. Because let's face it, if you're making TV shows, there's two reasons yeah. to do it. One, you want to get word out or two, you want to make money or three, both. And so usually it's, I would say the, the make money is probably the, the biggest, biggest thing to put a TV show out. And the, the mission of the, to the stars Academy is to not do that is, is, uh, is to try to get some. When I, when they started and I talked to them, cause I've talked to Tom and I've talked to Lou and those are the two main players. It was to basically demystify the fact and, and get rid of the, the stigma that's tied to UFOs. And let's look at it from a science base and then use TV to get the word out on the progress. And they've done some pretty cool things. I mean, you know, they've the the Italian government gave them all kinds of files that had been, you know, property of their government. They got a bunch from it might have been Argentina, gave them all kinds of stuff. Like, here's all our records. What can you do with it? To try and now pull from country base to a gl more global based research, which is what you were talking about. And then using independent scientists that are not tied to a government, I mean, any government, but just using independent research agencies to start looking at some of the metallurgy because you go, oh, I found this. We had this piece of metal. What is it? And some of the stuff has been explained. They've got some objects, artifacts that have not been explained. And that's slowly coming out, you know, and I think. Uh, and you your know, hope is the U.S. government will release some well, more the government things. Well, the government, the U.S. government came out a month ago and said, yeah, we have, we have, uh, we have material that we cannot explain the origin. They have said that. They yeah. just haven't released the wreckage from the Roswell thing, which I keep joking about. I'm like, come on, it's 70 some years old. I mean, Classify like, it, let it out. I, I think you put it beautifully that in this time, that would be a heck of an inspiring, hopeful thing to see. Like people don't- Just to distract them. Yeah, right? the division is, I mean, nothing will unite a, 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 us humans, descendants of chimps, uh, like uh, the idea that there's life out there. Oh, it would, it would literally change. I said this a while ago. I forget. I think it was the London Sun-Times had called me. And I said, you know, personally, I think this is a global issue. It's not. If there is stuff coming down, which we're pretty sure there is, there's enough stuff that we can't explain. If there is stuff coming down, then this is not a country-based thing. And it's not about technology. And it's not about who's going to win the next war. Because you don't know what they're doing. So you got really a couple of theories. One, you've got ET or Close Encounters. And the other extreme is you've got Independence Day. Are you going to prepare and bet on ET and Close Encounters, or do you actually try and do stuff in case it is Independence Day? You actually have a game plan. And when you get into Independence Day, that scenario, you know, and I, I don't like going too much into sci-fi, but let's just say in theory that that becomes a reality. It's not a U.S., Russia, China, England, France, Spain, 
name any country and any continent, it becomes a global issue. And the only way you can deny, it's just like Americans. We all, you know, we're, we're divided. Mm -hmm. it, it's, we, it's been that way forever. So if you think we won't get through this, we'll get through it because we've had times just like this before. Until Nazi Germany pops up. But if Nazi Germany pops up or someone flies two airplanes into the World Trade Center and yes. then all of a sudden we're all like united. We all also have very, very short memories. <laughs> yes. We do. Exactly. It's when you look and go, uh, well, we can do this. And you go, well, no, no. If, if you think that everyone on the planet is good, you need to stop taking the drugs that you're taking. You yeah, know, we said this. So. There were people during the rise of Hitler... No, no, it's, it's, it's okay. No, no, it's okay. We're not going to do, we're not going to stop. No, no, it's okay. No, no, it's okay. And you got to think, the only thing that stopped Hitler was his ego by going into Russia. If he just stuck with the pact with Stalin and not went to the East and had to fight, and it was really the Russian winner that crushed him, and he would have put all his high troops to the other side... There would have been a totally different outcome. The man in the iron, the man in the high tower, whatever. It's a Netflix show where Nazi actually wins it. And you look, you know, we didn't know everything that was going on, especially the atrocities with the concentration camps and what he was doing to the, to the Jews. I mean, it's you look at that going, if you really want to see evil, and then there's the whole side of what Stalin did because he actually exterminated more people than Hitler did, but that never gets the press. And know? the thing is, we forget this, we forget this history in our conflicts today, we forget that there is the nature of evil. We forget that there's real evil in the world. And um, the thing to fight that evil is to be united, to be uh, both. It's like this interesting line, like you talked about Joe Rogan, of being both like kind to each other, compassionate, empathetic, but also being like strong and a bad motherfucker when you need to. To make sure that you that like there's a, it's a balance between kindness and force. Well, that, it is. You, you use use force when force is necessary, is necessary. But you don't have to walk around like Billy Badass all the time. Right. I mean, some of the toughest people that I grew up with, that literally could kick the shit out of whoever came near them, they never got in fights because one, even people that didn't know them, because they were actually nice guys. You know, they were they're just good dudes. But you know, if you cross them, like I had a friend of mine. Uh, he was, he's a nationally ranked wrestler. Mm -hmm. It went to, went to Naval Academy with me. He's a very, very good friend of mine. Um, and, uh, he is, when you meet him and he wrestled at 190 pounds and he did not lose a match his senior year until he went to nationals. He just had a bad day. He actually lost to a guy he had pummeled the shit out of. Mm -hmm. And he would cross. It was funny. We, we joke about it, even with him. Cause when you meet him, he's like the nicest, like local, Hey, Hey dude, you know, Hey, how you doing? He's super nice. And he would cross that ring on a, on a wrestling mat. As soon as he crossed that ring, it was like a totally different person. Yeah. And he would go out there and just destroy people. I mean, physically destroy, like put a hurt on. And he would get done and he's like super humble and they'd raise his hand and he would, he would, he'd have this blank expression. They'd raise his hand and he'd walk off. And as soon as he crossed the line, he'd, he'd look up and smile. And go, hey, hi guys. How you doing? Like he literally just went and could <laughs> rip someone's arms off. But as soon as he crossed the line, he was a totally different person. He's like, and he's that way today. Yeah. And man, he, he wouldn't even tell you he's a wrestler. Yeah. That's kind of a symbol of the best of America. <laughs> That's what America is. Oh, he's that wrestler. He's you a. cross the line, you're. You're, uh, you can be hard, but when, when, once you're off the mat, you're just a kind human being. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. I, let me direct, because it's such an interesting topic from a career perspective, from a science perspective. You're, I mean, you've spoke, you've been brave in, you know, telling your story, not some dramatic thing, but just telling the things you've seen. Did it encounter, did, uh, did it impact your career? Is that why more people haven't come out? Like uh, you've mentioned uh, Roswell, like how, what advice do you give to people, to the community, to me as a scientist for ways to go forward about this topic and still have a, a you know, not being put in a bin in society that he's a loon or she's a loon or that person. Mine is to get away from the little green men. Just d d divorce the two little green men. And, you know, and I've talked to Lou Elizondo about this, you know, and, and the group that they're working with, which is incredible. I mean, they've got Steve Justice, who used to run Skunk Works, where they built, you know, 
projects. Now, Lou Elizondo, we should mention, was a program director. He ran so, the ATIP program at the Pentagon. And ATIP was a program that was tasked with investigating any kind of uh, un- UFOs, UAPs. Yeah. So what's funny is the unofficial official report that I joke about, yeah. the guy who wrote the unofficial official report was actually an original member of ATIP. And the original stuff that ATIP did was FOIA exempt. And people go, how do you know that? I go, because I stood there with the memo in my hand that said these are, it, it literally, I watched the DOD memo that said it and it was signed. So he was one. So that's why the, that's why I call it the unofficial official report. It was never, it was never releasable because people go, oh, I put in a FOIA request and I didn't get that. I go, well, just because you put in a FOIA request and get it. I go, because how much, how much time do you think that guy's going to spend to get you the information that you requested if he can't find it? I actually got called by the Navy. I had a, a commander in the Navy call me about, uh, right before the article came out in the New York Times, it was this was starting to come back, and she had called me because there's been there was a FOIA request for stuff about the Nimitz incident, and I said, "Do you know of anything?" She called me. She goes, "Do you know of anything else besides the the situation reports that come off the ship?" And, you know, and you got to remember when the situation report comes off the ship, that's like third hand. So we tell someone, they tell someone, that person has to write it up. So there's all kinds of inaccuracies in it. But then there's the unofficial official report that's actually pretty well written. There's some errors in it, but it was, you know, I didn't help write it. I just did it. And he did a really good job of researching it and figuring out who's who in the zoo and the players. Mm -hmm. Um, So she called me and said, is there anything out there? And I said, officially out there. She said, yes. I said, I don't know of anything. I knew of the unofficial official report, which is that one. But I'm not, you know, if you don't know about it, I'm not going to tell you because that's not my job. And nor did I care. I mean, did in that whole situation you, you mentioned, Lou? I mean, did you think about your impact to your career? Like, just to get back to the question, did do you think others, other pilots, other thing, uh, other people like in the uh, Roosevelt are thinking about this kind of thing? Why aren't they talking about this? Why are people afraid uh, to talk about this? Uh, well, honestly, the, the military and the press, there's a distrust. I'll just tell you that right now. Uh, we typically don't like talking to the press because if I talk to you. You know, especially when I do uh, even the TV shows, you know, because I've been on a couple of shows. When you look at it, you, you know, they come to my house and they film me for two hours. Yeah. And, and then and what you see on the screen something. is five minutes. Well, and the, and the other thing with the press, let me give you my perspective from autonomous vehicles is the clipping happens. Yes. But also the incompetence. Let me just call out journalism. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're not thinking. De- I mean, so, so here's the thing. I've uh, I have a PhD and I've taken painfully too many classes from like physics and math and I've also have a deep curiosity about the world. I read a lot. That seems to be missing with journalism. So you're talking to a person who is not going to push the story forward in an interesting way. Not the story, but the actual investigation of uh perhaps one of the most amazing things that humans have witnessed in history. Like you it might have been nothing it might, who knows what you witnessed might have been from a sort of debunking perspective might have been some kind of trick of mind you you and others have hallucinated something there could be some simple explanation but possibly it was a uh, something not of this world and to not do justice to this story from a scientific perspective it seems at best negligence. And so, yeah, well, that's true for journalists. That's true for other scientists. We, it's just, a, it's human nature. Oh, yeah. If we, if we can't, if we see something that we can't explain, then sometimes if you just, eh, it, maybe it's just yes. me and you let it go away and you don't think about it, and, you know, maybe it'll just, it, you know, it's, you, it's, you ignore it. Um, yeah. The other side is the inquisitive mind that says, well, what was that? And I want to, I want to dig more into it. You know, and if you, you, you look at it or you're going against the norm, um, you can get ostracized, you know, and if you look at, you know, and Einstein's the perfect example. I mean, when he started coming up with some of his theories, some of the top physicists in the world were like, dude, you're, you're a nut job. And he's, he's literally proving them, but he didn't have, you know, he proved them in theory, but he didn't have the means to actually do the experiment to prove his there, theory. There's a great book that I recommend people read called Proving Einstein Right by Jim Gates that uh, talks about like the hard work that people try to do years after uh, to try to experimentally validate the predictions that Einstein made with uh, with his theories. 
It's fascinating. But yes, at the time, it's kind of crazy what he's saying. Yeah, if you look at it back at the time, don't we? We look at it now and go, "Well, the guy was a walking genius, and he was." But if you go back in time when he was doing it, it was like, "What are you talking about?" You know. And but one of the challenges is your eyewitness. <laughs> but speaking on the weird, you've, uh, uh, in the best sense of the word, weird. You've written about and made the case that we should take UFO sightings more seriously. So that's one of the things that. Uh, I've been uh, inundated with sort of the excitement and the passion that people have for the possibility of extraterrestrial life, of life out there in the universe. I've always felt this excitement of just looking up at the stars and wondering what the hell's out there. Uh, but there's people that have more like, uh, more uh, grounded, excitement and passion of actually interacting with uh, with aliens on this here, our planet. What's the case they, from your perspective for taking these sightings more seriously? The data from the Navy to me seem quite serious. Mm -hmm. I don't pretend that I have the technical abilities to judge it as data, but there are numerous senators at the very highest of levels former heads of CIA, Brennan. I talked to him, did an interview with him. I asked him, what's up with these? <laughs> what do you think it is? He basically said that was the single most likely explanation was yeah. of alien origin. Now, you don't have to agree with him. But look, if you know how government works, these senators, or Hillary Clinton for that matter, or Brennan, they sat down, they were briefed by their smartest people, and they said, hey, what's going on here? And everyone around the table, I believe, is telling them, we don't know. Mm -hmm. And that is sociological data I take very seriously. I have not seen a debunking of the technical data, Yes, which is eyewitness reports and images and radar. Again, at a technical level, I, I feel quite uncertain on that turf. But evaluating sort of the testimony of witnesses, it seems to me it's now at a threshold where one ought to take it seriously. Yeah, there's a, one of the problems with UFO sightings is that because of people with good equipment, don't take it seriously. It's such a taboo topic that you have just like really shitty equipment collecting data. <laughs> and so you have the blurry Bigfoot kind of situation where you have just bad video and all those kinds of things, as opposed to, uh, I mean, there's a bunch of uh, people, uh, Avi Loeb from Harvard uh, talking about Amuamua. It's, it's just like people with the equipment to do the data collection, don't want to help out. And that creates a kind of divide where the scientists ignore that this is happening and there's the masses of people who are curious about it. And then there's the government that's full of secrets that's leaking some confusion and it creates distrust in the government, it creates distrust in science and it prevents the scientists from being able to explore some cool topics, some exciting possibilities that they should be, be curious kids like Avi talks about. Even if it has nothing to do with aliens, yeah. whatever the answer is, it has to be something fascinating. Yeah. We already know everything's interesting, but this is fascinating. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but look, that all said, I, I suspect they're not of alien origin. And let's yeah. let me tell you my reason. The people who are all gung-ho, they do a kind of reasoning in reverse or argument from elimination. They figure out a bunch of things that can't be. Like, is it a Russian advanced vehicle? Mm -hmm. No. Probably pretty good arguments there. Is it a Chinese advanced vehicle? No. Is it people like from the Earth's future coming back in time? No. And they go through a few others. They have some really good no arguments. Then they're like, well, what we've got left is aliens. Yeah. This argument from elimination, I don't actually find that persuasive. You can talk yourself into a lot of mistaken ideas that way. Yeah. The positive evidence that it's aliens is still quite weak. The positive evidence that it's a puzzle is quite huge. And the, and the, whatever the solution to the puzzle is, it might be fascinating. And that, it's going to be so weird or fascinating or maybe even trivial, but that's weird in its own way, that we can't set up by elimination all the things it might be able to be. Yeah. And just like you said, the debunking that I've seen of these kinds of things are 
less uh, explorations and solutions to the puzzle and more a kind of half-hearted dismissal. And Avi, as you mentioned to him on your podcast with him, he's been attacked an awful lot. Mm -hmm. And when I hear the idea carrier attacked, I get very suspicious of the critics. Uh, yeah. if, if he's wrong, like, just tell me why. Yeah. Like, my ears are open. I don't have a set view on Oumuamua, you know? I, I know I can't judge Avi's arguments. He can't convince me in that sense. I'm too stupid <laughs> to understand how good his argument may or may not be. And not, like you said, ultimately, in the argument is, uh, in the in the meeting of that debate is when we where we find the wisdom. Like dismissing it. That's one of the things that troubles me. There's a bunch of people like Nietzsche sometimes dismissed this way. Ayn Rand is sometimes dismissed this way. Oh, here we go. Like the, the, there's a, as opposed to arguing against her ideas, dismissing it outright. Right. And that, that does, that's not productive at all. Uh, she may be wrong in a lot of things, but like laying out some arguments, even if they're basic human arguments, uh, that's, that's where we arrive at the wisdom. I love that. Uh, is there something um, deeper to be said about our trust in institutions and governments and so on that has to do with UFOs? That there, there's a kind of suspicion that the US government and governments in general are hiding stuff from us uh, when you talk about UFOs. This is my view on that. If we declassified everything, I think we would find a lot more evidence all pointing toward the same puzzle. There aren't some alien men being held underground. Yes. There's not some secret file that lays out whatever is happening. I think the real lesson about government is government cannot bring itself to any new belief on this matter mm -hmm. of any kind. And it's a kind of funny inertia. Like government is deeply puzzled. They're more puzzled than they want to admit to us, which like, I, I'm okay with that actually. They shouldn't just be out panicking people in the streets. <laughs> But at the end of the day, it's a bit like approving the AstraZeneca vaccine, yeah. like which does work and they haven't approved it. Like, when are they going to do it? Like, when is our government actually, if only internally, going to take this more than just seriously, but like take it truly seriously? Yeah. And I just don't know if we have that capability kind of mentally to sound like Eric Weinstein for a, another <laughs> moment. <laughs> To, to stay on the same topic, although on the surface shifting completely, uh, because it is all the same topic. You have written and studied art. So, okay, so so here's another point. So this is again, these are a little bit mind twisting in some ways, but but yeah. the 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 um um okay, another thing that's sort of we know from computation is this idea of computation universality. The fact that given that we have a program that runs on one kind of computer, we can as well you know, we can convert it to run on any other kind of computer. We can emulate one kind of computer with another. So that might lead you to say, well, you think you have the rule for the universe, but you might as well be running it on a Turing machine because we know we can emulate any computational rule on any kind of machine. And that's essentially the same thing that's being said here. That is that what we're doing is we're saying um, these different interpretations of physics corresponds to essentially running physics on different underlying, you know, thinking about the physics as running in different with different underlying rules as if different underlying computers were running them. And but the, because of computation universality, or more accurately, because of this principle of computational equivalence thing of mine, there's that there, they are, um, these things are ultimately equivalent. So the only thing that is the ultimate fact about the universe the ultimate fact that doesn't depend on any of these, you know, we don't have to talk about specific rules, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The ultimate fact is the universe is computational and it is the the things that happen in the universe are the kinds of computations that the principle of computational equivalence says should happen. Now, that might sound like uh, you're not really saying anything there, but you are because you, can, you could in principle have a hypercomputer that things that take an ordinary computer an infinite time to do, the hypercomputer can just say, oh, I know the answer. Mm -hmm. It's this immediately. What this is saying is the universe is not a hypercomputer. It's not simpler than a, an ordinary Turing machine type computer. It's exactly like an ordinary Turing machine type computer. And so that's, the, that's in the end, the sort of net net conclusion is that's the thing that is the sort of the hard immovable fact about the universe 
that's sort of the, the fundamental principle of the universe is that it is computational and not hypercomputational and not sort of infracomputational. It is this level of computational ability. And it's um, and it kind of has, and that's sort of the, the, the core fact. But now, you know, this, this idea that you can have these different kind of uh, rural reference frames, these different description languages for the universe, it, it makes me, you know, I, I used to think, okay, you know, imagine the aliens, imagine the extraterrestrial intelligence thing, you know, at least they experience the same physics. Right. And now I've realized it isn't true. They, they could have a different royal frame. That's, yeah, that's fascinating. The, the, they can end up with a, 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 a description of the universe that is utterly, utterly incoherent with ours. Yeah. And, and that's also interesting in terms of how we think about, well, intelligence, the nature of intelligence and so on. You know, I'm, I'm fond of the quote, you know, the weather has a mind of its own because <laughs> these are, you know, these are sort of computationally, that, that system is computationally equivalent to the system that is our brains and so on. And what's different is we don't have a way to understand, you know, what the weather is trying to do, so to speak. We have a story about what's happening in our brains. We don't have a sort of connection to what's happening there. So we actually, it's funny, last time we talked, maybe over a year ago, uh, we talked about how it was more based on your work with Arrival. Uh, we talked about how would we communicate with alien intelligences. Can you maybe comment on how we might, how the Wolfram Physics Project changed your view, how we might be able to communicate with alien intelligence? Like if they showed up, is it possible that because of our com comprehension of the physics of the world might be completely different, we would okay, just so, not so be able to communicate it, at here's all? The, here's, the, here's the thing, you know, intelligence is everywhere. The fact, this idea that there's this notion of, oh, there's going to be this amazing extraterrestrial intelligence and it's going to be this unique thing, it's just not true. It's the same thing. You know, I, I think people will realize this at about the time when people decide that artificial intelligences are kind of just natural things that are like human intelligences. They'll realize that, that extraterrestrial intelligences or intelligences associated with physical systems and so on it's all the same kind of thing. It's ultimately the, computation. It's all the same. It's all just computation. And the issue is, can you, are you sort of inside it? Are you, are you thinking about it? Do you have sort of a story you're telling yourself about it? And, you know, the weather could have a story it's telling itself about what it's doing. We just, it's utterly incoherent with the stories that we tell ourselves based on how our brains work. I mean, ultimately, it must be a, a question whether we can align exactly align exactly. with the kind of intelligence right 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 so and there's then a the systematic question, way of doing it right so the question is in the space of all possible intelligences what's the how do you think about the distance between description languages yeah. for one intelligence versus another and needless to say i have thought about this and uh, um you know i i don't i don't have a great answer yet but but i think that's a that's a thing where there will be things that can be said and there'll be things that where you can sort of start to characterize you know, what is the translation distance between this, you know, version of the universe or this, you know, kind of set of computational rules and this other one? In fact, okay, so this is a, uh, you know, there's this idea of algorithmic information theory. There's this question of sort of what is the, uh, when you have some something, what is the sort of shortest description you can make of it where that description could be saying, run this program to get the thing, mm -hmm. Right. So I'm pretty sure that that the um, uh, that there will be a physicalization of the idea of algorithmic information, and that okay, this is again a little bit bizarre. But so I mentioned that there's the speed of light, maximum speed of information transmission in physical space. Mm -hmm. There's a maximum speed of information transmission in branchial space, which is a maximum entanglement speed. There's a maximum speed of information transmission in ruleal space, which is, has to do with a maximum speed of translation between different uh, description languages. And again, I'm I'm not fully wrapped my brain around this one. Yeah, that one uh, just blows my mind to think about that. But that starts getting closer to the, yeah, the it's kind the, of a the intelligence. Right. It, it's a and it's also a physicalization of 
of algorithmic information. And I think there's probably a connection between, I mean, there's probably a connection between the notion of energy and some of these things, which again, I, I you know, hadn't seen all this coming. I, I've always been a little bit resistant to the idea of connecting physical energy to things in, in, in computation theory, but I think that's probably coming. And that's what essentially at the core what the, the physics project is, that you're connecting information theory with well, it's, physics. Yeah, it's computation and computation. And, yeah, with right. I mean, our physical universe. Yeah, right. I mean, the fact that Explicit. our physical universe is is right that we can think of it as a computation, and that we can have discussions like, you know, the theory of the physical universe is the same kind of a theory as the p versus mp problem, and so on, is is really, uh, you know, I think that's really interesting, and and the fact that well. Uh, okay, so this this kind of g brings me to one one more thing that I have to, in terms of this sort of unification of, yeah. of different ideas, which is metamathematics. I hope. But let me ask you a question. I asked this of him and Sarah on a clubhouse once. So what do you think would happen the next day? Let's say we discover life. It's Proxima Centauri B. It's, um, it looks just like slime mold, like you got on your, you know, brie cheese or whatever. We discover it. What would happen the next day? And they were like, oh, this would be transformative. And, and, and I'm not trying to be like, you know, total Cassandra about this. But I said, I don't think anything would happen. And they're like, what are you talking about? It would be transformational. I'm like, I stipulate that life exists. Go down to like the river. You know, I'm in San Diego. Go down to the Pacific Ocean. Scoop up a glass. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you're going to find life in there. And what are we doing? What are we doing to our earth? We're destroying it callously. We're like pumping crap into there. Like we have this toxic waste spill a couple of months ago in San Diego. I couldn't go to the beach. What, what, let me take it a step further. You know how many, well, you know how many people, I'm sorry that you do know, but how many people died in the 20th century? Killed. These are advanced civils. This isn't a slime mold. We kill, we maim, we harm, we hurt, we hate. I don't think anything would happen the next day. Then we go back to what we had. And I said, if that weren't proof enough, life has been discovered at least two or three times just in my professional career. Once in 1996, these Allen Land Hills meteorites in Antarctica, this, so like microbial respiration processes. Still, we don't know. It was a press conference held by Bill Clinton on the White House lawn that's featured in the movie Contact. Um, we purpose for that movie. And um, and then there's uh, and then there's this um, the, this phosphorus life this this the toxic life in the pools of Mono Lake many you know extremophile we don't give a crap we continue to so why are we thinking that like our salvation from whence will our salvation come as the Bible says <laughs> like it's not going to change how we are it's not going to magnify how I treat you or you treat me and and we're pretty knowledgeable people you and i compared to you know lay people uh, okay that's interesting that's a really interesting argument i i wonder if you're right but I, my intuition is uh, i can i can maybe present a different argument that you can think about in the realm of things you care about even deeper which is like what happens once we figure out the origins of the universe like how would that change your life i yeah. would I, I would say there are certain discoveries that even in their very idea will change the fabric of society. I tend to see if there's definitive proof that there's life, and the more complex, the more powerful that uh, idea is no, elsewhere, that I'm not exactly sure how it will change society um, because it's such a slap in the face. <laughs> it's like a, such a humbling force, or maybe not, or maybe it's a motivator to say, um, yeah, I don't know which force would take over. Maybe it would be governments with military uh, start to think like, well, how, how do we kill it? <laughs> if there's a lot of life out there, how do we create the defense systems? How do we extract it? Or, or yeah, or, yeah, or yeah. mine it for mm -hmm. uh, for benefits. All those, I mean, I just see like uh, there's a hundred million literal counterexamples of that. I mean, right now there's like, like 700 million kids in poverty and like, we just, how do we go about our life and just not deal with that? I mean, I look, I put it aside. I eat hamburgers and, I, you know, in a hundred years I'll be canceled for being a, you know, a carnivore or whatever. But, you know, so obviously to get through life, you have to make certain compromise. You're not going to think about certain things. But I, I, I just think there is a sort of wish fulfillment. Like every time there's water, why are we going to Mars and digging and flying this cool ass helicopter? I'm, mm -hmm. We're looking for water. Like stipulate that water was there. Like, I believe there was water. I think we should investigate and see what the geology was like. But but don't you think, so, so you're saying- but Don't think you're going to get meaning from it. That's all I'm saying. I, I, I'm not saying it's not worth doing. I'm, I'm just saying there's a wish fulfillment aspect that people will find meaning for life 
from science. Okay, but there's a there's a complicated line here. What what, what if it's this intelligent civilization living, obviously probably not on Mars, but somewhere like uh, in a neighboring galaxy that we uh, sorry in 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 a name in a neighboring star system star system that we discover. Don't you think that had a profound change in meaning? I mean, I guess, again, I assume that because of this panspermic process or whatever, that the probability is much, much greater than zero. I mean, it's not one, 100%, but it's it's much likelier than not that at least some living material from Earth has ejaculated itself into the solar system, into the universe, right? Into our galaxy. Beep that, please. <laughs> <laughs> As well. That's right. So I, like... The fact that that could happen and that you're holding a piece, you know, from a planetary body, one that couldn't support life as far as we know, uh, but I could get next time if, if you, if you, if you play nice and you come on my podcast someday, I will give you a tiny chunk of Mars. So Mars theoretically could support stuff, right? Moving on up. So yeah, so I believe that there's there could be remnants of Earth in this. So so that means there could be evolution. I don't think there's any chance that there's like you know people using iPhones and having podcasts and stuff in at Proxima no, there's, Centauri. There's so much some chance though, right? So, uh, so again, it, it, yeah. it's, I it's, think the pro well, obviously the simple statement to say it's much, much, much higher probability that life exists than technological life exists. Right. I don't think we can argue that. Um, it doesn't mean it's forbidden. Again, I'm not saying any of this is forbidden, not worth studying, yeah, not interesting. It's, it's a likelihood thing. Yeah. And to answer your, I think you're w wise to push back and like, what does it matter what I'm doing? And I like to think about that, you know, let me ask you the most absurd question of all that you did not sign up for, but it's especially, I've been hanging out with a guy named Joe Rogan recently. Sure. So it's very important um, for, for, me, for me and him to figure this out. If a president, because you said, you implied the president is very powerful. If a president shows up and, and the US government is in fact in possession of aliens, alien spacecraft, do you think the president will be told a more responsible adult historian question version of that is, uh, is there some things that the machine of government keeps secret from the president or is the president ultimately at the very center? So if you like map out the set of information and power, you have, you have like CIA, you have all these organizations that like, that do the, um, the machinery of government, not just like the passing of bills, but like, uh, gaining information, uh, homeland security, uh, actually like engaging in wars, you know, all those kinds of things. Uh, how central is the president? Would the president know some of the shady things that are going on? A aliens or some kind of cybersecurity stuff against Russia and China, all those kinds of things. Is the president really made aware? And how, if so, how nervous does that make you? So um, presidents, like leaders of any complex organizations, uh, don't know everything that goes on. Uh, they have to ask the right questions. This is Machiavelli. Most important thing a leader has to do is ask the right questions. You don't have to know the answers. That's why you hire smart people, but you have to ask the right questions. So if the president asks uh, the US government, those who are responsible for the aliens or responsible for the cyber warfare against Russia, they will answer honestly, they will have to. Um, but they will not volunteer that information in all cases. So the best way a president can operate is to have people around him or her who are not the traditional policymakers. This is where I think academic experts are important, suggesting questions to ask to therefore try to get the information. It makes me nervous because I think human nature is such that the, uh, the academics, the experts, everybody, is almost afraid to ask the questions for which the answers might uh, be burdensome. Yes, and so that's the, right. And, and you can get into a lot of trouble not asking, it's the old elephant in the room. <laughs> Correct. Correct. You, 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 this is exactly right. And too often, mediocre leaders and those who try to protect them try to shield themselves. They don't want to know certain things. So this is part of what happened with the use of torture by the United States, which is a war crime, um, during the war on terror. Uh, President Bush, at times, intentionally did not ask, and people around him prevented him from asking or discouraged him from asking questions he should have asked to know about what was going on. And that's how we ended up where we did. Uh, you could say the same thing about Reagan and Iran-Contra. 
I wonder what it takes to be the kind of leader that steps in and asks some difficult questions. So aliens is one, UFO spacecraft, right? Another one, yeah, torture is another one. The CIA, how much information is being collected about Americans? I can see as a president being very uncomfortable asking that question. Because if the answer is a lot of information is being collected by of Americans, then you have to be the guy who lives with that information. For the rest of your life, you have to walk around. You're probably not going to reform that system. It's very difficult. You have to. You probably have to be very picky about which things you reform. You don't have much time. It takes a lot of sort of effort to restructure things. But you nevertheless would have to be basically lying to uh, to the you know to to your, to yourself to others around you about the unethical things. Depends, of course, what your uh, the, the ethical system is. I wonder what it takes to ask those hard questions. I wonder if how few of us are can be great leaders like that. And I wonder if our political system, the electoral system, is such that makes it likely that such leaders will come to power. It's hard and you can't ask all the right questions and there is a legal hazard if you know things at certain times. But I think you can, back to your point on hiring, you can hire people who will do that in their domains. And then you have to trust that when they think it's something that's a question you need to ask, they'll pass that on to you. Uh, this is why it's not a good idea to have loyalists because loyalists will shield you from things. It's a good idea to have people of integrity uh, who you can rely on and who you think will ask those right questions and then pass that down through their organization. Yes. Is there some broader understanding of how we should think about alien intelligences than um, like little green men? Yes. That uh, that you can maybe elaborate on mm -hmm. and talk about? Yes. This comes directly out of my research in Catholic history. What I found was that, let's take, for instance, this idea of an angel. Okay, so we all think we know what an angel looks like. Why? Well, we've been told what an angel looks like. We see what an angel looks like. Uh, throughout history, people have painted angels, and they all look pretty much the same. Um, but actually, if you go to the primary sources on, you know, either in Hebrew or in Greek or, you know, in whatever language and in Latin, and you look at experiences that people have di talked about, you know, where they've written down their experiences about angels, um, Angels don't at all look like what we think. They they don't look like little cherubs with wings. They don't look like tall, you know, strong, anthropomorphic, you know, human-looking things. They don't. They look really weird. And sometimes they don't look at all a humanoid. Mm -hmm. um, they look like strange spinning things, right, with mm -hmm. like, you know, eyes and things like that. They they communicate telepathically with us. Okay, so what does that mean for the idea of, of extraterrestrials or what we consider to be aliens? Like, um, I do think that there, first, if we are, if, listen, it's, I'm not the first to say this. If we're in contact with non-human intelligence, we're most likely in contact with its technology. Because think about us. Um, do we send human beings to Mars yet? Some people would say yes, but let's put that aside. Yeah. So no, we don't. We use our technology. We send our rovers to Mars. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if there's an extraterrestrial civilization, is it sending, are they coming by themselves? Are they coming to see us or are they sending their technology? Most likely they either are technology or or they are sending their technology. Yeah, there might be a gray area between what is technology and what the aliens are. Yeah. So, but you're saying like uh, basically a robotic probe that would be the equivalent of us, our human civilization created technology. Way more, m way more uh, advanced than what we could believe to be a probe. All right. <laughs> it's kind of funny to think about like if uh, whatever a, a sort of. Uh, extraterrestrial creations have visited earth that we're we're interacting with some like dumb crappy drone technology. yeah it's true <laughs> <laughs> and we're like like <laughs> we're, we're like building these like myths and so on from like an experience with yes. some like crappy drone yeah. made by uh -huh. some crappy startup somewhere that is correct <laughs>
<laughs> when the actual intelligence is like something that m much grander. Um, yeah, that's, that's that's the more likely uh, situation. That is <laughs> that's correct. what I like to tell people. I'm like, no, it's probably a lot weirder than you think. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. So, uh, another, but, another... but what forms can it possibly take? So, yeah, like, okay. I, I really love this idea that. Um, I tend to be humble in the face of all the, that we don't know. And I tend to believe that the form alien life forms would take and the way they would communicate is much more likely to be of a form that we can't even comprehend or perhaps can't even perceive directly. So like, you know, uh, it could be in the space of, you know, we don't understand most of what, how our mind works. It could be in the space of whatever the heck consciousness is. Like maybe consciousness itself is communication uh, with aliens or like, I don't know. Uh, it could be just our own thoughts is actually the alien life forms communicating. Like, I, I know all that sounds crazy, but I'm saying like, I'm just trying to come up with the craziest possible thing that doesn't make any sense. That could very well be true. And you can't say it's not true because we don't understand basically anything about our mind. So it could be all of those things, uh, everything from hallucinations, all the things that are explored through, uh, through the different drugs uh, that we've uh, talked about in this podcast in general, Joe Rogan loves to talk about DMT and all those kinds of hallucinogenic drugs, all of it, including love and fear, all those things that could be aliens communicating with us, memes on the internet that could be, I'm pretty sure humor is alien communication. No, I don't know. But uh, so is there some way that's helpful for you to think about beyond the little green men Oh, absolutely. It um, it accords exactly with how I think, actually. Um, so I'll explain. Um, I liked in American Cosmic, I attained the status of full professor. So I was like, okay, I can pretty much write this book like I want to do it. And I did. So I used a lot of quotes from cool artists like David Bowie. Okay. So David Bowie opens the book. Okay. And he basically says, and so does Nietzsche, by the way, David Bowie and Nietzsche Boom, two two awesome quotes right together. That's how I opened no my book. No better opener. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember the quotes? Yeah, of course. So the first, the quote by David Bowie, and that's what I'm going to concentrate on in response to what you just said, which I think is absolutely correct. Um, David Bowie said the internet is an alien life form. Okay. And if you've not seen David Bowie's interview where he says that, I highly recommend it. He's so brilliant. Okay. So David Bowie is actually quite brilliant about the idea of UFOs. He's also brilliant about the idea of technology, okay? And most people wouldn't think that, but I mean, he's pretty darn smart, <laughs> yeah. okay? So, all right. So I started to think about it. And uh, I also, early on in my research, met Jacques Vallée, okay? So he's a technologist. Uh, he has a PhD in information technology from computer science, basically, from Northwestern. And he got that back in the day. You know, when yeah. I say back in the day, I'm not talking a thousand years ago. I'm talking like in the 60s, okay? So he's- Back when computer science wasn't really even the field yeah, that wasn't you can get a, a degree in. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he has a PhD in it. And he's French. He's from France, but he lives in Silicon Valley. And he worked on ARPANET, which is the proto-internet. Yeah. Uh, he mapped Mars. He's also an astronomer. I mean, he's just this all-around brilliant guy, right? Yeah. And he's also interested in UFOs. And most people take those two interests of his as separate interests. And I remember being at a very small conference and listening to him, uh, being in awe, of course, because he's an awe-inspiring person. And then thinking, wait a minute, why do people compartmentalize those two things about him? They're one and the same. Okay, so when we talk about UFOs and UAPs and stuff, we have to talk about digital technology and things like that. Now, if we are going back to what I so if I were to say what if I were to believe in and I like I said earlier, I was agnostic bordering on belief, most likely a believer in these this extraterrestrial or not extraterrestrial. Let me put it another way. Non-human intelligence that's communicating with us. I'm going to tell you how I think they communicate with us. Mm -hmm. And I go back to the Greeks again. Okay. And the Greeks had this idea of muses, you know, the muses. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So there are these things called muses and we tend to think of them as metaphors, right? But what if they're not? What if they're actually 
non-human intelligence trying to communicate with us, but we're so stupid. We can't like understand. Like, so only people with like, you know, in super amazing um, capacities, like poetic, creative, you know, intelligent, mathematical, whatever, you know, because they tend to do this symbolically. They tend to communicate with us in symbols form. And so music, you know, symbols, we've got math that are, you know, it's a symbolic language. And so what, so, okay, so muses are probably a good idea for me of what this would be. Now, would muses have spaceships, you know, or those things that we call physical counterparts to what they are? Um, that's another question altogether. But if, you know, I, I, now, why would I think this? Because. So let's take a step back to uh, Roswell. We talked about it a little bit. What's your sense about that whole time? Uh, Roswell and just Area 51 and um, the sightings and also the follow on mythology around those sightings. Um, of that's with us today. All right. So <laughs> where do I get started? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it is a mythology here, right? The mythology of Roswell, it's it's very religious like in the sense that it, there's a pilgrimage to Roswell people make and they go to there's a festival there as well, like a religious festival. Um you can get little kitschy stuff like you can get at a religious festival there. So it's very much like a place of pilgrimage where a hierophany occurred and a hierophany is basically contact with non-human intelligence, okay? So non-human intelligence is thought to have contacted humans or crashed at this place in Roswell, New Mexico. Now, what's fascinating is that I begin my book by going out to a crash site in New Mexico. Um, I have to get blindfolded with um, my, well, to tell you the truth, the story is that I'm with Tyler, who's an invisible and he wants to show me a place in New Mexico where a crash happened. And he says that he thinks that I need to see physical evidence because I don't believe. And so I said, I'll go, but I'm going to bring a friend of mine. And he said, no, you have to go alone. He goes, it's a, it's a place that is on government-owned property, and it's a no-fly zone. And when you go, you'll be blindfolded. And I said, I definitely need to bring a friend. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, well, who do you want to bring? I just had met this university scientist who's very well known, and I call him James in my book. And I asked, and I had a feeling James would definitely want to do this. And I asked James and he said, I'll go tomorrow. Okay. So I suggested this to Tyler and Tyler said, absolutely not, you know. And I thought, mm, I know he's going to look up James and he's going to say yes. Because if anybody can figure out what this material is that you're going to go look for, it's going to be James. He has the instruments. And so Tyler did, in fact, look him up and finally said, OK, I got you can go. So we both head out there and we get blindfolded. And Tyler takes us out there. It takes about 40 minutes um, outside of a certain place in New Mexico. So in terms of Roswell, this is what I can say is that. According to Tyler, there were about seven crashes out in the 1940s in New Mexico in, in various places. Um, we went to one of them, according to Tyler. I, at the time, I was completely an atheist with regard to anything that had to do with the UFOs. So we were out there. We had specially configured um, metal detectors for these metals. And we did find these, okay? And um, they've since been studied by various scientists, material scientists, so forth. And um, I believe Jacques talked about not those particular ones, but others on the Joe Rogan show. Mm -hmm. um, there are no anomalies. So there are, we uh, scientists don't, I'm, a, I'm not a scientist, so I can't weigh in on whether, I just, I just believe the people, these people, I believe, because they're well-known scientists. What do you mean they're not anomalies? So the, no, they are non. Oh. They are non anomalous. Oh, anomalous in terms of the materials that are uh, naturally occurring on Earth. Yes. Okay, so that so there's some kind of inklings of evidence that uh, that something happened in Roswell in terms of crashes of alien technology. Now, what else is there to the mythology? So there's some, some okay. crashes, right. right? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of epic. <laughs> it's whatever. pretty epic, yeah. <laughs> and uh, w w what else? Like what, um, 
what are we supposed to take away from this? I mean, right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it's weird. Okay. So um, there's this. Okay. So in religious studies, like I said, we call it a hierophany, which is the meeting of a non-human intelligent thing, whatever it is, an angel, a god, whatever, a goddess, with or an alien with humans. And that's the place. Okay. So the place is New Mexico. Mm -hmm. So we, so New Mexico becomes folded into the mythology of this new religion is what I call a new type of religion um, of the UFO. And it becomes ground zero for this new mythology. Just like Mecca is the, is the place where Muslims go, they have to go, right? At least once in their lives. It's a pilgrimage place now. So this is, so in my book, that's how I, I tell it. Now, what about Roswell in the public imagination? Um, obviously, according to Annie Jacobson, who's good, you know, she's a great author, um, investigative journalist. She's written about Roswell too. I don't agree with all of what she comes up with, but part of it is that there's a lot of military stuff going on there that is classified and there's a reason why you can't get in and nor would you want to, right? So, um, so there's a lot of experimentation going on there. Um, I don't believe that it has to do with ETs, frankly, but in the imaginations of Americans, Roswell is that place, but I went to a different place and apparently there are several places in New Mexico. Now, strangely enough, I travel back to New Mexico at the very end chapter of my book, but it's not, it's, I don't, I don't go there physically. I go there through the story of a Catholic a uh, nun who actually believes that she bilocated to New Mexico mm. uh, in the, gosh, in the 1600s. So she, yeah, it was very strange. And I was at the Vatican at the Space Observatory when I made that connection that she probably went to the very, well, she believed she went to this very place that I had gone. <laughs> can you uh, can you elaborate on a little bit? Like, what does it mean to go to that place? So for the, her? The, yeah, yeah, for for her. I mean, so we're kind of um breaking down the barrier between what it means to be in a place and time. <laughs> right? right. I agree with you. Uh this is the field of religious studies. So, and again, I don't say it's true in my book. I just say it's a very strange coincidence yeah. that I'm at the Vatican Observatory. In fact, I'd finished my book. But while I was at the Vatican Observatory, I was there with Tyler, and we were looking at the records. The can they're called the trial records, but they're the canonization records of these two saints. Yeah. Each was said to have done amazing things. One was Joseph of Cupertino, who levitated. Okay, or is said to have levitated. The other was Maria of Agreda from Spain. They're contemporaries in the 1600s who was said to have been able to bilocate, which is to be in two places at once. Okay. So this is a belief in Catholicism that certain very holy people can do these kinds of things like levitate, which by the way is also associated with UFO abductions. You know, people get levitated out of their beds and things like that. So we were sent there um, by a billionaire who was interested in levitation and bilocation. And since I could get in to the Vatican, and I knew the director of the Vatican Observatory, both Tyler and I were able to go to the secret archives and look at the canonization records, and then go to Castle Gandolfo, which is about an hour from the Vatican, where the first observatory, the space observatory of the Vatican is. The second one is in Arizona, and it has a much larger telescope. So we went, and we... and. Brother Guy gave me the keys to the archive. I said, look at anything you want. And I got to see a lot of stuff by Sar Carl Sagan, by the way. I know you talked oh, about, right. yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> so they have a whole section on extraterrestrial, the search for extraterrestrial life. And they don't, by the way. How awesome is that? It was awesome, <laughs> yeah. So we got to stay there. They have a scholar's quarters. Yeah. And so they had two. And so Tyler stayed in one and I stayed in the other. And <laughs> Brother Guy probably shouldn't have been so nice to me and given me the... um the keys, because I, I, when I got home, we were there for two weeks. When I got home, I got this frantic phone call from him. And he basically said, Diana, he goes, do you remember where you put the, the original Kepler? And so I had this Kepler, right? Yeah. And so I misplaced it. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, uh, I, I remembered great. where it went. I yeah. was like, oh gosh, I, thank goodness I found it. But he'll probably change the rules of the Vatican <laughs> Observatory after my visit. So Maria is, um, she's actually in the history of uh, our country in that 
she first wrote a cosmography of um, what she said was the spinning earth. And this was in the 1600s. And she that's her first book. And she wrote that. And then she said that she was transported on the wings of angels to the new world. And she said that she met a, a culture of people and she um, basically told them about the faith of Catholicism. Okay. And then what happened was that the people that she, and she described the fauna, she described the people and everything like that. And so there were actually missionaries there. Mm -hmm. And when they went to try to um, convert some of the people who already lived there, um, apparently they already knew a, a bunch of stuff. And they said, how did you know all this stuff? And they said, uh, this lady in blue came and told us, and they said, did it look like this? And they showed them, they didn't, obviously didn't have a photograph, but they had a picture of a, a sister, a nun. And they said, yeah, they, she wore similar clothes, but she was much younger, right? And these guys were, you know, thought that was weird. But when they went back to Spain, they found that this woman had been doing that in her mind, had mm -hmm. been traveling I mean, I don't know what to make of it. There's so many things that are sort of uh, forcing you to kind of go outside of, um, you know, I'm, I'm of many minds. I have a very, most of my days spent with very rigorous scientific kind of things and even engineering kind of things. And then I'm also open-minded and just the, the entirety of the idea of extraterrestrial life forces you to think outside of uh, conventional boundaries of thought, scientific, current scientific thought. Let's put it that way. And your story right now is <laughs> certainly an example it's of that. It's freaking you out. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. That's, through American Cosmic and in general, you've interacted with much of the UFO community. You mentioned ufologists. By the way, is it ufologists or is it ufologists? It's ufologists. Ufologists. <laughs> yeah. So what, first of all, what is a ufologist? And second of all, um, what have you learned about this uh, community of ufologists, or also as you refer to them as uh, the invisibles, or the members of the invisible college, or just in general, people who study UFOs from the different, all, all the different kinds of groups that study UFOs? Sure. Generally, what I found is that they are, okay, so people who are interested in UFOs from like being a kid, you know, and seen some cool movie like Star Wars or something, and then they become interested and then they study it as best they can, UFOs or UAPs. They're generally an honest group of people who are using their tools. There are generally two types of them. Um, there are those who believe in the nuts and bolts, like the physical craft, and they believe in that these are things from other planets. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's like the E.T., H hypothesis, uh, you know. Um, H I'm H sorry, ET hypothesis. ETH is what ETH, we call it. Yeah, ETH. sorry about that. <laughs> so this is like there's an actual spaceship, like a phys like something akin, but much more advanced than the rockets we use now. Yeah. And uh, they have advanced so some yeah. kind of mm -hmm. not necessarily biological, but something like biological organisms that travel on these yes. spaceships. So this would be like what to the Stars Academy is trying to decipher like how, you know, how do they do it? You know, maybe we could use that technology, the propulsion and things like that. They look at the rocket technology. Yes. Okay, so there are those. And then there are people who believe that it's more consciousness based, mm -hmm. okay? So these are your two types of um, ufologists who are known. And these are people who we know about. Then I found that there are people who are quote unquote, I call them the invisibles because Jacques Vallée in the, in the 70s, he and um, I think actually Alan Hynek, his colleague, quoted uh, – this is a Francis Bacon thing, by the way. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the early modern time period when scientists could be killed for basically trying to go outside what the church or the mm -hmm. government institution determined was – dogma. And so they had to be really careful. So they call, he called it the Invisible College. So Hynek took that term and re reused it, or what do you call it? Um, repurposed it. Okay. So he repurposed it. So that they were still talking to each other, though. So what I found to be the case was that there was a group of people who were scientists, but were not on the internet. You know, to people today, and students of mine in particular, 
and my own kids, actually, they think that you only exist if you're on the internet <laughs> or something only exists if it's on the internet. Yeah. And that's, of course, untrue. And so what I found was that there are most people who are the most powerful people of our society and are doing things are not on the internet. You're not going to find any trace of them. So a lot of these people are what I call invisibles, people who are studying at least their work is invisible. You might find them on the internet, but you're going to find that they're part of the bowling league or something like that, right? You right. will not find that they are actually engaged in research ab about this topic, okay? And so I called them the invisibles because I was surprised to find them. And I thought, well, this is no longer the invisible college because these people are not even talking to each other. And that's why I reference this um, movie Fight Club. In it, you have and invisible, okay? And his name is Tyler Durden. And he's incredible. He does incredible things. Um, he's like a person who should not exist, right? Because he does so many things that are amazing. And so I found a person like that and I call, and he's a real person. Um, he's partially on the internet, but nothing that he does around that topic of UFOs is on the internet. So I decided to call him Tyler D after Tyler Durden. And so these people, I, um, I've termed the UFO Fight Club because they work together, but they don't know. In fact, his boss doesn't know what he does. They don't talk to each other because, you know, the first rule of Fight Club. Same as the second. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you don't talk about <laughs> No, you don't do it. Why do you have a sense that um, there's such a, um, I don't want to say fear, but a principle of staying out of the limelight? I think there's something real, and I think that the use of it could be um, dangerous for people. Oh, sorry. You mean like something real, like there's actual technology? I don't know. What's the right terminology yeah. here to use? Let's just call it alien technology, ideas about technology yes. that are being explored that are dangerous if made public that maybe become dangerous if yes. made public. So, so I wouldn't call word. you don't have to call it alien, alien technology. You can call it ideas about alien technology right. because I don't know if it's actual alien technology or not. I honestly don't know. But I do know for a fact, because it's a historical fact, that Jack Parsons and um, Konstantin Tchaikovsky, who's Russian, believed in these things and believed that they were downloading this information. Whether or not they were, I don't, I mean, they definitely created the rocket technologies. That's true. How they did and whether their process was exactly what they said it was, I don't know. So this is the same thing today. So we've got some powerful technologies going on here. And, you know, of course we have a military and we have a military for a reason. Every, almost every government who needs a military has one. Um, and so they're going to um, keep these the way they should be kept in my interpretation. I mean, think about it. Everybody accepts the fact that we have a military. Almost everybody does. Why are they so upset then that the military keeps secrets? Yeah, well, that's that's the nature of things. I mean, we can get into that whole thing. I, I, uh, I, I tend to, I've spoken with the CTO of Lockheed Martin on this. Um, I've obviously read and think about war a lot it's such a difficult question because this space this particular space of technology there's a gray area that i think is evolving over time i think nuclear weapons change the game in terms of what should and shouldn't be secret i think there's already technology that will enable us to destroy each other and so there's some sense in which some technology should be made public this is the same discussion of um you know, uh, between companies, which part of your technology should you make public through like, for example, academic publications and all that kind of stuff. Like how the Google search engine works, PageRank algorithm, or how the different deep learning, like there's pretty vibrant machine learning research communities within Google, Facebook, and so on. And they release a lot of different ideas. It's an interesting question, like, how dangerous is it to release some of the ideas? I think it's a gray area that's constantly uh, changing. I do also think it's super interesting. I wonder if you could elaborate on a little bit that there's this gray area between what's actually real in terms of alien technology and the belief of it when held in the minds of really brilliant people that they ultimately may produce the same kind of result in terms of being able to create new technologies 
that are human usable. Like, is there, um, in your mind, they're one and the same? Is like believing in alien craft and uh, actually being in possession of an alien craft? I don't think they're the same, no. Belief is powerful, okay? Um, in New Age communities, you know, people think thoughts are things, okay? That's been said. You know, thoughts are things. You can make them happen kind of thing. Believe in them enough. It is true that if I believe I can run a 540 mile, I'll do it, okay? And I probably will do it. And I've done it before, actually. Um much younger, but I did it. <laughs> so, but my coach is the one that instilled that belief in me, right? Yeah. And so, but can I run like a one minute mile? No. Okay. So I guess, does that answer your question? Like there's only so far belief goes in generating reality. Well, yeah. I mean, I guess that's what, uh, just having listened to Jacques Vallée, that it seemed like reality is not was not as important for the scientific exploration of the concept of alien technology. I could be wrong, but this is what I think Jacques is getting at. There are other ways to access places in reality other than what we consider to be physical. Right. That's this consciousness. Okay. So in, like I said, so religious studies is among other things, it's just, it's looking at visionary experiences All right. So people do have visionary experiences. They did without drugs. You know, they did with drugs. They do with drugs. They do. Many have them without drugs today. And oftentimes those visionary experiences um, correspond to each other. Now, how do we how do we make sense of that? So, you know, do these places actually exist? In a sense, I think they do. And so I think that, you know, like, let's take that very famous case of a Virgin Mary apparition in Fatima, where I think there was like a lot of people, thousands and thousands, if not like, I think 50,000 or something like that, a lot of people uh, gathered to see what's now called um, the miracle of Fatima, which was the spinning of the sun. Well, a lot of people saw different things, but they all saw some kind of thing. Okay. So they all saw different things, but it was uh, something happened. Okay. So I guess... The question is, um, what are these places where we access non, what I'd call like non-physical realities, Mm -hmm. okay? Where we actually do get information. We get, like who could say that Jack Parsons didn't get information from doing these rituals and accessing these? We have to say that he actually did because we see the results, the physical results. The same thing with Tyler. And that's why I put Tyler in this camp with this tradition with Jack Parsons, I say that Tyler is is getting these, what he calls downloads, and you can see the results of them physically. He sells them on the NASDAQ. He makes millions of dollars from them. He They help people. I've seen people who they've helped, okay? But um, it'd be interesting to get your opinions on certain more concrete sightings that are sort of monumental sightings with alien intelligences um, in the history, in the recent history that I, at least I'm aware of. I'm, I'm not uh, very much aware of, of this history, but the most recent one, I've spoken with David Fravor on this podcast. I really like him as a person. He's a, he's a fun guy, but also he's gotten a chance to, um, he's described his account of having experience with the, what he and others now term the Tic Tac UFO. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you think of that particular sighting, which has captivated the imagination of many in particular because there's been videos released of it? Yes. Of these UFOs, but I find the videos to be way too blurry and grainy to be of interest to me. The Personally, uh, to me, the most fascinating thing is the first person account from David and others about that experience. But what, what are your thoughts? Those videos have been out for a while, actually, much. I think in the uh, mid 2000s, they were out. But what you have is you have kind of like this corroboration from a group and also the New York Times involvement in 2017. My opinion about the Tic Tacs is that um, first, I believe the people who have had the experiences, I know some of them, like, you know, some of the radar people and things like that, they saw them. And they're not, I don't believe they're making it up. Okay. Um, I do think that this is being this 
is being used uh, as a spin, okay? And I'm just going to say that. And the reason I think that is this is because at the time it was released, I was still in touch with many people who were among the UFO Fight Club. And so they had intimate knowledge of these things. And the first thing they said was, um, we have satellites that can read the news on your phone when you're reading it. So we've got better footage than this, and this is not good footage at all. Therefore, they believe that it was authentic footage that had been doctored up. Now, why? <laughs> I don't know why. Um, so I so I honestly don't know if it's accurate or not. I mean, I believe the people, absolutely. But was this something out there to fool these people? Perhaps. I don't know. Um, is it spun? Um, the people who I know who are part of the UFO Fight Club believed it was real, okay, and said, this is badly done, but real, <laughs> okay? I see. But so there's some kind of, when you say spinning, there's some parties involved that oh, yeah, there's are trying to policy. leverage it yeah. from yeah. the- For funds, probably. For, for funds, for financial interests. Yeah, I think so. Nevertheless, it has inspired- a conversation and just a lot of people in the world that um, there's something mysterious out there that uh, we're not fully informed about. And I was certainly grateful that the New York Times ran the story right before my book came out. <laughs> well, see, but there's the financial interest that to me as a person who uh, doesn't give a damn about money, actually, I don't like money, uh, is... Um, except for when it's used in the, in the context of a company to build cool things. But like personally, I don't know, I find the financial interest uh, side off-putting, um, especially when we're talking about the exploration of some of the most, like money is a silly creation of human beings. I agree. <laughs> and it's, it's <laughs> yeah. uh, used to provide uh, temporary, like uh, the unfortunate thing with money is that it, um, helps you buy things that too easily allow you to forget the important things in life and also to forget the difficult aspects of life, to do the difficult intellectual work of being cognizant of your mortality, of like fully engaging in life, in a life of reason too, of thinking deeply about the world, all those kinds of things. If you get like a nice car or something like that and just like, I don't know, all, all the different things you could do with money is you, it can make you forget that. Anyway, as a, there's a long way to say that, yes, yes, it's very nice that it coincided nicely with the book, <laughs> but also it, uh, I think it, I mean, like I said, I think it inspired quite a lot of people that, you know, maybe there's a lot of things out there that were, like it reminded a lot of people, there's things out there we don't know about. Lex, I can agree with you on that. But can I push back on two things? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's do it. All right. The first one is that I was happy to receive money from the book because of the New York Times article. That's absolutely false. Right. So I published my book with Oxford, which is an academic press, and you don't get paid with an academic yeah. press. Okay. So money was not it for me. What it was was recognition that my research was right. being validated. So, you know, because then people called me and said, well, maybe it's more than interesting. Okay. And they right. did. Okay. The other thing about money is just as you say that now I agree with you there, I'm upset about money too. I think there should be universal health care, uh, a universal income. All, you know, I don't think people should be in poverty, especially because we are so wealthy as a species, frankly. Um, okay. That said, think about this. If you are, if you don't have money, you can't have a life of the mind either. Right, one hundred percent. So I'm not espousing that like money is the devil. I just think that there is money can be um, a drug, or I would compare it to like food or something like that, where like you really should have enough to nourish yourself. Yes. Right, and uh, too much could and yeah. too much can be a huge problem. Uh, yeah. So that that that's where I come from with money, and I'm just uh, aware. I'm fortunate enough to have the skills and the health to be able to earn a living in whatever way, uh, like I wish of having being in the United States and being able to speak English. So at the very least, I could work at McDonald's, and my standards are. I told Joe, I made the mistake. I told Joe Rogan that I've always had a few money. And people are like, oh, Lex was always rich. No, no, no. I was always broke. What I mean by 
uh, I've always had a few monies. <laughs> My standard <laughs> of what it takes to have a few is, is always very little. I'm just happy with, with very little. But yes, it's true that uh, money for many people and including for myself, it's just a different level for different people, mm -hmm. is freedom. Yes, absolutely. Freedom to think, yeah. freedom to do, to pursue your passions. It just so happens, I am very fortunate that many of my passions often come with a salary, if I wished. Right. So like, everything, <laughs> like I, me, I love programming. So even just like working as a like basic level software engineer would be a source of a lot of joy for me. And that happens in this modern model modern world to come with a salary. Yeah. So yeah, is is definitely true. I just mean that it's, it can be, become a dangerous drug. So I'm glad I'm glad you are in this pursuit that you are in for the love of knowledge. And uh, but it's true. Yeah, uh, so people should definitely buy your book. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be making money off of it. <laughs> oh yeah, this rocks. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Maybe uh, my next book. <laughs> yes. You, you, yeah, your sense is there's something as there's some groups of people that may be trying to leverage this for financial gains. And, uh, you know, probably good financial. I mean, nice. they may have good reasons for this, too. Like, OK, let's take the study of UFOs. OK, maybe many people in government that decide who dole out the money, let's put it that way, they think UFOs aren't real. So they're not going to give these programs money. So how do these programs make money? Um, they're going to have to find a way to do it. So maybe yeah. that's how they do it. OK, so I. That's fascinating. This is a way to raise money for for doing for the science, research yeah research, i think yeah. so can i ask you uh, a question on propulsion that's a little bit more out there so i don't know if you've uh, seen quite a a lot out of recent articles and reports and so on about uh ufos mm. like the tic tac aircraft i keep seeing a lot of chatter about it but i haven't gone deep into it so the DOD released footage filmed by um, pilots, and there's a lot of reports about objects that moved in ways they haven't seen before that seem to uh, defy the laws of physics if we consider the aircraft that we have today. And so th the reason I asked you that is because it kind of, um, to me, whatever the heck it is, it's inspiring for the possibilities of uh, ideas for propulsion. Mm, mm -hmm. If it's like um, secret projects from foreign nations or it's physical phenomena that we don't yet understand, like ball lightning, all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Or if it is aliens or objects from an alien civilization, I most likely believe it's for, if it's an object from an alien civilization, it's gotta be like a really dumb drone. They just like yeah. got lost. It's, it's <laughs> definitely not yeah. like the pinnacle of intelligence. It's like some like teenagers, like uh, science like, fair experiment. Yeah, it just yeah. flew for yeah. for a few centuries out and just landed. And then we humans are all like really excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, uh, this wild thing. I mean, what do you, what do you think about those? Um, first of all, like the millions of reports of UFOs. Right, there's some psychology there that's deeply cultural. Uh, but also the possibility of aliens having visited Earth. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to see some better pictures uh, for the reason I mentioned earlier, having to do with the difficulty of traveling between star systems. It's really hard for me to believe it's aliens. Uh, I, I just can't understand why you would um, go to all that trouble to transport something across light years and then do what these UFOs are allegedly doing like how is that interesting how, how does that justify the trip so if you travel across you know those kinds of distances you'd make a bigger splash first of all i i would expect that the the arrival of these things would be something we'd notice it's got to you know decelerate into into our solar system by Unless it got here really, really, really slowly, so I guess that's a, <laughs> that's a possibility, and just kind of snuck in. So the end, we would detect some kind of footprint in terms of energy. You would think 
So I actually think your idea of a science fair project gone gone bad, you know, it makes more sense in in that it would explain why these if these things are alien technologies, they're just kind of hanging around our aircraft carriers for no particular reason, like doing doing not trying to communicate. <laughs> yeah. You know. Is it can you imagine a scenario where aliens have visited Earth or are visiting Earth and we wouldn't notice it at all. Oh, sure. I mean, if they've got technology to to get here, they've probably got technology to conceal the, the fact that- Oh, they're, they're trying to conceal themselves. I meant more like they're not trying to conceal themselves, but oh. we're just, our Do cognitive capabilities are like too limited and we are not thinking big enough. We're, oh. we're looking for little green men. Yeah. We're looking for things that operate at a time scale that's human-like. Uh, you know, it's yeah. No, I yeah, I love thinking about ideas like that. That's great science fiction novel fodder. You know uh, that the aliens are are so different uh, that we simply don't don't see them. I mean, is there um, you know, in terms of language, do you think it, it would be difficult, not aliens visiting us, but traveling to other places to, to find a common language? You, you've written about the importance <laughs> of language in intelligent civilizations. Mm. Um, how difficult is the problem to bridge the gap between aliens and humans Yeah, in terms of language so we're not lost in translation? Yeah, I mean, there's different takes on that depending on how biologically similar they are to us. You know, I mean, there's a school of thought that says basically, uh, advanced life has to be carbon based for just reasons of chemistry so right away if you impose that limitation then you're you're kind of assuming a uh, something that's starting to be biologically similar to us so if they're about as big as we are and uh you know they um they they kind of move around in in space you know in a physical body the way we do then then there's probably a way to to solve that communication problem uh, if they're, you know, like beings of pure energy from Star Trek or right. something like that, then it's a different story. Well, I love thinking about that kind of stuff too. I mean, this, the, you know, consciousness itself may be, may be alien. I mean, it, it could be, like you said, <laughs> beings of pure energy. Um, I, I think, I think of life as just complex systems and the, the kind of forms those complex systems can take seems to be much larger than the particular biological systems we see here on Earth. Um, I have to ask a Twitter question okay. about aliens. Yeah. Ready, ready, this is for I'm, Twitter. I'm ready. Well, what would you expect from Twitter? Yeah. Can humans have sex with aliens? Neil Stevenson. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can pass. <laughs> <laughs> I asked the language question. Can they commu communicate? Yeah. Uh, um, can they fall in love before before sex? That's how it works. So, which question are, am I answering? The sex or the the love? Um, I mean, it depends. What is more fundamental to relations across? Yeah, yeah. across intelligent species. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, sex can mean a lot of things. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, uh, if reproduction, you're, right? You, you know, the the in in Star Trek, in classic Star Trek, you had to to really suspend your disbelief. To, to think that um, Spock was half Vulcan and half human, right? Because that's just not gonna not gonna work DNA wise. Um, so um, so if, if by sex you mean reproductive sex, then um, uh, I would say no, unless you, you unless you go to a panspermia um, kind of theory, which is that. Uh, you know, humans were seeded onto the planet as part of a galactic, uh, you know, uh, uh, program of some of some sort. Hmm. Um, and then we're just returning home, yeah, and hanging out with our with old our relatives, distant cousins. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but that that doesn't seem, you know, it doesn't seem seem plausible. We we know that we know that humans had sex with Neanderthals, with Denisovans, Denisovans. Um, so you could think of them as aliens that that came from our planet. Um, so um, so that's a kind of data point, 
I guess. Um, but, um, <clears throat> you know, if you broaden your definition of sex to mean any kind of uh, gratifying physical interaction, then sure. Right. <laughs> Dancing. And that's that's how we get to love. Okay. And love can take many forms. Love can certainly take many. <laughs> In a second. But first, let me ask for the other alternative, which is panspermia. Right. So that's the idea, the hypothesis that life exists elsewhere in the universe and got to us through like an asteroid yes. or planetoid or some, uh, according to Wikipedia, space dust, whatever the heck that is. <laughs> uh, it sounds fun, but basically rode along yeah. whatever kind of rock and got to us. Do you think that's at all a possibility? Sure. So I think the reason that most original life science are interested in the origin of life on Earth and say not the origin of life, um, you know, on Mars and then panspermia, you know, the exchange of life between planets being the explanation is once you start removing the origin of life from Earth, you know even less about it than you do if you study it on Earth. Although I think there are ways of reformulating the problem. This is why I said earlier, like, oh, you mean the historical origin of life problem? You don't mean the problem of how does life arise in the universe and what the universal principles are, because there's this historic problem, how did it happen on early Earth? And there's a more tractable general problem of how does it happen? Yeah. Um, and how does it happen is something we can actually ask in the lab. How does it, how did it, how did it happen on early Earth is, um, a much more detailed and nuanced question and requires detailed knowledge of what was happening on early Earth that we don't have. Um, and I'm personally more interested in general mechanisms. So to me, it doesn't matter if it happened on Earth or it happened on Mars. Um, it just matters that it happened. We have evidence it happened. Um, the question is, did it happen more than once in our universe? And so the reason I don't find panspermia as a particularly... I think it's a fascinating um, hypothesis. I definitely think it's possible. Um, and um, and I in particular think it's possible once you get to the stage of a life where you have technology because then you, you obviously can spread out into the cosmos. Um, but it's also possible for microbes because we know that um, certain microorganisms can survive the journey in space and we, you know, they can live in a rock and go between Mars and Earth. Like people have done experiments to try to prove that could work. Um, so in that scenario, it's super cool because then you get planetary exchange, but say we go find, we go look for life on Mars and it ends up being exactly the same life we have on earth, biochemically speaking, then we haven't really discovered something new about the universe. Mm -hmm. What kind of aliens are possible? Were there other original life events? Mm -hmm. If we find, if all the life we ever find is the same original life event in the universe, it doesn't help me solve my problem. But it's possible that that would be a sign that you could separate the environment from the basic ingredients yes so like that's true you can have like a life gun that you shoot <laughs> throughout the universe and then uh like once you shoot it it's like the simpsons yeah. with a makeup gun that was a great episode uh when you shoot this life gun it'll it'll find the earths it'll like get sticky it'll, yeah. it'll stick to the earths and, and that kind of reduces the barrier of uh like the time it takes, the the luck it takes to, to actually from nothing, from the basic chemistry, from the basic physics in the universe for the life to spring up. Yeah, I think this is actually super important to just think about, like, does life getting seeded on a planet have to be geochemically compatible with that planet? So you're suggesting like we could just shoot guns in space and like yeah. life could go to Mars and then it would just live there and be happy there. Um, but that's actually an open question. So one of the things I was going to say in response to your question about whether the origin of life happened once or multiple times is for me personally right now in my thinking, all this, this changes on a weekly basis, but um, is that I think of life more as a planetary phenomena. So I think the origin of life, because, right. um, because life is so um, intimately tied to planetary cycles and planetary processes, and this goes all the way back through the history of our planet, that the origin of life itself grew out of geochemistry and became coupled and controlled geochemistry. And, and when we start to talk about life existing on the planet is when we have evidence of life actually influencing properties of the planet. Um, and so, so if life is a planetary property, um, then going to Mars is not a trivial thing because you basically have to make ours Mars more Earth-like. Um, and so in some sense, um, like when I think about sort of long-term vision of humans in space, for example, 
really what you're talking about when when you're saying let's send our civilization to Mars is you're not saying let's send our civilization to Mars. You're saying let's reproduce our planet on Mars. Like the information from our planet actually has to go to Mars and make Mars more Earth-like, which means that you're now having a reproduction process, like a cell reproduces itself to propagate information in the future. Planets have to figure out how to reproduce their con- conditions, including geochemical conditions, on other planets in order to actually reproduce life in the universe, which is kind of a little bit radical. But I think um, for long-term sustainability of life on a planet, that's absolutely essential. Okay. So if we were to think about life as a planetary phenomena, and so life on Mars would be best if it's way different than life on Earth, can we talk about aliens? Anytime. <laughs> Uh, so one, I think one interesting way to sneak up on the question of what is life is to ask, what should we look for in alien life? You know, if we were to look out into our galaxy and into the universe and come up with a framework of how to detect alien life, what should we be looking for? Is there like set of rules? Uh, like it's both the tools and the tools that are serve as sensors for certain kind of properties of life. So what should we look for in alien life? Yeah. So we have a paper actually coming out on Monday, which is collaboration. Um, it's, it's actually really Lee Cronin's lab, but my group worked with him on it and we're working on the theory, which is this idea that we should look for life um, as high assembly objects. What we mean by that is um, which is actually observationally measurable. And this is one of the reasons that I started working with Lee on these ideas is because being a theorist, it's easy to work in a vacuum. It's very hard to connect abstract ideas about the nature of life to anything that's experimentally tractable. Mm-hmm. Um, but what his lab has been able to do is develop this method where they look at a molecule and they break it apart into all, all its component parts. And so you say you have some elementary building blocks and you can build up all the ways of putting those together to make the original object. Mm-hmm. And then you look for the shortest path in that space. Um, and you say that's sort of the assembly number associated to that object. Um, and if that number is higher, it assumes that a longer causal, causal history is necessary to produce that object or more information is necessary to specify the creation of that object in the universe. Now, that kind of uh, idea at a superficial level has existed for a long time. That kind of idea as a physical observable of molecules is completely novel. And what his lab has been able to show is that if you look at a bunch of samples of non-biological things and biological things, there's this kind of threshold um, of assembly where o- as far as the experimental evidence is, and also your intuitive intuition would suggest that bi- non-biological systems don't produce things with high assembly number. Um, so this goes back to the idea like a protein's not going to spontaneously fluctuate into existence on the surface of Mars. It requires an evolutionary process and a biological architecture to produce a protein. You generalize that argument, you know, a complex molecule or, or a cup or a desk ornament um, in this sort of abstract idea of assembly spaces as being um, the causal history of objects. And you can talk about the shortest path from elementary objects to an object given an elementary set of operations. And you can experimentally measure that with a mass spec. And that's basically sort of the idea. That's really fascinating. I can't get out of my head. I start imagining Legos and all the Legos I've ever built and how many steps, what is the shortest path to to the final, right, right. the final little Lego castles. (laughs) So So yeah, so then like asking about going to look for alien life, the idea is, you know, most of the instruments that NASA builds, for example, or any of the space agencies looking for life in the universe are looking for chemical correlates of life, right? right? But here we have something that is based on properties of molecules. It's not a chemical correlate. It's a agnostic. It doesn't care about the molecule. It cares about what is the history necessary to produce this molecule. Um, how complex is it in terms of how much time is needing, how much information is required to produce it. So when you observe a thing on another planet, you're essentially, the process looks like reverse engineering, trying to figure out what is the shortest path to create that thing. Yeah, so most, yeah, and I would say most, like most examples of biology or technology don't take the shortest path, right? But the shortest path is a bound on how hard it is for the universe to make that. Yeah, and so and I guess what, what you and Lee are saying that there's a heuristic that's a good metric for uh, like better perhaps than chemical correlates. Yes, 
because yes. it, it doesn't it's not contingent on looking for the chemistry of life on earth on other planets and it also has a deeper explanatory framework associated to it as far as the kind of theory that we're trying to develop associated to what life is and i think this is one of the problems i have in my my field personally in astrobiology is people observe something on earth say oxygen in the atmosphere or an amino acid in a cell and then they say let's go look for that on another planet. Uh, let's look for oxygen on exoplanets or let's look for amino acids on Mars. And then they assume that's a way of looking for life. Um, and it, it, or even phosphine on Venus. But, you know, like there's all these examples of let's look for one molecule. A molecule is not life. Life is a, a system that patterns particular structures into matter. That's like, it's, that's what it is. And it doesn't care what molecules are there. It's something about the patterns and, and that structure and that history. Um, and if you're looking for a molecule, you're not testing any hypotheses about the nature of what life is. It doesn't tell me anything. If we discover oxygen on an exoplanet about what kind of life is there, just oxygen on an exoplanet. It's not, there, there's, I, I guess I think like when you think about the question, are we alone in the universe? That's a pretty freaking deep question. It should have a freaking deep answer. It shouldn't mm -hmm. just be there's a molecule on an exoplanet. Wow, we solved the problem. It should tell us something meaningful about our existence. And I feel like we've fallen short on how we're searching for life in terms of actually searching for things like us in this kind of deeper way. But how do you do that initial kind of say I'm walking down the street and I'm looking for that double take test of like, like what the hell is that? Like that yeah. that initial, like how do we look for the possibility of weirdness, the possibility of high assembly number? Well, yeah. Like what would aliens look like th I, if they don't have two eyes and are if green? I knew, I, you know, I would have probably already solved the problem. Right. There's another Nobel Prize in there somewhere. Yeah, I think, somewhere actually. in there. Um. Well, I think it's it's kind of a, so so there is a bias here, right? So we've evolved to recognize life on Earth, right? Like I, you know, children at a very early age can tell the difference between a puppy and a plant, and then the plant and a chair, for example. You know, like it just it seems innate, um, and so I think, and also because we're life, um, you know. I think like there's this implicit bias that we should know it when we see it and it should be completely obvious to us. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of features of our universe uh, that are not completely obvious to us, like the fact that this table is made of atoms and that I'm sitting in a gravitational potential well right now. Um, and I guess um, my point with this is I think life is much less obvious than we think it is. Um, and so it could be in many more forms than we think it is. Um, and I guess this goes back to the point about being open-minded that we may not know what alien life looks like. It might not even be possible to interact with alien life because maybe something about, you know, our, our informational lineage, it makes it impossible for information from an alien to be copied to us. Therefore, there's no, you know, so to speak, communication channel. And I don't mean, you know, verbal communication, just it's not in our observational space. Like, you know, like, you know, there, there's, there's fundamental questions about why we observe the universe in position rather than momentum, but we also, you know, observe it in terms of certain informational patterns and things like that's what our brain constructs. And maybe aliens just interact with a different part of reality than we do. That's wildly speculative, but I think, I think, um, but it's possible. It's possible. And I think it's consistent yeah. with the physics. So I think the best ways we can ask questions are about, life and chemistry and asking questions about if information is a real physical thing, what would its signatures be in matter? Um, and and how do we recognize those? And I think the ones that are most obvious are the ones I've already articulated. You have these objects that seem completely improbable for the universe to produce because the universe doesn't have the design of that object in the laws. Mm -hmm. So therefore, an object had to evolve. We, we talked we call it evolution, but it had to be produced by the universe that then had all of the possible tasks to make that object um, specified. I mean, there's some, like, there's an engineering question here of, are there sensors we can create that can give us, a, can help us discover certain pockets of high assemblies, yeah. aliens? Like, I mean, there is a hope, setting dogs and chairs aside, there's a hope that visually and we could detect uh -oh. like because our universe, I mean, at least the way we look at it now, like this three dimensional, like space time, we can visually comprehend it. It's interesting to think like 
if we got to hang out, you know, if there's an alien in this room, like, would we be able to detect it with our current sensors? Not not the fancy kinds, yeah. but, but like Let's webcam. Say standing over there. <laughs> yeah, standing over there. Or maybe like in this carpet, see, there's all these kinds of patterns, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if, 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 I don't know if this carpet is an alien. Well, so uh, I see what you're saying. Um, so assembly theory is pretty general. Like, I mean, we've been applying it to molecules because it makes sense to apply it to molecules, but it's supposed to explain life. Um, you know, like the physics of life. So it should explain, you know, the things in this room in addition to molecules. Um, so I guess, uh, and you can apply it to images and things. So I guess the idea, you know, you could explore is just looking at everything on planet Earth in terms of its assembly structure and then looking for things that aren't part of our biological lineage. If they have high assembly, they might be aliens on Earth. I mean, that that is a very kind of rigorous computer vision question. Can we visually, is there a strong correlation yes. between certain kind of high assembly objects yeah. when they get to the scale where they're visually right. observable and some like when it's say uh projected onto a 2d plane can we right. can we figure out something right i'm glad you brought up the computer vision point because for a while i had this kind of thought in my mind that we can't even see ourselves clearly so one of the things you know people are worried about artificial intelligence for a lot of reasons but i think it's really fascinating because it's like the first time in history that we're building a system that can help us understand ourselves. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, people talk about AI physics, but like, um, you know, when I, when I look at another person, I don't see them as a 4 billion year lineage, but that's what they are. And so is everything here. Right. So imagine that we built artificial systems that could actually see that feature of us. What else would they see? Um, and I think that's what you're asking. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, I think that would be so cool. <laughs> uh, uh, I want that to happen, but I think I think we're a little ways off from it. But but yeah, we're going there. I hope. Okay, let me ask you. Uh, I apologize ahead of time, but let me ask you the internet question. So you're a physicist. You ask rigorous questions about the physics of uh, existence and uh, these models of high assembly objects. Now, when the internet would see an alien, they would ask two questions. One, can I eat it? And two, can I have sex with it? Yes. So, <laughs> the all the existential is, <laughs> questions. Those are very the important. The internet ones. is very sophisticated. So, <laughs> it really is. It's got in our basal cognition pretty, pretty good. So, you kind of mentioned that it's very difficult. It's possible that we may not be even able to communicate with it. Right. But I is, think the internet has more hope than we do. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a hopeful place. Yes. Uh, do you <laughs> do you think in terms of like interacting on this very primal level of? Right of sharing resources, like what would aliens eat? What would we eat? Would we eat the same thing? Would Could we potentially eat each other? Uh, right. One one person eats the other or, or the aliens eat us. And the same thing with not sex in general or reproduction, but genetically mixing stuff. Like oh, would, then, we, yeah. would we be able to mix genetic information? Maybe not genetic, but maybe information, right? And I think part of your question is like, so, so if you just, if you think of life as like this history of events that happen in the universe, like there's this question of like, how divergent are those histories, right? So when we get to the scale of technology, it's possible to imagine, imagine, although we can't even do it, like imagine all the possible technologies that could exist in the universe. But if you think about all the possible chemistries, somehow that seems like a lower dimensional space and a lower set of possibilities. Mm -hmm. So it might be that like when we interact with aliens, we do have to go back to those more basal levels to figure out sort of what the map is, mm -hmm. right? Um, like the, the sort of where we have a common history. We all, we we must have a common history somewhere in the universe. But in order to be able to actually interact in a meaningful way, you have to have some shared history. I mean, the reason we can exchange genetic information in each other's food or eat each other as food um, is because we have a shared history. So we have to find that shared history. The, the, we have to find the common ancestor in this causality map. The, 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 this Something, causality yes, tree. yes. And we have a last universal common ancestor for all life on Earth, which I think is sort of the nexus of that causality map for life on Earth. But the question is, where would other aliens diverge on that oh, that's map? That's really interesting. And I mean, you know, the, so say there's a lot of aliens out there in the universe, each each set of organisms would probably have like a number, you know, like Erdos number of like <laughs> how far, like how yeah. far our common ancestor is. And so the closer the common ancestor, like it is on earth, 
the more like each other, <laughs> the more likely we are to be able to have sexual reproduction. Well, it's like sort of like humans having common culture and languages, right? Yeah, exactly. Language, no, communi- yeah. communication. And the it more- might take a lot of work, though, with an alien because you really have to get over a language barrier. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. So, com- so it's communication, it's uh, 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 resources. I mean, it's yeah. the, the whole... And I think tied into that is the questions of like, who's going to harm who? Right. And, and actually definitions and of harm. Whether your parents approve, you know, all those kind of questions. Approve, whether the common ancestor approves. Yeah, that's, that's very, just very true. Uh, <laughs> how many alien civilizations do you think are out there? I don't have intuition for that, um, which I, I have always thought was deeply intriguing. So, and, and part of this... Uh, I mean, I say it specifically as I don't have intuition for that because it's like one of those questions that you feel around for a while and you really just, you, you, you can't see it. Um, even though it might be right there. And, um, in that sense, it's a little like the quantum to classical transition. You're like really talking about two different kinds of physics. And I I think that's kind of part of the problem. Once we understand the physics, that question might become more meaningful. Hmm. Um, but there's also this other issue, um, uh, and this was really instilled on me by my mentor, Paul Davies, when I was a postdoc, because he always talks about how, you know, whether aliens are common or rare is kind of just, um, you know, it's it like, you know, it follows a wave of popularity and it just depends on like the mood of, you know, what the culture is at the time. Mm-hmm. And I always thought that was kind of an intriguing observation. But but also there's this, you know, set of points about if you go by the observational evidence, which we're supposed to do as scientists, right, um, uh, you know, we have evidence of us um, and one original life event from which we emerged. And people want to make arguments that because that event was rapid um, or because there's other planets that have properties similar to ours, that that event should be common. But you actually can't reason on that because our existence observing that event is contingent on that ex- event happening, which means it could have been completely improbable or very common. Um, and Brandon Carter like clearly articulated that in terms of anthropic arguments Um a few decades ago. So so there is this kind of issue that we have to contend with dealing with life that's closer to home than we have to deal with with any other problems in physics, which we're, tr- we're talking about the physics of ourselves. And when you're asking about the origin of life event, that event happening in the universe, at least is like our existence is contingent on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you, you can think about sort of fine-tuning arguments um, that way too. So, um, but the, the, the sort of odder part of it is like when I think about uh, how likely it is, I think it's because we don't understand this mechanism yet about how information can be generated spontaneously. Mm-hmm. That I like, because I can't see that physics clearly yet, even though I have a lot of, you know, like some uh, things around the space of it in my mind, I can't articulate how likely that process is. Um, so my honest answer is I don't know. And it, it, sometimes that feels like a cop out, but I feel like that's a more honest answer and a more meaningful way of making progress than um, what a lot of people want to do, which is say, oh, well, we have a one in 10 chance of having it on an exoplanet with Earth-like properties because right. there's lots of Earth-like planets out there and life happened fast on Earth. Well, so <laughs> now kind of a follow-up question, but as a side comment, what I really am enjoying about the way you're talking about human beings is you always say, and not to make yourself conscious about it, because I really, really enjoy it. You say we. Yes. You don't say humans. You say, because oftentimes, like, and, and, you know, I don't know, evolutionary biologists will kind of put yourself out yes. as an observer. But you're, it's, it, it's kind of fascinating to think that you as a human are struggling about your own origins. Yes, that's say- that's the problem. And yeah, and I, I think um, I don't do that deliberately, but I do think that way. And this is sort of the inversion from the logic of physics, because physics, as it's always been constructed, has treated us as external observers of the universe. And we are not part of the universe. And this is why the problem of life, I think, demands completely new thinking, because we have to think about ourselves as minds that exist in the universe and are at this particular moment in history and looking out at the things around us and trying to understand what we are inside the system, not outside the system. We don't have descriptions at a fundamental level that describe us as inside the system. And this was my problem with cellular automata also. You're always an external observer yeah. for a cellular automata. You're not in the system. What does a cellular automata look like from the inside? I think you just broke my brain with that question. Exactly. But that's <laughs> I the thought about that for a long time. But. <laughs> I'm going to... Uh, yeah, that's a that's a really clean formulation uh, of a very fundamental question because you can only to understand cellular autonomy, you have to be inside of it. But as a human, 
sort of a poetic, romantic question. Does it make you sad? Does it make you hopeful? Whether we're alone or not, like in the different possible versions of that, if we're the highest assembly object in the entire universe, does that give at this you, moment in time? Maybe. At this moment in the causal, because we ca may, I chain. assume we have a future. Well, we definitely have a future. The question is, what, yeah, <laughs> where that future decreases the assembly. Like it could be we're at the peak, or we could be just. Um, that would be inconsistent with the physics in my mind. But so so I, I should give a caveat. I've given the, the caveat that I'm biased as a physicist, but I'm also biased as an eternal optimist. So pretty much all of my modes of operation for building theories about the world are not like an Occam's razor, what's the simplest explanation, but what's the most optimistic explanation. Um, uh, and part of the reason for that is if you really think explanations have causal power, um, in the sense that our the like the fact that we have theories about the world has enabled technologies and physically transformed the world around us. I think I have to take seriously that as a part of the physics I want to describe and try to build theories of reality that are optimistic about what's coming next because the theories are in part the causes of what comes next. <laughs> so there could be a physics of uh, hope or a physics of optimism in there too. Yes. Is... Um... That seems like also, I mean, optimism does seem to be a kind of engine that results in innovation. Yes. So this is dry, like, what? why the hell are we trying to come up with new stuff? Oh, so, um, so I made this point about thinking life is the physics of existence. And it's not just the physics of existence, it's the physics of more things existing. <laughs> So I think one of these drives creativity. of like, the, yeah, creativity, like optimism, the, so, so if you like, if people like entropy, I don't, I don't like entropy as it was formulated in the 1800s. I think it's an antiquated concept, but, um, but this idea of maximizing over the possible number of states that could exist, imagine the universe is actually trying to maximize over the number of things that could physically exist. What would be the best way to do that? The best way to do that would be evolve intelligent technological things that could explore that space. <laughs> what do you think uh, about all these UFO sightings? So to me, it's really inspiring. It's yet another localized way to dream about right. the mysterious that is out there. Yeah. So I've actually been more intrigued by the cultural phenomena of UFOs than the phenomena of UFOs themselves, because I think it's intriguing about how uh, we are preparing ourselves mentally <laughs> for understanding others and how we have thought about that historically and what the sort of modern incarnations of that are. Um, it, it's more like, I want an explanation for us. That's my motivation. Mm -hmm. And having some, you know, streaks across the sky or something and saying that's aliens, it doesn't tell you anything. Um, so unless you have a deeper explanation and you have, you know, more lines of, uh, you know, where is this going to take us in the future? It's just not as interesting to me as the problem of understanding life itself and aliens as a more general phenomenon. I, I do think it's uh, just, as you said, a good way to psychologically and sociologically prepare yes. ourselves to sort of like, what would that look like? Right. And very importantly, which is what a lot of people talk about politically, sort of uh, there's this idea from the, so I came from the Soviet Union of like the cold war and we have to hide secrets. Yeah. There's some way in us searching for life on other planets or searching for life in general, the, the way we've done government in the past, yeah. We tend to think of all new things as potential military secrets, so right. we want to hide them. And one of the ways that people kind of look at UFO sightings is like, like maybe we shouldn't hide this stuff. Like mm -hmm. what is the government hiding? Right. I think that's a really, you know, in one sense it's a conspiratorial question, but I think in another it's an inspiration to change the way we do government to where secrets don't, uh, Maybe there are times when you want to keep secrets as military right. secrets, but maybe we need to release a lot more stuff and see us as a human species as together in this whole yeah. search. Yeah, the public uh, engagement part there is really interesting. Um, and, and it's almost like a challenge to the yeah. way we've done stuff in the past right. in, in terms of keeping right. secrets when they're not. So like the the first step, if you don't know how something how something works, if there's a mysterious thing, the, the first instinct should not be like, let's hide it. Let's yeah. put it in the closet. Right. 
so right. that the Chinese or the Russian government or whatever government doesn't uh, doesn't find it. Maybe the first one, the first instinct should be let's understand it. Yeah, and perhaps let's understand it together. Right. No, I think that's good. And and something I realized recently that I never thought was going to be a problem, but I think this actually helps with quite a bit, is because so many um, people nowadays believe we've already made contact. That as an astrobiologist, if we you know actually want to understand life and make contact, we kind of have to deconstruct the narratives we've already built from ourselves and kind of unteach ourselves that we've learned about aliens and then reteach ourselves. So there's this really interesting sort of dialogue there um, and making it open to the public that they actually have to think critically about it and they see the evidence for themselves, I think is really important for that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the reteaching, that the, the aliens might be way weirder than we can imagine. Yes, <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're probably weirder than we can imagine. To get through. And one of the really exciting scientific things is that that particular point uh, is something that we might be able to discover even in our lifetimes that find life elsewhere, like Europa or yeah. be able to- See, that would be bad news, right? Because <laughs> if we find lots of pretty advanced life, yeah, that would suggest- uh, and, and especially if we found some, you know, defunct, you know, fossilized civilization or something yeah. somewhere else, that would of be bacteria. You mean of like what's that? A defunct civilization of like oh, oh, primitive oh, no. life. Yeah, I'm form. sorry, I switched gears there. If we if we found some intelligent or rather, you know, yeah. even even trilobites, right, and stuff, you know, yeah. elsewhere, that would be bad news for us because that would mean that the great filter is ahead of us. You, you know, right? Oh, because it would mean yeah. that lots of lots of things <laughs> have gotten roughly to our level. Yeah, but. But given the Fermi paradox, if yeah. you accept that the Fermi paradox means that there's no one else out there, you don't necessarily have to accept that. But if you accept that it means that no one else is out there, and yet there are lots of things we've found that are at or roughly at our level, mm -hmm. that means that the great filter is ahead of us and that bodes poorly for our long-term future. You know, yeah, but, it's, it's funny you said uh, you started by saying you're a little bit on the pessimistic side but it's funny because we're doing this kind of dance between pessimism and optimism because I'm not sure if us being alone in the observable universe as intelligent beings is pessimistic. It's, well, it's good news in a sense for us because it special. means that we made it through. <laughs> oh, right. See, if we're right. the only ones and there are such great filters, maybe more than one, formation of life might be one of them. Formation of eukaryotic, that is, with a nucleus cells, be an, another. Development of human-like intelligence might be another, right? There might be several such filters, and we were the lucky ones. And, you know, then people say, well, then that means you're, you're putting yourself into a special perspective, and every time we've done that, we've been wrong. And yeah, yeah, I know all those arguments, but it still could be the case that there's one of us, at least per galaxy, or per 10, or 100, or 1,000 galaxies, and we're sitting here having this conversation because we exist. And so there's a there's an observational selection effect yeah. there, right? Just because we're special doesn't mean that we shouldn't have these conversations about whether or not we're special, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's that's so, exciting. That's yeah. optimistic. <laughs> so that's the that's the optimistic part that yeah. if we don't find other intelligent life there, it might mean that we're the ones that made it. Uh, and and in general, outside the great filter and so on, you know, it's not obvious that uh, the, the Stephen Hawking thing, which is, it's not obvious that life out there is, is going to be kind to us. <laughs> oh yeah. As humans. But, so you know, I knew Hawking, and I greatly respect his his scientific work, and in particular, uh, the early work on the unification of general theory of relativity and quantum physics to two great pillars of modern physics, you know, Hawking radiation and all that. Fantastic work. You know, if you were alive, you should have been a recipient of this year's Physics Nobel Prize, which mm -hmm. was for the discovery of black holes and also uh, by Roger Penrose for the theoretical work showing that given a, a star that's massive enough, you, you basically can't avoid having a, a black hole. Anyway, Hawking, fantastic. I tip my hat to him. May he rest in peace. That would have but, been a heck of a Nobel Prize. Oh, black, yeah. black holes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would have been. Heck but, of a good group. But 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 going back to what he said that we shouldn't be um, broadcasting our presence to others. There, I actually disagree with him respectfully because 
First of all, we've been unintentionally broadcasting our presence for a hundred years since the development of radio and TV. Yeah. Okay. Um, secondly, any alien that has the capability of coming here and squashing us uh, either already knows about us and you know doesn't care because we're just like little ants. And when there are ants in your kitchen, you tend to squash them. But if there are ants on the sidewalk and you're walking by, do you feel yeah. some great conviction that you have to squash any of them? No, you, you generally don't, right? We're irrelevant to them. All they need to do is keep an eye on us yeah. to see whether we're approaching the kind of technological capability and know about them and have intentions of attacking them. And then they can squash us, right? Um, <laughs> they, you know, they, they could have done it long ago. Yeah. They'll, they'll do it if they want to. Whether we advertise our presence or not is is irrelevant. So I really think that that's not a huge existential threat. So this is a good place to bring up a difficult topic. You mentioned uh, they they might they would be paying attention to us to see if we come up with any crazy technology. There's folks who have uh, reported UFO sightings. There's actually I've recently found out there's. Uh, websites that track this, the, da the data of these reportings, and there's millions of them in the past uh, several decades, so seven decades and so on, that they've been recorded. And the ufologist community, as uh, they yeah. refer to themselves, you know, one of the ideas that I find compelling from an alien perspective, that they kind of started showing up ever since we figured out how to build nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. That we should- <laughs> <laughs> What a coincidence. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so, I mean, you know, if I was an alien, I would just start showing up then as well. Just to, Well, why not to, just observe us from afar? No, right? no I know, right. Yeah. I would figure out, mm -hmm. but th that's why I'm always uh, keeping a distance and staying blurry. Right. But, <laughs> <laughs> but Very pixelated. <laughs> very pixelated. You know, the, there is uh, something in the human condition that, a cognition that wants to see, wants to believe beautiful things. And uh, some are terrifying, some are exciting. Uh, goats, Bigfoot is a big fascination for folks. Yeah. And uh, UFO sightings, I think, falls into that. There's people that look at lights in the night sky. And I mean, there's it's kind of a downer to think in a skeptical sense, to think that that's just a light. Yeah. You want to feel like there's something magical there. Sure. Uh, I mean, I felt that first when my dad, my dad's a physicist, when he first told me about ball lightning. Yeah. When I was like a little kid. Very weird. Very like yeah. weird physical phenomena. Yeah. And he said his intuition was, uh, tell me this as a little kid, uh, like I really like math. His intuition was whoever figures out ball lightning will get a Nobel Prize. Mm-hmm. Like he, he, I think that was a side comment he gave me. And I, I decided there when I was like five years old or whatever, that yeah. I'm going to win a Nobel Prize for figuring out ball light. <laughs> yeah, ball light. That was yeah. like one of the first sort of sparks of the scientific mindset. Those mysteries, they capture your imagination. Yeah. I, I think when I speak to people that report UFOs, that's that fire, that's what I see, sure. that excitement. Yeah, you know, I understand that. Mm -hmm. But what... What do we do with that? Because there's hundreds of thousands, if not millions. Mm -hmm. And then the scientific community, you're like the perfect person. You have, <laughs> you have an awesome Einstein uh, shirt. I mean, what, what do we do with those reports? It's uh, most of the scientific community kind of rolls their eyes and dismisses it. Is, yeah. it. is it possible that a tiny percent of those folks saw something that's worth deeply investigating? Sure, we should investigate it. It's just one of these things where, you know, they've not brought us a hunk of kryptonite or something like that, right? They haven't brought us actual, tangible, physical evidence with which experiments can be done in laboratories. All right. Uh, it's it's anecdotal evidence. The photographs are, um, in some cases, in most cases, I would say, quite am ambiguous. I don't know what to think about. So David Fravor is the first person. He's a Navy pilot, commander. Yeah. And there's a bunch of them, but he's sort of one of the most legit pilots and yeah. people I've ever met. Right. The fact that he saw something weird. He yeah. doesn't know what the heck it is. Yeah. But he saw something weird. I mean, I don't know what to do with that. And one on the psych psychological side, 
So I'm pretty confident he saw what he says he saw, mm-hmm. which he's not provide. He's saying mm-hmm. I, it's something weird. Right. One of the interesting psychological things that worries me is that everybody in the Navy, everybody in the U.S. government, everybody in the scientific community just kind of like uh, pretended that nothing happened. Mm-hmm. That kind of instinct, that's what makes me believe if aliens show up, we mm-hmm. would all like just ignore the, their mm-hmm. presence. That's what bothered me, that you don't, you don't, investigate it more carefully and use this opportunity to inspire the world. Mm -hmm. Like, so in terms of kryptonite, I think the conspiracy theory folks say that whenever there is some good hard evidence Mm -hmm. that scientists would be excited about, Mm -hmm. there's this kind of conspiracy that I don't like because it's ultimately negative, Mm -hmm. that the US government will somehow hide Mm -hmm. the good evidence uh, to uh, to protect it. Of course, there's some legitimacy to it because you want to protect military uh, secrets, all that kind of stuff, but yeah, I I, I don't know. I don't know what to do with this beautiful mess because... um, I th- think millions of people are inspired by UFOs. Right. And it feels like an opportunity to inspire people about yeah. science. So I would say, you know, as Carl Sagan used to say, extraordinary claims require extraordinary yeah. evidence, right? I've quoted him a number of times. Uh, we would we would welcome such evidence. Uh, on the other hand, you know, a lot of the things that are seen or perhaps even hidden from us you could imagine for military purposes, surveillance purposes, the U.S. government doesn't want us to know. Or maybe some of these pilots saw Soviet or Israeli or whatever uh, satellites, right? A lot of the or some of the crashes that have occurred were later found to be, you know, weather balloons or whatever. You know, th- when there are more conventional explanations, yeah. science tends to stay away from the um, from the sensational ones, right? And so it may be that someone else's calling in life is to investigate these phenomena. And yeah. I welcome that as a scientist. Yeah. I, I don't categorically actually deny the possibility that ships of some sort could have visited us because, as I said earlier, at slow speeds, there's no problem in reaching other stars. In fact, our Voyager and Pioneer spacecraft in a few million years are going to be in the vicinity of different stars. We can even calculate which ones they're going to be in the vicinity of, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's nothing that breaks any laws of physics if you do it slowly. But that's different. You know, just having Voyager or Pioneer fly by some star, that's different from having active aliens altering the trajectory of their vehicle in real time spying on us. And then yeah. either zipping back to their home planet or sending signals that tell them about us because they are likely many years, many light years away, yeah. and they're not going to have broken that barrier as well. Okay, right? So, so I, I just you know go ahead, study them. Great. I you know for some young kid who wants to do it, it might be their calling and. That's how they might find meaning in their lives is to be the scientist who really explores these things. I chose not to because at a very young age, I found the evidence to the degree that I investigated it to be really quite unconvincing. And I had other things that I wanted to do, but I don't categorically deny the possibility. And I think it should be investigated. Yeah. I mean, this is, uh, this is one of those phenomena that, um, 99.9% 99.9% of people are almost definitely, there's conventional explanations. And then there's like mysterious things that probably have explanations that are a little bit more complicated. Yeah. It's, but there's not enough to work with. I tend to believe that if aliens showed up, there will be plenty of evidence uh, for scientists to study. Yeah. That, like, uh, and it, it exactly uh, as you said, a Voyager type of spacecraft. I could see sort of um, some kind of, kind of a dumb thing, almost like a sensor to like probing, like statistically speaking, flying by, maybe lands, maybe there's some kind of robot type of thingies that just like move around and so on. Yeah. Like in ways that we don't understand. But, but I feel like, well, 
I feel like there'll be plenty of hard, hard to dismiss evidence. And I also, especially this year, believe that the US government is not sufficiently competent, <laughs> given the huge amount of evidence that will be revealed from this kind of thing, to conceal all of it. Right. Uh, at least in modern times, you can say maybe decades ago, yeah. but in modern times. But you know, I uh, the the people I speak to, and the reason I bring it up is because so many people write to me; they're inspired by it. By the way, I wanted to comment on something you said earlier. Um, yeah, I had said that I'm sort of an, a pessimist in that I think there are very few other intelligent, mechanically able creatures out there. But then I said, yes, in a sense, I'm an optimist, yes. as you pointed out, because it means that we made it through yeah. the great filter, right? I, I meant originally that I'm a pessimist in that I'm pessimistic about the possibility that there are many, many of us out there. You know, mathematically speaking, yeah. in the Drake equation. It, exactly, <laughs> right, right. But, but it may mean a good thing yeah. for our ultimate survival, yeah. right? So yeah. I'm glad you caught me on that. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely agree with you. It, I, yeah. it is ultimately an optimistic yeah. statement. But anyway, I think, you know, UFO uh, research is, is interesting. And I guess one of the reasons I've not been terribly convinced is that I think there are some scientists who are investigating this and they've not found any clear evidence. Now, I must admit, I have not looked through the literature to convince myself that there are many scientists doing systematic studies of these various reports. So I can't say for sure that there's a critical mass of them. Well, the, but it's just that you, you, you never get these reports from hardcore scientists. That's the other thing. And astronomers, you know, what do we do? We spend our time studying the heavens, and you'd think we'd be the ones that are most likely, aside from pilots perhaps, at seeing weird things in the sky. And we just never do of the unexplained UFO type nature. Yeah, I definitely, I, I try to keep an open mind, but for people who listen, um, it's actually really difficult for a scientist. Like I get probably, like this year, I probably gotten over, probably maybe maybe over a thousand emails on, in, on the topic of AGI. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to, you know, people write to me, it's like, how can you ignore this in a GI side, like this model? This is obviously the model that's going to achieve general intelligence. How can you ignore it? I'm giving you the answer. Here's my document. And they're always mm -hmm. just these large uh, write-ups. The problem is it's very difficult to weed we through a bunch of BS. Right. It's, it's very possible that you had actually saw the UFO, but you have to acknowledge by UFO, I mean an extraterrestrial life. Right. You have to acknowledge the hundreds of thousands of people who are a little bit, if not a lot, full of BS. Right. And from a scientist's perspective, it just it's really hard work. And it's um, when there's amazing stuff out there, it's like, why invest yeah, in yeah. Bigfoot? when evolution in yeah. all of its richness is right. beautiful. Who right, cares right. about a monkey that walks on two feet I mean, or eight or sense, whatever? It's like there's a zillion decoys yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. at observatories. Yeah. True fact. We get lots and lots of phone calls when Venus, the evening star, but just really a, a bright planet, happens to be close to the crescent moon hmm. because it's such a striking pair. This happens once in a while. So we get these phone calls. Oh, there's a UFO next to the moon. And yeah. no, it's Venus. And so they're just, and I'm not saying the the best UFO reports are of that nature. No, yeah. there are some much more convincing cases and I've seen some of the footage and blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's just, there's so many decoys, yeah. right? So yeah. much so much noise that you have to filter out. Yeah. And there's only so many scientists, so it's hard. There's, almost so <laughs> much, there's almost, only so much time as well. And you have to choose what problems you work on. You you and your son, Christopher, helped create the alien language in the movie Arrival. So let me ask maybe a, a bit of a crazy question, but if aliens were to visit us on Earth, do you think we would be able to find a common language? Well, by the time we're saying aliens are visiting us, we've already prejudiced the whole story. Because <laughs> the, you know, the concept of an alien actually visiting, so to speak, we already know they're kind of... Uh, things that make sense to talk about visiting. So we already know they exist in the same kind of physical setup that we do. Uh, they're not, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's not just radio signals, it's an actual thing that shows up and so on. Um, so I think in terms of, you know, can one find ways to 
communicate? Well, the best example we have of this right now is AI. I mean, that's our first sort of example of alien intelligence. And the question is, how well do we communicate with AI? You know, if you were to say, if you were in the middle of a neural net and you open it up and it's like, what are you thinking? Can you discuss things with it? It's not easy, but it's not absolutely impossible. So I think I think by the time, by the, given the setup of your question, aliens visiting, I think the answer is yes, one will be able to find some form of communication, whatever communication means, communication requires notions of purpose and things like this. It's a kind of philosophical quagmire. So if AI is a kind of alien life form, what do you think visiting looks like? So if we look at aliens visiting, uh, and we'll get to discuss computation and, and the world of computation, but if you were to imagine, you said you already prejudiced something by saying you visit, but what? how would aliens visit? By visit, there's kind of an implication, and here we're using the imprecision of human language, you know, in a world of the future, and if that's represented in computational language, we might be able to take the uh, the concept visit and go look in the documentation, basically, and find out exactly what does that mean, what properties does it have, and so on. But by visit, in ordinary human language, I'm kind of taking it to be there's, you know, something, a physical embodiment that shows up in a spacecraft, since we kind of know that that's necessary. Um, we're not imagining it's uh, just, you know, photons showing up in a radio signal that, um, uh, you know, a photons in some very elaborate pattern. We're imagining it's it's physical things made of atoms and so on that, that show up. Can it be photons in a pattern? Well, that's a good question. I mean, whether there is the possibility, you know, what counts as intelligence? Good question. I mean, the, <laughs> yes. it's, um, you know, and I used to think there was sort of a, oh, there'll be, you know, it'll be clear what it means to find extraterrestrial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I've, I've increasingly realized as a result of science that I've done that there really isn't a, a bright line between the intelligent and the merely computational, so to speak. So, you know, in our kind of everyday sort of discussion, we'll say things like, you know, the weather has a mind of its own. Well, we let's unpack that question. You know, we realize that there are computational processes that go on that determine the fluid dynamics of this and that in the atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How do we distinguish, distinguish that from the processes that go on in our brains of, you know, the physical processes that go on in our brains? How do we, how do we, how do we separate those? How do we say, the, the physical processes going on that represent sophisticated computations in the weather, oh, that's not the same as the physical processes that go on that represent sophisticated computations in our brains. The answer is I don't think there is a fundamental distinction. I think the distinction for us is that there's kind of a, a thread of, of history and so on that connects uh, kind of what happens in different brains to each other, so to speak, and it's a, you know, what happens in the weather is something which is not connected by sort of a, a thread of, of uh, civilizational history, so to speak, to what we're used to. In our story, in the stories that the human brains told us, but maybe the weather has its own stories that Absolutely. it tells itself. Absolutely. And that's, and that's where we run into trouble thinking about extraterrestrial intelligence, because, you know, it's like that pulsar magnetosphere that's generating these very elaborate radio signals you know, is that something that we should think of as being this whole civilization that's developed over the last however long, you know, millions of years of of, uh, of processes going on in the in the neutron star or whatever, um, versus what uh, you know what we're used to in human intelligence? I mean, I think it's a. I think in the end, you know, when people talk about extraterrestrial intelligence and where is it and the whole you know Fermi paradox of how come there's no other. For signs of intelligence in the universe. Mm -hmm. My guess is that we've got sort of two uh, alien forms of intelligence that we're dealing with, artificial intelligence and sort of physical or extraterrestrial intelligence. And my guess is people will sort of get comfortable with the fact that both of these have been achieved around the same time. And um, in other words, people will say, well, yes, we're used to computers things we've created, digital things we've created, being sort of intelligent like we are. And they'll say, oh, we're kind of also used to the idea that there are things around the universe that are kind of intelligent like we are, except they don't share the sort of civilizational history that we have. And so we don't, uh, they're, they, you know, they're, they're a different branch. I mean, 
it's similar to when you talk about life, for instance. I mean, you 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 kind of said life form, I think, almost synonymously with intelligence, which I don't think is is um, you know, I the the AIs would be upset to hear you uh, equate those. Because I have really probably implied biological life, right. right? Right, right. But you're saying, I mean, we'll explore this more. But you're saying it's really a spectrum, and it's all just a kind of computation, and so it's it's a full spectrum and. Uh, we just make ourselves special by uh, weaving a narrative around our particular kinds of computation. Yes. I mean, the thing that I think I've kind of come to realize is, you know, at some level, it's a little depressing to realize that there's there's so little that's special. Or liberating. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, it's, you know, it's the story of science, right? And, in, in, you know, from Copernicus on, it's like, you know, first we were like convinced our planet's at the center of the universe. Yes. No, that's not true. Well, then we were convinced there's something very special about the chemistry that we have uh, as biological organisms. No, that's not really true. And then we're still holding out that hope, oh, this intelligence thing we have, that's really special. Yeah. Um, I don't think it is. However, in a sense, as you say, it's kind of liberating for the following reason, that you realize that what's special is the details of us, not some abstract attribute that, you know, we could wonder, oh, is something else going to come along and, you know, also have that abstract attribute? Well, yes, every abstract attribute we have, something else has it. But the full details of our kind of uh, history of our civilization and so on, nothing else has that. That's what, you know, that's our story, so to speak. And that's sort of almost by definition special. So I, I I view it as not being such a I mean I was I, initially I was like this is bad this is this is kind of you know how can we have self respect about um, about the things that we do then I realized the details of the things we do they are the story everything else is kind of a blank canvas I will argue that the question of like are there aliens out there is a very boring question hmm. because the answer is of course there are <laughs> right I mean like. We know that there are planets around almost every star. Um, <laughs> of course, there. Of course, there are other life forms. Life is not some specific thing that happened on the Earth, and that's it, right? Just that's a statistical impossibility. Yeah. Um, yeah, but the the difficult question is before even the fact that we don't know how life originates. I don't think we even know what life is, like definitionally. Yeah. Like formalizing a kind of picture of, in terms of the mechanism we would use to to search for life out there, or even when we're on a planet to say, is this life? <laughs> is this rock that just moved from where it was yesterday life? <laughs> or, or maybe life. not even a rock, something else. I gotta tell you, I wanna know what life is. <laughs> okay, and I want you to show me. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I think there's a song to basically accompany every single <laughs> thing yeah. we talk about today, and, and probably uh, half of them are love songs. Um, and somehow we'll integrate George Michael into the whole thing. Okay, so your intuition is there's life everywhere in our universe. Do you think there's intelligent life out there? I think it's entirely plausible. I mean, I, it's entirely plausible. Um, you know, I think I think there's intelligent life on Earth. Um, and so yeah, taking that, like say whatever this thing we got on earth, whether it's dolphins or humans, say that's intelligent. Uh, definitely dolphins. I mean, yeah, have so, you seen the dolphins? Well, they do some cruel stuff to each other. So if <laughs> <Yeah>. cruelty <laughs> is, uh, is a definition of intelligence, they're, they're pretty good. Yeah. And then humans are pretty good in that uh, regard. And then there's like, uh, uh, pigs are very intelligent. I got I got actually a chance to hang out yeah. with pigs recently, and they're um, aside from the fact they're trying to eat me, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're very uh, they're very they love food. They love food, but there's an intelligence to their eyes that was kind of uh, like haunts me because I also love to eat meat, mm -hmm. and then to to meet the thing I later ate, and that was very intelligent and uh, almost charismatic with the way it was expressing it, uh, himself, yeah. herself, itself, was uh, was quite incredible. So uh, all that to say, speaking of wild ideas, let me ask you about the thing we mentioned previously, which is this interstellar object, Oumuamua. Uh -huh. Could it be space junk from a distant alien civilization? 
you can't immediately discount that by saying absolutely it cannot anything can be space junk i mean from that point of view can any of the kuiper belt objects we see could you know, yeah. be space space junk anything on the night sky can in principle be space junk. And Kuiper Belt would catch interstellar objects potentially and like g force them into an orbit if they're like small enough? Uh, not the Kuiper Belt itself, but you can imagine like Jupiter family comets being gotcha. captured, uh, you know. So, so you can actually capture things. It's even easier to do this very early in the solar system, like early in the solar system's life while it's still in a cluster of stars. Um, it's unavoidable that you capture debris, whether it be natural debris or unnatural debris or just debris of some kind from other stars. That it's like a daycare center, right? Like everybody <laughs> passes their infections on to other kids. Yeah. Um, you know, or more and more, there's been a lot of discussion about and there's been a lot of interest in this over like is it is it aliens or is it not? But let's like if you just kind of look at the facts. Like what we know about it is it's kind of like a weird shape and it also accelerated. You yeah. Know, right. Like that's the two, those are, yeah. those are the two interesting uh, things about it. There are, um, there are puzzles about it and perhaps the most uh, daring resolution to this puzzle is that it's not, you know, aliens or it's not like a rock, it's actually a piece of hydrogen ice. Hmm. Right, so this is a friend of mine, uh, you know, Daryl Seligman, Greg Laughlin came up with this uh, idea where that in giant molecular clouds that are just clouds of hydrogen, helium gas that live in, um, <clears throat> live throughout the galaxy at their cores, you can condense ice to become these hydrogen, you know, icebergs, if you will. And then uh, that explains many of the aspects of, uh, in fact, I think that explains all of the Oumuamua mystery, how it becomes elongated, mm -hmm. because basically the hydrogen ice sublimates and kind of like a bar of soap that, you know, slowly kind of elongates as you uh, as you strip away the, uh, the surface layers. Uh, how it was able to accelerate because of a jet that is produced from, you know, the hydrogen coming off of it, but you can't see it because it's hydrogen gas. Like all of this stuff uh, kind of falls together nicely. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm intrigued by that idea, truly, because it's like, if that's true, that's a new type of astrophysical object. And it would be produced by... Uh, what's the monster that produced it initially? That kind of object. It, uh, so this is giant molecular molecular clouds. They are everywhere. I mean, they are. The fact that they exist is not. Are they rogue clouds or are they part of like an Oort cloud? No, no, they're rogue solar? clouds. Yeah, they're, they're just, just floating about. Yeah. So if you go, like a lot of people imagine the galaxy as being a, you know, a bunch of stars, right? And they're just orbiting. Right, but the truth is, if you fly between stars, you you run into clouds. Uh, that they don't are, have any large object that creates orbits. So they're just floating about. They're just floating. But why it, are they floating together? Or they just float together for a time and not? Well, so it's, it's, these are the these eventually become the nurseries of stars. So <laughs> as they as they cool, they contract and uh, you know mm -hmm. then collapse into stars or into wow. groups of stars. But some of them, the the starless. Um, molecular clouds, according to the calculations that Daryl and Greg did, can uh, can create these like icicles of yeah. hydrogen ice. I wonder why Super they would be cool. flying so fast. Because oh. they seem to be moving pretty fast at a you quick mean, pace. A more more, yeah. Oh, uh, that's just because of the acceleration due to, uh, due to the sun. If you stop, I mean, it's like, take something really far away, let it go, and the sun is here. By the time it comes it's close to the sun, fast. right, it's good, moving pretty fast. So that's an attractive explanation, I think, not so much because uh, it's cool, but it makes a clear prediction, mm -hmm. right, of when Vera Rubin Observatory comes online next year or so, we will discover many, many more of these objects, mm. right? And they have, um, so I like I like theories that are falsifiable, right? not ju not just testable but falsifiable. It's it's good to have a falsifiable theory where you can say that's not true. Mm -hmm. uh, aliens is a, is one that's 
fundamentally difficult to say, no, that's not aliens, well, right? Well, the interesting thing to me, if you look at one alien civilization, mm -hmm. and then we look at the things it produces, in terms of if we were to try to detect the alien civilization, the there's like, uh, say there's 10 billion aliens, there would probably be trillions of dumb drone type things produced by the aliens. And then be many, many, many more orders of magnitude of junk. Mm -hmm. So like, if you were to look for an alien civilization, in my mind, you would be looking for the junk. That's the more efficient thing to look for. That, so I'm not saying more and more has any characteristics of space junk, but it kind of opened my eyes like to the idea that we shouldn't necessarily be looking to the queen of the ant colony. We should be looking at, I don't know, I don't know, like like traces yeah. of alien life that doesn't look intelligent in any way, may not even look like life. It could be just garbage. We should be looking for garbage. Just generically. <laughs> just generically. Well, garbage that's producible by yeah. uh, unnatural uh, forces. That, I mean, yeah. uh, for me at least, that was kind of interesting because if you have a successful alien civilization, that we would be producing many more orders of magnitude of junk and that would be easier potentially to detect. Well, so uh, you have to produce the junk, but you have to also launch launch it. So this is the this is where I mean let's let's garbage imagine disposal. Yeah. <laughs> but let's imagine we are a successful civilization mm -hmm. that, you know, has made it to space. We clearly have, right? Um and yes, we're in the infancy of that pursuit, but you know, we've launched I don't know how many satellites. Um Probably, if you count GPS satellites, it must be at least thousands. It's right? it's certainly thousands. I don't know if it's over ten thousand, yeah. but it's on that order. But it's on that like a large order of magnitude. How many of the things that we've launched will ever leave the solar system? I think two. It's two so far. Well, yeah. maybe the Voyager, the Voyager one, Voyager two. I don't know if the Pioneer. So maybe three. Like, oh, there's also a Tesla Roadster out there. Uh, that that one it will never leave the solar system. It'll just uh, I think that one will eventually collide with Mars. That can yeah. be SpaceX's first Mars you know, destination. <laughs> um, but look, so there is an energetic cost to interstellar travel, uh, which is really hard to overcome. And when when we think about you know generically, what do we look for in an alien civilization? Oftentimes, we tend to imagine that the thing you look for is the thing that we're doing right now. Yeah. Right. So I think that, um, you know, if I if I look at the future, right, I and mean, for a while, like, we were saying, okay, if aliens are are out there, they must be broadcasting in radio, right? right? That radio, um, you know, the amount that we broadcast in radio has diminished tremendously mm -hmm. in the last fifty years, but we're doing a lot more computation, right? What are the signs of computation? Like that's a good, that's an interesting question to ask, mm -hmm. right? Um, we're, I don't know, I think something on the order of a few percent of the entire electrical grid last year went to mining Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, well, there, the, and the, yeah, the, the, there could be a lot of, in the future, different consequences of the computation, which, I mean, by, I'm biased, but it could be robotics, it could be artificial intelligence. So we may be looking for intelligent looking objects. Like that's what I meant mm -hmm. by probes, like things that yeah. move in kind of artificial ways. But the emergence of, of AI is not an if, right? It's, it's happening at, right in front of our eyes and the energetic costs associated with that are becoming, you know, a tangible problem. So I think, you know, if you imagine kind of extrapolating that into the future, right? What are the, you know, what becomes the bottleneck, right? The bottleneck might be powering, you know, powering the AI, broadly speaking, not one AI, but powering that entire AI ecosystem, right? So I don't know. I think, you know, space junk is, an, is kind of, uh, it's an interesting idea, but it's, it's heavily influenced by like sci-fi of 1950s, where yeah. by 2020, we're all like flying to the moon. Um, and so we produce a lot of space junk. I'm not sure if that's the pathway that alien civilizations take. 
Yeah, I've also it, never seen an alien civilization. I that's just don't that's know true. Anything. But if your uh, theory of chill, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, turns out to be true, and then we don't, you know, yeah. we don't necessarily explore. We seize the exploration phase of a, a like alien civilizations quickly seize the exploration phase of their um, of their efforts. Then uh, then perhaps they'll just be chilling in a particular space, expanding slowly but then using up a lot of resources and then have to have a lot of garbage disposal that sends stuff out. Yeah. And, and the other, you know, the other idea was that it could be a relay that uh, you'll almost have like these GPS like markers that you send throughout, which I think is kind of interesting. It's uh, similar to this probe idea of sending um, a large number of probes out to yeah. measure gravitational, um, to 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 measure basically yeah the, the the gravitational field essentially I mean a lot of people at Caltech or and MIT are trying to measure gravitational fields and there's there's a lot of ideas of sending uh, um, stuff out there that accurately measures those gravitational fields uh, to have a greater understanding of the early universe but then you might realize that communication through gravitation, through gravity is actually much more effective than, than radio waves, for example, something like that. And then you send out, I mean, okay. Yeah. If you're an alien civilization that's able to have gigantic masses, like mm -hmm. basically- We're getting there as a, as a civilization. No, we're not, not even close. Well, I mean- <laughs> no, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, yeah. I, I mean, like, be able to sort of uh, play with black holes, that kind of thing. So we're talking about yeah, a yeah. whole other different order of magnitude and masses. Then it, it may be very effective to send signals via gravitational waves. I actually, my sense is that all of these things are genuinely difficult to predict. You know, and I don't mean like to to kind of shy away. I just, I really mean if you think, if you take. Um, imagination of what the future looked like from you know 500 years ago yeah. right it's just it is so hard to conceive of the impossible right so um it's it's almost like um you know it's almost limiting to try and imagine things that are an order of magnitude uh you know or two orders of magnitude ahead in terms of progress just because you know you mentioned cars before you know yeah. If you were to ask people what they wanted in 1870, it's faster buggies, <laughs> right? So, um, so I, I think the whole like kind of you know alien conversation inevitably gets gets limited by by our entire kind of collective um, astrophysical lack of imagination. Right. If you know, I so to to push back a little bit, I I find that. Another fun question on this, because we're in in uh, from a computing perspective, we're trying to create something that's human like or superhuman like. Let me ask you about aliens. Mm, aliens. Uh, do, do you think there's intelligent alien civilizations out there, and do you think their um, technology, their computing, their AI bots, their uh, their chips are of the same nature as ours. Yeah, I, got, I have no idea. I mean, <laughs> if there's lots of aliens out there, they've been awfully quiet. I mean, there's, there's speculation about why. There yeah, seems to be mistake. more than enough planets out there. There's a lot. Yeah. Um, there's intelligent life on this planet that seems quite different. You know, like, you know, dolphins seem like plausibly understandable. Octopuses don't seem understandable at all. If they live longer than a year, maybe they would be running the planet. They seem really smart. And their neural architecture is completely different than ours. Now, who knows how they perceive things? I mean, that's the question is for us intelligent I mean, beings, we might not be able to perceive other kinds of intelligence if they become sufficiently different than us. So yeah, we, like, like understand we live in the current constrained world of, you know, it's yeah. three dimensional geometry and the geometry defines a certain amount of physics. And you know, you know, there's like how time works seems to work. Like there's so many things that seem like a whole bunch of the input parameters to the you know another conscious being are the same. Yes. Like if it's biological, biological things seem to be in a relatively narrow temperature range, right? Because you know organics don't aren't stable, too cold or too hot. You know, so so there's 
if you specify the list of things that input to that, but as soon as we make really smart, you know, beings, and they go solve about how to think about a billion numbers at the same time, and mm -hmm. and how to think in n dimensions. There's a funny science fiction book where the all the society had uploaded into this matrix, mm -hmm. and at some point, some some of the beings in the matrix thought, "I wonder if there's intelligent life out there." So they had to do a whole bunch of work to figure out like how to make a physical thing, because their matrix was self-sustaining. And they made a little spaceship and they traveled to another planet. When they got there, there was like life running around, but there was no intelligent life. And then they figured out that there was these huge, you know, organic matrix all over the planet. Inside there were intelligent beings that had uploaded themselves in, into that matrix. So everywhere intelligent life was, soon as it got smart, it up leveled itself into something way more interesting than 3D geometry and yeah, it escaped or, whatever this it up no, not escaped is better. Yeah, up level is better. Yeah, the the and, essence of what we think of as an intelligent being, I tend to like the thought experiment of the organism. Like humans aren't the organisms. I like the notion of like uh, Richard Dawkins and memes that hmm. ideas themselves are the organisms like that are just using our minds to evolve. So like, we're just like meat receptacles for ideas to breed and multiply and so on. And mm -hmm. and maybe those are the aliens. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Jordan Peterson has a line that says, you know, you think you have ideas, but ideas have you. Yeah. Right. Good line. Which, and, and then we know about the phenomenon of groupthink. And there's so many things that constrain us. But I think you can examine all that and not be completely owned by the ideas and completely sucked into groupthink. Mm -hmm. And part of your responsibility as a as a human is to escape that kind of phenomena, which isn't, you know, it's you know, it's it's one of the creative tension things again. You're constructed by it, but you can still observe it and you can think about it and you can make choices about, to some level, how constrained you are by it. And you know, it's useful to do that. And, but but they're at the same time, and it could be by doing that, that you know, the, 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 the group in society you're, you're part of becomes collectively even more interesting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so the outside observer will think, wow, you know, all these Lexas running around with all these really independent ideas have created something even more interesting mm -hmm. in, in the aggregate. So... So I so I don't know. I'm those are lenses to look at the situation but that all, give you some inspiration, but I don't think they're constraints. Right. You know? That's accurate. Uh you've mentioned offline that there might be a link between post biological AGI and SETI. So last time we talked, um you've you've talked about this intuition that we humans might be quite unique in our galactic neighborhood perhaps our galaxy, perhaps the entirety of the observable universe, we might be the only intelligent civilization here, which is, um, and you argue pretty well for that thought. Um, so I have a, a few little questions around this. One, the scientific question, in which way would you be, if you were wrong, in that intuition, in which way do you think you would be surprised? Like, why were you wrong? You we find out that you ended up being wrong. Like, in which dimension? So, like, is it because we can't see them? Is it because the nature of their intelligence or the nature of their life is totally different than we can possibly imagine? Is it uh, because the I mean, something about the great filters and surviving them, uh, or maybe uh, because we're being protected from signals. So all those explanations for um, for why we haven't heard a big, loud, like red light that says yeah. we're here. Yeah. So there are actually two separate things there that I could be wrong about. Two separate claims that I made. Right. The, the one one of them is. I made the claim, I think, 
most civilizations, when you're going from simple bacteria like things to space space colonizing civilizations, they spend only a very very tiny fraction of their of their of their life being where we are. Uh, that I could be wrong about. The other one I could be wrong about is the quite different statement that I think that actually I'm guessing that we are the only civilization in our observable universe from which light has reached us so far that that's actually gotten far enough to invent telescopes. So let's talk about maybe both uh, of them in turn because yes. they really are different. The first one, if 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 you look at the n equals one, <laughs> the data point we have on this planet, yes. right? So we spent um, four and a half billion years futzing around on this planet with life, right? We got, and most of it was pretty lame stuff from an intelligence perspective, you know, it's bacteria and then the dinosaurs spent, then but things gradually accelerated, right? Then the dinosaurs spent over a hundred million years stomping around here without even inventing smartphones. And, um, and then very recently, you know, it's only, we've only spent 400 years going from Newton to us, right? Yeah. In terms of technology, and we've if look at what we've done. Even, you know, when I was a little kid, there was no internet. Even so, it's. <clears throat> I think it's pretty likely for in this case of this planet, right, that we're either going to really get our act together and start spreading life into space, the century, and doing all sorts of great things, or we're going to going to wipe out. Um, it, it's a little hard. If I. If, I could be wrong in the sense that maybe what happened on this Earth is very atypical. And for some reason, what's more common on other planets is that they spend an enormously long time futzing around with the ham radio and things, but they just never really take it to the next level for reasons I don't have, I haven't understood. And I'm humble and open to that. But I would bet at least 10 to 1 that our situation is more typical because the whole thing with Moore's Law and accelerating technology, it's pretty obvious why it's happening. Mm -hmm. it, Everything that grows exponentially, we call it an explosion, whether it's a population explosion or a nuclear explosion, it's always caused by the same thing. It's that the next step triggers a step after that. Mm -hmm. So I, we tomorrow's techno today's technology enables tomorrow's technology and that enables the next level. And as it, because the technology is always better, of course, the steps can come faster and faster. Uh, on, on the other question that I might be wrong about, that's the much more controversial one, I think. Um, but, but before we close out on this thing about if if the first one, if it's true that most civilizations spend only a very short amount of their total time in the stage, say, between um, inventing um, telescopes or sure. elec mastering electricity and leaving their, and doing space travel, yeah. Uh, if that's actually generally true, but then that should apply also elsewhere out there. So we, we, we should be very, very, we should be very, very surprised if we at find some random civilization and we happen to catch them exactly in that very, very short stage. Mm -hmm. It's much more likely that we find a planet full of bacteria. Yes. Or that we find some civilization that's already post-biological and has done some really cool galactic construction projects in, in their in their galaxy. Would we be able to recognize them, do you think? Is it, is it possible that we just can't? I mean, this post-biological world, I, could it be just existing in some other dimension? It could, it could be just all a virtual reality game for them or something, I don't know, that, that it changes completely where we won't be able to detect. We have to be honestly very humble about this. Yeah. I think that I said. I think I said earlier the number one principle of being a scientist is you have to be humble <laughs> and willing to acknowledge that everything we think guess might be totally wrong. Uh, of course, you can imagine some civilization where they all decide to become Buddhists and very inward looking and just move into their little virtual reality and not disturb the the flora and fauna around them, and we might not notice them. Uh, but this is a numbers game, right? If you have millions of civilizations out there or billions of them, all it takes is one with a more ambitious mentality right. that decides, hey, we are going to go out and settle a bunch of other solar systems and maybe galaxies. And then it doesn't matter if they're a bunch of quiet Buddhists, we're still going to notice yeah. that expansionist one, right? Yeah. And it, it seems like a, quite the stretch to, to assume that, you know, we know even in our own galaxy that there are probably a billion or more 
planets that are pretty Earth-like. And many of them were formed over a billion years before ours, so had a big head start. So if you actually assume also that life happens kind of automatically on an Earth-like planet, I think it's it's pretty t quite the stretch to then go and say, okay, so I, we are there billions of another billion civilizations out there that also have our level of tech, and they all decided to become Buddhists, and not yeah. a single one decided to go like go Hitler on the galaxy and say we need yeah. to go out and colonize, or and or not, and not a single one decided for more benevolent reasons to go out and get more resources. That that seems seems like a bit of a stretch, frankly, and, and this leads into the. The second thing you challenged me to be that I might be wrong about how rare or common is life, you know. So Francis Drake, when he wrote down the Drake equation, multiplied together a huge number of factors and mm -hmm. said we don't know any of them, <laughs> so we know even less about what you get when you multiply together the whole product. Yeah. Uh, since then, a lot of those factors have become much better known. Mm -hmm. One of his big uncertainties was how common is it that a solar system even has a planet, right? Well, now we know it's very common. Earth-like planets, we know we have better. There are dime a dozen, there are yeah. many, many of them, even in our galaxy. At the same time, you know, we have, thanks to, I, I'm a big supporter of the SETI project and its cousins, uh, and I think we should keep doing this. And we've learned a lot. We've, we, we've learned that so far, all we have is still unconvincing hints, nothing more, right? And, and there are certainly many scenarios where it would be dead obvious I, if there were, a hundred million other human-like civilizations in our galaxy, it would not be that hard to notice some of them with today's mm -hmm. technology, and we haven't, right? So, so what we can what we can say is, well, okay, uh, we can rule out that there is a human-level civilization on the moon, and in fact, in many nearby solar systems, where we <clears throat> we cannot rule out, of course, that there is something like Earth sitting in a galaxy. Five billion light years away, mm -hmm. um, but we've ruled out a lot, and that's already kind of shocking, given that there are all these planets there. You know, so yeah. like, where are they? Where are they all? That's the that's the classic Fermi paradox. Yeah, and and um, so so my argument, which might be really wrong, is very simple. Really, it just goes like this: Okay, we have no clue about this. It could be the the, the probability of getting life on a random planet. It could be. 10 to the minus one, a priori, or 10 to the minus five, 10, 10 to the minus 20, 10 to the minus 30, 10 to the minus 40. Basically, every order of magnitude is about equally likely. When you then do the math and ask how close is our nearest neighbor, it's again equally likely that it's 10 to the 10 meters away, 10 to 20 meters away, 10 to the 30 meters away. We can we have some nerdy ways of talking about this with Bayesian statistics and a uniform yeah. log prior, but that's irrelevant. This is the simple basic argument. And, and now comes the data. So we can say, okay, how many were, there are all these orders of magnitude, 10 to the 26 meters away, there's the edge of our observable universe. If it's farther than that, light hasn't even reached us yet. If it's uh, less than 10 to the 16 meters away, well, it's <laughs> within Earth's, it's no farther away than the sun. We can definitely rule that out, you know. Um, so I think about it like this. A priori, before we looked with telescopes, you know, it could be 10 to 10 meters, 10 to 20, 10 to 30, 10 to 40, 10 to 50, 10 to blah, blah, blah. Equally likely anywhere here. Yeah. Uh, and now we've ruled out like this chunk. Yeah. And, and, so and most of and, it is outside. And here is the edge of our observable universe already. Yes. Yep. So I, I'm certainly not saying I don't think there's any life elsewhere in space. If space is infinite, then you're basically 100% <laughs> guaranteed that there is. But the probability that there is life, that, that the nearest neighbor it happens to be in this little region between where we would have seen it already yeah. and when, where we will never see it is actually significantly less than one, I think. Mm. And and I think there's a moral lesson from this, which is really important, which is to be good stewards of this planet and this shot we've had. You know, it can be very dangerous to say, oh, you know, it's fine if we nuke our planet or ruin the climate or mess it up with un unaligned AI because... I know there is this nice Star Trek fleet out there. They're going to swoop in and yeah. take over where we yeah. failed. Just like it wasn't the big deal that the Easter Island losers wiped themselves out. That's a dangerous way of lulling yourself into false sense of security. If it's actually the case that it might be up to us 
and only us, the whole future of intelligent life in our observable universe, then I think um, it's both, it, it really puts a lot of responsibility on our shoulders. It's inspiring, it's a little bit terrifying, but it's also inspiring. But also, it's empowering, I think, most of all, because, sure. because the biggest problem today is, and I see this even when I teach, right? So many people feel that it doesn't matter what they do or what we do, we feel disempowered. Oh, it makes no difference. This is about as far from that as you can come. But we realize that what we do on our little spinning ball here in our lifetime, you know, could make the difference for the entire future of life in our universe. You know, how empowering is that? Yeah, survival of consciousness. I mean, on the the other, a, a very similar kind of uh, empowering aspect of the Drake equation is say there, are, there is a huge number of intelligent civilizations that spring up everywhere, but because of the Drake equation, which is the lifetime of a civilization, yeah. maybe many of them hit a wall. And yeah. and just like you said, it's clear that, that for us, the great filter, the one possible great filter seems to be coming you know, in the next 100 years. So it's also empowering to say, okay, well, uh, we have a chance to not, I mean, the way great filters work, it is just get most of them. Exactly. Nick Bostrom has articulated this really beautifully too. I, I you know, every time so yet another search for life on Mars comes back negative or something, I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Our odds for us surviving. Is yes, as long as you already made the argument and broad brush there, right? Uh, but just to unpack it, right? The point yeah. is, we already know. <laughs> There's a crap ton of planets out there that are Earth-like, and we also know that most of them do not seem to have anything like our kind of life on them. So what what went wrong? There's clearly one step along the evolutionary, at least one, filter, roadblock, in going from no life to spacefaring life. And um, where is it? Is it in front of us or is it behind us, right? <laughs> if, if there's no filter behind us, and we keep finding all sorts of of uh, little mice on Mars and or whatever, right? That's actually very depressing because that makes it much more likely that the filter is in front of us. Yep. And that what, what actually is going on is like the ultimate dark joke that, that that whenever a civilization invents sufficiently powerful tech, it's just, you just set your clock and then after a little while it goes poof for one reason or other and, and wipes itself out. That would be, wouldn't that be like utterly depressing yeah. if we're actually doomed? Whereas if it turns out that there is a really there is a great filter early on that is, for whatever reason seems to be really hard to get to the stage of of um, sexually reproducing organisms or even the first ribosome or or whatever right or or maybe you have lots of planets with dinosaurs and cows but for some reason they tend to get stuck there and never invent smartphones all of those are huge vic boosts for our own odds because been there done that you know <laughs> it doesn't matter how hard it, or unlikely it was that we got past that roadblock because we already did yeah and the, then the, then that makes it likely that the future is in our own hands we're not doomed so that that's why <laughs> that's why i think the fact that li that um life is rare in the universe it's not just something that there's some evidence for but also something we should actually hope for that brings up the question of uh, asking for a friend here, if there's, uh, you know, other pockets of complexity, uh, commonly called as uh, alien, intelligent civilizations out there. Well, we You're, don't know for sure, but I, I have a strong suspicion that the answer is yes, because the, uh, the one case we do have at hand to study here on Earth uh, we sort of know what the conditions were that were helpful to life, the, the right kind of temperature, the right kind of star that, that keeps, maintains that temperature for a long time, the liquid environment of water. Uh, and it, once those conditions emerged on Earth, which was roughly four and a half billion years ago, it wasn't very long before what we call life started to leave relics. So we can find uh, forms of life, primitive forms of life that are almost 
as old as the earth itself in the sense that once the earth became reason was was turned from a a, a very hot boiling thing and cooled off into a solid mass with and with water uh, life emerged very very quickly so so it seems that these general conditions for life uh are enough to to make it happen uh relatively quickly now the other lesson i would i think that one can uh draw from this one example it's dangerous to to draw lessons from one example but that's all we've got uh and uh that that the emergence of intelligent life is a different issue altogether it uh, that took a long time and seems to have been pretty contingent <laughs> uh the you know the the for a long time well, for most most of the history of life, it was single celled things. You know, uh, yes. even multicellular life only rose about six hundred million years ago. So much after, you know. So uh, and the the uh, uh, and then intelligence is kind of a luxury. You know, if you think <laughs> uh, many more kinds of creatures have. Uh, big stomachs and then, then big brains and in fact uh most 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 have no brains at all in a, in any reasonable sense that, that that then uh and the dinosaurs ruled for a long long time and some of them were pretty smart but they they were at best bird brains because you know birds came from the dinosaurs and uh and uh, and it could have stayed that way, you know. And and and, and human and the emergence of humans was very contingent and kind of a very very recent development on evolutionary timescales. And uh, you can argue about the level of human intelligence, but it's you know I think it's <laughs> that, that, pretty impressive. That's what we're talking about, and it's very it's very impressive, and and can ask these kinds of questions and discuss them intelligently. Uh, the uh, so. I guess my, my, so this is a long winded answer or justification of, of my feeling is that uh, the conditions for life in some form are probably uh, satisfied in many, many places around the universe, even, and even within our galaxy. Uh, I'm not so sure about the emergence of intelligent life. Or the emergence of technological uh, civilizations that 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 seems uh, much more con much more contingent and special, and we might it's conceivable to me that we're the only example in the galaxy. Or although, yeah, I don't know one way or the other. I I, I have different opinions on different days of the week. But uh, one of the things that worries me in in in, uh, in the spirit of being humble that our particular kind of intelligence is not very special. So th there's all kinds of different intelligences. And yeah. even more broadly, there could be many different kinds of life. Yes. So uh, uh, the basic right. definition, and I just had, I think somebody that you know, Sarah Walker, I just had a very long conversation <laughs> with her about even just the very basic question of trying to define what is life from a physics yeah. perspective, yeah. even that question within itself, I think one of the most fundamental questions in science and physics and everything is just trying to get a hold, trying to get some universal laws around the ideas of what is life, because that, that kind yeah, of unlocks well, a bunch of things around life, intelligence, consciousness, all those kinds of things. I agree with you in a sense, but I think that's a dangerous question because the the answer can't be any more precise than the question and the uh the the question what is life kind of assumes that we have a definition of life and that it's a natural phenomena that that can be distinguished and but that really there are edge cases like viruses and uh some people would like to say that uh, electrons have consciousness and they, you know so you can't if you really have fuzzy concepts it's uh it's very hard to to reach precise kinds of scientific answers but i think there's a very fruitful question that's adjacent to it which is uh, has been pursued in different forms for uh quite a while and is now becoming very sophisticated and 
reaching in new directions, and that is what are the states of matter that are possible? You know, so in in high school or grade school, you learn about solid, li solids, liquids, and gases, but that really just scratches the surface of different ways that are distinguishable that matter can form into uh, uh, macroscopically different meaningful patterns that we call phases of matter. And then there, there are precise definitions of what we mean by phases of matter <laughs> and, uh, and that have been worked out and fruitful over, over the decades. And we were discovering new states of matter all the time and kind of having to work at what we mean by matter. We're discovering the capabilities of matter to organize in interesting ways. And uh, the, the, some of them, like liquid crystals, are uh, important ingredients of life. Our cell membranes are liquid crystals, and, and that's very important to the way they work. Uh, recently, there's been a development in where we're talking about uh, states of matter that not only not that are not static, but that have dynamics that have that uh, have characteristic patterns not only in space but in time. These are called time crystals, and that's that's been a development that's just in the last decade or so. It's, it's really really flourishing. Uh, and so, uh, is there a state of matter that corresponds, or a group of states of matter that corresponds to life? Uh, Maybe, but, but the answer can't be any more definite than the question. I'm afraid, so. I mean, I, I got to push back on the the, the, the quite. Those are just words. I mean, I, I I disagree with you. The 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 question points a to a direction. The answer might be able to be, to be more precise than the question because well, because uh, just as you're saying, there there's uh, that we could be discovering certain characteristics and patterns that are associated with a certain type of matter, uh, macroscopically speaking, and that yeah. that we can then well, uh, be able to post facto say, this is, let's assign this, the word life to yeah, this well, kind of matter. I agree with that completely. That, that's what that's, uh, <laughs> but that, that's, so it's not a disagreement. It's very frequent in physics that, or in science, that uh, words that are in common use gets get refined and reprocessed into scientific terms that's yes. happened for things like force and energy uh and so we in a way we we find out what the useful definition is uh or symmetry for instance and the common usage may be quite different from the scientific usage but the scientific usage is special and takes on a life of its own and we find out what the the useful version of it is uh or the, the the fruitful version of it is so i do think so in that spirit i think if we uh can identify states of matter that or linked states of matter that can carry on processes of uh self reproduction and development and, and information processing we should say we we might be tempted to classify those as things as life <laughs> yeah. but there isn't so what do you make of all the all the stories of ufo sightings all that kind of stuff do you think they've visited earth yes uh, my grandfather was an air traffic controller in the soviet union and he said they would often see these things that were not um operating the way we knew vehicles operate. So that's good enough for me. So, I mean, do you think government is in possession of some, like, what do you think government is doing with this kind of information? Is, do you think somebody has any understanding of UFO sightings uh, or any kind of information about extraterrestrial life forms that are not known to the public? Yes, that's indisputably true. I think the fact that so many of these sightings are from aerodynamic professionals, like pilots and, and things of that nature, they are people who've seen it all, who are reputable. If they are on record saying, I've seen things that don't make sense, and both the Russians and the Americans thought it was the other one, uh, that says something. Shouldn't that be a bigger problem? Shouldn't that be bigger news and a bigger problem if government is in fact hiding it? 
I guess, but like, what are they going to do with that information? It's a, it's a good question. Like, if a UFO, uh, if a extraterrestrial spacecraft, which mo most likely would be like a crappy space, like it it wouldn't be the actual aliens. It would be like some drone probe ship AI. Uh, yeah, AI. Yeah. So if that, like, what would you do with that information? As a, somebody that's in charge of, you know, like you see how badly uh, WHO fumbled the discussion of masks. Masks, yeah, masks is one of them, but everything really in terms of communicating with the public honestly about what they know, what they don't know. And that's a trivial one. Right. I don't, I don't, I don't know. They certainly feel incompetent at, at being able to communicate effectively with the public about something much more difficult, much sure. more full of, mis full of mystery, like a, a, a thing, a piece of material that's out of this earth. Forget like organic material. I don't, I don't know. To me, I, as, so from a scientist's perspective, it would be beautiful, it would be inspiring to, to reveal this to the world. Here's a mystery and make it completely public, share it with China, share it with everybody. I think there is a domino effect where the concern would be, what else are you hiding from us? And at that point, if you said, no, 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 this is everything, people wouldn't believe you and they would, you can't blame them for not believing them. Ah, uh, yeah. And then it'll be like, show us the aliens. They'd be like, we don't have them, we just have the craft, you're lying. Is there some version of the alien conversation that could incorporate oh, the breaking of frameworks? Well, I think so. I mean, the key question would be, uh, we, we've had the Pentagon release uh, multiple videos of strange UFOs that undermined a lot of us. I just think it's also really fascinating to talk about the fact that those of us who were trained to call BS on all of this stuff just had the rug pulled out from under us by the Pentagon choosing to do this. And you know what the effect of that is? You've opened the door for every stupid theory known to man. My aunt saw a ghost okay, now we're gonna have to listen to, well, hey, the Pentagon used to deny it. Then it turned out there were UFOs, dude. Whoever is in charge of lying to the public, they need a cost function that incorporates the, the damage and trust. Because I held this line that this was all garbage and all BS. Now I don't know what to think. There's a fascinating aspect to this alien discussion, the breaking of frameworks that involves the release of videos from the Pentagon which is almost like another dimension that trust in itself or the nature of truth and information is a kind of dimension along which we're traveling constantly that is is uh, messing with my head to think about because I mean, do you, <laughs> like, because it almost feels like you need to incorporate that into your study of the nature of reality is like the constant shifting of the notation, the tools we use to communicate that reality. And so like, what am I supposed to think about these videos? Is it, is it a complete distraction? Is it a kind of cosmic joke? I don't know, but you know what? I'm tired of these people, just completely tired of these people. The, the, the people on the Pentagon side or the people who are interpreting the stuff on the Pentagon side? I'm, tired, the, the of the, I'm of the, tired of the authorities playing games with what we can know. The fact that you and I don't, do you have a security clearance? Uh, some level of it for, because I was funded for DARPA for a while. I don't have a security clearance. You know, I, I am going to release whatever theory I have. And my guess is, is that there is zero interest from our own government. Um, and so the Chinese will find out about it at the same time our government does, because Lord knows what they do in these buildings. I, I, I watch crazy people walk, walk in and out of the intelligence community, walk in and out of DARPA. And I think, wow, you're talking to that person? That's really fascinating to me. We don't seem to have a clue as to who might have the ball. Complete lack of transparency. Do you well, think it's possible there's the government is in possession of something deeply fundamental to understanding of the world that they're not releasing? So this is one one thing is this is one of the famous distractions that people play with the narrative. Assume that that were true of alien life forms, in, uh, spacecraft in possession. That the government is in possession of alien spacecraft. That's Assume the popular that we're true. narrative. Yeah. I don't think the government really exists at the moment. I believe, and this is not an idea that was original to me. There was a, a guy named Michael Teitelbaum who used to be at the Sloan Foundation. And at some point I 
pointed out that the U.S. government had completely contradictory objectives when it came to the military and science. And one one branch said this, one branch said that. I said, you know, I, I don't understand what, which is true. What does the government want? He said, you think there's a government? And I said, what do you mean? He said, what makes you think that the people in those two offices have ever coordinated? What is it that allows each office to have a coherent plan with respect to every other office? And that's when I first started to understand that there are periods where the government coheres and then there are periods where the coherence just decays. And I think that that's been going on since 1945, that there have been a few places where there's been increased coherence, but in general, everything is just getting less and less coherent. And that what war did was focus us on the need to have a government, a people, a mission, capacity, technology, commitment, ideology. And then as soon as that was gone, um, you know, different people, those who'd been through World War II had one set of beliefs, those born in the 1950s, uh, you know, or, or late 40s, by the time they got to Woodstock, uh, they didn't buy any of that. So coherence is the, is it the complete opposite of like, per, uh, of bureaucracy being paralyzed by bureaucracy? So coherence is efficient, functional government? Because when you say there's no government, meaning there's no, uh, emergent function from a collection of individuals. It's just a bunch of individuals stuck in their offices without any kind of efficient communication with each other on a single mission. And so a, a government that is truly at the epitome of what a government is supposed to be is when a bunch of people working together on a single What are we mission. about? Are we about freedom? Are we about growth? Are we about decency and fairness? Uh, are we about the absence of a national culture so that we can all just do our own thing? I've called this thing the USAN, the United States of absolutely nothing. Uh, these are all different visions for our country. So it's possible that there's a alien spacecraft somewhere and there's a, like 20 people that know about it. And then they're kind of it like, as you communicate further and further into the offices, that information dissipates, it gets distorted in some kind of way, and then it's completely lost. The power, the possibility of that information is lost. We bought a house and I had this idea that I wanted to find out what all the switches did. And I quickly found out that your house doesn't keep updating its plans. As people do modifications, they just do the modifications and they don't actually record why they were doing what they were doing or what things lead to. So there are all sorts of bizarre, like there's a switch in my house that says privacy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what privacy is. Does it turn on an electromagnetic field that is, <laughs> does some lead shielding go over yeah. the house? Um, that's what we have. We have a system in which the people who've inherited these structures have no idea why they're grand. You often talk about getting off this planet. And I think you don't often talk about extraterrestrial life, intelligent life out there. Do you wonder about this kind of thing, about intelligent civilizations out there? I do, but I try to not wonder about it in a particular way. Um, in, a, in a certain sense, I do find that speculating about Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster and space aliens is kind of a recreation for when things aren't going very well. Uh, at least it gives us some meaning and purpose in our lives. So I worry about, you know, for example, the simulation hypothesis is taking over from religion. You can't quite believe enough to go to church or synagogue or the mosque on the weekend. So then you just take up an interest in, uh, in the simulation theory because that's something like what you do for your job coding. I do think that in some sense, the issue of aliens is a really interesting one, but has been spoiled by too much sort of recreational escapism. The key question that I find is, let's assume that it is possible to look out at the night sky and see all of these distant worlds and then go visit them. If that is possible, it's almost certainly possible through some uh, as yet un, uh, unknown or not accepted theory of physics beyond Einstein. And I mean, it doesn't have to be that way, but probably is. If that theory exists, there would be a, a percentage of the worlds that have life in sort of a Drake equation kind of a way that would have encountered the ability to escape uh, soon enough after unlocking the power of the atom at a minimum and whatever they have that is probably analogous to the cell uh, on that world. So 
assuming that life is a fairly generic thing that arises, uh, probably not carbon-based, probably doesn't have DNA, but that something that fits the pattern of uh, Darwinian theory, which is descent with variation, um, differential success. And thereby constantly improving and so on, that, that there, through time there'll be a trajectory where we'll, there'll be something increasingly complex and fascinating and beautiful like us humans, but much more. That can also off-gas whatever entropy it creates to give an illusion that you're defeating uh, thermodynamics, right? So whatever whatever these things are, probably has an analog of the bilipid layer so that cells can get rid of the chaos on one side of the barrier and keep order on the other. Whatever these things are that create life, assuming that there is a theory to be found that allows that civilization to diversify, um, we would have to imagine that such a civilization might have taken an interest in its concept of the universe and have come here they would come here. They would have a deep understanding of the physics of the universe sufficient to have arrived here. Well, there's two questions, whether they could arrive physically and whether their information could be sent here and whether they could gain information from us. It's possible that um, they would have a way of looking into our world without actually reaching it. I don't know. But yes, if my hope which is that we can escape this world is can be realized if that's if that's feasible then you would have to imagine that the re reverse is true and that somebody else uh should be here this is where i've been i've been talking to a bunch of people about um extraterrestrial life i'm really excited by i don't know it's the other thing um when I look out to the stars, it's exciting to me. I know I think you've spoken about it being scary, mm -hmm. <laughs> but to me, it's exciting that there's intelligent creatures out there far beyond perhaps the intelligence of our own that uh, are just too far away to explore yet, but we might one day come in contact with them. So uh, that, that to me is the ultimate motivator is to meet other intelligence life forms out there and connect with them. Have you ever met uh, Jacques Vallée? Uh, no, but I've been in communication. I want to. Ho I hope to talk to him. He's an amazing. He's French, yeah. I um, <laughs> I know that there's ma many him? theories about. Yes. You know, if there's alien, we don't know, right? But but some people think it's from another star systems. And Jacques Vallée has a like to make a long story short. He has a different theory. He thinks it's perhaps beings that could be living in a different dimension than, than us. And the reason why he says that is when he makes an experiment, ex when there is a sightings very often of a UFO, let's say I'm, I'm the UFO, that you have three guys. One, they, they are looking at the UFO very often. <laughs> One experiment that you can do, and sometimes that, that is the case, you ask your two friends to walk on the side and there's a, a, t a point that it's like a corridor. You see the UFO and then you stop seeing it like mm -hmm. a corridor. And that's one of the reasons why he's saying that it's perhaps a dimension. And I found that fascinating, you know? It's, I, this is what, you know, to the discussion of consciousness and all that, it, it, it feels like we might be just experiencing a very particular slice of this universe. We might not be understanding what's at the higher dimensions or, yeah, I mean, higher dimensions in whatever form that means. You know, there's all these physical theories now that describe a, a world with dimensions that's much higher than the four dimensions of, the three dimension of space and the one dimension of time. So whatever the hell is going on in those other dimensions, it could be something, unfortunately, this is the sad part. It might be something we can't even comprehend with our human brains. That the limitations are just, um, I mean, we're built, we're just descendants of apes. So like, it might not be possible to even understand. Is there alien? Is there another dimension? Are they a human from the future? Is there perhaps Chinese or another, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? A group of people that are working with a technology far behind. But you know what, Lex, I, I had a chance to meet, uh, you know, because of the sport I'm doing, I met a lot of people in military and politics sometimes that I, I ask them every time. <laughs> I met I met one this week and, and yeah. um I I I asked him, I say, is it true about the, the UFO is there? Is there and he says to me he's like 
before, even before I ask him, I say, hey, I, I sort of have to ask you a question. I was in uh, Los Angeles. And uh, I said, sorry, I have to ask you a question. He said, oh, you want to ask me about UFO? Right away, you knew. And I said, yes. He, he said, saw it in your eyes. He said, yeah, there is things that flies that we don't know. But yeah. it does, he didn't tell me, he doesn't know, it. they don't know if it's alien or whatever, but there's things apparently that are detected. And I know you met uh, Fravor, yeah. you know, like. Fravor is fascinating. It's I mean, it makes crazy. Me, it makes me sad that. We live in a different era now that that it's it used to be a, a subject that was ridiculed and now it, it's so cool that it's you know I'm very excited to live in to that that era you know yeah it's really exciting but still the governments are kind of behind the times on that aspect is they're not transparent and they don't communicate well you know it saddens me to think the possibility that that you know like the U.S. government might be in possession of something that they don't tell the world about because they're just scared it's because they don't know what the hell it is and they don't want the chinese to gain the technology or all those kinds of things do you think the president of the united states for example because the president comes and go every right four or eight years do you think he would know all the secret or it would be a guy like for example vladimir putin would know mo much of uh you know what i mean i don't think the president even know like even can knows all all the the secret the u.s right? president yeah i don't think so don't because think so he, he goes they go back and forth you know every four years you know they have the terms right so i you know i i wasn't sure before but i think i could trust the previous united states president of donald trump that if he knew he would, <laughs> He would probably tweet about it. So perhaps. I, <laughs> so, I yeah, I I think it, 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 from from the con, you know I've worked with DARPA, I work with uh, DOD at a clearance, and I think from the perspective, if you if you see the world as fundamentally a dangerous world, where secrets are important to have from a military perspective, I think it's very unsafe to tell the president of the United States. Yeah that you have this kind of technology. So if you think of the world in that way, I, I hate that that's how that world is viewed because ultimately I think what's more powerful than the military secrets, and I hope that actually is what will happen in the 21st century, is what's more powerful is inspire people, inspire the the young Elon Musks of the world to, to create cool new things. If we have technology that we've, uh, uh, have come have encountered that we don't understand that should only be inspiration to, to uh develop that kind of stuff mm -hmm. it shouldn't be seen as military uh, as a military threat as a secret to hold on to i think secrets um uh, i hope we more and more let go of the idea that there are secrets that give us advantage you know like in the tech sector people are more and more releasing the software they're making it open source like secrets don't make sense. Uh, they share the knowledge, right? Share, share the knowledge. Like share, like being afraid to share the knowledge. I think, I hope, is an old idea. It's more, I, yeah. When you make it, things more compartmentalized, you know. Yes. Yeah, right. Well, yeah. The, well, that's the other thing is the bureaucracy of government is like people only know their own little thing and they don't spread the information. It doesn't travel well. I mean, there's a lot of just inefficiencies that are. It makes me sad. It makes me sad because. Uh, the the science, the engineering that happens in governments, like Lockheed Martin developing the different airplanes that they're used for military applications, is some of the most incredible engineering ever. And it's secret because they're afraid to share it wow. with the Russians and the Chinese and so on. But on that topic, I do think somebody like Vladimir Putin <laughs> would know probably knows some stuff. <laughs> My God, my God. <laughs> I would I would love to know what he knows. But then again, you, you never know because even he is, you know, people think of him as an exceptionally powerful person, but he's also just managing a bunch of tribes. Hmm. His power is very limited. He's trying to hold together uh, a bunch of greedy, power hungry madmen. That's right. Okay, and he's trying to establish a balance. He might not know everything, so. I, I hope this changes because I think there's nothing more exciting about. I don't even know if there is a human that knows. You know what I mean? Like this idea that 
there's some uh, civilization, alien civilization that that land on the White House and say, "Hi, right, I come to meet the president." And like, why would they do that? You know what I mean? It's kind of absurd, you know. It, well, I I do think that actually, I mean, that's one possibility, right? Is Lart, you know. <laughs> if an alien civilization really wanted to contact us, I think everybody would know. So I think what we're, if if there's any kind of interaction between humans and aliens, I think most likely what we're interacting with is a crappy like probe drone thing that kind of just like, like it's like this- <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> no, no, no. more, yeah, yeah. It's this dumb thing, you know, we're not interacting with the aliens. I think j- just like, just like for us, I think humans aren't, when we uh, venture out into space, the first thing that's going to meet aliens is our robots. It's not us humans, because we keep sending robots out. So they're going to like, they're going to make decisions about humans by looking at the robots. <laughs> so, the, the famous grays. <laughs> the grays. <laughs> maybe they are robots, maybe it's all BS too, you know? Yeah, yeah, so I, I don't know I don't know what uh, that interaction actually would look like if aliens really wanted to reach out, really communicate. And I don't know if we're able to actually communicate with them. That's one of the sad things. We might not be able to, that we might, the aliens might already be here and we might just not even know, know how to see them or know how to communicate with them. There's so much misinformation and sometimes there is peoples that are very credible that, that that made crazy claims you know like like you don't know what to believe you know like like paul elier the 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 minister of defense of canada said like some that there is many alien rays that ever that, that's what he says <laughs> research it and, yeah. and the, that that scientist uh, from uh, i think israel recently have said something yeah. about trump he, he was keeping secret or medvedev you're from russia medvedev yeah. have been cut in the like in, during a break in between interviews to talks about like, oh, it's like men in black, so to speak. I don't know. He didn't look like he was joking, but I don't know if he oh, was saying the truth. I didn't know about this. That's yeah, you can check on YouTube. It's a, it's, 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 it, went, it went viral. Yeah, there's a lot of things like that sometimes. I'm like, or, or Bob Lazar. I'm like, imagine if it's true, man. Yeah. Imagine, imagine if, we're, if we're like a fish in the water, we live in our own world and sometimes there's a, a fisherman that grabbed the fish, yeah, <laughs> take him out of the water and, and threw it back in the water. And the fish goes back to the other fish and say, hey, <laughs> there's someone that, that take me out of the water. Then I've seen uh, things that I did not like. Imagine if it's true. Like, we like, uh, yeah. And, and uh, one other thing, like, I wanted to ask you because you, you were consciousness. And, and, there, there, and there's no telling what spooky things may in fact be true. I mean, I don't know if you've been on the receiving end of you know, recent rumors about uh, our conversation about UFOs very likely changing in the near term, right? But like yeah. there, there was just a Washington Post article and a New Yorker article. And, you know, I've received some private outreach and perhaps you have, I, I know other people in our, our orbit have pe- people who are claiming that the government has known much more about UFOs than they have let on until now. And this conversation is actually is about to become more prominent, you know, yes. and, and it's it's not going to be whatever, you know, whoever's left standing when the music stops, it's not going to be a comfortable position to be in as a you know, super rigorous scientific skeptic saying there's no there who's been saying there's no there there for the last 75 years right you know, like like uh, to the, the short version is it, it sounds like the office of naval intelligence and the pentagon are very likely to say to congress at some point in the not too distant future that we have evidence that there is technology flying around here that seems like it can't possibly possibly be of human origin right, right? Now I don't know what I'm going to do with that kind of disclosure, right? Maybe it's just it's going to this going to be nothing, no follow-on conversation to really have. But that is such a powerfully strange circumstance to be in, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it's just what are we going to do with that? If in fact that's what happens, right? Uh, if in fact the the considered opinion, despite the the embarrassment it causes them, of 
the US government, of all of our intelligence, all of the relevant intelligence services, is that this isn't a hoax. It's too, there's too much data to suggest that it's a hoax. We've got too much radar imagery. There's too much, too much satellite data, whatever data, whatever data they actually have. There's too much of it. All we can say now is something's going on and there's no way it's the Chinese or the Russians or anyone else's technology. That should, that should arrest our attention, you know, collectively to, to a degree that nothing in our lifetime has. And now one worries that we're so jaded and confused and distracted that it's going to it'll get, get much less coverage than than uh you know Obama's tan suit did yeah. you know uh, a bunch of years ago it's just it's uh who knows how we'll respond to that but uh, it's just to say that our the need for us to tell ourselves a a an honest story about what's going on and what's likely to happen next is never going to go away Right. And, and it's important. It's just the, 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 the division between me and every person who's defending traditional religion is where, where is it that, where is it that you want to lie to yourself or lie to your kids? Like, where is honesty a liability? And I, and for me, it, you know, I, I've yet to find the place where it is. And it's so obviously a strength in almost every other circumstance because it is the thing that allows you to course correct. It is the thing that that, that allows you to hope at least that your beliefs, that your stories are in some kind of calibration with what's actually going on in the world. Yeah, it's, it is a little bit sad to imagine that if aliens en masse showed up to Earth, they would be too preoccupied with political bickering or to like these like fake news and all that kind of stuff to notice yeah. the very basic uh, evidence of reality. I, I do have a glimmer of hope that there seems to be more and more hunger for authenticity. And I feel like that opens the door for a hunger for what is real. Like that people don't want story, like they don't want like layers and layers of, of uh, like fakeness. Uh, and I'm hoping that means that will directly lead to a greater hunger for reality and reason and truth. You know, truth isn't dogmatism. <laughs> like, truth isn't uh, authority. I have a PhD and therefore I'm right. Hmm. Uh, truth is almost the, like the, the, the reality is there's so many questions, there's so many mysteries, there's so much uncertainty. This is our best available, like a best guess. And we have a lot of evidence that supports that guess, but it could be so many other things. And like, just even conveying that, I think there's a hunger for that in the world to hear that from scientists, less dogmatism and more just like, this is this is what we know, we're doing our best given mm -hmm. the uncertainty, given, I mean, this is true with uh, obviously with the uh, virology and all those kinds of things, because everything is happening so fast, there's a lot of, and biology is super messy, so it's very hard to know stuff for sure. Mm -hmm. So just being open and real about that, I think I'm hoping will change people's hunger and openness and trust of uh, what's real. Yeah, well, so much of this is probabilistic. It's, I mean, so much of right. what can seem dogmatic scientifically is just you're just you're placing a bet on whether it's worth reading that paper or rethinking your presuppositions on that point right. you know it's like it's not it's not fundamental closure to data it's just that there's so much data on one side or so or so much so much would have to change in terms of your understanding of, of what you think you understand about the nature of the world if this new fact were so that y you can pretty quickly say all right that's probably bullshit right like and and it can sound like a fundamental closure to new conversations, new evidence, new new data, new argument, but it's really not. It's just it really is just triaging your attention. It's just like like okay, you, you're telling me that uh, your best friend can actually read minds. Okay, well, that's interesting. 
let me know when that person has gone into a lab and actually proven it, right? Like, I don't need, I, like, I, this, this is not the place where I need to spend the rest of my day figuring out if your buddy can, can read my mind, right? Yeah. But there's a way to communicate that. I think, I think it does too often sound like you're completely closed off to ideas as opposed mm -hmm. to saying like, this is, you know, as opposed to saying that there's, there's a lot of evidence in support of this, but you're still open-minded to other ideas. Like there's a way to communicate that. It's not necessarily even with words. It's like, it's even that Joe Rogan energy of it's entirely possible. Just it's that energy of being open minded and curious like kids are. Like this is our best understanding, but you still are curious. I'm not saying allocate time to exploring all those things, but still leaving the door open. And there's a way to communicate that I think that 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 people really hunger uh for. Let me ask what about uh space itself? So I have to ask you about aliens. <laughs> Again, something uh, since you emphasize evidence, um, do you think there is how many? Do you think there are, and how many intelligent alien civilizations are out there? <laughs> I, uh, I have I have no idea. But I have certainly, as far as I know, unless the government's covering it up or something, we haven't heard from. Uh, we don't have any evidence for such things yet. But there's there seems to be no there's no particular obstruction why there shouldn't be. So. I mean, do you, <laughs> you work on some fundamental questions about the physics of reality. When you look up to the stars, yeah. do you think about whether somebody's looking back at us? Yes, yeah, well, actually, I originally got interested in physics. I actually started out as a kid interested in astronomy, exactly that, and a telescope and whatever that, and certainly read a lot of science fiction and thought about that. I, I find over the years, I find myself kind of less, anyway, Less and less interested in that, well, just because I don't, I kind of don't really know what to do with them. Um, I've also kind of, kind of, at some point, kind of stopped reading science fiction that much. Kind of feeling that there was just too, that the actual science I was kind of learning about was perfectly kind of weird and fascinating and unusual enough, but and better than any of the stuff that in Isaac Asimov. So why should I? <laughs> yeah, and you can mess with the science much more than the the distant science fiction. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the one that's exists in our imagination or the one that exists out there in, in, among the stars. Yeah. Well, you mentioned science fiction. You've written quite a few book reviews. I gotta ask you about some books perhaps, if you don't mind. Um, is, is there one or two books that you would recommend to others and maybe if you can, what ideas you drew from them? Either negative recommendation or positive. Recommendation. <laughs> well, do I, not read this book for sure. Well, I must say, that, I mean, I, I, unfortunately, uh, yeah. Well, you can go to my website, and there's a you can click on book reviews, and you can see I've written, read a lot of a lot of. I mean, I, I, as you can tell from my views about string theory, I, I'm not a fan of a, a lot of the kind of popular books about. Oh, isn't string theory great? And about yes, yeah, so I'm not a fan of. Uh, a lot of things of that kind. Can I ask you a quick question on yeah. this, a small tangent? Are you a fan, okay, can you explore the pros and cons of, forget string theory, sort of science communication, sort of cosmos style communication of concepts to people that are outside of physics, outside of mathematics, outside of even the sciences, and helping people to sort of dream and fill them with awe about the full range of mysteries in our universe. That's a complicated issue. You know, I think, you know, I certainly go back and go back to, to like what inspired me, and um, maybe to connect it, uh, to connect it a little bit to this question about books. I mean, so, certainly one, the books that some books that I remember reading when I was a kid were about the early history of quantum mechanics, like Heisenberg's books that he wrote about, you know, kind of looking back at telling the history of what happened when he developed quantum mechanics. It's just kind of a totally fascinating, romantic, great story. And uh, those were very inspirational to me. And um, I would think maybe that other people might also also find them that. But the- um, And that's that's almost like the human story of the development of the ideas. Yeah, the human story. But yeah, just also how, you know, they, they are these very, very weird ideas that didn't seem to make sense, that how they were struggling with them and how, you know, they actually, anyway. It's, 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 it's I think it's a, the, the period of physics kind of beginning you know, 1905 with Planck and Einstein and 
ending up with the war when <laughs> these things are get used to you know make massively destructive weapons it's, it's just the truly amazing so many so many new ideas let me on another a tangent on top of a tangent on top of a tangent ask if we didn't have einstein so how does science progress is it the lone geniuses or is it uh some kind of weird network of ideas swimming in the air and, and just kind of the the geniuses pop up to catch them and others would anyway Without Einstein, would we have uh, special relativity, general relativity? I mean, it, it, it's an interesting case to case basis. I mean, I mean, special special relativity. I, th I think we would have had. I mean, there are other people. Anyway, you could even argue that it, it was already there in some form in some ways. But I think special relativity you would have had without Einstein fairly, fairly quickly. General relativity, that was a much much harder thing to do, and. Um, Required a much more effort, much more sophisticated. That you, I think he would have had sooner or later, but it would have taken taken quite a bit longer. Other that, thing that took a bunch of years to vi validate scientifically the general relativity. But even for Einstein, from you know the point where he had kind of a general idea of what he was trying to do to the point where he actually had a well defined theory that you could actually compare to the real world, that was you know. I don't forget the number of the order of magnitude. Ten years of very serious work, and um, if he hadn't been an around to do that, it would have taken a while before anyone else got around to it. On the other hand, there are things like, with quantum mechanics, you have um, you know, Heisenberg and um, Schrodinger came up with two, which ultimately equivalent, but two different approaches to it, you know, within months of each other. And, you know, so if Heisenberg hadn't been there, he already would have had Schrodinger or whatever. And if neither of them had been there, it would have been somebody else a few months later. So. There are times when the, um, you know, just the, a lot, often it's the combination of, of the right ideas are in place and the right experimental data is in place to point in the right direction and it's just waiting for somebody's going to find it. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe to go back to your, uh, to your aliens, I guess the one thing that I often wonder about aliens is would they have the same fundamental physics ideas as we, as we have in mathematics? Would their math, you know, would they, you know, it, how how much is this really intrinsic to our minds? If if you start out with a different kind of mind, wouldn't you end up with a different ideas of what fundamental physics is, or what or what the structure of mathematics is? So this is why, like, yeah. if, if I was, uh, you know, I like video games. The way I would do it as a curious being, so first experiment I'd like to do is run Earth over many thousands of times and see if our particular, um, no, you know what. I wouldn't do the full evolution. I would start at Homo sapiens first and then see the evolution of Homo sapiens millions of times and see how the, the ideas of science would evolve. Like, would you yeah. get, like how would physics evolve? How would math evolve? I would particularly just be curious about the notation they come up with. Yeah. Um, every once in a while, I would like throw miracles at them to like <laughs> to, to mess with them and stuff. And, and then I would also like to run Earth from the very beginning to see if evolution would produce different kinds of brains that would then produce different kinds of mathematics and physics. And then finally, I would probably millions of times run the universe over to see what kind of um, what kind of environments and what kind of uh, life would be created to then lead to intelligent life, to then lead to um, theories of mathematics and physics and to see the full range. And like sort of uh, like uh, Darwin kind of mark, okay, it took them, uh, what is it? Uh, several hundred million years to come up with uh, calculus. <laughs> I would just like keep noting how long it took <laughs> and get an average and see see which ideas are difficult, which are not. And, and, then, and then conclusively, Sort of figure out if it's uh, if it's more collective intelligence or singular intelligence that's responsible for shifts and for big phase shifts and breakthroughs in science. Yeah. If I was playing a video game and ran okay. the, I got a chance to run this whole thing. Yeah, but um, we're talking about books before about I distract okay, us. So books, yeah, go back books and yeah. So and and then yeah. So that's one thing I recommend is the is the books books about the from the original people, especially Heisenberg, about the how that happened. And there's also a very, very good kind of history of of the kind of what happened during this 20th century 
in physics and you know up to the time of the standard model in 1973 it's called the um, the second creation by um Bob Kreese and uh, and man that's one of the best ones i know that's <laughs> but the the one thing that i can say is that so that book i think forget when it was late 80s 90s <laughs> do you do you ever think about aliens like what they might look like i try to when i i deal with thought experiments like these i try to keep a very abstract uh, mindset. And I notice that whenever uh, I try to instantiate these abstractions, I I corrupt whatever thoughts uh, there are for which they're useful. So it's kind of like the labels discussion. So like the moment exactly. you try to make it concrete, it's probably going to look like some cute version of a human, a big, like, it's the little green fellas with the with the eyes and so on, or whatever. Whatever the movies uh, have instilled, like your cultural upbringing, you're going to project onto that and the assumptions you have. Exactly. That's interesting. So you prefer to sort of step away and think and abstract notions of what it means to be intelligent, what it means to be a living life form, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I try to. I almost try to pretend I'm I'm blind and I'm deaf and I'm only. Um, a mind with no inductive reasoning capacity when I'm trying to think about uh, thought experiments like these, because I know that uh, if I incorporate whatever my eyes uh, instruct my brain, I will uh, I will impede my ability to think as deeply as possible. Because once again, it's the, the thing which shallows our thought can be the incorporation of circumstance and coincidence. And for particular kinds of thought, that's very important. I'm not discounting the use of inductive reasoning um, in many humanities and in many sciences, but for the deepest of thoughts, once again, I, I, I feel it's important to try to transcend whatever uh, methods of observation characterize human experience. See, but within that, that's all really beautifully put. I, I wonder if there is a common mathematics and a common physics between us and alien beings, we still have to make concrete the methods of communication. Yeah. Uh, and that's a fascinating question of like, while remaining in these abstract fundamental ideas, how do we communicate with uh, them? I mean, I, I suppose that question could be applied to different cultures on Earth. <laughs> but it's f finding a common language. Uh, do you think about that kind of problem of basically communicating abstract fundamental ideas? My least favorite aspect of math or physics or any of these really deep sciences is the symbolic component. You know, I'm I'm dyslexic. I don't like looking at at symbols. They're too often a source of, of ambiguity. And I think you're entirely right that if one thing holds us back with um, communication with something that, that, that behaves or, or looks nothing like us, I think if one thing holds us back, uh, it will be symbols and the communication of deep thought. Because as I said, I think communication frequently compromises thought uh, by intention or by just uh, theoretical inadequacy. Question is, if you were able to ask an alien some questions, what would they be? This is a really good question, and uh, I find it to be actually a really good thought experiment. Let me put out some uh, candidate questions out there and see what sticks. So first I'll probably ask for advice for the human species as a whole, for our civilization, of what we might do to survive and prosper for a long time to come, assuming the alien is uh, from a civilization that's far older than ours or far wiser. And I think there could be some really interesting, clear statements about the things we're doing here on earth that are getting us into trouble from an alien perspective. So I think that's the number one thing. And maybe I'll bring up like along those lines, bring up questions of great filters. Like, you know, if you look at the history of your civilization, when did you almost destroy the entirety of your species? 
uh, it would be like informative from a historical perspective to see like, you know, for us, it's currently what the nuclear age and the few moments in the history that could have resulted in an, an all out nuclear war. It'd be interesting to see if they mentioned something about AGI, something about uh, viruses or wars or just things that don't we don't even think about. So I guess question number one would be like some basic life advice. Hoping that this alien is like a Naval type character who can like in a crisp, short way, give some profound advice. <laughs> Second, I would probably ask, now this is a very selfish conversation because it's just following along the things on top of my head that follow my curiosity. I would ask about the difference between their civilization and ours. I would ask whether they have some of these things that make us human. Like love, like do you guys have love where you come from? Do you have death, mortality? You know, I suspect it's possible to have mortality not even be a concept that makes any sense to an alien species, that of course everybody's immortal and there might be some kind of enforced selection mechanism, like evolution in general. I would ask about consciousness, try to like tease apart the question of like this thing of subjective experience, is is this some kind of uh, self-centered, weird, over-dramatized quirk of evolution that we have that's not actually special at all? And then we make a kind of big deal about it. That's some kind of useful feature of our brain to think of ourselves as individuals that's completely silly. It would be interesting to try to tease apart whether they have consciousness and what form their intelligence takes that is distinct from consciousness in the way that we think of humans as being conscious entities that are also able to do intelligent things. Are those intricately connected? Are those separate? It'd be interesting to sort of tease that apart of how their alien minds work. So that includes intelligence, consciousness, love, and death, all the greatest hits. Okay, then I will probably go to physics. Of course, you got to ask about physics. I would look into the alien's eyes, if they have eyes, and try to determine if um, if we can actually even find the same language of mathematics, of physics, of sciences. In general, I would probably ask about the big mysteries of physics and science, of what's outside our universe. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there stuff? <laughs> And what's outside the stuff we think of as stuff? So like what's outside the universe? I'd be hesitant to ask the why questions, but you know, I'll try a few out to see maybe there is a good answer to the why questions of like, why did it start? Like, why is there something rather than nothing? Then I would probably ask slightly more detailed about what's the universe made of? Like what's up with this dark matter and dark energy stuff? Like what are the basic building blocks of reality? And what are the laws of physics that govern that reality? So I would of course ask, kind of sneak in there, just like casually, can you maybe give a few hints of how to unify? First of all, are we on the right track in terms of uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity? And then how do you unify all the laws of physics? Maybe sneak in there in a different angle, trying to ask about the singularity in the black hole, or maybe what happens at the very beginning of the Big Bang, like where those laws are all unified. Maybe trying to get a sense of what are the kind of physics required to fully describe these events. I think the physics discussion would be a good time to ask, is there a God? Maybe not use the G word, but instead say, is there a kind of a centralized designer or team of designers that have like launched the universe? and are actively managing the universe. And of course, another version of asking that, I would uh, probably talk about the simulation of uh, looking at the universe as we see it, as a computation, as a computer that's doing information processing, see if that rings a bell to the alien, if there's a connection to that. In general, I would ask about what kind of computers you have, and also what kind of computer games, that'd be really useful. Like, what do you do for fun? <laughs> you come here often? But that's like usual icebreakers. Of course, I'm not mentioning those. That's just like chatter at the bar. 
So I guess outside the big physics questions, I would ask the more engineering centric questions. First, my interest AI about super intelligence. How do we build super intelligent systems, ones that are far more intelligent than humans? How do we travel close to the speed of light or faster than the speed of light? Like how did the aliens get to where we're at that we're meeting and talking? Related to that would be a question of energy. How do we harness the energy of a sun or multiple suns or all of the suns in our galaxy? And then also kind of an engineering question, can we travel through time? And if we can, how do we build a time traveling machine? And is it a good idea? I think a lot of these questions will be appended with a sort of caveat of like, if you know the answer to this question, will I be better off if you told me this answer? <laughs> Sometimes knowledge is not power. Sometimes uh, knowledge is a burden that leads to self-destruction. So we wanna be careful about that. Of course, as the alien gets tired of talking to me at this intergalactic bar, probably gets up, sort of politely, starts walking away. I'll, um, I would definitely ask some questions, you know, for my own personal knowledge bank. Is P equals NP? Good question. Theoretical computer science, one of the big questions, all mathematics. Be, I just need to know the answer. Just give me the answer, I'll work from there. Okay, we'll figure out the rest, just the answer. So yes or no. Uh, probably won't ask him for investment advice. He probably thinks that the whole concept of money is silly, but I might ask about uh, Bitcoin. Good long-term investment or bad? What do you think? The digital currency in general. And of course, we'll probably ask, is Elon Musk one of you guys or a different species? Do you know which uh, galaxy which group of planets it came from. It'd be nice to sort of localize things. Is there others like it that visit and build companies? Just get some of the details. This AMA has suddenly become ridiculous, but I think this is a really nice thought experiment and I'll think about this a little bit more. I I'm sure there is a list of really precise questions that could most efficiently unlock the mysteries before the human race that are both useful for our progress and useful for us. It's possible that a human-like intelligent civilization has previously existed on Earth. Oh, yeah. The reason I say this is like, it is jarring to think that we would not, if they went extinct, we wouldn't be able to find evidence of them. After a sufficient amount of time. Uh, after a sufficient amount of time. Of yeah. course, there's like, uh, like, basically humans, like if we destroy ourselves now, human civilization destroyed ourselves now. After a sufficient amount of time, we would not be, we'd find the evidence of the dinosaurs, we would not find evidence of yeah, us humans. Yeah, that's, a, that's kind of an odd thing to think about. Although I'm not sure if we have enough knowledge about species going back for billions of years that we could, we could, we might be able to eliminate that possibility. But it's an interesting question. Of course, this is a similar question to, you know, there were lots of intelligent species throughout, the, throughout our galaxy that have all disappeared. Uh, yeah, that's super sad that um, there, exactly, that there there may have been much more intelligent alien civilizations in our galaxy that are no longer there. Yeah. Um, you actually talked about this, um, that humans might destroy ourselves. Yeah. And how we might preserve our knowledge. Yeah. And advertise that knowledge <laughs> to other <laughs> Advertising is a funny word to use. There's no, PR, from a PR perspective. There's no financial gain in this. <laughs> uh, you know, like make it like from a tourism perspective, make it interesting. Can you describe how Well, how there's a couple of things. I, I broke it down into two parts, well, actually three parts. One is, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of things we know that, what if, what if we were, to, what if we ended, what if our civilization collapsed? Yeah, I'm not talking tomorrow. Yeah, you know, we could be a thousand years from now. Like, so, you know, we don't really know. But, yeah. but historically, it would be likely at some point. Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Um, you know, could we? And then, then intelligent life evolved again on this planet. Wouldn't they want to know a lot about us mm -hmm. and what we knew? Wouldn't they? Wouldn't be able to ask us questions? So, one very simple thing I said: How would we archive what we know? Mm -hmm. That was a very simple idea. I said, you know what? It's, that wouldn't be that hard. Put a few satellites, you know, going around the, the sun, and we upload Wikipedia every day, and mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing. 
Uh, so, you know, if we end up killing ourselves, well, it's up there and the next intelligence piece will find it and learn something. That would be, they would like that. They would appreciate that. The, um, uh, so that's one thing. The next thing I said, well, what if, you know, how would, outside, outside of our solar system, mm -hmm. we have the SETI program. We're looking for these intelligence signals from everybody. And if you do a little bit of math, which I did in the book, uh, and you say, well, what if intelligent species only live for 10,000 years? before, you know, technologically intelligent species, like ones are really able to do the stuff we're just starting to be able to do. Mm -hmm. um, well, the chances are we wouldn't be able to see any of them because they would have all been disappeared by now. Um, they've, been, they've lived for 10,000 years and now they're gone. And so we're not going to find these signals being sent from these people because um, if I said, what kind of signal could you create that would last a million years or a billion years? That someone would say, damn it, someone smart lived there. Yeah. We know that. That would be a life-changing event for us to figure that out. Well, what we're looking for today in the SETI program isn't that. We're looking for very coded signals in some sense. Um, and so I asked myself, what would be a different type of signal one could create? Um, I've always thought about this throughout my life. And in the book, I gave one, one possible suggestion, which was um, uh, we now detect planets going around other, other suns, uh, mm -hmm. other stars. Uh, excuse me. And we do that by seeing this the this slight dimming of the light as the planets move in front of them. That's how uh, we detect uh, planets elsewhere in our galaxy. Mm -hmm. um, what if we created something like that that just rotated around our, our our around the sun and it blocked out a little bit of the light in a particular pattern that someone said, "Hey, that's not a planet. That is a sign that someone was once there." You can think, what if it's beating up pi? You know, three point whatever. Um, so the idea from that, a distance, you can, you it, can from a distance, broadly broadcast, takes no continual activation on our part. This is the key, right? You, no one has to be sitting here running a computer and supplying it with power. Mm -hmm. It just goes on. So we go, it continues. And, and I argued that part of the SETI program should be looking for signals like that. And to look for signals like that, you ought to figure out what the, how would we create a signal? Like, what would we create that would be like that, that would persist for millions of years that would be broadcast broadly that you could see from a distance that was unequivocal, came from an, a, a bio, a, an intelligent species. And so I gave that one example because um, they don't know what I know of, actually. And then, and then finally, right, if, if our, ultimately our solar system will die at some point in time, you know, how do we go beyond that? And I think it's possible, if, if at all possible, we'll have to create intelligent machines that travel throughout the, throughout the, uh, the solar system or throughout the, the galaxy. And I don't think that's going to be humans. I don't think it's going to be biological organisms. So these are just things to think about, you know, mm -hmm. like what's the, old, you know, I, I, kinda, I don't want to be like the dinosaur. I don't want to just live and like, okay, that was it. We're done, you know. <laughs> well, there is a kind of presumption that we're going to live forever, which uh, I, I think it is a bit sad to imagine that the message we send as, uh, as you talk about is that we were once here instead of we are here. Well, it could be we are still here, uh, but it's more, of a, it's more of an insurance policy in case we're not here, you know? Well, the, I don't know, but there is something, I think about, we, we as humans don't often think about this, but it's like, uh, like whenever I... Um, record a video I've, I've done this a, a couple of times in my life i've recorded a video for my future self just for mm -hmm. personal just for fun and it's always just fascinating to think about that preserving yourself for future civilizations for me yeah. it was preserving myself for a future me but that's a little that's a little fun example yeah of archival well these podcasts are are, are preserving you and i in, in a way uh, yeah for future um, hopefully well after we're gone. But you don't often, we're sitting here talking about this. You are not thinking about the fact that you and I are going to die and there'll be like 10 years after somebody watching this and we're still alive. You know, in, in some sense I do. I'm here because I want to talk about ideas. Right. And these ideas transcend me mm -hmm. and they transcend this time in, in, on our planet. Um, we're talking here about ideas that could be around a thousand years from now or a million years from now. I, when I wrote my book, I had an audience in mind and one of the clearest audiences was, was aliens. No, <laughs> were people reading this a hundred years from now? Yes. I said to myself, how do I make this book relevant to someone reading this a hundred years from now? What would they want to know that we were thinking back then? What would make it like that was an interesting, it's still an interesting book.
Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure I can I achieve that, but that was how I thought about it because these ideas, like especially in the third part of the book, the ones we were just talking about, you know, these crazy, it sounds like crazy ideas about, you know, storing our knowledge and, and you know, merging our brains with computers and, and sending, you know, our machines out into space. It's not going to happen in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, and they may not even happen in the next hundred years. They may not happen for a thousand years. Who knows? Uh, but we have the unique opportunity right now, we, you, me, and other people like this, um, to sort of at least propose the agenda um, that might impact the future like that. That's a fascinating way to think uh, both like writing or creating, try to make, try to create ideas, try to create things that uh, hold up in time. Yeah. You know, understanding how the brain works, we're going to figure that out once. That's it. It's going to be figured out once. And after that, that's the answer. And people will, people will study that thousands of years from now. We still, we still, you know, venerate Newton and, and Einstein. And, um, and, you know, because, because ideas are exciting even well into the future. You know? they well, the know. interesting thing is like big ideas, even if they're wrong, are still useful. Like, yeah, especially if they're not completely wrong. Like, like right, right, right. Right, yeah. Newton's laws are not wrong. They're just Einstein's are better. <laughs> right? So, um, well, it's, so yeah, I mean, but we're talking with Newton and Einstein. We're talking about physics. I wonder if we'll ever achieve that kind of clarity about understanding um, like complex systems and the this particular manifestation of complex systems, which is the human brain. Oh, I, I'm, I'm totally optimistic we can do that. I mean, we're making progress at it. I don't see any reason why we can't completely, I mean, completely understand in the sense, um, you know, we don't really completely understand what all the molecules in this water bottle are doing, but, you know, we have laws that sort of capture it pretty good. Um, and uh, so we'll have that kind of understanding. I mean, it's not like you're going to have to know what every neuron in your brain is doing. Um, but, but enough to, uh, to, first of all, to build it. Yeah. And second of all, to do, you know, do what physics does, which is like have uh, concrete experiments yeah. where we oh, can yeah. validate. I, I, we're, 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 this is happening right now. Like it's not, this is not some future thing. Um, you know, I'm very optimistic about it because I'm, I know about our, our work and what we're doing. We'll have to prove it to people. Um, but um, I, I consider myself a rational person. And, um, you know, until fairly recently, I wouldn't have said that. But right now, I'm where I'm sitting right now. I'm saying, you know, we we can, this is going to happen. There's there's no big obstacles to it. Um, we finally have a framework for understanding what's going on in the cortex, and um, and that's liberating. It's it's like oh, it's happening. So I I can't see why we wouldn't be able to understand it. I just so using that logic. How many alien civilizations do you think are out there? There's 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 like trillions of environments. Mm -hmm. AKA planets, uh, or maybe you can think even bigger than planets. How many lifelike organisms do you think are uh, out there thriving? And maybe how many do you think are long gone, but were once here? I think, well, innumerable. Uh, I think in so terms of the- Greater than zero. Gr much greater than zero. I mean, I would just be surprised. What a waste, right? Of all that space just for us, if we're never gonna get there. Um, that would be my first, uh, way to think about it. But second, I mean, I remember when I was about seven or eight years old, and I would love if any of your listeners could find this National Geographic. Uh, I remember opening, uh, the page of the National Geographic. I was about, again, seven to 10 years old. And it was sort of a current picture of the universe. It was around probably 1968, 1969. And I just remember looking at it and thinking, what kinds of empires have risen and fallen across that space yeah. uh, that we'll never know about? And would, isn't that sad that we know nothing about something so grand? Uh, and so I've always been a reader of science fiction because I like the creative ideas of what people come up with. And I especially like science fiction writers that base it in good science, but base it also in evolution. That if you evolve a civilization from something lifelike, right, some sort of biology, its assumptions about the universe will come from the environment 
in which it grew up. So for instance, Larry Niven is a great writer uh, and he imagines different kinds of civilizations. In some cases, what happens if uh, evolu what happens if intelligence evolved from a herd animal, right? Would you lead from behind, uh -huh. right? Would you be, uh, you know, in his case, one of them were the, the so-called puppeteers. And to them, the moral imperative is cowardice. You put other people forward to run the risk for you, right? And so he writes entire books around that premise. There's another guy, uh, Bryn, David Bryn, is his name, and he writes the uh, so-called um, Uplift Universe books. And in those, he takes different uh, intelligences, each from a different evolutionary background, and then he posits a civilization based around where and what they came from. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, to me, I mean, that's, that's just fun, but I mean, back to your original question, is how many are there? I think as, as, as many stars as we can see. Now, how many are currently there? I don't know. I mean, that's the whole, that's the whole question of, you know, how long can a, a civilization last before it runs out of steam? And you, for instance, does it just get bored or does it transcend to something else? Or does it say, I've seen enough and I'm done? What does running out of steam look like? It could be destroy itself or get bored. You know, it said, or we've we've done everything we can, and they just decide to stop. I don't know. I just don't know. It's that Elon Musk worry that we stop reproducing, or we slow down the reproduction rate to where uh, the population can go to zero. Can go to zero, and and we can't, and we collapse. I mean, so the only way to get around that is uh, perhaps create enough machines with AI to take care of us. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Let's again put, put our uh, sort of philosophical hats on. Do you think the US government or some other government is in possession of something of uh, extraterrestrial origin that is far more impressive than uh, anything we've seen in the public? If I, I've not seen anything personally, but if I believe the people who I don't think can lie, yes. This is How does that make you feel in terms of the way government works, the way our human civilization works, that there might be things like that and we're not, they're not public? Is, is, is there a hopeful message for transparency that's possible? Like if you were, if you were uh, in power, and I'm not saying president, because maybe mm -hmm. the president is not the, the source of power here, would you release this information in some way or form? Yes, if I were. I, I think it would, I think it's, I think it's something that can bring humanity together, right? I think that knowledge of this kind of thing to know that we are, you know, we are more alike than we are different in comparison to whatever this is, is, uh, is a positive thing for us. Um, and to know, you know, I don't necessarily care that the government has been hiding it. And I think, you know, people who've been talking about what we should give government officials or whatever amnesty, I think that's probably the right, the right answer. We don't, it, this isn't a time to look back and say, you did something wrong. You did whatever you did because that was the data you had available to you at the time. And those, you had good reasons for doing it. Now, if your reasons were selfish, if your reasons were you wanted to do it because you wanted to monetize it yourself uh, to the to your benefit, but against that of others, then I think maybe there's something else that could be said. But you know, a, an opportunity to get all this information out. If I were in charge, I would I would try to do it. Now, I might be shown something though that says hmm, there's a reason why you don't want to let anybody know this. You know, maybe you don't want everybody have having access to unlimited. Uh, energy, because maybe you might turn it into a bomb. Or something that gives you hints that something like unlimited energy is possible, but you haven't figured it out yet. And if you make it public, maybe some of the other governments you have tensions with mm -hmm. will figure it out first. Right. I mean, I, the, it's kind of an arms race going on, I think. In all forms, and it's, it makes me truly sad because uh, it's obvious that... Um, for example, the origins of the COVID virus 
it's obvious to me that the Chinese government, whatever the origins are, is interested in not releasing information about it because it can only be bad for the Chinese mm -hmm. government. Mm -hmm. And then every government thinks like this. Like what, uh, every actually, this has been disappointment to me talking to PR folks at companies. Like they're always nervous. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're always like conservative right, in, right. The, in the sense like, well, if we release more stuff, it can only be bad. And then an Elon Musk character comes along who tweets ridiculous memes and doesn't give a fuck. And I've been encouraging CEOs, I've been encouraging people to be transparent. And of course, government is, national security is really like another level, it's human lives at stake, but Let's start at the lighter case of just releasing some of the awesome insides of the how how the sausage is made, the technology, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and being transparent about it because it it excites people. It uh, like you said, it it, it connects people, it, it inspires them. It's uh, good for the brand. It's good for everybody. I, yeah. I I honestly think this kind of idea that people will steal the information and will use it against you is. Um, is an idea that's not true in his idea of the 20th century. Like right. you said, some of the benefits of the social media, uh, the, our, our social world is that transparency is beneficial. And I hope governments will learn that lesson. Of course, they're the, mm -hmm. usually the last to learn such right. lessons. Right. <laughs> You've talked to people that uh, told stories of UFO encounters. Mm -hmm. What is the most fascinating to you about the stories of these UFO encounters that... Uh, that you've heard that people have told you? The similarity of them, uh, the uniformity of the, of the stories. Now, I, I just wanna say up front, a lot of people think that when I speculate, I believe something. Right. That's not true, right? Speculation is just creativity. Speculation is the beginning of hypothesis. None of what I hear in terms of the anecdotes do I necessarily believe are they true? But I still find them fascinating to listen to because at some level, they're still raw data and you have to listen. And once you start to hear the same story again and again, then you have to say, well, there might be something to it. I mean, maybe it's some kind of a Jungian uh, background in the human mind and human consciousness that creates these stories again and again. And it's coming out of the DNA. It's coming out of that pre-programmed something. And Jung talked quite a bit about this kind of thing, uh, the collective unconscious. But actually, one of the most interesting ones I find is this constant uh, message that you're not taking care of your world. And this came long before climate change, it came long before uh, many kinds of, you know, let's say current day memes uh, around, uh, you know, taking care of our planet, uh, pollution, etc. And so, you know, for instance, perhaps the best example of this, the one that I find the most fascinating, is a story out of Zimbabwe, uh, 50 or 60 children, one afternoon in uh, Zimbabwe, it's a it was a, a well-educated group of white and black children uh, who at lunchtime in the playground saw a craft uh, and they saw little men. And they all ran into the teachers and they told the same story and they drew the same pictures. And the message several of them got was, you are not taking care of your planet. And it got, you know, there's actually a movie coming out uh, on this uh, episode. and. 30 years later now, the people who were there, the children who have now grown up, say it, it happened to us. Now, did it happen? Was it some sort of hallucination or was it a, an imposed hallucination by something? Was it material? I, I don't know. But these kids were seven to 10 years old. You see them on video. Seven to 10 year olds can't lie like that. And so, you know, whether it's real or not, I don't know. But I find that fascinating data. And again, it's, the, it's these unconnected stories of individuals with the, same, with the same story. That is worthy of further inquiry. 
Yeah, so here we are humans with limited cognitive capacities trying to make sense of the world, trying to understand what is real and not. We have this DNA that somehow in complex ways is interacting with the environment, and then we get these uh, uh, novel ideas mm -hmm. that come from the populace, and then they make us wonder about what it all uh, means. And so how to interpret it. If you think from an alien perspective, how would you communicate with other lifelike organisms? You perhaps have to find endpoints on this interaction between the, the DNA and its manifestations in terms of the, the, the human mind and the, how it interacts with the environment. So get some kind of, all right, what is this DNA? What is this environment? I have to get in somehow <laughs> to, right. to like interact with it, to get to perturb the system to where these little ants, human like ants, get like excited and figure and see stuff something. out. Yeah, right. yeah. And then and then somehow steer them. Uh first of all, for investigative purposes, understand like oftentimes to understand a system you have to perturb it. Exactly. Yeah. To like poke at it. To get, yeah. they get excited or not, and then the 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 other ways you want to, if you worry about them, you can steer in one direction or another. Mm -hmm. And this kind of idea that that we're not taking care of our world, um, that's interesting. I mean, that's comforting. That's hopeful because that means the greater intelligence, which is what I would hope, would want to take care of us. Like we want to take care of the gorillas in the national parks in Africa. Yeah, but right? we don't want to take care of cockroaches. So there's a line we draw. Yeah. So you ho have to hope that- <laughs> Right now we're a bunch of angry monkeys and you know maybe whatever these intelligences are, are also keeping an eye on us. You know, that you don't want a bunch of, you know, you don't want the, the angry monkey troop stomping around the local galactic arm. Do you think these folks are telling the truth? Do you think they saw what they say they saw? I think they saw what they said they saw, but I also think they saw what they were shown. I mean, if you go back to the whole notion of, okay, how long has this been around? It didn't just start showing up in 1947, right? There are stories going back, uh, you know, into the 1800s of people who saw things in their farming, in their farm fields in the U.S. It's in, it's in, it's in local newspapers from the 1800s. It's fascinating. But if you can go even further back, you know, so to your point of how are, how would you as a higher intelligence represent yourself to a lesser intelligence? Well, let's go back to pre-civilization. Maybe you show yourself as the spirits in the forest and you give messages through that. Once you get a little bit more civilized, then you show yourself as the gods. And then you're God. Well, we don't believe in God anymore, necessarily. Not everybody does. So what do we believe in? We believe in technology. So you show yourself as a form of technology, right? But the common thread is you're not alone. And there's something else here with you. And there's something that's, as you said, watching you. And at least watching over your shoulder, but I, I, I think that like any good parent, you don't tell your student everything. You make them learn. And learning requires mistakes because if you tell them everything, then they get lazy. You've uh, looked at the brains of, um, or information coming from the brain of some of the people that have had UFO encounters. What, what's common about the brain of people who encounter UFOs? So the, the study started with a group of, uh, let's say, a cohort of individuals that were brought to me and their MRIs uh, to ask about the damage that had been seen in these individuals. It turns out that the majority of those patients ended up being, as far as we can tell, Havana syndrome. And so for me, at least, this, you know, that part of the story ends in terms of the injury. It's likely almost all Havana syndrome. That's somebody else's problem now. That's not my problem. Um, but when we were looking at the brains of these individuals, we noticed something right in the center of the basal ganglia uh, in many of these individuals that at first we thought was damage. It was basically uh, an enriched patch of MRI dense 
uh, neurons that we thought was damage, and it, but then it was showing up in everybody, and then we looked and it said, oh, it's actually not. The other readings on these MRIs show that actually that's living tissue. Um, that's actually in the head of the caudate and the patamen. Um, and at the time, and I remember even asking a good friend of mine uh, at Stanford who is a um, psychiatrist, what does the basal ganglia do? He said, oh, the basal ganglia is just about uh, movement and nerve and motor control. And I said, well, that's odd because, uh, you know, these other papers that we were reading at the time started to suggest that it was involved with uh, higher intelligence and is actually downstream of the executive function uh, and involved with intuition and planning. And if you think about it, if you're going to have motor control, which is centralized in one place, motor control requires knowledge of the environment. You know, you, you don't want to move something and, and hit the table. Or if you're walking across a room, you want to be aware and cognizant of what you might bump into. So obviously, all of that planning is requires access to all the senses. It requires access to your desires, memory, knowledge of where and what you want and desire to walk near or by. Like I use the example of you're at a party, you want to avoid that person, you like that person, the waiter's about to drop something. All without thinking, you maneuver. So that actually, all that planning is done in the basal ganglia. Um, and it's actually now called the brain within the brain. It's a, it's a goal processing system, subservient to executive function. So what we think we found there was not something which allows people to talk to UFOs. I mean, I think the UFO community uh, took it a step too far. What I think we found was a form of higher functioning and processing. So what we then looked at, and this was the most fascinating part of it, we, we looked then at individuals in the families of those, uh, let's say the index case individuals, and we found that it was actually in families. Hmm. And more so, this is the most fascinating part, we've probably looked now at about 200 just random cases that you can download off of databases online. You don't see this higher connectivity. You only find it in what Kit Green would have called or has called higher functioning individuals, people who are, uh, I mean, he, he called them savants. I, I don't have the means to, uh, we haven't done the testing, but as it turns out, my family has it, right? We, we found it in, in me, my brother, my sister, my mother. We found it as well in other individuals, husband and wife pairs. So statistically, if you had a group of 20 individuals and you found two husband-wife pairs, both of whom had it, and yet it's only found at about, we think, one in 200, one in 300 individuals, the fact that two individuals came together, two sets of individuals came together, both of whom had it, implied either a restricted breeding group mm -hmm. or attraction. The reason why it seems to be in, let's say, so-called experiencers or people who claim, if, if intuition is the ability to see something that other people don't, and I don't mean that in a paranormal sense, but being able to see something that's in front of you that other people might just dismiss, well, maybe that's a function of a higher kind of intelligence to say, well, I, I'm not looking at an artifact. I'm not looking at something that I should just ignore. I'm seeing something and I recognize it for not what it is, but that it is something different than is normally found in my environment. Yeah, you know, I have a, a little bit of that. I, I seem to uh, see the magic in a lot of moments. Like I have a deep, uh, it's obviously, not obviously, but it seems to be chemical in nature that I just... I'm excited about life. I, I love life. I love like stupid things. It feels like I'm high a lot <laughs> uh, on like mushrooms or something like that, where you'd really appreciate that. So I'm, you're able, I'm able to detect something about the environment that uh, maybe others don't, I don't know, but like I seem to be over the top grateful to be alive on a lot of, for a lot of stupid reasons. And that's in there somewhere. I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting because, um, 
it really is true that our brains, the way we're brought up, but also the genetics enables us to see certain slices of the world. And um, some people are probably more receptive to anomalous information. They see the, they see the magic, the possibility in the novel thing, right? as opposed to kind of uh, finding the pattern of the common, of the regular. Some people are more, wait a minute, this is kind of weird. I mean, a lot of those people probably become scientists too. Like, huh, hmm. like th there's this pattern happening over and over and over and then something weird just happened. And then you get excited by that weirdness and start to pull the string and discover what is at the core of that weirdness. Right. And perhaps is that, you know, maybe by way of question, how does the human perception system deal with anomalous information, do you think? Well, it first tries to classify it and get it out of the way. If it's not food, if it's not sex, right? If it's not uh, in the way of my desires, or if it is in the way of my desires, then you focus on it. And so the, I think the question is how much spare processing power, how much CPU cycles do we spend on things that are not those core desires? What uh, is the most kind of um, memorable, powerful UFO encounter report you ever heard? Just to you pers on a personal level, like this something that was really powerful. Well, I mentioned the Zimbabwe one. That's particularly interesting. And one that actually most people don't know about, but family driving down the highway, two little girls in the back, open glass topped car, and the little girls see a craft right over their car. This is in the middle of the day on a busy highway. The mother sees it. Nobody can, they look around, nobody else seems to see it. So the girls take out their camera, take a picture of it. And then they get home. Uh, they look at the picture. There's no craft, but there's a little object about 30 feet above their car or so, probably about three feet across, kind of star-shaped. It's not the craft, but it's something else. There's obviously there was something there. And so what were they seeing? Were they seeing a projection? Were they seeing, and why were only they seeing it? And the photograph was capturing something very different than they were seeing, Correct. but there's still an object. What, can you give a little bit of context? Is this from modern day? It's modern day, oh yeah, they had a camera. I mean, they had a cell phone camera. And this was like a, a four or five years ago. report provided. By the way, where's the, like a central place to provide a report? Is this? Oh, well, there's a MUFON, but this isn't public. I've seen the picture. Oh, this is something you've directly interacted with. Yeah, yeah, I've seen the picture. So those moments like that, they captivate your, uh, well, it's your so, mind. It's so different, and it doesn't fall into the standard story at all. But it also, but it, in another way, it's kind of a, it's a clear enunciation of this notion that when people see events, they don't all see the same thing. Now, we've heard this about like traffic accidents. Different people will see the color of the car differently or the chain of events differently. And just tells you that memory isn't anywhere near what we think it is. But the issue around these so-called UFO reports is that the same people will see a very different thing, almost as if whatever it is is projecting a is projecting something into the mind rather than it being real, right? Rather than it being a real manifestation, you know, material in front of you, it's actually almost some sort of an altered virtual reality that is imposed on you. I mean, you know, I think the company Meta and all the virtual reality companies would love to have something like that, <laughs> right? Well, you don't have to actually wear something on your face Yes. To experience a virtual reality. What happens if you could just project it? Well, that's the fundamental question from an alien perspective. When you look at it, or as we humans look at ants, how does its perception system operate? So not only how does this thing's mind operate, how does the human mind operate, but how does it their perception system operate so that we can like stimulate the perception system 
mm -hmm. properly to get them to think certain things. And so, uh, you know, <laughs> that's a really important question. But humans think that, um, you know, the only way to communicate is in like 3D or 4D space time, there's physical objects, or maybe you write things in some kind of language, but there could be just uh, so much more um, richness in how you can communicate. And so from an alien perspective, where somebody has much greater technological capabilities, you have to figure out how do I use the skills I have to right. stimulate uh, the human, the limited humans. Right. Well, I mean, let's, let's take the ants exam again as an example. Let's say that you wanted to make ants practical. You wanted to use them for something, right? You wanted to use them as a form of biological robot. Now, DARPA and other uh, people have been trying to use insects for, you know, into turn them into biological robots. But if you wanted to, you would have to interact with their sense of smell, right? Their pheromone system that they use to interact with each other. So you would either create those molecules to talk to them, to make them do, I'm not saying talk to them as if they're intelligent, but talk to them to manipulate them in ways that you want. Or if you were advanced enough, you would use some sort of electromagnetic or other means to stimulate their neurons in ways that would accomplish the same goal as the pheromones, but by doing it in a sort of a telefactoring way. So let's say you wanted to telefactor with humans. You would interact with them. And this is, again, this is a technology which you could imagine possible. You could telefactor information into the sensory system of a human, right? But then each human is a little bit different. So either you know enough about them to tailor it to that individual, or you just basically take advantage of whatever the sensory net is that that individual has. So if you happen to be good at sound, or you happen to be a very visually inclined individual, then maybe the sensory information that you get that's most effective in terms of transmitting information would come through that portal. I think the aliens would need to figure out that humans value physical consistency. So we've discovered physics. So we want our perception to make sense. Maybe they don't, they haven't, you know, that's not an obvious fact of perception that you have to figure out what kind of things are humans used to observing in this particular right. environment of Earth? And how do we stimulate the perception system in a way that's uh, not anomalous or not too, right. doesn't cross that threshold of just like, well, that's way too weird. Right. So they have to, I mean, that's not obvious that that should be important. You know, maybe you want to err on the side of uh, anomaly like lean into the weirdness. So communication is complicated. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why I always I always find this issue of people talking about the so-called grays as interesting because it, it it is related to what you're saying. They're different enough, but they're not so different as to be scary, right? They're not venom dripping fangs, right? They're different enough, but they they all it's also like they're what you could imagine us becoming in some distant future. So is that a purposeful representation? I don't know. I mean, I don't believe in the grays, for instance, but I believe that people think that they see it. So if we're talking about a communication strategy that says, you know, we're, we're like you, but not the same as you, this might be a manifestation that you, that you represent in terms of a communication strategy. What do you make of David Favre's sighting of the Tic Tac UFO and other pilots who have uh, seen these objects that seem to defy the laws of physics? Well, I think you have to take them at their word. Um, Are they fascinating to you? These oh, absolutely. Reports? No, I know. I know a lot of these people, right? So I, I know Lou Elizondo, Chris Mellon, the whole crowd. I've been. I, I saw the videos about three weeks or so before they went public. I was um, at a bar with Lou <laughs> overlooking the Pentagon um, in Crystal City, and they showed him to me, and my hair stood on end. Wow. And he said, he, said, this is, he said, this is coming out soon. And I, I know 
one of the guys on the inside who was the naval intelligence who had interviewed all of these pilots again before this came out. And it was hair-raising to hear this, uh, but also uh, exciting that, you know, here's not just people's testimony. These are credible individuals. And if you've seen the 60-minute episode with uh, some of the pilots, uh, you know, they have no monetary gain. If anything, they've got negative gain uh, from coming out. But then you also have all of the simultaneous uh, ship analysis from the USS Princeton and the radar analysis, etc. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's just data. It's not a conclusion. Um, I'm, I'd be perfectly happy, honestly, perfectly happy if somebody sh showed that it was all a hoax. I can go back to my day job. <laughs> right. That could be a hoax, but other things might not be. I mean, that, right. this is the point. I, I mean, what, this is why it's nice to remove some of the stigma about this topic because it's all just data and, mm -hmm. uh, and anomalous events are such that there's going to be, they're going to be rare in terms of how much data they represent, but we have to consider the full range of data to discover the things that actually represent something that's, um, if we pull at it, we'll discover right. something that's extraterrestrial or something deep about the phenomena uh, on Earth that we don't yet understand. Right. Well, if it only stimulates people, for instance, to think, okay, well, what happens if we could move like that with momentumless movement? And, and it stimulates young individuals to go into the sciences to ask those questions. That to me is fascinating. I mean, after I've been openly talking about this in the last year, especially, I've had a number of uh, students from top schools who aren't my students come to me and say, if I can help, let me. How can I help? I never had thought about this before, but you opened, you and others, not just you and others, have opened my mind to thinking about this matter. Yeah, that's why it's actually funny that uh, uh, Elon Musk doesn't think too much about this, uh, these kinds of propulsion systems that could defy the laws of physics as we currently understand them. To me, it's a powerful way to think what, what is possible. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's inspiring, even if some yes. of the data doesn't represent uh, uh, extraterrestrial vehicles, I think the, the, the observation itself, it's like uh, something you mentioned, which is uh, you know hypothesizing, imagining these things, considering the possibility of these things, I think opens up your mind in a way that uh, ultimately can create the technology. First, right. you have to believe the technology is possible before you can create it. Right. In my own lab, you know, we always look for, as as I've said before, what is inevitable, and you know, saying inevitably this is the kind of data we need. But if we need that kind of data, the instrument we want isn't, doesn't exist. Yeah. Okay, so I imagine the perfect instrument, I can't make it, and you back into something which is practical, and then you, in a sense, reverse engineer the future mm -hmm. of what it is that you wanna make. And I've started and sold like at least half a dozen or more companies using that basic premise. And so it was always something that didn't exist today, but we imagined what we wanted. And at the time, many people said it couldn't be done. I mean, for instance, all the gene therapy that's done today with retroviruses came from a group meeting in David Baltimore's lab. I was a postdoc with him. And one of the other postdocs wasn't able to make retroviruses in a way that he wanted to. And I realized I had a cell line that would allow us to make retroviruses in two days rather than two months. And so he and I then worked together to make that system. And now all gene therapy with retroviruses is done using this basic approach mm -hmm. around the whole world because something couldn't be done and we wanted to do it better and we imagined the future. And so that's, I think, what the whole UFO phenomenon is doing for people. It's like, well, let's imagine a future where these kinds of technologies are, but also let's imagine a future where we don't blow ourselves up, right? So if these things are there, they manage to not blow themselves up. So it means that at least one other civilization got past the inflection point. 
So if some of the encounters are actually representing alien civilizations visiting us, why do you think they're doing so? Uh, you suggested that perhaps it's to study and understand their own past, right? Right. What, what What are some of the motivations, do you think? And again, from, from our perspective, us as humans, what motivations would we have when we approach other civilizations we might discover in the future? Well, I think one motivation might be to steer us away from the precipice, right? Or on the assumption that, you know, even if we make it past the precipice, at least uh, we're not a bunch of psychopaths, you know, running around. So maybe there's a little bit of motivation there to make sure that your the neighbor that's growing up next to you is not, you know, unruly. Um, you know, but I mean, maybe it's sort of a moral imperative, like what we have with, you know, creating uh, national parks where animals can continue to live out their lives in a natural way. Mm. Um, I don't know. I mean, that would be, I mean, the problem is we're imagining from a anthropomorphic viewpoint what an alien might think. And as I've said before, alien means alien, right? I mean, not Hollywood aliens, but a whole different way of thinking and a whole different level of experience and let's say wisdom, hopefully, uh, that we could only hope to understand. Now, but if we ever get out there, if we ever make it past our current problems, uh, and even if we don't have faster than light travel, and even if we're only using ram scoops or light sails to get where we wanna go, uh, and it takes us 10,000 years to get somewhere or to spread out, um, we might encounter such things. And are we just going to stomp all over it like we did in colonial South America or Africa or all the rest on our current path, likely, you know, and, and so what are we going to learn? Well, we, we're getting better and better at understanding what is life. Mm -hmm. And I think we're getting better and better at being careful not to step on it when we when we see it. And I, I, this is one of the nice things about talking about UFOs, is it expands the Overton window. It expands our understanding of what possibly could be life. Mm -hmm. It gets us to think, it gets the scientific community to think. When we go to Mars, when we go to these different moons that possibly have life, you know, we're not looking at uh, legged organisms. We're looking at some kind of complexity Mm -hmm. that uh, arises in resistance to the natural world. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of interesting- I like that, resistance to the natural world, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so s somehow there's a rebellious process, complex system going on here. And I don't know, you know, the, the many ways it could take form. And there, there's a sense, you know, for aliens that as the technology develops, they take form more and more in, in, as information, mm -hmm. as something that can influence the space of of ideas, of the processing of data itself. So I just, uh, this idea of embodiment that we humans so admire, physically visible, perceivable embodiment may be a very uh, inefficient thing, right? right? <laughs> if you think just about, you know, your area, AI, you know, we're, we're trying to make smaller and smaller and smaller uh, circuitry that is uh, basically closer and closer to the physics of how the universe operates, right? Right down at the level of, I mean, quantum computers are basically right down about quantum information storage. So fast forward 10,000, 100,000 years, maybe somebody found a way to embody AI directly into the physics of the universe, right? And it doesn't require a physical manifestation. It just it just sits in space-time. It's just a, a locally ordered space. We're just locally ordered space-time, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? You know, I mean, people, but maybe they just, they found a way to embody it there. They probably have to get really good at not, you know, trampling on the ants. Mm -hmm. the, the better your technology gets, the easier it is to accidentally like, oops, 
right? <laughs> Just well, destroy these simpleton biological systems. We constantly think about whatever these things might be. We think that they are some sort of a unified force. Well, maybe they're not unified. Maybe they are as disparate as you and I are. And maybe what keeps them from stomping all over the ants is each other, right? That they are in a self-tension to prevent one or more of them from running amok. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's kind of the anarchy of nations that we have on Earth. Yeah. So there's there's always <laughs> we're, there's always going to be this... Um, there's a hierarchy. This hierarchy that's formed of greater and greater intelligences. Right. Right. And they're all probably also wondering, wait, what's bigger than me? Exactly. That's what I always wonder, is that maybe that they're... What keeps them in line is something that is beyond them. Like what created the universe? I mean, that, you know, that that's probably a question that bothers them too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what about the communication task itself? How hard do you think it is for aliens to communicate with humans? So is, is this something you um, think about, about this barrier of communication between biological systems and something else? How difficult is it to find a common language? Well, I think if you're smart enough or technologically enabled enough, it's relatively straightforward. Um, now, whether your concepts can ever be dumbed down to us, that might be hard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean- Again, talking to the ants. Talking to the ants, I mean- they On don't... Instagram. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> you want to look good in this picture. Let me explain. To Let you me explain you to you why. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the essential problem of, you know, perhaps they realize who it is that they're talking to. And they say, we're rather than muddy the picture, we're only going to give them limited information. Yeah. Right. And yeah, maybe we could sit down like you and I and have a conversation but then they would make assumptions, the humans would then make assumptions about us that aren't true, because we're not humans, right? So let's stay at arm's length. Let's just let them know that we're here, right? And here's the limited amount of, of communication. Again, this, this notion that if you give somebody everything, they'll get lazy. And, you know, if, if they've been around as long as they have, they've seen every kind of thing that can go wrong. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, they know as much as they might want to step in, that, that would be a wrong thing. Yeah, you have to also understand the, the, the amount of wisdom they carry. Yeah. You know, and so it's it's very easy as well for religions to. I don't want I don't want to get into a whole religious conversation, but you could it's very easy for you could see how religions could call them angels or devils or what have you, because again, if you're trying to fit it into a framework of cultural understanding, um, the first thing you reach for is God, and so it, it when you when you look at what these things are. And again, it, with the angels and the devils, uh, in a similar sort of way, their communication is limited. They just kind of give little, what's the, or, the oracle of Delphi? They kind of give these Delphic pronouncements, and then it's up to you to figure out what it is that they really mean. You've also looked at UFO materials. You are in possession of UFO materials yourself. Claimed UFO materials. C claimed. Alleged alleged UFO materials, that's right. So what's another term? Weird materials that don't seem to... Uh, uh, they have a say? story. They have a, <laughs> they have a story that doesn't seem to be of natural origins, but it, it's not, you know, there's a process to proving that, and that process may uh, take decades, if not centuries, because you have to keep pulling <laughs> at, the, at the string and discover where they could possibly come from. But anyway, you, you're in a possession of some materials of this kind. Can you um, describe some of them and maybe also talk to the process of how you investigate them? How do you analyze them? Right. So let's say that there's two classes of materials that I've 
been given by people and they're not given by like the government or anything, just given people who've collected them. And there's a, a reasonable chain of evidence associated with them that you believe is not just a pebble. Somebody picked up off a road. Um, there are almost always things that people have claimed have either been dropped off as like some sort of a leftover material, molten metals, or um, they are from an object that was released from this that kind of ex ex exploded. They're almost always metals. I have some couple of things that might be biological that are interesting that I haven't really spent a lot of time on yet. When you look at a metal, you basically, well, okay, what are the elements in it? Mm -hmm. And what's it made of? And so there's pretty standard approaches to doing that. Most of them involve a technology called mass spectrometry. Uh, and there's probably about five or six different kinds of mass spectrometry that you could bring to bear on answering it. And they either tell you, depending upon the limit of the resolution of the instrument, they either tell you the elements that are there, or they tell you the isotopes that are there. And you're interested not just in knowing whether something is there or not, you're interested in knowing whether there are, you know, the the amounts of it. The, the And in the case of elements, how many different isotopes are there? And and that's kind of where, in some of these cases, it gets interesting, right? Because on in at least one of the materials, as we first studied it, the isotope ratios of, in this case, it was magnesium, are way off normal. And I just don't know why. It doesn't. It doesn't prove anything. It just pr all it proves is that it was probably accomplished by some kind of an industrial process. Whether it's the result of a process, or whether and and this is sort of the leftover, or whether it was made that way for a particular purpose, I don't know. All I know is that it it was engineered. That's it, right? But then it's the question is, is sort of you go one step deeper. Why would you engineer it? Right. Well. Why and what does the, the engineered means? There's all kinds of. It could be a byproduct. It could be, um, the main result of an engineering process. It would be a small part of the engineering process that is the main mm -hmm. part. Well, so the ratios of isotopes for any given element are basically the result of stellar processes. Uh, a supernova blew up sometime several tens, you know, several billion years ago, uh, that became a cloud. Those atoms coalesced gravitationally to form another sun and a, a ring that became a rocky planet. Uh, and the ratios of the isotopes were determined at the time of that explosion. And so everything in the local solar system is more or less of that ratio depending upon certain gravitational different but but by uh, fragments of a percent not mm -hmm. whole tens of percent difference so what do humans use isotopes for mostly to blow stuff up i mean the the vast majority of the isotopes that have been made in the in the per pound or ton are things like certain ratios of plutonium and uranium to blow stuff up we don't make or engineer isotopes, which it's it's today is relatively easy to do, but it's still expensive. For any other reason, apart from let's say uh, as uh, anti-cancer, um, we use stable isotopes in money these days as a counterfeiting tool. You basically embed certain ratios of isotopes in to make it harder for counterfeiters to accomplish. Um, and so, but other than that, we don't do anything with that. So why would you make grams of such material in this one case and drop it around on a beach in Brazil? So which case are we talking about? This, is the, that Brazil this case. is the Ubatuba case. Can you describe this case a little bit further? Like what yeah. material we're, we're talking about, just the full story of the case? So it's um, an interesting one. It's an interesting one. So it, a fisherman saw an object that uh, released something or it, it, it exploded. And it was this relative, I'm, you know, I've got some big chunks of it, uh, relatively pure magnesium, 
with obviously something else in it because magnesium burns. So it, it had something in it that would, other metals, simple alloy, that would prevent it from, from uh, basically burning up. Um, and so the question is, and so, so then we had, we had two pieces that came from um, two different chains of custody, both claimed to be from the same object. At least uh, physically, when you look at the two things, they look the same, right? So we took small fragments of each of them. We put them in an instrument called a secondary ion mass spec, uh, which is an extremely sensitive instrument. And it can see down to 0.0001 mass units, uh, which is important for, let's say, more arc arcane reasons. But um, it's a sensitive instrument. And so one of the chains of custody, we had two pieces from the same chain of custody, and then two pieces from the other chain of custody. One of them had completely normal uh, magnesium isotope ratios, magnesium 24, 25, 26, and the other was off. Well, not just like slightly off, way off. And they were both off to the same extent. So, uh, I mean, it was sort of like you had an internal control of what was normal, and you had this other one which was which was wrong. And so you're left with uh, it's kind of an open question. Was this a hoax? Were these two chains of custody, one of them a hoax, that somebody purposefully introduced those things? Because you could do it. It would cost a lot. I mean, at the time that this was found, I guess the 1970s or so, um, might have been earlier, I forget. Uh, the amount that I had would have cost several tens of thousands of dollars to make. Um, and again, it's not something you would just throw around and, and why would you do it in the hope that some guy 30 years from then would, would pick it up and study it? Yeah, it's a very subtle, it's, subtle yeah, troll. It's a long-term plan. <laughs> um, so, so I, I just don't know, I just don't know what to make of it, except yeah. it's interesting, but it's, but so a, a different kind of question that you're asking is what constitutes evidence? Right. So is, is this sufficient evidence? Absolutely not. But somebody's put it forward. I have the time. It's my time. I'll study it. And I, my objective is to sort of take those that I think are credible enough and do a reasonable analysis, put it out there. And maybe somebody else will come up with an idea as to what it is. Now, what would be better is some sort of true technology. Right, something that is obviously we don't have it, you know. And people like uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and Seth Shostak have come out rightfully and have said, you know, when you show up with, you know, uh, something really obviously technological that we don't understand, you know, then we'll pay attention. Right, not just material, not just material. A piece of metal is is interesting, uh, but, and, and several of the things that I've looked at and things that people, other things that people have come to me with, we found to be completely banal or were actually pieces of aircraft that were invented back in the 1940s. Yeah. And so take them off the table. See, but I, <laughs> I think, um, again, I think showing up with technology that we humans would find completely novel, it's actually a really difficult task for aliens because it obviously can't be so novel that we don't recognize it. For what it is. Yeah. For what it is. And so, and I would say most of the technology aliens likely have would be something we don't recognize. Mm -hmm. so, so they, it's actually a hard problem how to convince ants. Mm -hmm. Like you first have to understand what ants are tweeting about, <laughs> yeah. like what, what they care about in order to like inject into their culture. Because, uh, you know, that's why I think it would be the technology that you could present is in the space of ideas, is in the, is, is try to influence individual humans and with the encounters right. and try to, with this kind of thing that, that you mentioned about uh, us not taking, messages about us not taking care of the world. 
it's difficult to come. I mean, I to for them to understand, you have to come up with trinkets that impress us. I mean, maybe the very technology, the fascination with the development of technology and the development of technology, the actual act of innovation itself is the thing that they're communicating. Right. I mean, exactly. this is kind of what you know Jacques Vallée thinks about is the role of <laughs> the control system. He calls it the control system. Well, let me uh, ask about Jacques. Uh, who is he? Um, you know, science is not immediate. You're gonna have to be patient. And even some of my science colleagues have said, "Well, where's the data?" My answer to them has been, "Where's been your work to try to produce any?" Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm not here to give you everything on a silver platter. We talked offline how much I love data and mm -hmm. machine learning and so on. And uh, it's been really disheartening to see the, the U.S. government not invest as much as they possibly could into this whole process. So let's jump to the most recent thing, which is what do you make of the report titled Preliminary Assessment mm -hmm. on Identified Aerial Phenomena that was released by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence in June 2021. So this is, was like, uh, okay, we're going to step back. And we're mm -hmm. going to like, what, where do we stand and where do we hope the future is? What do you make of that report? Is it hopeful? Is it? Oh, I see uh, it as very hopeful, very hopeful. I think the adults are finally stepping up in and being in charge, right? In I the mean, good sense of adult. What's that? In the good sense of In the of good adult. sense of adult. Um, <laughs> you know, childlike curiosity is a pretty powerful thing. That's true. Yeah. yeah. I, I, it's, but it's also, I think, the people who were worried that the populace at large might run screaming into the streets and riot, yeah. uh, you know, have, you know, they basically, the empiric evidence is they're wrong. You know, this, these videos and all these things have been out for now, what, five years? Most people don't even know about it. Right, so as 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 hyped as it's been, and all over the newspapers that it's been, and et cetera, you know, even Tucker Carlson has talked about it many times on his news program. Um, Joe Rogan has a lot of people don't know about it. Mm -hmm. So I think people, if it's not affecting their day to day life, they're going on with their day to day life. So, but that said, I think it was an important sea change in the internal discussions going on in the government. Because, and, and the reason being, that I, I think this is actually partly true with the, the, the maturation of human social technology, it was becoming so obvious that this stuff was showing up again and again and again around our ships, they just couldn't keep it quiet anymore, right? And so it's like, we need to do something about it. And Lou Elizondo and Chris and others, to their great credit, found the right angle to talk about this. It says, well... Okay, let's say it's not out there. Maybe it's the Russians, the Chinese, or somebody else. We should know about this because we damn sure know it's not us. So that to me is an important thing to, to finally be a little bit more open about the matter. But like I often say, I'm not looking for people to give me permission to do anything. I'm just going to do the analysis myself with what I have. Avi Loeb has taken the same approach. He said, I'm not going to wait for the government to give me telescopic information about technologies or, or things that might be even in our own solar system. I'm just going to collect it myself. And, and that's the right way to do it, right? Don't wait for somebody else to give it to you. It's also possible to inspire a large number of people to do a wider spread data collection. Yes. I mean, you yourself can't do a large enough data collection that would, if you're talking about anomalous events. Right, right. You you should be collecting high resolution data about everything that's happening on earth in terms of like, at, in terms of the kind of things that would indicate to you a strong signal that something mm -hmm. weird happened mm -hmm. here. And this is why, you know, governments can be good at funding large scale efforts. Yes. I mean, you know, NASA and and so on, working with SpaceX, uh, with Blue Origin, uh, to, you know, fund uh, capitalistic sort of fund companies, fund company efforts to do huge moonshot projects, right. and in the same way, do huge moonshot data collection efforts in terms of UFOs. I mean, we're not. It needs to be like 10x 
like one or two orders of magnitude more funding exactly. to do this kind of thing. And I, I understand on the flip side of that, if you make it about what are the Russians, what are the Chinese doing, you know, make it a question of geopolitics, it gets touchy because now you, you're kind of taken away from the realm of science and making it military, making it military. Some of the greatest, this is what makes me as an engineer, makes me truly sad that some of the greatest engineering work ever done is by Lockheed Martin mm -hmm. and we will never know about it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I wish we were, it was different, but um, it's the world we live in. Um, you know, but related to that UAP task force announcement that you just said, you know, the, the bill was passed in the Department of Defense and now it formally establishes an office mm -hmm. to collate that information and also to be transparent about it. Money is now set aside, right? What, what do you think of it, just in case people don't know, the DOD established a new department to study uh, UFOs called Airborne Naming, come on. But yes, yeah. Airborne Object Identification and Management Synchronization Group. A, do you know how to pronounce that? No, Ghibli? I do not. No, a and that's a stupid. A -O -I -MSG. It's stupid and needs to be renamed, but. AOIMSG, AO. All right, is directed by the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security. What do you make of this office? Do you, are you hopeful about this office? I, I think there's still a tug of war going on behind the scenes as to who's gonna control this. Uh, but I do know though that money has been set aside that will be used to uh, make things more public, right? To start to get uh, others involved. And um, you know, there's, I'm involved with an effort to get other academics involved. So you think there might be some of that money could be directed towards funding, maybe like groups like yours to do some research here? Right. So they would be open to that, you think? I hope so. I mean, it, nothing is set in stone yet. So, you know, I, I and I'm not hiding anything because I just don't know anything, right? But I do, um, I do think that there will be uh, public efforts. Now, there are, going, there, are, there are being set up other private efforts to bring monies involved and to use that to leverage uh, and get access to some of the internal resources as well. So um, what you're seeing is uh, kind of an ecosystem building up uh, in a positive sense uh, of people who are willing to do the research. So you know, before it, it would be, you couldn't even go to a scientist and ask them to help. Now, if there's money, as I said before, scientists are essentially capitalists. We go where the money is, you know, we'll, I mean, the work that I've done, I did out of my own pocket. Uh, and probably about fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars of money went into the paper we published yeah. out of my own pocket. Um, and you know, but the amount of money that needs to go in is in the in at least the few millions to do a proper analysis of these materials. The work I know that the Galileo project is involved with, uh, it's probably in the in the you know five to ten million range to get stuff done. But that's actually a relatively modest amount of money to accomplish something that has been in the zeitgeist for decades. I, I should also push back a little bit on something you probably will agree with. You said scientists are essentially capitalists. What I've noticed is there's certainly an influence of money, but oftentimes when you're talking about basic research and basic science, the money um, is a little bit, a little bit of ambiguous to what direction you're doing the research in. And the scientists get really good at telling a narrative of like, yeah, 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 we're fulfilling the purpose of this funding, but we're right. actually, they end up doing really what they're curious about. Yes. And of course you cannot deviate, like if you're getting funded to study penguins in Antarctica, you can't start building rockets, but probably you can because you'll convince some kind, you concoct a narrative saying, Rockets are really important for studying penguins in the Antarctic. Right. I, I, I think that's actually, this is one thing I think people don't generally understand about the scientific mind, is I don't know how capitalistic it is, because if it was, they would start an effing company. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, when I meant capitalist, I didn't mean in the, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll start companies per se. I mean, we can only do the research where there's money. 
Right. And so from, from, you know, maybe it's a, a, a bad use of the term capitalist. So, but the, we will only do the research where there's money. I mean, why do most people work, uh, many biologists uh, work in cancer research? Because there's a lot of money there. It's an important problem. But uh, I might not have ever gotten involved in it if there wasn't money. I might have gone and I was going to be a botanist when I, when I was uh, a kid. That's what I wanted to do. Um, so having money available will bring people to bear. Now, an another mistake that's often actually made, I think, by the lay public about science is that people think that we're paid to do things. Just as you said, I get a research grant, and luckily from the NIH, they they give you a fair amount of latitude. Uh, I will go my own way, and I'll find something. I might have proposed something, but I'll end up somewhere entirely different by the end of the project. And that's how good science is done. You follow the you follow the data, you follow the the results, um, and so that's what I'm hoping can be done here. I think the worst kind of thing that could be done with this subject area is to put it inside another company where they have a set plan of what it is they're going to do, and the scientists either tell do what the executives tell them to do or not. That isn't how anything will really get discovered. Put it. Get it out into the public, get open minds thinking about it, and then publishing on it and doing the right kind of work. That's how real progress will be made with this. Your intuition that the, there were intelligent civilizations out there, but it's very possible that they're no longer there. It's kind of a sad picture. They enter some steady state. They all wirehead themselves. What's wirehead? Um, stimulate, <laughs> stimulate their pleasure centers. Uh, and just, you know, live forever in this kind of stasis. Oh, Th they become, well, I mean, I think the reason I believe this is because where are they? If there's some reason they stopped expanding, because otherwise they would have taken over the universe. The universe isn't that big, or at least, you know, let's just talk about the galaxy, right? 70,000 light years across. Uh, I took that number from Star Trek Voyager. I don't know how true it is, but, um, uh, yeah, that's not big. Right, seventy thousand light years is nothing for some possible technology that you can imagine that can leverage like wormholes or something like that. Oh, you don't even need wormholes. Just a von Neumann probe is enough. A von Neumann probe and a million years of sublight travel, and you'd have taken over the whole universe. That clearly uh, didn't happen. So something stopped it. So you mean if you right for for like a few million years, if you sent out probes that travel close, what's sublight? You mean close to the speed of light? Let's say point one c. And it just spreads. Interesting. Actually, that's an interesting calculation. Huh. So but what makes you think that we'd be able to uh, communicate with them? Like, uh, yeah, what, what's, uh, why do you think we would able to be able to comprehend intelligent lives that are out there? Like, even if they were among us kind of thing, like, or even just flying around? Well, I mean, that's, possible. It, it's possible that there is some sort of prime directive. Uh, that'd be a really cool universe to live in. Um, and there's some reason they're not making themselves visible to us. Right. But it makes sense that they would use the same, well, at least the same entropy. Well, you're implying the same laws of physics. I don't know what you mean by entropy in this case. Oh, so, I'm, yeah. I mean, if entropy is the scarce resource in the universe. <laughs> so what do you think about like Stephen Wolf from Everything is a Computation? And then what if they are traveling through this world of computation? So if you think of the universe as just information processing, then uh, what you're referring to with, with entropy, and, and then these, these pockets of interesting complex computation swimming around, how do we know they're not already here? How do, how, how do we know that this, like all the different amazing things that are full of mystery on earth are just like little footprints of intelligence from light years away? Maybe. I mean, I tend to think that as civilizations expand, they use more and more energy. Uh, and you can never overcome the problem of waste heat. So where is their waste heat? So we'd be able to, with our crude methods, be able to see like there's a whole lot of energy here. But it could be something we're not, I mean, we don't understand dark energy, right? Dark matter. It could be just stuff we don't understand at all. Maybe. Or they can have a fundamentally different physics, you know, like that that we just don't even comprehend. Well, 
I think, okay, I mean, it depends how far out you want to go. I don't think physics is very different on the other side of the galaxy. I would suspect that they have, I mean, if they're in our universe, they have the same physics. Well, yeah, that's the assumption we have, but there could be like super trippy things like, like our cognition only gets to a slice uh, and all the possible instruments that we can design only get to a particular slice of the universe. And there's something much like weirder. Maybe we can try a, a thought experiment. Um, would people from the past be able to detect the remnants of our, uh, would we be able to detect our modern civilization? And I think the answer is obviously yes. You mean past from a hundred years ago? Well, let's even go back further. Let's go to a million years ago. Right? The humans who were lying around in the desert probably didn't even have, maybe they just barely had fire. Uh, they would understand if a 747 flew overhead. Oh, in, in, in this vicinity, but not um, if, the, if a 747 flew on Mars. Because like, they wouldn't be able to see far. Because we're not actually communicating that well with the rest of the universe. We're doing okay. We're just sending out random like 50s tracks of music. True. And yeah, I mean, they'd have to, you know, the, we've only been broadcasting radio waves for um, 150 years and well, there's your light cone. So. Yeah. Okay. What do you make about all the, I recently <laughs> came across this, uh, having talked to uh, David Fravor. I don't know if you caught what the, the videos that Pentagon <laughs> released and uh, the New York Times reporting of the UFO sightings. So I kind of looked into it, quote unquote, and there's actually been like hundreds of thousands of UFO sightings, right? And a lot of it you can explain away in different kinds of ways. So one is it could be interesting physical phenomena. Two, it could be people wanting to believe and therefore they conjure up a lot of different things that just, you know, when you see different kinds of lights, some basic physics phenomena, and then you just conjure up ideas of possible out there mysterious worlds. But, you know, it's also possible, like you have a case of uh, David Fravor, who is a Navy pilot, who's, you know, a leg as legit as it gets in terms of humans who are able to perceive things in the environment and make conclusions, whether those things are a threat or not. And he and several other pilots mm -hmm. saw a thing, I don't know if you followed this, but they saw a thing that they've since then called TikTok that moved in all kinds of weird ways. They don't know what it is. It could be technology developed by, by the United States and they're just not aware of it and the surface level from the Navy, right? It could be different kind of lighting technology or drone technology, all that kind of stuff. It could be the Russians and the Chinese, all that kind of stuff. And of course their mind, our mind, can also venture into the possibility that it's from another world. You have, have you looked into this at all? I what do think, you think about it? I think all the news is a psyop. <laughs> uh, I think that the most plausible- Nothing is real. Yeah, I listened to the, uh, I think it was Bob Lazar yeah. um, on, on Joe Rogan. And like, I believe everything this guy is saying. And then I think that it's probably just some like MK Ultra kind of thing, you know? Uh, what do you mean? Like they, 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 uh, you know, they made some weird thing and they called it an alien spaceship. You know, maybe it was just to like stimulate young physicists' minds. We'll tell them it's alien technology and we'll see what they come up with, right? Let me ask the craziest question. Indulge me for a second. I'll, uh, <laughs> this is a joke. Of what we've been talking about? Like, okay. I no, all of, seatbelt on. all of this is a sign. All, all of that, despite the, the caveats about armchair, I think is within the reach of science. Uh, let me let me ask one that's kind of um, also within the research science, but as Joe likes to say, uh, it's entirely possible, right? Uh, is it possible that uh, with these DMT trips, when you meet entities, is it possible that these entities are extraterrestrial life forms? Like our understanding of little green men with aliens that show up is totally off. I often think about this, like what would actual extraterrestrial intelligence look like? And my sense is it will look like very different 
from anything we can even begin to comprehend. And how would it communicate? And how would it communicate? Yeah. Would it be necessarily spaceships with right. interstellar travel or? Could it be communicating it through chemicals, through if there's the panpsychism situation, if there's something, not if, I almost for sure know we don't understand, you know, a lot about the function of our mind in connection to the fabric of uh, the physics in the universe. A lot of people seem to think we have theoretical physics pretty figured out. I have my doubts because I'm pretty sure it always feels like we have everything figured out until we don't. <laughs> right. But I mean, there's no grand unifying theory yet, right? But, I mean, but even that's then, been widely recognized. We could be missing out like the concept of the universe just can be completely off. Like mm -hmm. how many other universes are there? All those all those kinds of things. I mean, there's just the, the basic nature of information, the uh, time, yeah, time, whether, time, all, all of those things. Even, yeah. Well, yeah, what, yeah, whether that's just like a thing we assign value to or the, whether it's fundamental or not, that's whole, Sean, Sean right, I could talk to yeah. Sean Carroll forever about whether time is emergent or fundamental to the reality, but, is it possible that the entities we meet are actual alien life forms? Do you ever think about that? Yeah, 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 I do. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 I've to some degree laid my cards out with by identifying as a radical empiricist, you know. And it's like yeah. so the answer is it possible? And I think, you know, ultimately if we, if you're a good scientist, you got to say now that's at the extremes it's a like yes. Yes. You know, and it might get more interesting when you had to you're asked to guess about the probability of that. Is that a one in a one in a million, one in a trillion, one in a one in uh, more than the number of atoms in the universe uh, probability? And as an empiricist, is like what what is a good testable? Like, how would you know the answer to that question? Well, how would you be oh, able to validate? Sorry. I mean, well, can you get some information that's verifiable? Like, like um, information that about some other planet that that or or some aspect some and gosh it would be an interesting range but what range of discovery that we can anticipate we're going to know within um you know whatever a few years next 5 10 20 years um and seeing if you can get that predict that information now and then over time it might be verified you know the type of thing like you know Part of Einstein's work was ultimately verified not until decades and decades later, at least certain aspects through the um, through empirical observations. Um, but it, but it's also possible that the the alien beings have a very different value system and perception of the world, where all of this little capitalistic improvements that we're all after, like predicting the concept of predicting the future, too, is like totally useless to uh, to, to other life forms uh, that have that perhaps think in a much a different way, maybe a more transcendent way, I don't know, but. So they wouldn't even sign the consent form to be a participant in our they, experiment. They would <laughs> like, not, okay, yeah. they would not. Uh, and they wouldn't yeah. even understand the nature of these experiments. I mean, that um, maybe it's purely in the realm of uh, the, the consciousness thing that we, we uh, talked about. So they're communicating in, in a way that is totally different than the kinds of communication that we think of as on earth. Like what's the purpose of communication for us? For us humans, the purpose of communication is sharing ideas, it feels like. Like converging, like it's the Dawkins like memes. It's like we're sharing ideas in order to figure out how to uh, collaborate together to get food into our systems and procreate and then like murder everybody in the neighboring tribe because they, they'll steal our food. Like we are all about sharing ideas. Maybe uh, it's possible to, to have another alien life form that's more about sharing experiences. You know, uh, like it's less about ideas. I don't know. And maybe uh, that'll be us in a few years. Like yeah. how could it not? Like instead of explaining something laboriously to you, l like having people describe the ineffable psychedelic experience, yeah. like if we could record that, and then get the neural link of 50 years from now, like, oh, just plug this into your- Just transfer in the experience. Yeah, it's like, oh, now you feel what it's what it's like. And like, in one sense, like, how could we not go there? And yeah. then you get into the realm, of, especially when you throw time into it, are the aliens us Yeah. in the future? Or even like a transcendental temporal, like the, the us beyond time. Right. Like, I don't know, like you get into this realm, well, one. there's a lot of possibilities. Yeah. But I think, you know, there's one psychedelic researcher that's who did high-dose DMT, 
um, <laughs> research in the 90s who speculated that um, that and there was a lot of alien encounter experiences. Like maybe these are like entities from some other dimension or you, he do, labeled it as speculation, but you know. Do you remember the name? Oh, Rick Strassman. Oh, Rick Strassman. Who did, yeah, yeah, the, the DMT work. He labeled it as speculation, but you know, I think that, yeah, I, I think we'd be wise to kind of, you know, find, you know, it's always that balance between being mm -hmm. empirically grounded and, and skeptical, but also not being, and I think in science, well, often we are too closed, Yeah, it, which relates to like, you're talking about Elon, like in academia, it's like often like, I think you're punished for thinking or even talking about 20 years from now, because it's just so far removed from your next grant or for your next paper that you're it's easy pickings yeah. and you know, that you're not allowed to speculate. So I, I think the, uh, I'm a huge fan of, I think the, the best way to me, at least to practice like science or to practice good engineering is to like do two things and just bounce off, like spend most of the time doing the rigor of the day to day of what can be accomplished now in the engineering space or in the science, like what can actually, what can you construct an experiment around, do like that, the usual rigor of the scientific process, but then every once in a while, on a regular basis, to step outside and talk about aliens and consciousness. And uh, you, we just walk along the line of things that are outside the reach of science currently, uh, free will, the the illusion the illusion or the perception of the experience of free will of anything just just mm -hmm. the the entirety of it being able to travel in time through wormholes it's like it's really useful to do that especially as a scientist like if that's all you do you go into a land where you're not actually able to think rigorously there's something at least to me that if you just hop back and forth you're able to, I think, do exactly the kind of injection of out of the box thinking to your regular day to day science that will ultimately lead to breakthroughs. And, but you, but you have to be the good scientist most of the time, and that's consistent with what I think the great scientists of history like yes. like in most of the, the 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 history, you know, the greats, you know, the Newtons and uh, you know Einsteins. I mean, they were. There was less of a, and, and this change, I think, as time marched on, but less of a separation between those realms. Yeah. It's like there's the inclination now for it's like as a scientist, and it, this is like you know, this is science, this is my work, and then this it's like my inclination to say, oh, Lex, don't take me too seriously because this is my armchair. I'm not speaking yeah. as a scientist. Yes. And I'm bending over backwards yes. to say, like, you know, to divide that self. And maybe there's been less of there's been that evolution, and and that's and like the greats like didn't see that i mean newton yeah. and, and you go back in time and it's like that obviously like connects to then religion especially if that is the predominant world where newton like how much you know like how much time did he spend trying to like decode the bible and whatnot you know yeah. and maybe that was a yeah. dead end but it's like if if you really believe in that in yeah. that particular religion and you're this mastermind and you're trying to figure things out it's not like oh this is what my job description is and this is what the grant wants it's like no, I've got this limited time on the planet. I'm going to figure out as much stuff as possible. Nothing is off the table and you're just putting it all together. So this is kind of this trajectory is maybe related to this, the siloing in science, like again, related to my, like, oh, I'm not a philosopher, you know, going whether you consider that a science or not, not empirical science, but like going to these different disciplines, like, you know, the greats, you know, didn't yeah. observe the, ba the yeah. boundaries didn't exist. No they boundaries. didn't observe them. And now for something completely different, we talked about aliens earlier. <laughs> so uh, George brought up Bob Lazar. I, I um, will likely probably talk to Bob Lazar on this podcast. And then um, and then John had a, a skeptical look on his face about, about aliens. So let me ask uh, John and Gordon, uh, do you think there's intelligent alien civilizations out there in the universe outside of our own? The universe is unimaginably large. The idea that we are the only life forms in a cosmos as large as this is, I think, naive and foolish. Um, there's a very high likelihood that if life could evolve on this planet, 
that it could have done so on many, many other planets around the uh, around the cosmos. I think anyone who puts even a moment's thought into this would realize that there's almost certainly other forms of life out there. The real question with regards to the alien community is, um, have they got here and are they yeah. circling our planet in um, little silver sources and making observations and periodically stealing people for experimentation purposes. Doesn't have to be silver saucers. It could be different other <laughs> color saucers. Um, and that question, I'm, I'm, I'm not at all convinced. No, I, I don't think. Recently, um, Navy footage has come out showing some very interesting phenomena. If you talk to almost any experienced pilot, they will tell you they've seen things in the upper atmosphere that are very difficult to explain. Uh, I'll be the first one to agree with you on this. There are some things out there that are extremely difficult to explain. Like literally UFOs, unidentified yeah, flying Yeah, I mean, objects. we just don't know what they are. But to go from the idea that there's things out there that we don't understand to there's like little creatures running around and, um, uh, and these somehow exist, uh, I just reserve judgment. I just say I'm, I'm agnostic about these things. I think it's possible, but um, all the evidence that I've been shown so far was insufficient to come to any kind of definite conclusions. Until aliens land in Central Park on Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m. and get out with little alien ray guns and start shooting people, I don't believe in many of the stories that get told. Well, what about if it's not little aliens with ray guns, but something very different, very, very difficult to detect for us humans, mm. us very human-centric well, creatures. At that point, it's a, it's a fascinating idea, and it's certainly possible, but show me the evidence. All right, what about you, Gordon? You, do you, do you uh, look at the cosmos and ponder the stars often? I think it's fair points John raised. Uh, something really interesting I saw the other day was uh, someone posted like, if an alien organ or civilization 65 million light years away somehow managed to look at Earth, they would theoretically see the dinosaurs because they're 65 million light years mm -hmm. away. So like imagine us looking at galaxies that are 100 million light years away. That's 100 million years ago. You have no idea what it looks like now. Um, so that's what's super interesting to me about it. Yeah, the, the expanse is huge and so much cool stuff could be going out there. Yeah. And, um, the scary thing, of course, is if they haven't visited us yet, the there has to be a good reason for it. And the, the, the set of scary reasons of all the fact that they, maybe once you get sufficiently advanced in your development, you destroy yourself naturally, as humans seem to be approaching now. We, we more and more have the tools to destroy ourselves completely in terms of our weapon systems. Um, and we're developing them more and more and they're becoming better and better and then we're starting to get angry and angry on Twitter and Instagram at each other. Mm. It's, those are good points you're raising. <laughs> uh, History has taught us that everything that lives one day will die, so we will, we will perish. One day, yeah. We will. There's also just the, the sheer difficulty of, um, of, of travel through space. Like space is an unimaginably inhospitable environment. And to the best of our knowledge, this even the theoretical speeds that we can attain in space, even if we could travel at the speed of light, we're not even remotely close to that. Still, the distances that need to be traveled to get to even relatively close solar systems are very, very long. If you look at astronauts who have spent significant amounts of time in space just orbiting the Earth, it has severe health effects on them. We're, we're just not built for space. We're supposed to be in a gravitational environment. By we, you're referring to your biological meat bag that's containing the essence of the mind that is John Donahue. Maybe we can transfer the mind alone. Mm, so the, 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 the bag, the meat, the meat bag yeah, is not designed yeah. for space, but maybe the but again, this is all, contents of the mind is. It's, uh, it's possible, but there, what do you there's think, no uh, concrete evidence for You it. folks who like difficult things, uh, what do you think about uh, Elon Musk wanting to colonize Mars? Is this something you find an interesting or a um, aimless pursuit? I think it's a must or a salvation. We need to leave at some point the planet because historically in the past, we know that 
We've been bombarded by asteroid, volcano. There are crazy things happen here. It's very unstable. You know, we, we, if you look at it to, uh, through a, a lifetime of a human being, it's nothing but just look 12,000 years ago what happened, you know? So, so there is cataclysm that happened all the time. It's very unstable. So if we want to survive as a species, I think it's, it's, we need to get out, to be able to get out and spread our seed. So these are the early steps on a, on a really long journey, but is there something about like, you know, we, we don't get that exploration from most of modern society. You know, the kind of exploring that people did throughout the centuries of, uh, you know, coming to the North America, just to, throughout, we were shrouded in physical uncertainty of what's out there. And now we get to do the same kind of exploration with Mars. Is there, so I mean, is there any aspect of you that wants to travel out to space, that wants to travel to Mars? There, you know, the goal is to allow civilians to travel perhaps in our lifetime, meaning affordably. You can do so now unaffordably. Traveling to space and traveling to Mars are two different things. I think I would like to travel into space. I don't know if I would like to travel all the way to Mars. Because of the risks involved? Just because... Boring? Is there some part of you that enjoys the I, I think the that unknown? if I was like towards the end of my life, I would like to travel to Mars. Because <laughs> it would be just, nice just to die the, on ju Mars. Just for the experience, yeah. But if I go to Mars, I'm not coming back. Like, that's it. <laughs> One-way ticket. <laughs> Maybe with the technology we have now, maybe in the future, maybe our the children of our children will will be able to to experience that to go to to the well the the weekend <laughs> on Mars. Uh, well, the the whole design of the Starship that the SpaceX is working on is supposed to come back, it's supposed to be reusable. So it's not it's not a one way ticket. That's the whole point. It's, just, it's always going back and forth, back and forth. What's the time frame between two planets? Like to travel from? I think the current thing, you'd be stuck on Mars for two years. But how long does it take to get from Earth to Mars? Oh, it's pretty, I'm not exactly sure, but it's pretty quick. It's pretty quick. Like, and, uh, I don't no. know, on the scale of months, not scale of years. You might not be healthy when you come back. You know, all the astronauts, they experience uh, health issues. You know, they lose a lot of muscle mass, bone density. So yeah, I don't think the technology is good right now. I mean, let's say that- If it is, I would love to be, doing it for a weekend. If it's well, safe, I would, well, love, I would be the first one to do it. Or a professional fighter who sacrifices his body for something. <laughs> so there's some sacrifice we do in life, right? I don't want to be the first. I wouldn't want to, I leave the other one, but when I know it's, it's safe, okay, count me in. So one of the things that people say, and this is something I wonder about is, it's like having children or something. Once you see, once you're out in space and you look out and you see Earth, you look back at Earth, that's an experience that's unlike anything else. Like you can't replicate it here. Um, is, is to look back at that like blue dot. And that- really nerve wracking. <laughs> <laughs> oh like shit, we're just, You see like Earth disappear into the distance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, disappear into the distance. And then you get to actually stand on Mars and see, and just to look, you're standing on the ground and you're looking out and you see the planet from which you came and where you might not be coming back. But there's a challenge to the whole thing, whereas the risk is tremendous. And I don't know, I find that risk really compelling for some reason, but that could be just the exploration. I guess that's a genetic thing too, how much do you want to explore? There's a sense though in which, even in the best case scenario where they did get the technology to whisk you to Mars in a, in a fairly short period of time, it's kind of an inauthentic sense of exploration because your participation in it is no more exciting than your participation in an airline flight to a foreign country. You're basically, you, you didn't have anything to do with the creation of the, of the vessel. You're not in command of the vessel. You're not in any way, shape or form important to the mission. You're just a person sitting in a passenger seat and you get off in a destination the same way you would if you flew to Singapore or London or someplace like that. Well, it's, there's um, a hierarchy of there's a leadership and then there's a bunch of people and they all have roles. You don't get okay. to go to Mars without having a, some skill set to contribute. But if it, you, you made it sound like space tourism where you just well, yeah, pay a ticket. I, I, don't, I think it's a long time before you have space tourism to Mars where you have nothing to contribute. Okay. Like you will have to. So what do you something. do? You go through like a training program. You go training program, and then there's uh, there's technical things you'll be contributing. So they they would bring people 
you know, in terms of agriculture, I don't know. Okay, so this is this is better. This sounds like they're actual they're, they're more like explorers. Like if you you talked before about explorers in, in human history where Magellan sets off on his boat and every person on the boat had a specific function. They were they were all into the mission in a very authentic fashion. If they weren't on the boat, the performance of the crew would somehow suffer. So th this sounds much better. And with yeah. just with like with Magellan, I'm pr I think most of the crew died. A significant number yeah. did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and from, uh, yeah, from bacteria, I mean, from things that are unexpected and so mm. on. And if we discover life on Mars, I mean, who knows what that entails? Because that's like a, a manned mission to Mars would likely be very driven by the research to do all the kind of um, exploration required to find life. Now, from uh, Mr. Musk's uh, point of view as a developer, presumably there has to be some kind of financial incentive here too. Is there some kind of financial benefit to Mars missions? Is, is presumably um, there wouldn't be that many people on Earth that could afford a ticket to pay for the kind of research and development that would require this. Is there some kind of mining on Mars of minerals that would be useful? So I think Earth? there's a lot of answers to this, but the only honest answer is the one that looks back into human history, where we did a lot of things just because we, we could. A lot of hard things just because we could, and that led to a lot of innovation that ultimately made our life better. So this is more... This is why you have NASA, this is why you have government organizations. Like, what's the purpose of NASA? NASA would answer that by saying, okay, well, we're helping launch satellites up there, all the, they'll have a bunch of answers, but the reality is the programs were funded in large part by our desire to explore the unknown. And um, there's some aspect to which we have to all invest into that because historically speaking, that has produced a lot of cool things along the way that were totally unexpected. Like, uh, But NASA is funded by public funding, public the taxpayer. Funded. Uh, how is Mr. Musk going to fund this? Well, currently, it, most of the funding was the SpaceX is NASA giving money uh, to, so they're making a competition. Who can, who can get our satellites? We need to go to, um, you know, it was for the space station to uh, resupply the space station, or we need to s launch satellites up. Who's going to carry those quote unquote payloads? They just need, so NASA is paying whoever the heck wants to uh, get kilograms of thing up into space. Why it's, did, this is NASA's specialty. Why did they just give up on that? Well, they, Why they, they realized when Mr. Musk came along and then Bezos and others that said, we can do it for one tenth the price. So why did the why should the taxpayers pay for the why don't you NASA do what you do well, which is like t test out cutting edge stuff, make sure they're safe, and now that we've developed um, a car, let us let us UPS and FedEx take care of uh, doing this at scale, doing it cheaper, doing it better. Wow. I mean that's the argument. Mm. And NASA took what they realized is, is it took way way too long to do stuff. When you're investing millions, that's billions of dollars into a project, the the bureaucracy builds up, and the conservatism builds up to where you're. I mean, you really have to test everything out. So projects take years, and then you have somebody like Elon Musk coming along and says, "Well, let's do launches every every week," and as opposed to just throwing away the rocket, we'll reuse the rocket. That was one of the sort of cutting edge inventions. It's a dumb, obvious idea. Like, like Elon says, why do you throw away the plane? It's the equivalent as if you flew a plane every time you threw it away. Why are we every time throwing away the plane? But NASA tried that kind of thing with the space shuttle since the 1970s. And yes, well, they did that with the space shuttle, but not not at the scale here that uh, it was the space shuttle was seen as this like majestic, amazing thing that requires a huge amount of investment. With Elon Musk is like, no, with every basic rocket should be reusable. Next. Cut cut cost, cut cost. Do you do you think like the more technology we have, the more advanced we become, the more specialized we need to be? Like is that for that reason that now they they there is different branch? Like you just explained now now NASA they're specialized in this, but yeah. they left, you know, other branch. Yeah, there's there's the greater and greater specialization as we build up more stuff, which is fascinating because is is it making us more dumb in a way do, do you think like 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 yeah i don't know like 
you you <laughs> know but maybe. like I, I use a cell phone but i don't know how to build it up from yeah. like i mean know. it's that beta males building up this whole society um because we're this collective intelligence we rely on each other more and more and it, it i do also see sort of the rise of conspiracy theories and all those kinds of things because like I, i've been talking to a few folks about flat earth recently and it's fascinating <laughs> It's fascinating. There's a large community of people that believe the earth is flat. And that idea takes hold in this day and age of all the ideas, that's the one that takes hold for a large number of people. And I think that's a consequence of this, this kind of specialization where it's just a huge amount of experts. But if you look out into our world and try to reason simply about our existence, we, we are losing the skill to do that because more and more people are specialized as opposed to general thinkers. We're like extremely good at specific sightings of weird phenomena that, uh, you know, what does UFO mean? It means it's uh, a flying object and it's not identified uh, clearly at the time of sighting. That's what UFO means. So it could be a uh, physics phenomena, it could be ball lightning, it could be all kinds of fascinating. I was always fascinated with ball lightning as a, um, as like the fact that there could be physical phenomena in this world that are observable by the human eye. Of course, all physical phenomena generally are fascinating that are, that that really smart people can't explain. I love that. Cause it's like, wait a minute, especially if you can replicate it. Mm -hmm. It's like, wait a minute, how does this happen? That's like the precursor to giant discoveries in mm -hmm. chemistry and biology and physics and so on. But, it sucks when those events are super rare, right? Physical, like like ball lightning. Uh, so so that's out there. And then uh, of course that phenomena could have other interpretations that don't have to do with the physics, the chemistry, the biology of earth. It could have to do with more extraterrestrial explanations that in large part, thanks to Hollywood and movies and all those kinds of things, captivates the imaginations of millions of people. Uh, but just because it's science fiction that captivates the imagination of people doesn't mean that some of those sightings, all it takes is one. One of those sightings is actually a sign that it's, it's extraterrestrial intelligence, that it's an um, object that's not of this particular mm -hmm. world. Do you think there's a chance that that's the case? What do you make, especially the pilot sightings, what do you make of those? Um, so I, I agree with there's a chance. There's always a chance. Any good sci scientist would have to, or observationist would have to, you know, I want to see if aliens exist, come, come to Earth. What I know about the universe is I think it's unlikely right now that there are aliens visiting us, but, but not impossible. I think the um, releases, the dramatization that's been happening politically, saying we're going to release all this information, this you know classified information. Um, I was kind of disappointed because it was just very poor um, um, material. And right now, the the you know the the ability to capture high resolution video, everybody is carrying around with them an incredible video device now, and we haven't got more compelling data. And so that we've just seeing grainy pictures, a lot of hearsay, instrument kind of malfunctions and whatnot. And so I think on balance, I think it's extremely unlikely, but I think something really interesting is happening. Um, that, and also during the pandemic, right? We've all been locked down. We all want to have, we want to, our imaginations are, you know, running riot. And I think that the, the, the I don't think that the the information out there has convinced me there are any anything interesting on the UFO side. But what it has made me very interested about is how humanity is opening up its mind to ponder aliens mm -hmm. and the the mystery of our universe. And so I don't want to dissuade people from having those thoughts and say you're stupid and look at that it's clearly incorrect. That's not right. That's not fair. What I would say is that I lack sufficient data replicated observations to to make me go oh i'm going to take this seriously but i'm really interested by the fact that there is this um this great deal of interest and i think that it it drives me to maybe want to make or make an artificial life form even more and to help nasa 
and the Air Force and whoever go and look for things even more because I think humanity wants to know what's out there. There's this yearning, isn't there? Yeah, but but I see. I almost uh, depending on the day, I sometimes agree with you, but uh, w with the thing you just said. But one of the disappointing things to me about the sightings, I still hold the belief that a non-zero number of them uh, is an indication of something very interesting. So I don't side with the people who say everything can be explained with like uh, sensor artifacts kind of thing. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with you. I didn't say that either. I would say I just don't have enough data. Right. But the thing I want to push back on is is the statement that everybody has a high definition camera. One of the disappointing things to me about like the report that the government released, but in general, just having worked with government, having worked with with people all over, uh, is how in incompetent we are. Like if you look at the, pan the response to the pandemic, how incompetent we are in the face of great challenges without great leadership, how incompetent we are in the face of the great mysteries before us without great leadership. And I just think it's actually, the fact that there's a lot of high definition cameras is not enough to capture the full richness of weird, of the mysterious phenomena out there of which, extraterrestrial intelligence visiting Earth could be one. I don't think we have, I don't think everybody having a, a, a smartphone in their pocket is enough. I think that allows for TikTok videos. I don't think it allows for the capture of even interesting, relatively rare human events. That's not that common. It's rare to have be in the right moment in the right time to be able to capture the thing. I agree, I agree. Let me, let me rephrase what I think on this. I, I haven't seen enough information. I haven't really actively sought it out, I'm, I must admit. But I'm I'm with you in that I love the idea of anomaly detection, in chemistry in particular, right? I want to make anomalies, sorry, or not necessarily make anomalies. I want to understand an anomaly. Let me give you yes. two from chemistry, um, which are really quite interesting. Um, phlogiston, going way back, where people said, there's this thing called phlogiston, and for ages, the alchemists got really um, this kind of the, this the fire is a thing. Um, and that's one. And then we determined that phlogiston wasn't what we thought it is. Let's go to physics, the ether. The ether is a hard one because I think actually the ether might exist. And I'll tell you what I think the ether is later. Um, and it, and, and it, Can you explain ether? So uh, as, as the vacuum, so the, the light traveling through the ether in the vacuum, there is some thing that we call the ether that, that basically mediates the, the movement of light, mm -hmm. say. And I think that, um, and then the other one is cold fusion, which is more of a, so a few years ago um, that, that people observed that when they did some electrochemistry, when they were uh, splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen, that you got more energy out than you put in. And people got excited to th and they thought that this was a nuclear reaction. And um, and in the end, it was kind of discredited because you didn't detect neutrons and all this stuff. But I'm pretty sure, I'm a chemist, and I'm going telling you this on your podcast, but why not? I'm pretty sure there's interesting electrochemical phenomena that's not completely bottomed out yet, that there is something there. However, we lack the technology and the experimental design so all I'm saying in your response about aliens is like we, we lack the experimental design to really capture these anomalies. And we are encircling, encircling the planet with many more detection systems. We've got satellites everywhere. So there is, I do hope that we are going to discover more anomalies. And remember that the solar system isn't just static in space. It's moving through the universe. So there's just more and more chance. I'm not what with Avi Loeb that uh, he's generating all sorts of kind of... Um, a cult, I would say, uh, uh, with this, but there. But I'm not against him. I think there is a finite chance if there are aliens in the universe that we're going to happen upon them, because we're moving through the universe. How many alien civilizations are out there in those four phases that you're talking about? When you look up to the stars, and you're sipping on some wine, and um, talking to other people with British accents about something intelligent, intellectual, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> Do you think there's uh, a lot of alien civilizations looking back at us and wondering the same? My romantic view of the universe is really um, taking loans from my logical self. 
So what I'm saying is I have no doubt, I have no idea. But having said that, there is no reason to suppose that life is as hard as we first thought it was. And so if we just take Earth as a marker, and if I think that life is a much more general phenomena than just our biology, then I think the, the universe is full of life. And the, Fermi, the reason for the Fermi paradox is not that um, they're not out there, it's just that we can't interact with the other life forms because they're so different. And I'm not saying that they're necessarily like as depicted in Arrival or other, you know, um, I'm just saying that perhaps there are very few universal facts in the universe and that, and maybe um, that it's not, it's quite, the te our technologies are quite divergent. And so I think that it's very hard to know how we're going to interact with alien life. You think there's a lot of kinds of life that's possible. I, I guess that was the intuition. Yeah. You provided that uh, the way biology itself, but even this particular kind of biology that we have on Earth, uh, is is something that uh, is just one sample of a uh, nearly infinite number of other possible mm -hmm. complex, autonomous, self-replicating type of things that could yeah. be possible. And so we're almost unable to see the alternative uh, versions of us. Huh. I mean, um, we'd still be able to detect them. We'd still be able to interact with them. We'd still be able to like which, uh, what's exactly is lost in translation? Why can't we, why can't we see them? Why can't we talk to them? Because I, I too have a sense, <laughs> you put it way more poetically, but it seems both statistically and uh, sort of romantically, it feels like the universe should be teeming with life, like super intelligent life. And uh, I, I just, I, I sit there and the Fermi paradox is very, it's felt very distinctly by me when I look up at the stars, because it's like, it, it's uh, the same way I feel when I'm driving through New Jersey and listening to Bruce Springsteen and feel quite sad. Uh, it's like Louis C.K. talks about pulling off to the side of the road and just uh, weeping a little bit. I'm almost like wondering like, hey, why, why aren't you talking to us? You know, it feels lonely feels lonely because it feels like they're out there. I think that there are a number of answers to that. I think the Fermi paradox is is perhaps based on the the assumption that there's that if life did emerge in the universe, it would be similar to our life, and there's only one solution. Um, and I think that what we've got to start to do is go out and did look for selection detection rather than an evolution detection rather than life detection. Um, and I and I think that once we start to do that, we might start to see really interesting things. Um, and we haven't been doing this for very long. Um, and we are living in an expanding universe, so that makes the problem a little bit harder. Uh, <laughs> Everybody's always leaving. Um, but I'm I'm distance wise. I'm, I'm very optimistic that we will. Well, I don't know. There are two movies that came out in the same within six months of one another: Ad Astra and Cosmos. Ad Astra, the very expensive blockbuster, you know, with Brad Pitt in it and um, saying there is no life and it's all, you know, we've got a we're, life on Earth is more precious than Cosmos, which is a UK production, which basically aliens came and visited Earth one day and they were discovered in the UK, right? It was quite, it's a, it's a fun film. Um, and But I really loved those two films. And I'm, I, I, and at the same time, those films, at the time those films were coming out, I was working on a paper, um, a life detection paper, and I found... It was so hard to publish this paper, and it was almost as depressed. I got so depressed trying to get this science out there that I felt the depression of uh, the the film in Ad Astra, like life is there's no no life elsewhere in the universe. And but I but I'm incredibly optimistic that I think we will find life in the universe, firm evidence of life, and it will have to start on Earth, making life on Earth and surprising us. We have to surprise ourselves and make non biological life on Earth. And then people say, well, you you made this life on Earth, therefore it's the, you're part of the causal chain of that, and that might be true. But if I can show how uh, I I'm able to do it with uh, very little cheating or very little information inputs, just creating like a, a, a model planet, of some description, and watching it, watching life emerge. Then I think that we will be even to 
to persuade even the hardest critic that that, that it's it's possible. Now, with regards to the Fermi paradox, I think that we might crush that with the JWST. It's basically, if I recall correctly, the mirror is about 10 times the size of the Hubble, that we're going to be able to do spectroscopy, um, look at colors of exoplanets, I think. Not brilliantly, but we'll be able to start to classify them. And we'll start to get a real feel for what's going on in the universe on these exoplanets. Because it's only in the last few decades, I think, maybe even last decade, that we even... um, um, came to recognize that exoplanets even are common. Mm-hmm. And I think that that gives us a lot of optimism that life is um, going to be out there. But I think we have to start framing, um, th- we have to start preparing the fact that biology is only one solution. I can tell you with confidence that biology on Earth does not exist anywhere else in the universe. We are absolutely unique. Well, okay. I love the confidence, but uh, where does... The, that confidence comes that's what so in in that movie annihilation the the shimmer this alternate dreamlike state is created by i believe perhaps an alien entity of course mm-hmm. uh, everything is up to interpretation mm-hmm. right but do you think there's in our world in our universe do you think there's intelligent life out there and if so how different it, is it from us humans well one of the things I was trying to do in Annihilation was to to offer up a form of alien life that was actually alien, because um, it, it it would often seem to me that in the way we would represent aliens in in uh, books or cinema or television or well, you know, any one of the sort of storytelling mediums is we would always give them very human-like qualities. So they wanted to teach us about galactic federations, or they wanted to eat us, or they wanted our resources, like our water, or they want to enslave us, or or whatever it happens to be. But all of these are incredibly human-like motivations. And um, I was interested in the idea of an alien that was not in any way like us. It didn't share... It, maybe it had a completely different clock speed, maybe it's way, so we're, we're talking about, we're looking at each other, we're getting information, light hits our optic nerve, our brain makes the best guess of what we're doing. Sometimes it's right, sometimes, you know, the thing we were talking about before, what if this alien doesn't have an optic nerve? Maybe it's way of encountering the space it's in is wholly different. Maybe it has a different relationship with gravity. The basic laws of physics it operates under might be fundamentally different. It could be a different time scale and so on. Yeah, or or, or it could be the same laws. It could be the same underlying laws of physics. You, you know, it's it, it's a machine uh, created, uh, or it's a, it's a creature created in a quantum mechanical way. It just ends up in a very very different place to the one we end up in. So so part of the preoccupation with annihilation was to come up with an alien that was really alien and didn't give us. And it it didn't give us and we didn't give it any kind of easy connection between human and the alien. Because I I think it was to do with the idea that you could have an alien that landed on this planet that wouldn't even know we were here. And we might only glancingly know it was here. There'd just be this strange point where the Venn diagrams connected, where we could sense each other or something like that. So in the movie, first of all, incredibly original view of what an alien life would be and it's it's so in that sense it's a huge success let's go inside your imagination did the alien that alien entity know anything about humans when it landed no so the idea is you're both you're basically an alien life is trying to reach out to anything that might be able to hear its mechanism of communication or was it simply was it just basically their biologist exploring different kinds of stuff that you but, can but find? But you see, it, but this is the interesting thing is, as soon as you say their biologist, right, you've done the thing of attributing human type yeah. motivations to it. I, I, I was trying to free myself from anything yes. like that. So all sorts of questions you might answer about this notional alien, I wouldn't be able to answer because I don't know what it was <laughs> or, or how it worked. You know, yeah, I, I had I gave it some I had some rough ideas, like it had a very 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 slow clock speed, 
And I thought maybe the way it is interacting with this environment is a little bit like the way an octopus will change its color forms around the space that it's in. So it's sort of reacting to what it's in to an extent, but the reason it's reacting in that way is indeterminate. But it's so, but its clock speed was slower than our human life clock speed or inter, but it's faster than evolution. Faster than our than evolution. Our evolution. Yeah, given the four billion years it took us to get here, then yes, maybe it started eight. If or, you look at the human civilization as a single organism. Yeah. In that sense, you know, this evolution could be us. Uh, you know, the, the evolution of living organisms on earth could be just a single organism and it's kind of, that's its life, is mm -hmm. the evolution process that eventually will lead to probably the the heat death of the universe or mm -hmm. something before that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's just an incredible idea. So you almost don't know, you've created something that you don't even know how it works. Like yeah, be because anytime I tried to look into how it might work, I would then inevitably be attaching my kind of thought processes into it. And I wanted to try and put a bubble around it where I would say, no, this is, this is alien in its most alien form. I have no real point of contact. For, um, I uh, think, I, you, you know, you, you might ask, why aren't they looking for us? One possibility is that we are not interesting. Like we were talking yeah, about ants. Ants. another possibility, you know, if there are millions of or billions of years uh, into their technological development, they created their own their own uh, habitat, their yeah. own cocoon, yeah. where they feel comfortable. They have everything they need, and it, it it's risky for them to establish communication with other. Yeah. Uh, so they have their own cocoon and they close off. Yes. They don't care about anything else. Yes. Now. In that case, you might say, oh, so how can we find about them if they are closed off? The answer is they still have to deposit trash, right? That's, <laughs> that is something from the law of thermodynamics. Yes. There must be some production of trash. And you know we can still find about them just like investigative journalists going through the trash cans yeah. of uh, celebrities in Hollywood. You, know? yes. you can learn about the private lives of those celebrities by looking at the front. <laughs> it's fascinating to, to think, you know, if, if we are the ants in this picture, if we, if this thing is a water bottle or if it's like a smartphone, like where, <laughs> where on the spectrum of possible objects of space, because there's a lot of interesting trash. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? So like, where, how interesting is this trash? Possibly? But imagine a caveman seeing a cell phone. The yeah, caveman I, would think, since the caveman played with rocks all of his life, he would say, it's a rock. Just yes. like my fellow astronomers said. Yes, right? yes exactly. So, that's that's br brilliantly put. <laughs> Actually, as a scientist, do you hope it's a water bottle or a smartphone? Because- a smart, I, I hope it's even more than a smartphone. I hope that it's something that is really sophisticated. That's and, funny. I, yeah. See, I'm the opposite. I, I feel like I hope it's a water bottle because at least we have a hope with our current set of skills to understand it. Yeah, a but caveman has no way of understanding the smartphone. It's like, it will be like, I feel like a caveman has more to learn from the plastic water bottle than they do from the smartphone. But suppose we figure it out. If we, if we, for example, come close to it and, and, and learn what it's made of. And I guess the smartphone is full of like thousands of different technologies that we could probably pick at. Do you have a sense of where uh, a hypothesis of where is the cocoon that it might have come from? If no, because uh, the okay. So first of all, you know the solar system. The outermost edge of the solar system is called the Oort cloud. It's a cloud of icy rocks um, of different sizes that were left uh, over from the formation of the solar system. Yes, and uh, it, it's thought to be roughly a, a ball or a sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's halfway, the extent of it is roughly halfway to the nearest star, okay? So you can imagine each planetary system basically touching uh, the Oort clouds of those stars yes. that are near us are touching each other. Space is full of these billiard balls that are very densely packed. Yes. And what that means is 
any object that you see, irrespective of whether it came from the local standard. Of, so we said that this object is special because it came from a local standard of rest. But even if it didn't, you would never be able to trace where it came from because all these Oort clouds overlap. So if you take some direction in the sky, you will cross as many stars as you have yeah. in that direction. Like there is no way to tell which old cloud it came from. So yeah, so I, di I didn't realize how densely packed everything was uh, yeah. uh, from the perspective of the Oort cloud. Yeah, that's really interesting. So yeah, it could be it could be nearby, it could be very far away. Yeah, we, we have no clue. You, you said cocoon uh, and you kind of, uh, uh, paint, uh, I think in the book, uh, I've read a lot of your articles too on the Scientific American, which are brilliant. So I'm kind of mixing things up in my head a little Go bit. Ahead. But there's, uh, what does that cac cocoon look like? What is a civilization that's able to harness the power of multiple suns, for example, um, look like? like if, when you imagine possible civilizations that are a million years more advanced than us, what do you think that actually like looks like? I think it's very different than we can imagine. Uh, by the way, I should start from the point that even biological life, you know, just uh, without technology getting into the game, uh, could look like something we have never seen before. Mm -hmm. uh, take, for example, the nearest star, which is Proxima Centauri. It's four and a quarter light years away. So they will know about the results of the 2016 elections only next month in February, 2021. Yes. Um, it's very far away. Um, but um, if you think about it, um, you know, this, this uh, star is a, is a dwarf star and uh, it's much cooler than, it's uh, twice as cold as the sun, okay? And it emits mostly infrared radiation. So if there are any creatures on a, the planet close to it that is habitable, mm -hmm. which is called Proxima B, there is a planet in the habitable zone, in the zone just at the right distance where in principle liquid water can be on the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, if there are any animals there, they have infrared eyes because our eyes was designed to be sensitive to where most of the sunlight is in the visible range. But Proxima Centauri emits mostly infrared. So, Who you know, the nearest to see each other <laughs> in the nearest uh, star system, these animals would be quite strange. They would have eyes that are detectors of infrared, very yeah. different from ours. Moreover, this planet Proxima B faces the star always with the same side. Mm -hmm. So it has a permanent day side and a permanent night side. And uh, obviously the creatures that would evolve on the permanent day side, which is much warmer, would be quite different than those on the permanent night side. Between them, there would be a permanent sunset strip. Mm -hmm. And my daughters said that that's the best opportunity for high value real estate, because you will see the sunset throughout your life, right? <laughs> yeah. it ne the sun never sets uh, on this on this trip. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, these worlds are out of our imagination. So just even the individual creatures, the, the sensor suite that they're operating with might be very different. Very different. So I think when we see something like that, we would be shocked. Not to speak about seeing technology now. So I, I don't even dare to imagine, you know? Uh, and I think, you know, obviously we can bury our head in the sand and say, it's never aliens, like yeah. many of my colleagues yes. say. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you, if you never look, you will yeah. never find. If you are not ready to find wonderful things, you will never discover them. And the other thing I would like to say is reality doesn't care whether you ignore it or not. You can ignore reality, but it's yeah. still there. Yes. So we can all agree, based on Twitter, that aliens don't exist that Oumuamua was a rock. Yeah. We can all agree. And you will get a lot of likes, yes. you'll have a big crowd of supporters, and everyone be, will be happy and give each other awards and honors and so yes. forth. But Oumuamua might still be <laughs> an alien artifact. Who cares what humans agree on? Yeah, exactly. it, there is a reality out there. And we have to be modest enough to recognize that we should make our statements based on evidence. Science is not about ourself. It's not about glorifying our image. It's not about getting honors, prizes. You know, a lot of the scientific, a lot of the academic activity is geared towards creating your echo chamber where you have students, postdocs repeating your mantras so that your voice is heard loudly so that you can get more honors, prizes, recognition. 
That's not the purpose of science. The purpose is to figure out what nature is, right? And in the process of doing that, it's a learning experience. Mm -hmm. You make mistakes. You know, Einstein made three mistakes at the end of his career. He argued that in the 1930s, he argued that black holes don't exist, gravitational waves don't exist, and quantum mechanics doesn't have spooky action at a distance. Yes. And all three turned out to be wrong. Okay, so the point is that if you work at the frontier, yes. of, then you make mistakes. It's inevitable because you can tell what is true or not. And avoiding making mistakes in order to preserve your image makes you extremely boring. Okay, yeah. you will get a prize, but you will be a boring scientist because you will keep repeating things we already know. If you want to make progress, if you want to innovate, you have to take risks and you have to look at the evidence. It's a dialogue with nature. You don't know the, the truth in advance. You let nature tell you, educate you, and then you, you realize that what you thought before is incorrect. And a lot of my colleagues prefer to be in a state where they have a monologue. You know, if you look at these people that work on string theory, yes. uh, they have a monologue. They know what, and in fact, their monologue is centered on anti deceiver space, which we don't live in yeah. now. You know, it's to me, it's just like the Olympics. You know, you, you define 100 meters and you say, whoever runs this 100 meters is the best athlete, the fastest, you know. And uh, it's completely arbitrary. You could have decided it would be 50 meters or 20 meters. Yeah. Who cares? You just measure the ability of people this way. So you define anti deceiver space as a space where you do your mathematical gymnastics. Mm -hmm. And then you find who can do it the best and you give jobs based on that. You give prizes based... But as we said before, you know, nature doesn't care about, you know, the prizes that you give yeah. e e to each other. It cares, you know, it has its own reality and yes. we should figure it out. And it's not about us. The scientific activity is about figuring out nature. And sometimes we, we may be wrong. Our image will not be preserved, but it's, that's the fun, you know, I, I, um, kids explore the world mm -hmm. out of curiosity. And I always want to maintain my childhood curiosity. And I don't care about the labels that I have. In fact, ha having tenure is, is exactly the opportunity to behave like a child because yeah. you can make mistakes. <laughs> yeah. And I was asked by the Harvard Gazette, you know, the, the, new, the yeah. Pravda of Harvard, <laughs> uh, what, what is yeah. the one thing that you would like to change about the world? Yes. And I said, I would like my colleagues to behave more like kids. Yeah. That's the one thing I would like them to do because something bad happens to these kids when they become tenured professors. Yeah. They start to worry about their ego yeah. and about themselves more than about the purpose of science, which is you know, curiosity-driven, figuring out from evidence. Evidence is the key. So when an object shows anomalies like umuamua, what's the problem discussing, you know, whether it's artificial or not? You know, so there was, I should tell you, there was a mainstream paper in Nature yes. published saying it must be natural. That's it. It's unusual, but it must be natural, period. And then at the same time, uh, the, those main, some other mainstream uh, scientists tried to explain the properties. Yes. And they came up with interpretations like it's a dust bunny, you know, the kind that you find in a household, a collection mm -hmm. of dust particles mm -hmm. pushed by sunlight. Something we have never seen before. Or it's a hydrogen iceberg. It actually evaporates like a but comet, but hydrogen is transparent. You don't see it. And that's why we don't see the cometary tail. Yeah. Again, we have never seen something like that. In both cases, the objects would not survive the, the long journey. Yes. We, we discussed it in a paper that I wrote afterwards. But my point is, those that tried to explain the unusual properties went into great length at discussing things that we have never seen before, okay? Mm -hmm. So even when you think about a natural origin, you have to come up with scenarios that of things that were never seen before. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, they look less plausible to me personally. But my point is, if we discuss things that were never seen before, right? Why not discuss, why not contemplate an artificial origin? What's the problem? Why do people have this pushback uh, you know, I worked on, on dark matter and um, we don't know what most of the matter in the universe is. Yeah. It's called dark matter. It's just an acronym 
because we have no clue. We simply don't know. So it could be all kinds of particles. And over the years, people suggested weakly interacting massive particles, axions, all kinds of particles. And experiments were made. They cost hundreds of millions of dollars. They put upper limits, constraints that ruled out many of the possibilities that were proposed as natural initially. Yes. The mainstream community regarded it as a mainstream activity to search the nature of the dark matter. And they, nobody complained that it's speculative to consider weakly interacting massive particles. Now, I ask you, why is it speculative to consider extraterrestrial technologies? We have a proof that it exists here on Earth. Yes. We also know that the conditions of, of, of Earth are reproduced in billions of systems throughout the Milky Way galaxy. So what's more conservative than to say, if you arrange for similar conditions, you get the same outcome. How can you imagine this to be speculative? It's not speculative at all. Yeah. And nevertheless, it's regarded the periphery. And at the same time, you have physicists, theoretical physicists, working on extra dimensions, supersymmetry, uh, super string theory, yes. the multiverse, Maybe we live in a simulation. Yeah. All of these ideas that have no grounding in reality, some of which sound to me like, you know, just like what someone would say. Uh, Science if, fiction, basically. Because you have no way to test it, uh, you know, through experiments. And experiments really are key. It's not just a nuance. You say, okay, forget about experiments. As some philosophers try to say, you know, if there is a consensus, what's the problem? The point is, it's key, then that's what Galileo found. Yes. It's key to have feedback from reality. Yes. You know, you can think that you have a billion dollars or that you are more rich than, you know, uh, Elon Musk. That's fine. You can feel very happy about it. You can talk about it with your friends and all of you will be happy and think about what you can do with the money. Then you go to an ATM machine and you make an experiment. You yes. check how much money you have in, in, in your checking account. And if it turns out that, you know, you, you don't have much, you can't, you can't materialize your dreams, okay? Yes. So you realize, you have a reality check. Yes. And my point is, without experiments giving you a reality check, without the ATM machine showing you whether your ideas are bankrupt or not, without putting skin in the game, and by skin in the game I mean, don't just talk about theoretical ideas, make them testable. If you don't make them testable, they're worthless. They're just like theology that is not testable. By the way, theology has some tests. Let me give you <laughs> That's interesting. three examples. Yes. Um, it turns out that my book already inspired a PhD student at Harvard in the English department uh -huh. to pursue a PhD in that direction. And uh, she invited me to the PhD exam a couple of months ago. And in the exam, one of the examiners, a professor, asked her, do you know why Giordano Bruno was burnt at the stake? Mm -hmm. And she said, no, I think it's because he was an obnoxious guy and uh, irritated a lot of people, yes. which is true. But the professor said, no, it's because Giordano Bruno said that other stars are just like the sun and they could have a planet like the earth around them that could host life. Oh, and that was offensive to the church. Why was it offensive? Because there is the possibility that this life sinned, okay? And if that life sinned on planets around other stars, it should have been saved by Christ. And then you need multiple copies of Christ. And that's unacceptable. How can you have duplicates of Christ? Right. And so they burned the guy. So it was about that's okay. I, I'm just like loading this all in because that's kind of brilliant. So he he was actually already into it's not just about the stars. It's anticipating that there could be other life forms. Yeah. Like why if this star if there's other stars why would it be special? Why would our star yeah. be special? He was and making then, the right argument, and, and he would just follow that all along to say like there should be other earth earth like places there should be other life, life. Forms. And, and then, then that there was needs offensive. to be copies of christ <laughs> yeah so that was uh, offensive so i said yeah. i said to that um <laughs> i said to that professor i said great you know i i wanted to introduce some scientific tone to the discussion yes and i said this is great because now you basically laid the foundation for an experimental test of this theology yes. what is the test we now know that other stars are like the sun 
And we know they have planets like the Earth around them. So suppose we find life there and we figure out that they sinned. Then we ask them, did you witness Christ? Mm -hmm. And if they say no, it means that this, this theology is ruled out. So there is an experimental test. So this is experimental test number one. Another experimental test, you know, uh, <laughs> in the Bible, you know, in the Old Testament, Abraham uh, was uh, heard the voice, the voice of God, to sacrifice his son, mm -hmm. right? Only son. And uh, that's what the story says. Now, suppose Abraham, my name, by the way, had the... Uh, <laughs> a voice memo up on his cell phone. Yes. He could have pressed this up and recorded the voice of God. Yeah. And that would have been experimental evidence that God exists, mm -hmm. right? Fortunately, he didn't. But it's an experimental test, mm -hmm. right? There is a third example I should tell, and that is Elie Wiesel attributed this story to Martin Buber, but it's not clear whether it's true or not. At any event, the story goes that Martin Buber, you know, he was a philosopher and he said, you know, the Christians argue that Jesus, you know, the, the Messiah arrived already and will come back again in the future. The Jews argue that the Messiah never came and will arrive in the future. So he said, why argue? Both sides agree that the Messiah will arrive in the future when the Messiah arrives, we can ask whether he or she <laughs> came before, you yeah. know, like visited us <laughs> and then figure it out. And yeah. one side, so again, experimental test of a theology. Yes. So even theology, if it puts a skin in the game, you know, if it makes a prediction, mm -hmm. could be tested, right? Uh, so why can't string theorists test themselves? Or why can't, you know, even cosmic inflation, that's another model that, you know, one of the inventors from MIT, mm -hmm. Alan Guth, argues that it's not falsifiable. Mm -hmm. uh, I arg My point is, a theory that cannot be falsified is not helpful because it means that you can't make progress. You cannot improve your understanding of nature. The only way for us to learn about nature is by making hypotheses that are testable, doing the experiments and learning whether we are correct or not. So be, and coupled that with a, a curiosity and open-mindedness that allows us to explore all kinds of possible hypotheses, but always the pursuit of those, the, the, the scientific rigor around those hypotheses is ultimately get evidence. Knowledge is of, of, of what nature is should be a dialogue with nature yes, a rather dialogue. than a monologue. Monologue, beautifully put. On the topic of... Uh, like discovery of evidence of alien civilizations, which is something you touch on in your book, what that idea would do to societies, to the human psyche and in general. Do, do you think, and you talk about the, uh, I still have trouble pronouncing, but a um, muamua um, um, wager, mm -hmm. right? What, what do you think is, uh, can you explain it? And what do you think in general is the effect that such knowledge might have on human civilization? Right, so uh, Pascal had this wager about God. And by the way, there are interesting connections between theology and the search for extraterrestrial life. You know, it's possible that, you know, we were planted on this planet by another civilization. That, yes. Uh, you know, we attribute to God powers that are, that belong really to a technological civilization. Uh, but, Putting that aside, uh, Pascal basically said, you know, let's, there are two possibilities, either God exists or not, right? Mm -hmm. And if God exists, you know, the consequences are quite significant. And therefore, you know, we should, we should consider that possibility differently than equal weight to both possibilities. Yes. And uh, uh, I suggest that we do the same with Oumuamua or other technological signatures that we uh, keep in mind the consequences uh, and therefore pay more attention to that possibility. Now, some people say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. My point is that the term extraordinary is really subjective. You know, for one person, a black hole is extraordinary. For another, you know, it's just a consequence of Einstein's theory of gravity. Yeah, it's nothing extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, 
the same about the type of dark matter, the, anything. So we should leave the extraordinary part of that sentence. Just keep evidence, okay? So let's be guided by evidence. And even, even if we have extraordinary claims, you know, let's not dismiss them because the evidence is not extraordinary enough. Because if we have an image of something and it looks really strange and we say, oh, the image is not sufficiently sharp, therefore we should not even pay attention to this image or not mm -hmm. even consider. I think that's a mistake. Yes. What we should do is say, look, there is some evidence for something unusual. Let's try and build instruments that will give us a better image. Uh, and if you just dismiss extraordinary claims, because the, you consider them extraordinary, you avoid discovering things that you haven't expected. And so I believe that along the history of astronomy, there are many missed opportunities. And I speak about astronomy, but I'm sure in other fields, it's also true. I mean, this is my expertise. For example, you know, the Astrophysical Journal, which is the main primary publication in, in astrophysics, uh, if you go, you go beyond, be, before the 1980s, there are images that were posted in the Astrophysical Journal of giant arcs, you know, arcs of light surrounding clusters of galaxies. And, you know, you can find it in printed versions of the Astrophysical Journal. People just ignore, they put the image, they see the arc, they say, oh, I mean, who knows what it is, and just ignore it. And then in the 1980s, the subject of gravitational lensing became popular. Mm -hmm. And the, the idea is that you can deflect light by the force of gravity. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you can put a source behind the cluster of galaxies and then you will get these arcs. And actually Einstein predicted it uh, in 1940. And you know, so these things were expected, but it, people just had them in the images, didn't pay attention. So I'm sure there are lost opportunities sometimes. You, even in existing data, you have things that are unusual and, and exceptional and they're not being addressed. You, we can do much better than that. We can look for artifacts that they left behind. Even, right. even if they are dead, you can look for industrial pollution in the atmospheres <laughs> of planets. Right. Uh, why do I bring this up? Again, to show you the conservatism of the mainstream in astronomy. And by the way, I, I shouldn't, you know, I have leadership positions. I, I was chair of the astronomy department for nine years, the longest serving chair at Harvard. And I'm the chair of the board on physics and astronomy of the national academies. You know, it's a primary uh, board. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm director of two centers at Harvard and so forth. So I, I, I do represent the community in, in various ways, but at the same time, you know, I'm a little bit disappointed by the conservatism that people have. And so let me give you an illustration of that. So the astronomy community actually is going right now through the process of defining its goals for the next decade. And there are proposals for telescopes that would cost billions of dollars and whose goal is to find evidence for oxygen mm -hmm. in the atmosphere of planets around other stars. Yes with the idea that this would be a marker, a signature of life. Now, the problem with that is Earth didn't have much oxygen in its atmosphere for the first two billion years. Mm -hmm. Roughly half of, you know, half of its life, it didn't have much oxygen, but it had life. It had microbial life. It's not, un it's not clear yet, as of yet, what the origin is for the rise in the oxygen level after two uh, billion years, about 2.4, a billion years ago, but we know that a planet can have life without oxygen in the atmosphere mm -hmm. because Earth did it. The second problem with this approach is that you can have oxygen from natural processes. You can break uh, water molecules and make oxygen. Right. So even if you find it, it will never tell you that for sure life exists there. Mm -hmm. And so even with these billions of dollars, the mainstream community will never be confident uh, whether there is life. There. Now, how can it be confident? There is actually a way. If instead of looking with the same instruments, if you look for molecules that indicate industrial pollution, <laughs> for example, CFCs, you know, that are produced by refrigerating systems yeah. or industries here on earth that That's dilute brilliant. the ozone layer, mm -hmm. you know, you can search for that. And I wrote a paper five years ago suggesting that. Now, what's the problem? You can just tell NASA, I want to build this telescope to search for oxygen, but also 
for industrial pollution. Nobody would say that yeah. because it sounds like, you know, on the periphery of the field. And I ask you, why would- That's hilarious. Because yeah. that's exactly, I mean, that would just be you're a, saying is quite brilliant. I mean, because uh, it, it's a really strong signal. And if life, if there's alien civilizations out there, then there are probably going to be many of them, and they're probably going to be more advanced than us, and they're probably going to have something like industrial pollution, which would be a much stronger signal than some basic gas, which could have a lot of different explanations. So like right. something like oxygen or, I mean, I don't, you know, uh, I mean, we could talk about signs of life on Venus and so on, but, like if you want a strong signal, it would be <laughs> pollution. I love how garbage is. <laughs> no, but the pollution, like, you have to understand, we think of pollution as a problem, yeah. but uh, on a planet that was too cold, for example, to have a uh, la comfortable life on it, you can imagine terraforming it and putting a blanket of polluting gases such that it will be warmer. Yeah. And that would be a positive change. So if, uh, an industrial or, or a technological civilization wants to terraform a planet that otherwise is, is too cold for them, they would do it. Yeah. So what's the problem of defining it as a search goal using the same technologies? The problem is that there is a taboo. We are not supposed to discuss extraterrestrial intelligence. There is no funding for this subject, not much, very little. And young people because of the bullying on Twitter, you know, all, all the social media and elsewhere, young people with talent that are curious about this, these questions do not enter this field of study. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if you step on the grass, it will never grow, right? So if you don't give funding, obviously, you know, the mainstream community says, look, nothing was discovered so far. <laughs> obviously, nothing would be discovered if talented people go to other disciplines. Never, you never search for it well enough, you will never find anything. I mean, look at gravitational wave astrophysics. It's a completely new window into the universe, pioneered by Ray Weiss at MIT. Mm -hmm. And at first it was ridiculed. And thanks to some administrators at the National Science Foundation, it received funding, despite the fact that the mainstream of the astronomy community was very resistant yes. to it. And now it's considered a frontier. So all these people that I remember as a postdoc, a young postdoc, these people that bashed this field and said bad things about people, you know, said nothing will come out of it. Now they say, oh yeah, of course, you know, the, the Nobel Prize was given to the, you know, to the LIGO collaboration. Uh, of course, now they are, they, are, they are supportive of it. But my point is, if, if, if you suppress innovation early on, there are lots of missed opportunities. The discovery of exoplanets is one example. You know, in 1952, there was an astronomer called uh, named uh, Otto Struve, and he wrote a paper saying, why don't we search for Jupiter-like planets close to their host star? Mm -hmm. Because if they're close enough, they would move the star back and forth and we can detect the signal. Yes. Okay? And so astronomers on time allocation committees of telescopes for 40 years argued this is not possible because we know why Jupiter resides so far from the sun. You cannot have Jupiter so close because there is this region where ice forms far from the sun and beyond that region is where Jupiter-like planets can form. Mm -hmm. There was a theory behind it which ended up being wrong by, now, by today's standards. But yes. anyway, they did not give time on telescopes to search for such systems until the first system was discovered four decades after Otto Struve's paper. Mm -hmm. And the Nobel Prize was awarded to that just a couple of years ago. Yeah. And uh, you ask yourself, okay, so you know, science still made progress. What's the problem? The problem is that this baby came out barely, you know, and, and, and there was a delay of four Long decades. Delay. So the progress was delayed. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how many babies were not born because yeah. of this resistance. So there must be ideas that are as good as this one that were suppressed mm -hmm. because they were bullied, because uh, people ridiculed them, that were actually good ideas. And we, these are missed opportunities, babies that were never born. Yes. And you know, I'm willing to push this frontier of the search for technologies or technological signatures of other civilization. Because you know, when I was young, I was in the military 
uh, in Israel, it's obligatory to serve. And uh, there was this saying that, you know, one of the soldiers sometimes has to put his body on the barbed wire so that others can go through. Yes. And I'm willing to suffer the pain so that, you know, younger people in the future will be able to speak freely about the possibility that some of the anomalies we find in the sky yes. are due to uh, technological signatures. And it's quite obvious. This is why like like folks in the artificial intelligence space, Elon Musk and uh, a few others speak about this. And they look at the long arc. They, they say like, what, you know, this kind of, you know, you can call it like first principles thinking, or you can call it anything really is like, if we just zoom out from our current bickering and our current, like discussions in the what science is doing and look at the long arc of the trajectory we're headed at which questions are obviously fundamental to science right. and that should be asked and which is the space of hypotheses we should be exploring and like exoplanets is a really good example of one that was like an obvious one. I, I recently talked to Sarah Seeger and it was very taboo when she was starting out to That's work right. on an exoplanet and that was even in the 90s. Yeah. And uh like it's obvious should not be a taboo subject. And to me, I mean, I'm probably ignorant, but to me, exoplanets seems like it's ridiculous that that would ever be a ta taboo subject right. uh, to not fund, to not explore. That's very, but even for her, it's now taboo to say like what, you know, to, to look for industrial pollution. Right, right. It's and like, I find that ridiculous. <laughs> I tell you she why. Can't take the next step. It's so. ridiculous for another reason. Yes, not because of just the scientific benefits that we might have by exploring it, but because the public cares about these questions. Yes, and the lot. public funds science. So how yes. dare the scientists yes. shy away from addressing these questions if they have the technology to do it? Mm -hmm. It's like saying, I don't want to look through Galileo's telescope. It's exactly the same. You have the technology to explore this question, to find the evidence, and you shy away from it. You might ask, why do people shy away from it? Yes. And perhaps it's because of the fact that there is science fiction. I, I'm not a fan of science fiction because it has an element to it that violates the laws of physics in many of the books right. and, and, and the films. Magic. So, yeah. And I cannot enjoy the, these things when I see the laws of physics violated. But who cares that the you know the fact that there is science fiction? I mean, if if you have the scientific methodology to address the same subject, I don't care that other people uh, you know spoke nonsense about this subject or said things that make no sense. Who cares? You do your scientific work just like you explore the dark matter. Uh, you explore the possibility that Oumuamua is an artifact. You just look for evidence and try to deduce uh, what what it means. Um, and I have no problem with doing that. Uh, to me, it sounds like any other scientific question that we have, and given the public's interest, we have an obligation to do that. Yes. By the way, science to me is not an occupation of the elite. It doesn't allow me to feel superior to other humans that are unable to understand the math. To me, it's a, it's a way of life. You know, if, if there is a problem in the faucet or in the pipe, uh, at home, I try to figure out what the problem is. And with a plumber, we figure it out. And, you know, we look at the clues and the same thing in science, you know, you, you look at the evidence, you try to figure out what it means. It's, it's common sense mm -hmm. in a way. And uh, uh, it shouldn't be regarded as uh, something removed from the public. It should be a reflection of the public's interest. And I think it's actually a crime to resist the public. Mm -hmm. to, if the public says, I care about this, mm -hmm. and you say, no, 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 that's not sophisticated enough for me. I want to do intellectual gymnastics on anti deceiter space. <laughs> to me, that's a crime. Yes, I 100% uh, agree. So it's, it's hilarious that the very, not hilarious, it's sad that s people who are trained in the scientific community to have the tools to explore this world, to be children, to be the most effective at being children, uh, are the ones that resist being children the, the most. But there is a large number of people that embrace the childlike wander about the world and may not necessarily have the tools to do it. That's the, the more general public. And so, you know, I, I wonder if I could ask you and, and talk to you a little bit about you know, UFO sightings, that there's people, you know, quote unquote believers, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of UFO sightings. And 
you know, I've, I've, you know, uh, consumed some of the things that people have said about it. And uh, one, one thing I really like about it is how excited they are by the possibility, uh, by, it's, it's almost like this childlike wonder about the world out there. They're not, uh, it's not a fear, it's an excitement. Do you think, because we're talking about uh, this extra, possibly extraterrestrial object that visited, that flew by Earth, do you think it's possible that out of those hundreds of thousands of UFO sightings, one, is an actual one or some number is an actual sighting of a non-human, some alien technology. And that we're not, uh, we did not, we're too close-minded to, uh, to look and to see. I think to answer this question, we need better evidence. Um, my starting point, as I said, out of modesty is that we are not particularly interesting. <laughs> yes. And therefore, I would <laughs> I, agree with I would be hard pressed to imagine that someone wants to really spy on us. Uh, so I would think, you know, as a starting point, that we don't deserve attention and we shouldn't expect someone. To, but who knows? Now, the problem that I have with UFO sighting reports is that you know, fifty years ago there were some reports of fuzzy images, you know, saucer-like uh, things. Uh, by now, our Technologies are much better. Our cameras are much more sensitive. These fuzzy images should have turned into crisp, clear images yes. of things that we are confident about. And they haven't turned that way. It's always on the borderline of believability. And because of that, I believe that it might be most likely artifacts of our instruments yes. or some natural phenomena that we are unable to understand. Yeah, now, yeah. of course, the reason you, you need, you must examine those if, for example, pilots report about them or uh, the military finds evidence for them, is because it may pose a national security threat. If another country has technologies that we don't know about and they're spying on us, we need to know about it. And therefore, we should examine everything that looks unusual. But to associate it with an alien life is a little too far for me until we have evidence that stands up to the level of scientific credence, you know, that, that we are 100% sure that, you know, from multiple detectors and, you know, through a scientific process. Now, again, if the scientific community shies away from these reports, right. we will never have that. It's like saying, I don't want to take photographs of something because I know what it is, then you will never know what it is. But I think if if some scientists, if grants, let's put it this way, if funding will be given to scientists mm -hmm. to follow on some of these reports and use scientific instruments that are capable of detecting those sightings with much better resolution, with much yes. better information, that would be great because it will clarify the matter. You know, these are not, as you said, you know, hundreds of thousands, these are not uh, once in a lifetime events. Yeah. So it's possible to take scientific instrumentation and explore, go to the ocean where the, you know, someone reported that there are frequent uh, events that are unusual mm -hmm. and check it out. Yeah. Do a scientific experiment. What's the problem? Why not? Why only do experiments deep into the ocean and look at the ocean, ocean, oceanography or, or do other things? You know, we can do scientific investigation of these sightings and figure out what, what they mean. Yes. Uh, I'm very much in favor of that, uh, but until we have the evidence, I would be doubtful as to what they actually mean. Yeah, we we'll have to be humble and uh, and acknowledge that we're not that interesting. It's kind of you, you're making me realize that because it's so taboo, that the people that have the equipment, uh, meaning, and we're not just talking. Everybody has cameras now, but to have a large scale like uh, sensor right. network. network that collects data, that right. regularly collects, just like we look at the weather. We're exactly. collecting information, and then we can then access that information when there is reports, and like have it not be a taboo thing, where there's like millions or exactly. billions of dollars funding this effort, yeah. that, by the way, inspires millions of people. This right. is exactly what you're talking about, is like, is, yeah. is uh, the scientific community is afraid of a topic that inspires millions of people. Exactly. It's absurd. But it's, if you put blinders on your eyes, you don't see it. Yeah. Right. 
I should say that uh, we do have meteors that we see. These are rocks that by chance happen to collide with the Earth. Mm -hmm. And they, if they're small, they burn up in the atmosphere. But if they're big enough, uh, tens of meters or more, hundreds of meters, the outer layer burns up, but then the core of the object mm -hmm. makes it through. And this is our chance of putting our hands around an object <laughs> if nice. this meteor came from interstellar space. So one path of discovery is to search for interstellar meteors. And mm -hmm. with a student of mine, we actually looked through the record and we thought that we found one example of a meteor that was reported that uh, might have come from interstellar space. Oh, and uh, another approach is, for example, to look at the moon. Mm -hmm. The moon is different from the Earth in the sense that it doesn't have an atmosphere. So objects do not burn up on their way to it. It's sort of like a museum. It collects everything that comes. Of rocks from out there in yeah. deep space, yeah. And there is no geological activity on the yeah. moon. So on Earth, every 100 million years, you know, we could have had computer terminals mm -hmm. on Earth that could have been a civilization like ours <laughs> with electronic equipment yes. more than 100 million years ago. And it's completely lost. You cannot excavate and find it, yeah. evidence for it, because in archaeological digs, because the Earth is being mixed mm -hmm. on these timescales and everything that was on the surface more than 100 million years ago is buried deep inside the Earth right now because of geological activity. Fascinating to think but, about, by the way, yeah. But on the moon, this doesn't <laughs> happen. The only mm -hmm. thing that happens on the moon is you have objects impacting the moon and they go 10 meters deep, so they produce some dust. Mm -hmm. But the moon keeps everything. It's like a museum. It keeps everything on the surface. So if we go to the moon, I would highly recommend regarding it as an archaeological site yes. and looking for objects that are strange. Maybe yeah. it collected some trash, you know, from yeah. interstellar space. <laughs> yes. You mentioned aliens, very important topic. Do you actually think about, uh, about this? There's been an increased uh, interest and there's been uh, increased UFO sightings and encounters, all that kind of stuff. The US government at least releasing data, um, release releasing videos of uh, pilots, uh, pilot observations and from airplanes of UFOs. Do you think about this kind of stuff? Because you, you mentioned in the following context, you mentioned like our humans will get our shit together when the aliens eventually come. Yeah. Um, what do you make of all the sightings? Is that something you think about? I thought about it a lot when I was younger. Um, and I've just, I made my conclusions and yeah, I, I, I don't think that there's a possibility that there aren't aliens. I would think there would be impossible for there not to be aliens. Uh, there, you know, um, you know, I, I feel like this is pretty good real estate. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, you'd probably want it, but we already might be, well, I, well, I don't even think might, I mean, it's probably quite likely that we are to some degree aliens. I mean, all life is probably to some degree alien. I like the real estate, so the resources, but we're also kind of interesting. Yeah. Whatever this ant colony of living organisms that we've created, it's kind of interesting to study. I, I tend to believe that the alien civilizations that are going to reach us or have reached us are far more intelligent, just orders of magnitude more intelligent than us. And so it's going to be very difficult both ways, actually, for us to understand them and for them to dumb themselves down enough to understand us. Yeah, probably. So they might even just miss our existence altogether just because because we're i tend to believe i don't know what you think that we're not that special in terms of all the life forms in the universe there's a lot of cool stuff out there and uh, has to be has to be but to us we're special yeah well that's all that matters right <laughs> yeah <laughs> even the, the human species is the most special to, the, to us humans there could be much more special species here on earth they were just totally oblivious to like trees on a scale of thousands of years. Maybe they're like, they're, they're onto something. <laughs> Lex, you know, um, I think that so much of what makes a person special is what they pass on your kids. But, but I think that you are quite special because you're part of this thing that's potentially giving birth to the next thing. The robots. The robots. I, I should say, the funny thing is, while talking to Devin during this podcast, I, I would a door, doorbell ring, had to go downstairs, 
and there was a big box, <laughs> menacing box with a new legged robot. So um, the hilarity of you saying that is, because that, that, that robot is actually going to likely be the main robot that I show to the, to the world in, in the coming months, because that has the, that's the highest compute level in that robot. So I've, I've been playing a lot with legged robots, the um, four legs, mm -hmm. so like a, like a dog. Um, I like, I like all the robots, but there's something about when a robot has legs, it's able to communicate, it's able to connect with humans in some kind of deep way, in the way a dog can, mm. just show affection. Something about like step, 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 and then and then the robot realizes you're here, and then it steps and then notices you in the way the dog does and yeah. raises its head. Um, it makes me feel noticed and heard in the same way I do when a dog notices me. That excitement, that stupid excitement of like, yeah. yes. Uh, fellow living organism. And what excites me about legged robots is that, holy shit, it's possible to engineer this. It's possible to create that feeling. And I wonder where that can go. There's a lot of negative possible trajectories, uh, but I have a sense that there's positive ones too. You, you think more that love they'll the take world. us with them? Yeah, I yeah. think so. Because I, I de so th there's this fear of robots that they become super intelligent and run away from us humans and basically become so intelligent and then they almost just not giving a damn will destroy us. Uh, but I think in order for for robots to become intelligence, they have to integrate themselves with society. So they they by the very nature of, of how they become intelligent have to bring us along. So it's not that there'll be this separate thing. They have to, like, we'll have robots in the home. Well, they'll be interacting with us. You have human kids and you have a bunch of robots. You have robot friends, you have human friends. And they, the robots make your human to human relationships much more meaningful and richer. They bring more love to the world, but they it's integrated. It's not like they'll be developing smarter and smarter um, as like, um, sentient beings by themselves. I think that's very difficult to do. You have to be doing that together with humans. And so we'll come for the ride. There's technical things like we might merge like cyborgs mm. more and more. Well, we already saw our cyborgs, right? With the phones yeah. and so on, but more and more. So with Elon and Neuralink, deeper integration of ro robots and AI into our, like, increasing the bandwidth at which they can communicate. Right. So if we do implants in the brain, I think, um, again, a lot of people are really nervous about this, uh, as am I, but I think there's a lot of trajectories that are positive there. And that to me is exciting. And, and also I just don't think it's possible to stop this development. So we should uh, steer it. Yeah, yeah. For good. Did you... I mean, you must have watched the movie Terminator, right? Yeah, of course. I yeah. love Terminator. <laughs> yeah. I love my, Schwarzenegger. My favorite movie of all time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, that's that's the big fear, right? Yeah. What's the conclusion with Terminator? Isn't ultimately humanity wins? I, I think I they're know. at like Terminator 8 now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, yeah. The So there, and, and it's interesting, actually, I was going to bring this up as you were talking about it, but... Uh, but China and the United States, I actually don't know where Canada is on this, but they both have agreed that they're not going to put limits on autonomous weapon uh, system development. So they're not going to. They're not going to. So because China said we're not going to, and right. now US officially announced that we're not, we can't. Because the, well, you can't. It's like, it's you, you never could, right? As soon as it exists and it's better, people will use it. Well, but you, um, there's been a global ban on bioweapons. Mm. So you were able to come to an agreement there that we're not going to use biological weapons in war. So it was, it's a lot of people are really upset that in the case of AI driven weapons, the world said, nope, that's okay. Mm. And so now you have this potential for greater and greater automation and drones, for example, and picking uh, bombing locations. Yeah. And so the area at which they attack. And so 
you get th- th- some of that stuff that you mentioned that that drew you to the military is that teamwork between humans, that decision making. So there's strategy, but built into that team is a deep humanity. Like, yeah. Even when then there's an enemy, there's lines that you are aware of, of what is ethical, and what is not, what is just and what is not. And it's so easy for a machine uh, to, uh, to miss all of that, yeah. plow through it, and do deeply inhumane acts, commit atrocities. That mm. that's something that worries a lot of people. Yeah, because <laughs> uh, yeah, an AI based war is just is it's it's, it's terrifying, especially yeah. with cybersecurity, which is becoming more and more of an issue, which is hacking. Yeah, uh, sort of uh, people that look a lot like me being the warriors of the future. <laughs> yeah. Which is meaning people behind uh, uh, a keyboard versus uh, right. versus the traditional warriors. Probably inevitable. Yeah. And yeah. terrifying. It is, it is. But I think if you believe that it's possible, it's certainly gonna happen. Like at some point, it's just when, right? When does it happen? Anyway. So that, I mean, to me, I'm optimistic. Uh, ultimately optimistic about the future. And to me, I'm excited about the world with AI. I'm even excited about uh, the metaverse and all these kinds of things, living more and more in the digital space, in the virtual reality. I think, so it's a part of me that grew up in the non-internet world, non-computer world. You know, it says, oh, kids these days with their video games. You know, there's part of me that's like that. Um, But I think what's, it, when te- technology at its best can bring out the best of humanity. And so I think virtual reality, all of these things over time, we'll figure out how to how to fix it to bring out the humanity. So, social networks, the, the, the first generation social networks, now Facebook, Twitter, and so on, they have so many problems. They're bringing out the worst in people. But I think we're learning from that. And I think the next generation of social networks will be better and better and better. And so I'm optimistic, but of course, you know, one reason we may have not seen aliens yet, obviously, like in a way that's obvious, mm. is because once you get clever and smart and have all this cool technology, you destroy yourself. And we sure as humans are pretty close to that. Yeah, yeah, there might be that limit that is hard to get right. I'm hoping we get all our aggression between nations out through arm wrestling. Uh, competition <laughs> right <laughs> just all yeah, of that like, yeah uh, oh my god wouldn't that be great if that was if it was that simple yeah do you know if there's another over the top type movie to be made oh yeah yeah there's always stuff in the works um there's actually a there's the there's a tournament called over the top in australia that's a couple months away i think they're doing an all the over top scene but uh there are arm wrestling movies that are being made right now actually i'm there's a documentary that's filming me yeah. for this whole Yvonne thing but um uh, yeah, we're probably due for another big one. Yeah, but you're also just with your YouTube channel. You're doing a lot for the sport. That's really cool to see. Just being genuine, but just being like uh, looking not like you're looking today, but just like yeah, just yeah, the beard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, I'm normally just mess. like sleepy, yeah, yeah. you know, and just putting yourself out there completely as you are. That's a beautiful thing. The best thing about the sport is it brings people together. That's it. Yeah, the community, the the folks that got to interact with just so awesome so excited so full of kindness i'm definitely going to find the club here and uh and start working on my uh on my arm wrestling game uh devin this is such a huge honor that you would uh spend your valuable time you would come down to austin you would um uh, hang out with me and uh do this conversation super cool to talk awesome. to you lex yeah as i mentioned uh in case people you know people i'm sure will tell me so I hang out with Joe Rogan all the time. He's a friend. I told him that he should talk to Devin. He's going through some stuff currently, you know, uh, but I'm sure, that, I hope the conversation between you, Devin, and Joe happens eventually. He's, uh, that would be epic as well, because he's a- uh, um, Yeah, he I loves sh- fighting. He loves yeah. fighting, he loves wrestling, he loves strength. And uh, I think all of those are um, like so, perfectly encapsulated in the sport of arm wrestling. So thank you so much for talking to me, brother. Thanks so much, Lex.
Thanks for listening to this conversation with Devin Larratt. To support this podcast, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now, let me leave you with some words from Miyamoto Musashi. The only reason a warrior is alive is to fight. And the only reason a warrior fights is to win. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time. Uh, can I ask you, uh, in terms of, um, you know, the deep state and conspiracy mm -hmm. theories, there's a lot of talk about, so f again, from an outsider's perspective, if I were just looking at Twitter, it seems that at least 90% of people in government are pedophiles. <laughs> that 90, 90 to 95%, I'm not sure what that number is. Yeah. <laughs> if I were to just look at Twitter, honestly, or YouTube, I would think most of the world is a pedophile. <laughs> I would almost feel like. Right. And if you, if you don't fully believe that, you're a pedophile. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I would start to wonder, like, wait, am I, like, yeah. what, am I a pedophile too? Like, I'm either a communist or a pedophile or both, I guess. Uh, yeah, that's going to be clipped out. Thank you, yeah, internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to your yeah. emails. Uh, but is there any kind of shadow conspiracy theories that uh, give you pause or... Um, so the flip side, the response to a lot of conspiracy theories is like, no, the reason this happened is because it's a combination of just incompetence. So where do you land on some of these uh, conspiracy theories? I think most conspiracy theories are wrong. Some are true and those are spectacularly true. And if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I, and we don't know which ones. Though. I don't know which ones. That's the problem. I think, oh, well, I mean, look, man, I listened to your podcast. I think I was a huge non-believer in UFOs, and now I've probably never believed more in UFOs. Like, I, yeah. I, I believe in UFOs. Like, yeah. I'm very comfortable being like, not only do I believe in UFOs, like, I think we're probably being visited by an alien civilization. Yes. Like, and if you asked me that three years ago, I would be like, you're out of your fucking mind. Like, what are you talking about? Well, listen to David Fravor. That's yeah. all I have to say. That's it. Well, like, I, I have the sense yeah. that the government has information, it hasn't revealed, but it's not like they're, I don't think they're holding, there's like a, a green guy sitting right. there in a exactly. room. Exactly. They just, they have seen things they don't know what to do with. So, so it's like, they're confused. Like They're afraid uh, yeah. of, of, of revealing that they don't know. That's yeah, what I think know. it is. Right. They, right? It's revealing the, yeah, exactly, that <laughs> yeah. they don't know. And then they're in the process, there's a lot of fears tied up in that. Right. First, looking incompetent in the public eye. Nobody wants mm -hmm. to be uh, looked that way. And the other is like in revealing it, even though they don't know, maybe China will figure it out. Exactly. <laughs> so like we don't want China to figure it out first. And so that all those kinds of things result in basically secrecy, then that damages the trust in institutions on one of the most fascinating aspects, like one of the most fascinating mysteries of humankind of is there life intelligent life out there in the universe. So that's one of them, but there, there's other ones. Like uh, for me, when I first came across actually Alex Jones mm -hmm. was 9-11. Uh, yeah. I remember like, uh, cause I was, um, I was in Chicago. I was thinking like, oh shit, are they gonna hit Chicago too? <laughs> <laughs> that's what everybody was thinking yeah everybody yeah. everybody was thinking like right. what does this mean at scale what scale what i mean trying to interpret it and i remember like looking for information desperately like what what happened mm -hmm. what and i remember not being satisfied with the quality of reporting and figuring out like rigorous like here's exactly what happened and so people like alex jones stepped up and others that said like there's some shady shit going on and yeah. it sure as hell look like there's shady shit going on. Yes. Uh, so like, and I still stand behind the fact that it seems like there's not, I, there's not enough, inf like it wasn't a good job of being honest and transparent and all those kinds well, of things. Because it would implicate the Saudis, let's be honest, right? And see, <laughs> see that's, that's my conspiracy theory. So I'm like, yeah, I think they covered up a lot of stuff because they wanted to cover up for the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Like, and then, I mean, that is, a, that was a conspiracy theory not that long ago. I think it's true. I mean, yeah. I think it's a hundred percent true. It's probably true in a lot of cultures, maybe every culture, that food, and especially like in a family, the mother that cooks is the source of love and like ties the family together. It creates events where everyone comes together. It's uh, it's one of the only chances of togetherness. Uh, the thing that bonds a family is like dinner. 
or if we were eating together. And I don't know what to do with that. It's, it, it ties up with like dieting and so on. When I was on stricter diets, especially like competing and cutting weight and stuff, it, feel, it felt like I was almost like losing opportunity to connect with friends and family. It's interesting. It, it almost like cultures, we cannot fully experience love and family without eating. And on the flip side of that, eating enables us to experience love and family. I don't know what to do with that. It's a tough one because there's lots of layers around kind of gender roles and um, families changing and things. Yeah, I'd say I agree around the alienation and I've done carnivore diet and I've mm -hmm. tried some of these extreme protocols and I too, I suffered from loneliness. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like doing carnivore and and not being able to eat what my kids ate and talk about it at the same mm -hmm. time. Th those pieces are real. And I wonder with all of these diets, if that structure is actually helping or just taking away from people's kind of sensual understanding. Um, but I think that there's some rigor around that that helps people discover what's good for them mm -hmm. by, by eliminating and then growing towards more intuitive food is a good evolution from that base. Mm -hmm. I love to cook for people. I love to pay attention to their, their way of being and read what they'd like to eat. Mm -hmm. And it's my, my purest way of love. And that's for everybody in my life. I actually love to cook for people I love. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I, I, I would struggle to be, you know, putting out food all the time. It's like something for me, it's a real act of caretaking. Mm -hmm. So I definitely have that in my makeup. Um, and, and I definitely notice um, in times of like, of, of real stress, that's the piece that drops off, right? And then, and it's like, I've, if I'm unable to care for myself, I have a hard time cooking. So it's oh, for, wow. for me, it's very emotional. It's very connected to love. And individualistic. So like focused on the particular individual, it's almost like a, a journey of understanding what that person is excited about in the, in the landscape of flavors, right? Figuring that person out, what they like, mm -hmm. what, they, what they love to eat. Yeah. Uh, I see, let's talk about aliens. We already mentioned it. Let's start just by with the basic. What's your intuition as of today? This is a thing that could change day by day. But how many alien civilizations are out there? Is it zero? Is it a handful? Is it almost endless? Like the 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 un the observable universe or the universe is teeming with life. If I had gun to my head, I have to take a guess. I would say it's teeming with life. I would say there is. Um, I think. Uh, running a Monte Carlo simulation, this paper by uh, Andrew Sandberg and Drexler and a few others um, a couple years ago, I think you probably know about it. Um, I think they're, they're, they're the mean, um, it, you know, using different, uh, y using different, you know, running through a randomized Drake equation uh, multiplication, you ended up with 27 million as the mean in of intelligent civilizations in the galaxy, in the Milky Way alone. Mm -hmm. Um, and so then if you go outside the Milky Way, that would turn into trillions. That's the, that's the mean. Now, what's interesting is that there's a long tail because they believe some of these multipliers in the Drake equation. So for example, the, the probability that life starts in the first place, they think that the, uh, the kind of range that we use is for that variable or is way too small. And that's constraining our possibilities and if you actually extend it to you know you know some some crazy number of orders of magnitude like 200 they think should that that variable should be uh you get this long tail where i, I forget the exact number but it's like a third or a quarter mm -hmm. of the total outcomes have us alone like you know i think it's like i think it's a, a, a sizable percentage has us as the only intelligent life in the galaxy but you can keep going and i think there's like you know a, a, a non-zero like legitimate amount of outcomes there that have us as the only life in the observable universe at all is on earth. I mean, it seems incredibly counterintuitive. It, se it seems like, you know, when you mentioned that people think, um, you're, you know, you must be an idiot because, um, you know, if you picked up one grain of sand on a beach and examined it and you found all these little things on it, it's like saying, well, maybe this is the only one that has that. And right. it's like, probably not. They're probably yeah. uh, uh, most of the sand, probably or a lot of the sand. Right. So, and then the other hand, we don't see anything. We don't see any evidence, you know, which of course people would say that the, the people who still scoff at the concept that we're potentially alone, um, they say, well, of course, there's lots of reasons we wouldn't have seen anything. 
and, and, and they can go list them. Um, mm -hmm. And they're very compelling. But we don't know. And the truth is, if there were, if this were a freak thing, I mean, we don't, if, if this were a completely <laughs> freak thing that happened here, whether it's life at all or just getting to this level of intelligence, mm -hmm. that species, whoever it was, would think there must be lots of us out there and they'd be wrong. So just being, again, using the same intuition that most people would use, I'd say there's probably lots of other things out there. Yeah, and you wrote a great blog post about it. But to me, the two interesting um, reasons that uh, we haven't been in contact, I, I too have an intuition that the universe is teeming with life. So one interesting is around the great filter. So we either, the great filter is either behind us or, or in front of us. So... The, the reason that's interesting is you get to think about what kind of things ensure or um, ensure the survival of an intelligent civilization or lead to the destruction of intelligent civilization. That's a very pragmatic, very important question to always be asking. And we'll talk about some of those. And then uh, the other one is I'm saddened by the possibility that there could be aliens communicating with us all the time. In fact, they, they may have visited and we're just too dumb to hear it, to see it. Like the um, the idea that the kind of life that can evolve is just the range of life that can evolve is so large that our narrow view of what is life uh, and what is intelligent life is preventing us from having communication with them. But that, then they don't seem very smart because if they were trying to communicate with us, they would surely, if they were super intelligent, they would be very... I'm sure if there's lots of life, we're not that rare. We're not some crazy weird species that hears and, and you know has different kinds of ways of of uh, perceiving signals. So they would probably be able to, you know, if you really wanted to communicate with an Earth-like species, with a human-like species, um, you would send out all kinds of things. You'd send out, you know, radio radio, uh, radio waves and and you send out gravity waves and and lots of things. So if they're communicating in a way, they're trying to communicate with us and it's just, we're too dumb to perceive the signals. It's like, well, they're not doing a great job of uh, considering the primitive species we might be. So I, I don't know. I think, I think if a super intelligent species wanted to get in touch with us um, uh, and had the capability of, I, th I think probably they would. Well, the, they may be getting in touch with us they're just getting in touch with the thing that we humans are not understanding that they're getting in touch with us with. That's, I guess that's what I was trying to say is there could be something about Earth that's much more special than us humans. Like the nature of the intelligence that's on Earth or, or the thing that's of value and that's curious and that's complicated and fascinating and beautiful might be something that's not just like uh, tweets. Okay, like English language that's interpretable or any kind of language or any kind of signal, whether it's uh, gravity or radio signal that humans seem to appreciate. What? Why not the actual, it could be the process of evolution itself. There could be something about the way that Earth is breathing essentially through the creation of life and this complex growth of life. There's like, it, it's a whole different way to view organisms and view life that could be getting communicated with. And we humans are just a tiny fingertip on top of that intelligence. And the communication is happening with, with, the, with the main mothership of, of Earth versus us humans that seem to treat ourselves as super important and we're missing the big picture. I mean, it sounds crazy, but our understanding of what is intelligent, of what is life, what is consciousness is very limited. And it's, it seems to be and just being very suspicious, it seems to be awfully human centric. Like this story, it seems like the progress of science is, you know, um, constantly putting uh, humans down on the importance, like uh, on the cosmic importance, the ranking of how big we are, how important we are. That 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 seems to be the more we discover, that's what's happening. And I think science is very young, and so I think eventually we might figure out that there's something much, much bigger going on, that humans are just a curious little side effect of the much bigger thing. That's what, I mean, that, as I'm saying, it just sounds insane, but. Well, it just, it sounds a little um, like religious. It sounds like a spiritual, um, it, it, you know, it's, it gets to that realm where there's something that more than meets the eye. Well, yeah, but not, so religious, 
and spiritual often have this kind of woo-woo characteristic, like and people write books about them and then go to wars over whatever the heck is written in those books. I I mean more like it's possible that collective intelligence is more important than individual intelligence, right? It's the ant colony. What's the primal organism? Is it the ant colony or is it the ant? Yeah, I mean, I mean, humans, just like, you know, any individual ant can't do shit, but the colony can do, make these incredible structures and, and has this intelligence. And we're exactly the same. I mean, yeah. you know, you know, the famous thing that, you know, no one, no human knows how to make a 